This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison of the grave. There was a gorgeous tapestry found under a tomb, and they were all after it. The worried importer, the man with half a face, the Englishman in an L.A. slum, and the lady wearing a green veil. But before it was over, none of them had it, and two of the four were dead. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's transcribed story, The Baton Sinister. I'd watch the blood-red sun set behind an ugly purple storm out on the ocean, and the weird afterglow that crept into the canyons of the Hollywood Hills made me uneasy. Added emphasis to the disquieting phone call I received at my office from a man named Pollard Schindler, whom I knew was a very capable worldwide broker of bizarre art objects. In words that fell over each other in urgency, he asked me to meet him at my place at once. As I drove to my apartment, I figured the trouble lay ahead. But I didn't realize how close it was until I parked and started out of my car. A bullet smashed the corner of my windshield and I ducked for cover, then hugged the building and headed for the rear where I was sure I'd seen a gun flash. I was halfway there when the side door flew open and Pollard Schindler himself stopped me. Marlo. He was white-faced and shaking, his eyes ringed by dark blue circles of fatigue. Marlo, Marlo, that shot. Yeah, somebody threw a slug at me, Schindler, from back there. I was afraid of this. We can't talk here, not now. Come, let's get in your car and drive. Hurry. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's all this about? Who shot at me and why? It, it must have been that lizard, Myron Loft. Oh? He's followed me all the way from England, Marlo, because... But I... I tell you all about it when we're safe. Right now, we must get away from here. Okay, but watch yourself. Come on. Well, so far, so good. You see that hole in the windshield? It's lucky it's not in my head. Uh, are we being followed? Not yet, anyway. Well, Pollard, last time it was a cloak of Kamehameha and a trip to Honolulu. What is it this time? It's worse. A tapestry model, 15th century, and exquisite. Worth... Twenty thousand as a museum piece alone. Hey, that's a lot of money for a chunk of cloth. Bah, it's nothing. I'm getting better than eighty thousand for it from a man named Arthur Merritt in Seattle. Eighty grand. Yes, correct. You see, this Merritt claims to be a direct descendant from Edward, second Duke of York, who fell at Agincourt. Really? Yeah. He spent a fortune tracing his genealogy and collecting family treasures, and regards this tapestry as his greatest prize. Mm. Oh, it's a gorgeous thing, Marlow. Depicts the duke on a gold horse, riding to battle beside the king. And such colors, reds, blues, greens, breathtaking. Now, Ben. Ah, gosh, but I'm so tired. I don't think I've slept in weeks. For 80,000 bucks, you can afford to be tired, Schindler. But how does the guy with the itchy trigger finger fit into all this? Loft, that's come. He was after the tapestry, too. He got wind of the fact that someone was willing to pay 80,000 for it. But he doesn't know who. I see. You found it first, Yes. Yes, huh? yes in a sealed tomb under the ruins of a castle in Wales, just minutes ahead of Loft. Where's the tapestry now? At this moment, it's in a cheap suitcase checked in a public locker at the Kavinga Boulevard bus depot. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to pick it up and get it safely to Arthur Merritt. Here, here's the locker key. I take it on a plane, leaving in three hours, and your money. Five one hundred dollar bills. Enough? Enough. Where will I find Arthur Merritt? Uh, 76 West Street, Seattle. He'll be expecting you. And Marlowe, I feel better if you get the tapestry soon and keep it with you until plane time. You're really afraid of this guy, Loft, aren't you? He'll stop at nothing. I warn you. Now, I, uh, I'll get off here at the corner, Marlowe. All right. Incidentally, when you get the tapestry, don't go back to your apartment. Loft may be waiting there. Now, I'm at the Hollywood Crest Hotel. Hollywood Crest, huh? Yeah, call me when the job is done. Goodbye, Marlowe, and good luck. You'll need it. The key Schindler left was numbered 410, so I drove to the bus station and went in. A casual walkthrough showed me that locker number 410 was the last on the left. Then I ambled over to the lunch counter, ordered a sandwich and coffee, and sat down to case the rest of the customers. 
Finally, I spotted him. A dark man in ragged clothes with a profile out of Western Asia who was also watching number 410. The profile glanced around nervously and looked away fast when he caught me watching him. I eased the key to 410 out of my pocket and slipped it under my sandwich. Paul the waitress said be right back and started toward him. He saw me coming and made for the back exit, broke into a run. When he got to the door, we played follow the leader down the tunnel to the alley behind the bus barn and around the corner. There the game stopped. Because a claw that belonged on a lobster reached out, grabbed me by the shirt front, and pulled me up against 18 inches of curved Damascus steel, sharp enough to shave with. I knew then why he'd shown me only his profile. Half his face was handsome, the other half. Well, when he spoke, he hissed through the flexible half of his mouth. Stand still, my friend, or I slit your gizzard for you. Where is Myron Loft? I don't know. I never met the man. Up close, that is. Liar, you are working for him. Keep using that knife for punctuation, pal. I'll admit anything. I followed the fat German. I watched him put the tapestry in one of those lockers inside. Therefore, I knew that Loft or his hireling wouldn't be far behind. You mean me? You're off base. What's Myron Loft to you? Mm, What indeed? Only I know the true value of that tapestry. For it was I who paid for it. For half my face and half my mind. But before I'm through, Loft will know too. Where is he? I don't know, but I wish I were with him. Shall I kill you for being stupid? Go to Loft and tell him that Akkad is not dead, but has come back to teach him the price of treachery. This will surprise him, no doubt, huh? He murdered me so I would not talk. He left me for dead. Sent me hurtling, unconscious off a bridge in a truck of blazing oil. It made me like this. Claw for a hand, a face to frighten demons. But he did not kill me. Nice guy, Loft. And the tapestry itself... Tell him it will bring him nothing but despair. For I have put a curse of worthlessness on it that... A car! There, from the alley! The shot! Did you see who it was, a car? No, but I didn't have to see it to know. He thinks he has finished it now. But he is wrong. Look. Look for the baton sinister. What, what? Look for what, a car? In the Duke's shield, the baton sinister... Car. The words back on sinister, whatever that meant on his twisted lips. The twisted little man died. I walked back carefully the way I'd come, but life in the bus depot was going on as usual. The waitress gave me a hard eye when I sat down at the lunch counter again, and the mirror over the back bar told me why. I was pasty green from eyes to mouth. The thought that death in an alley still did that to me was strangely gratifying. I got the key from under the sandwich, dropped the buck on the counter, and then went to lock a force hand and opened it. Schindler's padded suitcase was there. I picked it up, took it over to a stall phone, and sat on it while I put in a call to Lieutenant Matthews at Homicide. Oh, say that again, Marlowe. I don't think I heard you right. Yes, you did, Matthews. I said a man with half a face named Dakar was shot in the alley back of Coinga Bus Depot. Probably because he knew too much about a tapestry. That's what you said the first time. Oh, who did it? You got any ideas? Well, it could be a guy named Myron Loft. That's all I know about him. Just a name. Okay, I'll send somebody. Stick around, will you, Phil? Hey, hey, Lieutenant. Yeah? You happen to know what a baton sinister is? Uh, spell that for me, will you, Phil? Never mind, Matthews. I'll call you again before I leave. <laughs> I left the bus depot. I drove to my office, took the suitcase upstairs, and after I locked myself in, I opened it under the lamp on my desk. Folds of dazzling cloth spilled out. I remembered Schindler saying Duke was riding a gold horse, so I looked for that. Yeah, it was easy to spot. And from there, I located his shield. It was deep blue with three white roses on one side and a red line on the other, and in the center, pointing diagonally from upper right to lower left, was a thin line of still deeper blue. That was all I had a chance to see hand in a rubber glove clamped a wet cloth over my face and the sickly sweet odor went through me like warm oil through a paper bag. A hundred years later, I had a strange dream. I saw a pair of high-heeled green suede shoes and then and then a woman in a green veil looking at an empty suitcase. <clears throat> it must have been a dream. Because I couldn't move and my eyelids were lead. And when the green veil and green shoes left, everything went black again. And 
next time it was no dream. I was face down on my office carpet alone and very sick to my stomach. I'd been chloroformed. I crawled over the desk and pulled myself up. The suitcase was open and empty. Somehow I got the phone off the hook, dialed information, and a minute later I had my client on the wire. Marl, you sound sick. What is wrong? I am sick. You're going to be too, Schindler. Your tapestry's gone. It was stolen. Gone? Stolen? Yeah. Oh, no, no. It can't be. You blundering, stupid fool, Marlowe. Why did you... What did you say? I'm sorry, Phil. Screaming in hysteria won't get it back, Phil. No. How did it happen? Well, I brought it up here to my office, but somebody was already in here laying for me. I was chloroformed and out for about half an hour. When I came to it, it was gone. Now, listen... You know a man named Akar, horribly scarred from burns. Akar? No. Why? Did he get it? Yeah. Not the way you think. He was killed at the bus station. What? Killed? Good heavens. Did Loft do it? I don't know. Akar thought so, and I'm getting tired of hearing that name, Loft. Hey, incidentally, what's a baton sinister? Baton sinister? Yeah. A mark in heraldry, but but why that mark? Well, it might be important. What is it actually, Paul? Well, it's... uh... A short line on a shield or a scutcheon mm-hmm. runs diagonally from sinister chief to Dexter base. What does that mean? From upper right to lower left, maybe? If you're facing the shield, yes. It's the mark of fraudulence. But why? Well, I was told to look for the baton sinister by, uh... Hey, wait a minute, Pollen. Huh? What? There's something on the floor here. It looks like an envelope. <clears throat> yeah. There's nothing in it, but it's addressed to... Holy smoke, this is addressed to Myron Loft, 946 South Grand Avenue, L.A. I knew it. I knew Loft was behind the Teff Marlowe. But now we've got a chance to get the tapestry back. Where is this Grand Avenue? Uh, it runs through a slum called Bunker Hill. Any cab driver knows it. I'm going down there now, Schindler. Good. I'll get there as soon as I can to cover you. Uh, and Marlowe, listen. The man is a devil. Be careful. <laughs> Bunker Hill stuck up above downtown L.A. like a water in a debutant's hand. The big street that had tunneled under it or bypassed it years ago left it nothing more than a dingy, isolated attic where the city's worn-out cast-offs finally end up to die. And the big hotels that opened on the swank street below had all carefully turned their backs on the hill. I parked near Angel's flight and walked on the odd number side of the street until I spotted 946, a crumbling yellow stucco rooming house that clung to the hill face from habit only. And I gave the windows a lot of attention to be sure no one was watching. And I went out of the corner, crossed, and came back. An anemic nightlight was on at the end of the hall. So I pushed my way through the smells toward a door with a grimy card that said office. I was about to knock when a voice purred from the landing on the stairs behind me. When you turn around, do it slowly, understand? Uh, perfectly. I dare say you're Pollard Schindler's man. Could be. Which makes you Myron Love. Yes, huh? I've been up on the roof watching you. I expected you'd come before long. I suppose you want the tapestry. Now, how'd you guess that? Then what price has Schindler decided to offer me? Price? You're kidding. Hardly. I don't enjoy humor. Perhaps you don't know much about the tapestry, hmm? Not much. I know more than I used to. I had quite a chat with Akar. Akar? <laughs> That's impossible. My ex assistant is dead. I know. But he lived long enough to tell me about the Baton Sinister and the Duke's shield. That's a lie, my fine fellow. There's no Baton Sinister on that shield, and it's... Oh, of course. That sly idiot. Akar would try something like a Baton Sinister. But for what purpose, I can't imagine. Just to make sure that you'd pay for his murder. What's that? Must have been a shock to find out he'd survived that burning truck accident you tried. So you finished him tonight with a bullet. Oh, that's strange. How much more do you know along this line? Enough to make bargaining more than worth your while, and I haven't kept it all in my head. I see. Well, my door is a second on the left. Now, move along now, quickly. I see no reason to hurry. I do. See what you mean. Although the accent was Oxford, the gestures were strictly skid row. So as I proceeded, Myron Loft and gun into my lord's sagging chamber, I watched carefully for the chance I knew I'd have to take before long. But a small step toward a dark corner... No, no, don't try that told me it wasn't going to be easy. The gentleman with the flaccid voice was being very wary about me. Now turn about and face me, quickly. So wary about me, in fact, that the quiet footstep behind him went unnoticed. The footstep that had been made by a green suede pump that belonged to a lady with a veil also green. I now knew I'd actually seen earlier in my office. When she took her next step, the gun she clenched in her expensively gloved hand was raised high. It came down hard. <laughs> 
Girl of my dreams, I thank you. That was neat, and believe me, not a moment Never too mind, soon. Uh, he's not dead, is he? No, he's just out cold. He's in deep freeze. But, uh, uh, aren't we being a little matter-of-fact about all this? We are. Did you expect he is? Well, from the veil, yes. That's where I'm probably being misled. I should concentrate on your green suede shoes. They seem to be more in character. And you seem to be quite ungrateful. And Gabby. So why don't we just move on some? Over there, that bundle. It could be the tapestry. The tap... Hey, lady, you're not after it too, are you? No. I came here to save your life. Uh-huh. I love you. That's charming. Come on, mister. Are we warm? Hot. Yeah, this is it, all right. Good. Now get back. Yeah. Away from it. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Way back. And for safekeeping into that snug little closet. Without so much as a peek? At the veil, I mean. Without so much as another word. Your mouth, I mean. Go on. Inside. It won't hold you for long, but I don't need long anymore. She was so right. Didn't hold me for long. Because even a misplaced hiccup could jar loose most any given segment of Bunker Hill construction. However, by the time I got to the street, it was Lady with Veil and Bundle tucked underneath her arm, climbing into a cab. And only a tail light skidding out of sight around a corner. So I played the only bet left. She departed in a cab. Maybe she'd arrived in one. And maybe that one was still in line at the hack stand across the street at the back of the hotel. At number four, I connected. Yeah, yeah, sure. The doll with a veil. I brought her here. Why? What's that mean to you? Everything. She's my long-lost sister. Where'd you pick her up? I can't remember. Okay, okay. Here, here's five. Now try it. Sure. It was a Sunset Gardens Hotel. Villa 12, which is around on the side. But you know what else? No, what else? I'll bet this five, she ain't really your sister at all. I'll bet she's really your wife. Oh, you're so wrong. She's really typhoid Mary, Jack. You better fumigate fast, both inside and out. Huh? Goodbye. I was 30 anxious minutes weaving my way through the thick westbound traffic that any snail could have easily outsprinted before I was finally parked away from Villa 12. Then out of my car and running toward the squat chunk of termite-proof old Spain. But I hoped I'd again meet up with both the lady who wore a mosquito net for a hat and my client's hard come by drapery. But the bungalow in front of me said no such luck. Because it was dark, closed tight, and as quiet as snow falling all the way around. Until I was in the back. Where each villa had its own junior picnic grounds, complete with barbecue pit. Then from somewhere behind me, I heard it. First the rattle of paper. Then a few footsteps, high heels, that I knew could be the green suede ones on flagstone. After that, over near the pit, liquid poured on wood and then sudden flame. It was a lady whose shoes I knew all right, but this time no veil. Only a face that might have been pretty if it weren't for the prancing shadows the flames threw over an expression that was a little more than determination, a little less than psycho. I moved close to her quietly. And when she had the tapestry unwrapped and was ready to make a little offering to the fire guards, I took my cue. Marshmallows would taste better, baby, honest. You! Yeah, a little me in 38, not so little. So stand very still, honey. Priceless heirloom included. Oh, no, I won't. It's going to fire where it belongs. That's a matter of opinion. Oh, no, 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 my arm, you big hate. Drop it. Let it go, baby. Better we dirty it than singe it. Come on, let go. There, that's better. Now, come on, firebug. Who are you? Who? Oh, Naomi Marsh. I... Got it out. Okay. Now, tell me where you fit in the tapestry, or do we shake some more? No, no, thanks. I'll, I'll tell you what you want to know. Who are you? My name's Philip Marlowe. Cop? No, a private detective hired to babysit with a tapestry. Let's not change the subject. Okay, okay. Getting there. I'm Arthur Merritt's niece and sole heir. The guy in Seattle who's waiting for me to deliver this item is your uncle? Uh huh. My uncle was a jerk. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You steal the tapestry, risk your life, play with guns, and with people who only play for keeps. Also, you can get a chance to burn 80,000 bucks worth of fancy needlework. Listen. My uncle has been throwing away his money on antiques, and all he's got left of a half a million is a hundred grand. I don't want four-fifths of that used for this stinking substitute for wallpaper. Anything else? Yeah. How long have you been working on this project, this Operation Arson? A week. Came down from Seattle when I learned that the man my uncle was dealing with was named Pollard Schindler. You can fill it in from there. Now, do you mind if I leave? I'm looking forward to bed and a good cry. Eighty thousand dollars worth. Do I go? Yeah, on one condition. Your gun, baby. It stays. I 
watched her until she was around at the front of the bungalow and out of sight. And I grabbed up the tapestry, started to fold it when a sudden flare from the fire threw a crazy spurt of light over the material on my arm. And I saw that on the shield that the Duke of Kent carried, there was no baton sinister. This was not the same tapestry I'd examined in my office. Right then, just to make things all the merrier, I once again heard from Naomi Martin. On the even chance that this was a trap, Naomi playing possum with healthy lungs. I ditched the tapestry in a nearby clump of trees, then gun in hand, ran for the front door of Villa 12. I got there just as the gray convertible lights out roared off, and Naomi was climbing back onto her feet. What took you so long? Now, listen, you, the real tapestry, where is it? The real... Oh, no, you're kidding. Baby, that number you just tried to burn is not the one I started out with tonight. It's minus Baton Sinister. Minus who? What are you talking about? Just this. Maybe you still have the tapestry and the routine with the frames was done with a phony and strictly for my benefit. And maybe you're nuts. Now you listen. What I told you before was the truth, nothing but. However, if it happens to work out that I walked off with a phony and you did likewise, I'm sorry. I'll bet. For the time being, I'll buy it that way. Now, tell me what went on here. Uh... I was about to unlock the door when it happened. A hand with a rubber glove grabbed wait me. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Rubber glove? Rubber glove? Do we say everything twice? Mm. Whoever it was obviously didn't want to leave fingerprints. Oh, the smell of chloroform on his hands. He comes to think of it, I, I did get a whiff of something funny. How do you know about that? In my office when the tapestry was... Wait a minute, you were there. Didn't you get a look at him? No, there was, there was only a single light on and you were already out cold when I got there. Yeah, but you must have seen something. Sure, stars. After he took the tapestry and laid an envelope of some kind next to you, I, I told him to reach way up. He got me piled into a heap on your office floor. The envelope you ran. I, I followed, but I lost it. Hey, I hey, hold it. And, and Back up, Naomi. What? Did you say he placed that envelope there next to me? That's what I said. See what I mean? We were... We Cut were it out, kidding. baby. I've got an idea, a thought. About a baton sinister and what's really going on. Also, it just occurred to me that Myron Loft might not remain unconscious forever. And that my client was going to cover me at Loft's place on Bunker Hill. Uh, well, wait, where are you going, Marla? Once I pick up the tapestry I just hid, which may not be a phony, back to Bunker Hill. So long, kid. Oh, no. Marlo, thank goodness you're here. I... I just shot Myron Love. You did what, Schindler? Yes. God in himmel. Dead Marlo. Hey, hmm. for the love of Steve, what's going on in this joint? Now then you can help, sweetheart. Oh, okay, bright eyes, but try to hold it down, will you? I... It was terrible, Marlo. I came to this place after I didn't hear from you and found out which room Love had. When I went in, he was on the floor, unconscious. So I started to look around for the tapestry. In the meantime, Loft came to, got hold of the gun and rushed you, is that it? Yes, we struggled, and then the gun went off. Oh, Marlo, what should we do now? Call the police? Yeah, I'll take care of it. You go back into the room there and don't touch anything and see that nobody else does. All right, Marlo. But uh, you have the tapestry? Yeah, I got it, Schindler. Safe and sound. Your worries are over. Matthews. Oh. I'm at 946 South Grand Avenue, and so's another body. What? At Myron Loft, I mentioned. My client, Paula Schindler, just shot him in self-defense. Which also clears up that that tobacco out behind the bus depot, huh? I mean, Loft got him and then tried for your client, but missed. Yeah. Yeah, if you believe my client. Yeah, well, I believe... Oh, Marla, what are you reaching for? few very tasty but hard to swallow facts. One, my client's a liar. Two, my client killed both Akka and Myron Loft. And three, I've been set up and used as the neatest chump, patsy, sucker, fall guy. They all fit. Even shot through my windshield for realism. Well, Schindler never had the real tapestry, Matthews. He had only a phony. He gave it to me to deliver and then swiped it from me. After which, he put me on the trail of the real one. Uh-huh. So while swiping it back for him like the good private detective you are, you'd come up with the real one, huh? That's tidy. I'll be right down, Phil. Okay. You, you told the police what happened, Marlowe? Yeah. I told them, Mr. Schindler. I told them everything. Now, there's nothing for us to do but wait. Well, I 
That does it, Lieutenant. Seven full pages of con- confession from Mr. Pollard Schindler, a very crafty bird. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Mooney. Oh, uh, bring that girl in a couple of minutes, will you? All right. Well, Phil, here it is, the whole story. Yeah? Yeah, look, Pollard Schindler went after the tapestry in England, but Myron Loft got there first. However, Schindler was the one who knew where he could sell it way above museum price, so Loft had a duplicate made up and saw to it that Schindler stole it from him. And it was Eckhart who added the Baton Sinister, the mark of fraudulence in heraldry, to the fake tapestry. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I still don't clearly follow the rest of it, Phil. I mean, here in L.A., you know? Oh, well, it wasn't much of a change. Another verse, same song. Loft stayed close to Schindler all the way back to England. Yeah. And he watched and he waited until he figured that Schindler was ready to close his deal, you see? Yeah. Then he stepped forward and announced that the tapestry Schindler had was a phony. Oh. And that he'd give him the real one for a healthy cut of the sale price. Uh-huh. And Loft couldn't go to Merritt direct because he didn't know who Merritt was. Sure. Oh. And from there it was me, the Patsy, with the best of references. Oh. That do it for you? Yeah, just about. Yeah. Schindler killed that car whom we didn't expect in the scene, and Loft, who he did, so neither one could spill to you. That's right. Now it... Uh, yeah, come in. Come in. Now, when did you... Hey, oh, just a minute, Miss March, yeah, please. Uh, when did all this come across to you, Phil? When I got mixed up with the lovely lady here, she told me that the man who had chloroformed me in my office had carefully placed an envelope on the floor next to me. An envelope I later took as a clue. From that switch, I started to look around for others. Oh, great. Hooray for campfire girl me. What kind of a medal do I get? Yeah, you get a pretty nice one, Miss March, and thanks to Marlowe, you get freedom. You know, we could prefer charges against you. Like what? Like what? Like assault and battery for slugging Loft. Grand larceny for the theft of the tapestry from Loft's place. Attempted destruction of okay, private property. Okay, okay, okay. I, I forgot about those things. Yeah. Thanks, Marlowe. Thanks, Marlowe. Mm-hmm. Is that your official statement? No more? Not even I'm sorry before you go? Well, yeah. I'm sorry, all right. Real sorry that I missed. Goodbye. <laughs> Another hour, and my signature was on another dozen official papers before I was free to leave Matthews. Who kept the real tapestry, but gave me the one we got back from Paula Schindler. The one with the baton sinister on it as a souvenir. So by the time I got back to my apartment, it was pushing four o'clock in the morning. And I was tired. Tired of a night that had been jammed full of crooked people who had taken crooked paths half across the world, chasing a buck. So tired, in fact, that I didn't notice Naomi Marchant leaning across the door opposite mine until she spoke. Marlo, Marlo, we could take that tapestry you have there, even if it's a phony one, and I'd have the Alan sell it to Uncle Arthur before he knows anything about what happened here. Marlo, we, we could... Marlo? No. Marlo? Marlo? Go away now. There was only one Marlo. thing to do. Put both Marlo. hands firm on her Marlo. shoulders, spin the girl around Marlo. and across my knees... Don't you take me! Oh, well. I was too tired for even that. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore and are produced and transcribed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Donnelly, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oront. Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... Rain slashing a glass roof, an old man's curiosity, and an imaginary imp out of place. They all became important when two people died violently, so a third could make a killing. speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This time rain slashing a glass roof, an old man's curiosity, and an imaginary imp out of place. 
They all became important when two people died violently so a third could make a killing. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Fatted Calf. of the season came as a surprise. It always does in L.A. where somehow or other people are never ready for it. <laughs> it's funny in a town where people are ready for anything. For every year, the opening slash of lightning stands nerves on edge and cracks composure like it was so much dreads in China. And by five o'clock in an afternoon of driving rain and thick gray sky, I was no exception. I wasn't helped any by the arrival of a special delivery letter. A hundred dollar bill enclosed which dragged me out of my suddenly cozy office into my car and over to Studio City in the San Fernando Valley, where, according to the letter, Junius Poppy, the veteran cartoonist and creator of the impish Peter Pageant comic strip, wanted to see me at once. But as I wound up the spiral of Macadam called Sunswept Drive toward number 3840, I forgot about the storm around me and wondered instead about the man I was going to meet. Wondered just how many parts Pixie, the originator of a half-leprechaun, half-very-funny human being tickled the nation's satiric funny bone daily from coast to coast was going to be. And when I was parked in front of the place which was a few million raindrops bouncing off a roof that was all glass, out of my car and going to the front door, I had made up my mind. Junior's poppy had to be small, slight, delicate, and maybe self-effacing, but certainly pleasant. Mr. Marlowe? How wrong can I be? Yes? Oh, uh, Mr. Poppy. Yes, of course. Come in, come in. You're getting wet. Follow me. But don't touch anything. You're soaked. Junior's poppy was tall, heavy set, gruff, and a crab. I dripped little puddles of water behind him through a long hall into a studio which was a half a dozen easels under twice as many fluorescent lights, and a litter of Peter Pageant drawings everywhere. Then, while Mr. Poppy did not offer me drink, cigarette, or even chair, I became resourceful. I took off my own coat, dropped it in a corner where it sloshed into a disgruntled heap. And I defiantly lit a cigarette and started to... Please, I despise tobacco. Oh, excuse me. Now, first, Mr. Marlowe, a few facts. I've been drawing Peter Pageant for 27 years, but unlike most of the syndicated cartoonists, I employ no staff. We use no material, allow nothing to be published that I haven't created personally, down to the last stroke of the pen. Hmm. However, I do have an assistant who serves two purposes. One, he inks in the balloon. What? The circle is where the words go. Oh. And two, and more important, he watches me work daily so that when I'm gone... <laughs> yes, even cartoonists die now. Peter Padgett will continue uninterrupted. My assistant is named Sid Kagan. And he, uh... Not to be more exact, his wife, Louise, is the reason I'm hiring you. Twice I opened my mouth to ask a question, but Kagan twice he waved the question man, aside. So liking him less by the minute I listened to him tell me what for the past and week Kagan had been. First preoccupied, then upset, and finally rebellious. Poppy, a bachelor who didn't want to lose a good man because of anything as trivial as a marital problem, had investigated and learned that Louise Kagan had spent a week in San Francisco recently. But he hadn't learned any more because an appointment he had made with her to talk it all over since the sleuthing was not subtle hadn't quite come off. It was the day before yesterday, Marlowe. We were to meet at a cocktail lounge. I was early and so I saw her come in and sit down. She's the type of tall brunette you don't miss. I was about to start toward her when she suddenly leaped from her table and hurried out of the place. For no reason? Please don't interrupt me, Marlowe. Of course, she had a reason. Mm. She was frightened at the sight of a man approaching her. Oh, he was very ugly. Patent leather hair, sallow complexion, eyes that belonged in a hawk. He followed her out, but she got away from him. And then he disappeared, too. And Louise hasn't called you since to explain? Until late last night, no. And then she apologized and lied about why she didn't show up. Forgot, she said. Casual-like, huh? Overly casual-like, Mr. Man. Now, please don't touch those drawings. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, no. We made another appointment for 6.30 tonight at a different place. An artist hangout called the Talisman on Lancashire. This time, Arlo, I want you to go in my place. Perhaps my approach is too uh, mechanical. There's just a chance. Now, Mr. Poppy, a few questions. First, to Kagan's home address. 717, uh, Magnolia Boulevard. 717. And Kagan himself, he's still working for you regularly? Yes, although he called this morning, said he was sick. Now, please, ask your questions quickly. I must return to my work. Peter Pageant's schedule, 
Four frames a day hasn't been interrupted in 27 years. Mm. Oh, here, this might interest you. Here, take a look at this. The last frame has a lot of detail. Yeah, it has. Peter addressing the U.S. Senate, huh? <laughs> Cute. You always work in pencil and ink in later? Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, now, anything else? Yeah, there is, Mr. Poppy. The whole business. Kagan's problem, I mean. If it's only a case of a gal not being true to a guy, I quit. And you get your dough back. I graduated from the over the transom class. Louise Kagan is not the kind of girl who plays around. I know. What makes you so sure? Well, for one thing, an example. Maynard Roper. Who? Maynard Roper. He's an agent for Empire Features, the oh. syndicate that handles my work. And though extremely handsome and what the ladies would call smooth, he got no place being, um, should I say, attentive to Louise. I could tell. I observed. Uh, now, satisfied? For the moment, I can still play that Roper just wasn't her type. I'll call you later, Mr. Poppy. Goodbye. And uh, don't bother showing me out. I can find the way myself. Impulse number one said nuts to the funny on paper only, Mr. Poppy. But impulse number two said quiet, Marlowe. It's the storm that's making you jumpy, and there's a hundred dollar bill in your pocket. So I got into my car and drove the mile and a half to 717 Magnolia Boulevard, where I figured I'd look over the Kagan home grounds before it was time for me to show it to Talisman. As I drove past the place, I saw there was a light in the living room. And a woman, brunette and attractive, who was no doubt the lady of the house, paging through a magazine. And things stayed like that each time I came around the block. But Twenty minutes later, when I parked in front of a nearby corner drugstore to get cigarettes, I forgot the lady of the house because getting out of a parked car in front of me was a man with sallow complexion and eyes borrowed from a hawk, easily seen by the rain splashed light from the display windows. And when he hurried inside into a phone booth, I saw the patent leather hair Mr. Poppy had already described. And he got his call through and turned his back to the street. I moved quickly to his car, opened the front door, struck a match and read the name and address on the owner's car, strapped around the steering wheel. It was Bert Slack, 200 Central Avenue, San Francisco, California. The city in which Louise Kagan had recently chosen to spend a week. A clock on the dashboard reminded me it was 6.15 and time to head for my rendezvous with the talisman. But a little voice deep inside said Mr. Bert Slack shouldn't. So, for what it was worth, I reached under the dashboard and yanked the ignition wire. And I got back into my car, hoping to gain ten minutes, and headed toward the club on Lancashire Boulevard. So to say, keep the rain from soaking all the way through, you know. Hey, yeah, all right, another scotch and soda. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hmm? That lady there, the one in the blue cape just came in. Oh, yes, yes. Ask her to come over to Mr. Uh, Poppy's table, will you? We'll order them. All right, sir, in the Keep the rain from soaking all the way through, isn't that awful? Sure, I'm awfully sorry I'm late, Junie's up. Oh, excuse me. Uh, waiter, you've made a mistake. No, no, Mrs. Kagan, the mistake what? was mine on purpose. You wouldn't have known me by name. Which is what? Philip Marlowe. I'm a friend of Junius's. He was tied up with his work tonight and asked me to keep this date for him. Like a drink? No, thanks. I haven't got the time. But why didn't Junius call me or leave a message here? I don't know. Perhaps he forgot her. Perhaps or... you're a liar. Perhaps he called my place after I left, then called here. Waiter. Yes, ma'am? Will you please check with the captain and see if anyone left a message for Mrs. Kagan, please? Yes, ma'am. And on your way back, two scotch and sodas, huh? Yes, ma'am. Now, just a minute, Mr. Marlowe. I've already said no. As long as we're playing things back, you already said I was a liar. Why? Because Junius told me that my meeting with him would be personal. And since he's gone far enough out of his way to even call me on the telephone about it, it must also be important to him. Yeah, it is. As important to him as, say, San Francisco is San... to you. So you're not really a friend of Junius Poppy? Not buddy-buddy, no. But I am a friend of Bert Slack's. You know Slack? Yeah. Now, why don't you sit down, Louise? Our drinks are coming. Well, here we are. Two scotches and sodas. Just the thing to keep the rank. Oh. <laughs> I already said that once, didn't I? Yes, you did. Yeah, well, uh, two scotches and sodas, just like you ordered. Oh, and uh, uh, no message for you, Mrs. Kagan. Thank you. Mr. Marlowe, you know about San Francisco, you know about Bert Slack, and somehow or other you know I was supposed to meet Junius Poppy here, and he couldn't make it. So why don't you just sit here and think it out all by yourself, huh? I'm going. Come back here. Let go of my arm. When I'm ready, gentle lady. Which might be right now, don't you think? Oh, Maynard, thank heaven you're here. I usually am, Louise. Well, my good man, have you reached a decision? About the young lady's arm, I mean. Let go. Maynard, please see that he doesn't follow me. It'll be a pleasure, Louise. What are we drinking, Mr. Uh... Marlowe, Marlowe. Scotch and soda. Mm. 
Wonder what keeps that from soaking through. Maynard Roper, the handsome syndicate agent, Junior's poppy, had tagged very smooth, was also very snide. When he slid into the booth next to me and we each had a fresh drink while Louise Kagan put distance between us. I knew that the urge I had to punch him in his finely chiseled Grecian nose could not be blamed on the stormy weather. It would be just as much fun on a sunny day. And a couple of minutes later, when he got up, flashed, glistening uppers and lowers at me and started to leave with a worse than snide, bye-bye, boy. I had to hold on tight. Somewhere along the line, I slipped. Hey, Roper, you forgot something. Oh? Well, what is it? This. There we go. Also, you didn't thank me for your drink. It was rude of you. Bye-bye, boy. <laughs> That I felt better. As I walked around to the alley behind the club where I parked my car, I noticed that the rain that tightened up to a drizzle that was about ready to call it quits. And that a corner of the sky already showed dark blue with a single star front and center. What I didn't notice until I was in line with my front fenders was company on hand. I have been waiting for you. It was small, with wide open eyes that flashed something close to hysteria, the length of a long, thin arm that was pointed at me and trembled while the hand awkwardly held a gun for what had to be his first time. I am Sid Kagan. I want to know why you are following my wife, what you had to do with her. I do know that you are a private detective and that your name is Philip Marlowe. That junior's poppy hired you. That much I found out. And you ought to be able to put the rest together yourself. You're a big boy now. Junius is worried about you, Kagan, because you in turn are worried about your wife. Look, he wants to help you all the way around. I don't believe you. I only believe that people are bothering Louise, molesting her, driving her out of her mind, and I... I want to stop them. I want to protect her. All right. Take a look at this picture and see if you can tell me whether or not this is one of those you say are molesting her. Picture? Let me see. I can't. It's only a calling card, Kagan. Don't give me that gun. Sure. With a clip out. Here. Oh, also, I'll give you some advice. Go on home, Kagan, and soak your hot head in a bucket ice cold. It's the most you can do to help. Now beat it before I get mad. Go on. All right. I'll go. But remember, Marlowe, I'm still going to protect my wife. Yeah, I'll remember, Kagan. You jerk. I think as stupid as an amateur with a gun. Stand still, Marlowe. I'm no amateur. Oh, fine. I wouldn't bother looking under the hood, either. We're now even. One torn ignition wire deserves another. Hmm? Well, Mr. Slack, wouldn't that 38 been waiting long? Long enough. So you're a private detective, huh? Now, that's interesting. I'm a private eye, too. Really? You find crumbs in every profession. Where do we go from here? No place. It's a team, anyhow. I'm finished. I've done my little job. I'm leaving town. The personal business that brought me here is over and done with. All's well. You'd be smart to look at it that way yourself, Jack. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. We'd go over big with my client, wouldn't it? What's the difference how it goes over with your client now? Why don't you read the papers? Meaning what? The latest edition. Here, catch. Hey. And read. Bring his puppy from... Out loud, Marlowe, please. Found dead in the Studio City home. Creator of Peter Pageant shot to death. Mm-hmm. Surprised, huh? Yeah. Funny. No, that's too bad. But I guess you'll get over it while you walk all the way down this alley without turning around. Now, go on. Move, Mr. Marlowe, as directed. Goodbye. In a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, you'll say, where is the time gone? When you listen to Club 15, the great quarter-hour show of melody, song, and patter starring Dick Hames with the Andrews sisters, Evelyn Knight and the Modern Airs. You'll like singing host Dick Hames. You'll like song stars Evelyn Knight and the Andrews sisters. In fact, you'll like everything about Club 15. Listen every weekday evening over most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Fatted Calf. When the 
man named Slack with a coat of ethics to match said walk, I walked. By the time I'd taken ten steps, I knew that he was already gone, so I went back to my car, cursed my way through a fast repair job on the wiring, and headed for my late client's studio again. When I got there, the usual messy routine of cameras, tape measures, and notebooks were still in progress. I was about to go inside. I changed my mind when I saw Louise Kagan step blithely out the door and walk almost jauntily over the flagstones that led from the house to the parking area. Hey, Louise, wait. Oh, you again. Well, what do you want? Just one good morbid reason why you're not making with tears over what's inside. I never lost any love in there. If I pretended I had, it wouldn't fool anybody for five minutes. Nobody liked Junius Poppy, and I was no exception. I'd go real easy with that kind of talk from now on if I were you. What's that crack supposed to mean? That not later than tomorrow morning, your husband, Sid, will take over Peter Pageant completely. So? So you struck gold, you're in. You got it made. Are you implying that I had something to do with Junius' death? Oh, I doubt that you pulled the trigger, baby, personally. But there's a good, solid connection, and I'm going to find it. Where's your husband? Inside with the police? No. I came here looking for him. He must be at home. Mm-hmm. How much do the cops know so far? Nothing except that Junius died between two and three hours ago. Look, why don't you trot in and ask them yourself, Quizmaster? I don't think they can help me. You see, I'm still interested in a big, ugly question mark all wrapped up with San Francisco. Look, Mr. And before I turn loose of it, I'll understand it, believe me. I'm going over to your place now to talk to Sid. Can I give you a lift? No, thank you. Suit yourself. I'll get there ahead of you, and I might find something you wouldn't want me to know about. All right. I'll ride with you. Let's go. Let's do that. Get in. Thanks so much for the ride. You know, I wouldn't have enjoyed it a bit more in a hearse. You can drop the acid routine, Louise. I got a thick skin. Let's go inside. Now, look, Marlowe. Sid isn't home. I can see from here the lights are out. Only proves somebody turned a switch. Come on, open up. All right. Come on. That's better. And since you're making yourself so at home, you might as well make yourself a drink. Hey, it's a good idea. Nice little boy you got here, honey. Always easier to talk with a drink in your... Uh... Hey, Louise, these papers on the table. Ever seen them before? What are they? Contracts, I'd say. Yeah, all filled out. Just waiting for Kagan's signature. So your husband is now a full-fledged, big-time cartoonist. What do you know? Pretty fast work, huh? Just what do you Creator mean? of Peter Pageant's been dead not more than three hours, and already a successor's contract are drawn up. No wonder Junius was bitter. Maynard Roper had those drawn up beforehand, just in case. Yeah, just in case somebody's patience ran out. Could be your husband's. I want to talk to him. You're out of your mind. He's been here, baby, and not long ago either. Here's his trench coat on the chair. What? Maybe he left again and maybe he didn't. Now, you take a look through the rest of the house, and if you find him, tell him to come on out. There's still time to talk. Or go on. <laughs> gave me a glare that said she'd like to run my head through a garbage disposal unit and walk past me to the hall. As I held the trench coat, I saw an interesting smudge on the elbow of the right sleeve. It was an imprint of the little cartoon character, Peter Pageant, in the exact pose I'd seen earlier. Peter Pageant addressing the United States Senate. It could only mean one thing. The right sleeve of the coat I was holding had been jammed down into wet ink on Junior's Poppy's drawing board shortly after I'd left the studio at night. I was still looking at the coat when Louise came back. She started to say something, but the doorbell interrupted and kept on interrupting, and finally, she walked over and answered it. It was Bert Slack, the man from San Francisco. His face, green and waxy, would have worn the same look if he'd been falling out of a ten-story window and knew he couldn't hold on. He gripped the door casing with both hands, like a slow-motion fireman sliding down a pole. Suddenly, he jerked up one hand and pointed at Louise. He turned his eyes at me and tried to speak. And he took five sliding, stumbling steps into the room and pitched headlong to the floor. The handle of a knife ringed by a patch of drying blood stuck out of his back between his shoulder blades. Oh, Sid. Sid, you Sid. couldn't have... You think Sid did it? Why, Louise? What's the reason? No, no, I didn't mean that. Oh, get away. Get out of here. Not yet. Slack was a cheap private eye from San Francisco, and you just got back from there. What happened up there, Louise? Why do you think your husband had to kill this guy? No, no, I won't tell you. I don't know anything. Oh, leave me alone. Get away. All right, all right. Get hold of yourself. You're hysterical. Now, listen to me. Where does Roper live? Come on. Maynard Roper, his address. 94 Addison Avenue. Why? Because your husband might be there, and I want to talk to him now more than ever. You're on your own, baby. Get good and hysterical if you want to. I'll see you. Before Addison Avenue was a shellac pine under ivy bungalow, hiding behind ten feet of manicured hedge. 
and flanked by a small swimming pool that involved more chromium than water. Now the door opened in response to a deep toned gown. I saw several thousand dollars worth of Chinese modern doodads behind the quilted silk smoking jacket wrapped around Maynard Roper. The first glare at a helping of hated me and then changed his mind and smiled. Well, hello, Mono. You seen our hot tempered Louise lately? Yeah, I just left her. She had the temper scared out of her when a guy died on a living room floor. So horrible. Yeah. This one had a knife in his back. He'd been carrying it for some time. Made it as far as Kagan's because he had something important to say, but he couldn't get it out. His name was Slack from San Francisco. Ever hear of him? Slack? Why, no. Hey, tell me, have you seen Sid Kagan recently? I mean, within the last hour? Yes, twice. Once when I took his new contracts to his place, and again when I came here to talk them over. He left a few minutes ago. Say where he was going? No. Wait. He did say he intended to stop at a drugstore. He had a headache. Which drugstore? Well, the one down the street about a block. Mm-hmm. Oh, but look, Marlowe, surely you don't really believe that Sid killed this man. He had a motive. Do you realize what you're saying? What have you got to go on, actually? A slip his wife made, and a Peter Pageant that turned up out of place. Oh, Luis was no doubt hysterical. Under those circumstances, I'd be, too. And as for Peter Pageant, don't forget that Sid's been practicing him for six years. He probably combs Peter Pageant's out of his hair at night. Not this one. It was on a trench coat sleeve. I found it in Sid Kagan's living room. It was picked up from wet ink on Junior's poppy's drawing board tonight. In fact, it was the last Peter Pageant Junior's drew before he was killed. That's what I've got to go on, Mr. Roper, so thanks and good night. I got in my car and drove fast till I found the drugstore and then pulled up across the street from the place and watched. A cab was waiting out in front. When the door opened in the store, I started to get out, but stopped again as Sid Keegan, the collar of his trench coat, turned up high. And both hands, thrust deep in his pocket, shouldered his way out. Got in a cab and drove away. I sat there for a few minutes until the crazy logic of the crazy pattern finally sank in. And I turned and drove back toward 94 Edison. A few houses down the street I parked, got out, and after dropping my gun in my pocket, I left my hand curled around it and walked in past the chromium swimming pool up to the pine and ivy house and looked in. It was deserted. I kind of started for the gate again, but... That was as far as I got. I'm not inside, Marlowe. I'm here behind you. Don't move. Automatic and all, huh? Didn't think you had nerve enough to stick here and wait for me, Roper. I had no choice. Raise him up slowly and don't turn around. I'll take your gun first. Okay. Now to get inside. So it was your trench coat I found at Kagan's, huh? You forgot and left it there when you took the contracts over. Yes. And when you told me about it, I followed you. I saw you spot Kagan still wearing his coat at the drugstore, and I knew then that you'd come back here after me. Why, Stand I... still. Sure, sure. You know, you might have gotten away with old Junius Poppy's murder because you were the only one with no motive, apparently. But you cluttered it up by killing your partner, Slack, too. Slack was stupid and loud-mouthed. He'd a double cross me or let the cat out of the bag the first time he got drunk. Blackmailers have to keep their secrets or they go out of business fast. With you, it's obvious that I have no choice. It's you or me. Yeah. You're a smart boy, Roper. How'd you manage to cut in on what Slack knew? He tried to find out from me whether Sid loved his wife enough to pay to keep her out of jail and how much he could demand and expect to get. I told you he was stupid. Believe me, chum, the idea of getting rid of Junior so Sid could get enough money to make blackmailing him worthwhile was quite a switch. But one a good agent might think of. Stand still. Don't try for anything on that table. Why not? What are you saving me for? More conversation? No. I just wanted to get my breath. I've had quite a day, remember? All right. Let's go now. Where? Out back to the garage. Go on. Just my Davey, please! Marlo, is he dead? I don't know. I don't think so. You sure picked a sweet time to show up, baby. How'd you manage it? I was out there a long time listening. When I realized what was happening, I came in. Yeah. Save my thick skin or kill a blackmailer. Well, once I killed a man unintentionally, I didn't want to do it again, even him. But tonight when I thought Sid had stabbed Bert Slack because of it, I, I couldn't stand it any longer. I came over to find you and turned myself in. The big question mark on San Francisco? Oh, there was a brawl. I got mixed up in it. A man had a gun, and in the struggle, it went off and killed him. I was scared silly. I ran away, but Slack had seen the whole thing. He even got the gun with my fingerprints all over it. And... Well, that's that. 
Let's go, Marlo. Yeah. Okay, baby. Let's go. Two refills, please. Okay. Better have some more, Sid. It's going to be a long night. Yes. I still can't get it through my head that this has happened, Marlo. I can't realize it. Slack saw that fight in San Francisco, got the gun with Louise's fingerprints on it, and came here to blackmail. That's right. He went to Roper for information on you, and Roper was smart enough to peg it and cut in. Killed Junior, so you'd get more money by taking over the strip, and then... And then he and Slack began to fight between themselves and may not kill him, too. Mm -hmm. How can there be people like that? Same way there can be rattlesnakes, black widow spiders, and cancer. Marlo... What is going to happen to Louise? I don't know, Sid. Oh. If she's got something now she didn't have before. What is that? You. <laughs> you loved her all the time. But she didn't know what that meant. She does now. Look, she might be finished with the police. Maybe you better go over, huh? Yes, I guess I'd better. Good night, Phil. And thank you. So long, Sid. <laughs> As he crossed the street and went into police headquarters, I turned back to my coffee and thought about Peter Pageant. <laughs> the impish, whimsical little character with a sly, knowing smile, half sad, half amused at the foibles of the world. Yeah, the world seems more and more to be made of halves. Like that old song. How's it go? Sometimes I'm happy... Sometimes I'm blue. <laughs> sudden storms and sudden calms. Maybe most of us are only half alive, huh? Take me, for instance. Half of me wants to go home and sit in front of a roaring fire with a drink and a good book. And the other half? Yeah. There's always that other half. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Donnelly, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Howard McNear, Parley Bear, Bill Johnstone, and David Ellis. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oran. <laughs> Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started with a wreck and went from there to double murder over 75,000 bucks worth of glitter that nobody got in the end. Because I found out just in time what was fishy about the tale of the mermaid. If you want to keep ahead of the headlines, listen every weekday evening, Monday through Friday, over most of these same CBS stations to Edward R. Murrow with the news. Mr. Murrow is radio's most distinguished reporter. His informal but informed manner of presenting the news has earned him more awards than any other newscaster on the air. This is Paul Masterson speaking. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This started with a wreck and went from there to double murder over 75,000 bucks worth of glitter that nobody got in the end. Because I found out just in time what was fishy about the tale of the mermaid. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, 
with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Tale of the Mermaid. Nine thirty, I was still in my office, tucking in the loose ends on a report. While I listened with half an ear to the fabric of city sounds rising from the street below. Fabric ripped suddenly by tires clawing concrete. A shattering crash that followed brought me to my feet. It was a traffic accident, a bad one. I ran to the window, but it had happened around the corner out of sight from my office. So I watched others run for it and remembered grimly that every 30 seconds, somewhere in the country, a thing like that happened. And one out of every 16 minutes was fatal. I wondered who had been chewed up in a chromium meat grinder this time as I listened to first the police, then the emergency ambulance, and finally, the scavenger truck cleaned the wreck off the street. After that, I went back to my report again and tried to forget about it. But an hour later, that same accident came back into my office. Mr. Marlowe. Yeah? This is Corey Riggs. Uh, yes, Miss Riggs. I'm a nurse at the Warwick Emergency Hospital. Uh-huh. About an hour ago, a man named Stanley Ott was brought in, and he's been calling for you. For me? He was badly injured in an automobile accident on Coenga on his way to your office. Wait a minute. Who did you say this was? I'm the nurse assigned to Mr. Ott at the hospital. I just got off duty, and I had to wait until I was relieved before I could call you. I see. Well, look, Miss Riggs, I'd like to help in any way I can, but it's not... Mr. Marlowe, Mr. Ott gave me $250 and told me to call you. Yeah, I know, but And he said that... I should give you 200 and keep the 50 for myself. Oh, fine. Now I get clients by proxy. I beg your pardon? Nothing. I'll be right over, Miss Riggs. I didn't know anyone named Stanley out, and I felt a little like an ambulance chaser, but I was only 15 minutes from getting to the emergency hospital. As I walked up the ambulance ramp, a smart-looking brunette came toward me. Mr. Marlowe? I'm Corey Riggs, the nurse who called. Oh, Hello. Can I see him now? It wouldn't do any good. You see, um, he went into a coma a few minutes after I called him. Oh, too late, is that it? Let's move away from the door, shall we? Sure. You see, Mr. Marlowe, before he went into the coma, Art wasn't rational. He was raving. About what sort of thing? About you and a girl. Oh? As near as I could make out, she's supposed to meet someone tonight at 2 o'clock and collect $75,000. That's quite an assignment. Who's the girl? I don't know. All I said was something about a, a plaid coat as identification. Plaid coat, huh? Any idea what he wanted me to do? Chaperone, maybe? No, he, he kept pleading, stop her, stop her, she can't do it. So I'm sure that he wanted you to prevent this girl from keeping that appointment. For some reason, it seems absolutely imperative to him. Well, where was this two o'clock meeting supposed to take place? I have no idea. Oh, fine. So it boils down to this. A girl we don't know in a plaid coat is meeting someone we don't know at a place we don't know at 2 a.m., the man who wants me to prevent it is in a coma and can't talk. Can he say anything else, Miss Riggs? He just kept saying, you've got to help me, Marlowe. It's life and death. You know, we can stir up an awful hornet's nest, poking our noses into 75000 bucks worth of business we know nothing about. I doubt that we can do any good anyway, because we don't have enough to go on. If he said anything else, to even point uh, in the right... Marlowe. What? Oh, wait a minute. He mumbled something once about a, a constant team. Constantine. Yes, it's some pier. What is it, a boat? I don't know. But at least it's a lead, isn't it? Mm. Anything else? Mm, no. Okay, where can I reach you? I'll be at my quarters, Crestview 5781. 5781. And keep track of Stanley Ott's condition, will you? If he comes out of it, talk to him. We've only got three short hours. I'll call you, Corey. <laughs> It felt a little weird as I left the hospital because I was traveling on strictly second-hand information as to what had gone on in a delirious mind. But in spite of that, there was still enough coherence in what Corey Riggs told me to make a case. My first stop was a phone booth and a call to the police, where I found out from the accident report that Stanley Ott was 30, unmarried, small-time lawyer and an L.A. resident with a clean police record. My next call was the harbor master's office at San Pedro. Constantine. Only one listed is a four-master. 
landed schooner sunk off Pirates Point near Monterey in 1870. A little before my time. Not the one, eh? Not the one. So I tried the Coast Guard. No fishing boat called Constantine on this coast, mister. That was followed by a check of Yacht Harbor at Long Beach, negative. And a call of the pleasure boat anchorage at Santa Monica. No Constantine registered here, sir. After that, a long, futile reconnaissance of the waterfront from one end to the other. It left me one solid hour later out at the end of a tottering, almost abandoned concession pier in Venice. Swearing in blind frustration at the black, seething ocean below. I was licked. You ain't thinking of jumping in, are you, pal? Hey, you look like you lost your best friend. I did, Buster. Me. I was sunk with a Constantine in 1870. Constantine? You know him, too, huh? Him? Yeah. You mean Constantine's a guy? Sure, pal. There's a shack there. Uh, wait till the beacon light comes around uh, again. Uh, you see? See that? Well, yeah. I'll be. <laughs> Prince Constantine Chevnov. Yeah. Occultist, palmist, and medium. Personal consultant by appointment only. Yeah, but uh, that's a fake. No fool. All them guys. Uh, he owes everybody around he, he, Even at the Ziggy. Me. For one buck and, and that's something. But he's a genuine Russian prince. Uh, uh, hey. Hey, where are you going? Have a look. Prince Konstantin Chevnov could be my boy. He wouldn't want you nosing around here, pal. That's too bad. Does he live here? Yeah, in, in the back. He uh, runs his pitch in the front where uh, all them uh, uh, green curtains are. Eh? Uh-huh. Yeah. I suppose he always leaves his door unlocked, huh? Why? What? What? Who? Hey, hey. That's, that's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. There'll be a light switch here someplace. Oh, yeah. Now, let's see what... Oh. Holy catch! Uh, goodbye, mister! Goodbye! As the little wharf rat darted through the door and scampered away into the darkness, I went over to the body, face up on the cheap, gaudy carpet of the seance room. He was about 35 in a substantial gray business suit, stained red in front where the bullets had gone in. His wallet was missing. There was no other identification on him. His gray, snap brim hat was spilled a few feet away, so I picked it up to look for initials and found instead a small file card stuck into the sweatband. Typed at the top was the heading, The Mermaid. Owner Otis Van Owen, only relative Evelyn Van Owen, niece. Mermaid stolen November 12, 1948. Insurance paid in full. In ink, Van Owen died August 1949, and under that in pencil... Constantine Chevnov, Venice Pier, and Louis Paradise. 913 Seacrest Road, Pacific Palisades. It took 20 minutes to find 913 Seacrest. And when I stopped and got close enough of what I saw through an open window made Constantine trap I just left look as reliable as a post office by comparison. It was a miniature Egyptian temple, exotic and dainty, sickening lushness of red velvet and yellow silk. And in the center of the room was a bloated little man balancing a long cigarette holder in one hand while he simpered into a honey-colored French phone in the other. I moved up quietly until I could hear him. A uh, uh, sentimental agreement. <laughs> that is right, Evelyn. Your Uncle Otis and I were the best of friends for years. <laughs> well, thank you, child. Uh, where are you now? Oh, the servitor. Good, good. I advise you to stay there until a few minutes before two and... Uh, uh, you uh, will not forget to wear a plaid coat, just to be sure I won't make a mistake. What is it, buddy? What? Side shoe? Oh, 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 careful now. Sudden noises like this gun going off upset, oh, Mr. Curtis. Is they find so interesting inside. Oh, yeah. Conversation. About the mermaid, probably. Uh-oh. I'm glad you dropped that one, bud, because oh, yeah. I'd bump you for a nickel to say nothing to 75G. I don't talk things over with punks. I reserve it for the head man. Go do something about it. Okay, bud, I will. Go on, move. Go on to the door inside. If the paradise gets some kind of kick out of stepping on big guys like you. The gopher face Especially shoved his automatic into the small of my back and washed me inside where the air was thick with cheap incense. The bloated little king with a long cigarette holder had stepped out. But he came back fast when the gopher called him. He stared at me from across the room and his nostrils flared for an instant. Then he simpered again and sidled toward me. The gopher dug at my spine with his gun. Well, now, 
What is this, Rudy? Snooper, Mr. Paradise. Caught him outside peeking in the window. Oh, it is a bad night for Snooper. Who are you? Name's Marlowe. And uh, the business? Snooping. He knows about the mermaid, Mr. Paradise. He does, does he? How much do you know? Speak up. He's got a fishtail instead of legs. You dare to joke. Don't you. Uh, uh, just stand here and take it, big man. You asked for it. Make a move and I'll drop you. I know what you are, Marlowe, but not how much you have found out. Now tell me, because the next time I slap you, it will carry more weight than my bare hand, I promise you. You have company, Paradise. Should I get it? No, you keep this baboon under control, Rudy. I will answer the door. Oh, Prince, come in. Paradise, Paradise, what do you mean? How far do you think you can go with my reputation? Do you want to get me hanged? Wife, what is the matter, Constantine? You are upset. Upset? I'm out of my mind. Oh, what a shock. And such a stupid thing for you to do. What are you raving about? He found that body on his front room floor, right, Constantine? Exactly. Precisely. And what is more, I did not put it there. Of all the places in the world, why did you pick this one? Paradise, who is this? This stranger here? If you would close your mouth and open your eyes more often, Prince Constantine, you would not be the nervous wreck you are. This? Is Mr. Marlowe, uh-uh. another snooper. Oh, another one? Paradise. Paradise, listen to me. It's better if we quit. It's better if we don't try it tonight. It's out of hand. I don't like it now. We should get away and come back next year and do it. Ah, right? you jellyfish, there jellyfish. is nothing to worry about jellyfish. now. Jellyfish. Insurance uh, investigators fine. often work yeah. in pairs. Is that not so, Marlowe? Your pitch, round man. You don't need any help from me. You are so right. Rudy and I caught the first at your place, Constantine. Nah, right. Now we have the second one sure. here. That is all there are. The danger is over. It's over. clear sailing from yeah, now Yeah, but on. what about that cadaver you had the audacity to leave lying in my sails? Oh, room? what about that? Oh, me, Constantine. Oh, that me, Constantine. was a necessity. Oh, I am sorry. Now, listen. Hey, Rudy. Just go on all the time? Yeah. Ain't it awful? And think of all the champagne, caviar, and bricola, stroganoff you can buy with the mermaid. I don't care. Just a bracelet. But at the same time, it is $75,000 worth of diamonds and platinum. Oh, that, uh, oh. Okay, Paradise. I trust you. Now, we go, huh? My, uh, Gnazdo. Uh, yes, Gnazdo. Uh, it is. Uh, Mr. Paradise. Uh? What should I do with the big boy here? Yeah, you're kind of leaving a loose end around, aren't you, Fatty? If I had the time, Marlowe, I would beat the arrogance out of you a little chunk at a time. Rudy. Yeah? You've got no initiative, but you do have imagination. So use it. Goodbye, Marlowe. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, it's a big break in entertainment for you and a big break in a career for some talented youngsters when Horace Heights' original youth opportunity program opens the door to fame and fortune every Sunday evening on CBS. Popular Horace Heights is host to young folks who want to break into show business. And every Sunday evening, one lucky winner does break in to his delight and your listening pleasure. Yes, for music, comedy, thrills, and all-around fun, listen to Horace Heights Sunday evenings. Another great CBS show heard over most of these same stations. Tune in, tune in this fall for the shows that you love best of all. Listen carefully. Here's the address. It's CBS, CBS. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Tale of the Mermaid. Paradise hesitated at the door, snarled the suggestion that this henchman use his imagination in disposing of me, and left in lockstep with the white Russian screwball, I got the point. But even if I'd missed it entirely, one look into Brother Rudy's eyes would have done the trick. There were no pupils, just slits of lethal viciousness. Windows to his warped little mind where I could practically see the montage going on. that ran from ancient thumbscrews by candlelight up to a generous beating by street lamp with brass knucks. <laughs> I saw the cold knot grow in the pit of my stomach. 
as Rudy, with a cannon in his hand, pointed at my head, started toward me. And from someplace outside, I got a break. Two romantic cats. Rudy spun toward the sound. One chance to a customer, Rudy, and you miss. Kill you, my lord. Blow your head off. Not tonight, gentle soul. Give it to me. I don't want you to hurt yourself until we've had a chance to talk. That's it. Now, lie down. I knew there was some reason why I like cats, their voices. Okay, Rudy, you've had enough rest. Now, let's get back to business. Now, now wait a minute. Come on, get up. We're going to talk. Wait, hold it, please. No reason for any more rough stuff. I'll cooperate. That's better. Where did Paradise and His Highness head for? The Gnaz, though, where is it? I don't know. Come on, you said there was no reason for rough stuff, remember? Ow! Yeah, yeah, I remember. That Gnaz, though, that's something I never heard of. An unhappy coincidence, Rudy. It's one thing I'm interested in. Hey, yeah, wait. Must be something else you want to know. Something else I could tell you that... Hey, hey, what are you going to do? You mean you Stay can't away. tell, Rudy? That's Keep funny. Away. All it... it takes is a little imagination. <laughs> out of the way, I started through the place looking for all important answer to what was the Gnazdo. The 20 minutes of turning drawers and closets inside out revealed nothing more exciting than Louis Paradise's address book, first names only, and a picture of a girl named Toodles who belonged to the Roaring Twenties, and by this time should have caught a death of cold. <laughs> His sister, no doubt. But no lead on the Gnazdo. So on the slim chance that my client Stanley Ott might already be back in this world and able to help, I got outside into my car and drove to the first drugstore where after checking the phone books under everything from bars to bathhouses for a gnazdo and getting no place, I called Corey Riggs at the nurse's home. No, Marlowe. Stanley no. Ott's still unconscious. I just talked to the night nurse on his floor. They expect him to come out of it soon. Uh, why? What happened? Well, it's too much to explain now, Corey, but that girl, the one in the plaid coat, mm -hmm. I found out that her name's Evelyn Van Owen and she's staying at the Surf Hotel. Now, see if that much checks with Art when he comes to, will you? All right. Oh, also, there's a diamond-studded item called the mermaid, which accounts for that 75000 he mentioned. Now, Constantine and the pier now equal a phony Russian prince who runs a spook palace out on the old Venice pier. Now, you got all that? Uh-huh. Good. Now, look, honey, listen real hard. Before Art passed out, did he by any chance say the word Ganazdo? Ganazdo? Yeah. Mm, no, what is it? I don't know. I, I think it's the name of a place. Oh, have you uh, checked the phone book? Yeah, yeah. It's no dice, Corey. Also, I checked one Mr. Louis Paradise, who you might uh, mention. Marlo, Marlo, wait a minute. What's Hold the matter? Wire, will you? There's a girl here, one of the nurses, who's trying to tell me something. Oh. It's the Ganazdo, Marlo. Oh. Shh, wait a minute. She knows something about it here. It's, it's Rosemary. You talk to her. Hello. Hello. You want to know what Gnazdo means? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's Russian, like Pashlamaya Gnazdo. Oh, that's, uh, well, what does it mean in English, Rosemary? Fast, please, is important. Well, that means let's go to my place. Gnazdo's the word for nest. Sort of like cozy apartment or cottage. My place, nest. You sure of that? Well, I'm positive. I was an army nurse in the war, and I spent two years in Germany after the shooting part was over. Two years, a half a block away from the Russian zone. That's close enough. Thanks a million, Rosemary. I don't mention it. Here's Corey. Oh. That do it, Marlowe? Yeah, I think so. At any rate, unless I'm way off base, it's where both the mermaid and all parties concerned are going to rendezvous at 2 a.m. That's less than a half hour from now. The prince's place on the pier. I want to be early, so goodbye, Corey. I'll call again when I know more. Yeah, and give my everlasting love to girlfriend Rosemary. She all is show a peace. There was still a few parts missing, the way there always are. As I drove fast for the old Venice Pier and added as I went along, it came out something like a team of paradise and Prince Whatchamacall it, ready, willing, and able to pay 75 grand for a piece of jewelry that one Evelyn Van Owen now owned. A mermaid. According to the data I'd found on the insurance man's body, it had once been stolen from Evelyn's late uncle. But I left it there when my rearview mirror set a long gray sedan that had been tagging me discreetly for the last three blocks. Now being indelicate about it and closing fast. The driver was old pal Rudy, and as he came abreast, he headed for me. All right, 
right. You're okay. You're okay, Mac. Don't you worry about a thing. We'll have you out of there in a minute. Ed. Hey, can't you knock up that horn? Uh, knock out the horn, he says. What do you think we're trying to do? Me it ain't so easy to get my hand past the frigid hood. You yeah. know. Oh. Oh. Well, that's better. Hey. Hey, cabby, what'd I hit? Well, in order of our appearance, Ooh. Mac, your car into a telephone pole, and then you into your dashboard. Oh, yeah, you're sure lucky you bounced off the car first, Mr. Slowed you down plenty. Oh, hey, here comes the ambulance. Yeah. Look at the roll. Not for me. I'm all right. Hey, come on, cabby, help me out of this, will you? Sure, sure, that's what we're trying to do, but uh, don't you worry, the ambulance ain't for you. But a guy that sideswiped you and then tried to get away. I seen what happened, and I went after him in my cab. <laughs> he turned into a dead end, no less, trying to shake me. Ooh, is he a mess. But I guess he'll live all right. Hey, what you got against you, anyhow, Mac? Just my life. Listen, your cab's still all right? Sure, there's some place you gotta go. There is. The old Venice Concessions Pier, my friend, and the sooner the better. Come on. <laughs> My head against the dashboard was exactly what I'd needed. Because right then and there, the method of Rudy's handiwork made me think of an angle that I'd neglected almost completely. My unconscious client had not wanted me to get the mermaid or the 75,000 bucks, but to stop Evelyn from keeping her rendezvous, which at this point I figured could mean but one thing. It was exactly 2 o'clock when the cab slammed to a stop near the pier. And I piled out and ran onto the empty, fog damp and flanking that led to Prince Constantine's shack. Nothing but mist moved over the pier. No unusual sound broke the pattern of waterfront noises. But I thought momentarily that I was still in time to prevent what Stanley out somehow knew was going to happen. That Louis Paradise and his eccentric sidekick intended to get the mermaid from Evelyn. But pay off in only one... <coughs> one way. I ran to the rear of the shack on stilts and got close to the half-open door where I could see and hear and found out just what I'd expected. In the storeroom spread out and very still on the oil-soaked planks that were a makeshift floor with the lifeless form of a girl who, according to the plaid coat she wore, was the late Evelyn Van Orn. And kneeling close to a gun in one hand, the sparkling mermaid in the other, was her execution on Louis Paradise. Next to him is number one boy, Prince Constantine Chevnov, not very happy. A fool, a fool to shoot her was stupid. Yes. Seventy-five grand, stupid. Uh... Or would you have preferred that I pay Miss Van Owen in cash? I had to kill her. Yes, 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 paradise, but the gun, so much noise, we can't afford to attract attention. There's two corpses on hand, I should say not, uh, Prissy. Don't try it, Louis. Are... Oh, oh, the mermaid. The space between the boards. The mermaid. Oh. It's in the water, Chevnov. Shame. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it's a shame. We did so much, uh, worked so hard. Uh, yeah, killed so often. And a run for it, Your Highness? Run? No. No, paradise is dead there. Without paradise, I... I am not so brave. I will do as you say. Keep quiet. Don't make a sound, Chef. No, we got company. Uh, Rudy, quiet! Stop. Pardon me. Can you please tell me where Louis Paradise can be... Fa- it's Louis Paradise there. Who are you? Evelyn Van Owen. What? Evelyn Van Owen. Oh. The woman who was supposed to sell the mermaid to Paradise? That's right. But on my way over here, just after I left my hotel, somebody struck me, knocked me out. He took my, my coat there and, and my purse and ran. Your purse with a mermaid, no doubt. Yes. And that, Miss Van Owen, makes this angle shooter here... Yeah. The very dead nurse, Corey Riggs. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Well, there's nothing to worry about, Miss Van Owen. Stanley's going to be all right. Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> Why is it women always cry when they're so happy? Huh? I don't know, but it's effective. Well, I'll run along now. Goodbye. Bye, Doctor. You know, Mr. Marlowe, when I was in Stanley's room with the doctor, Stan said he didn't lose control of his car at all when he had that accident in front of your place. He was run off the road by... By a gray sedan, I know. Because I had the same treatment. He's one of Louis Paradise's henchmen. 
Rudy, where's your car, honey? I'll walk you out. Oh, just outside the front door. Mm-hmm. Tell me, did I tell you why Rudy roughed him up? Yes, in a way. You see, I told Stanley about the deal with the mermaid, and he thought it all sounded a little phony. Can't understand why. He's a lawyer, you know. A legal type mind. Uh, yeah. He said meeting anyone at two in the morning was ridiculous. So he investigated as much as he could because he was worried about me. We're engaged, you No, know. I never would have guessed. And, and he found out that Mr. Paradise was a fence. And Stan said that probably he never intended to give me the $75,000 for the mermaid at all. That they, they intended to kill me. Mm, here we are. Tell me, why did you get in touch with Paradise in the first place? I was just following Uncle Otis's instructions. Mm -hmm. He gave me the mermaid when he was dying. And he told me if I wanted money to sell it only to a Mr. Paradise, but, but not to mention it to anyone. Your uncle faked the robbery, collected the insurance money, and then let you sell the mermaid to a fence, huh? It's lucky for you that Nurse Corey Riggs was clever. She put together just enough of Otis's gibberish to know that there was something good to be had and then got me to unravel it for her. She got killed taking my place. When she tried to collect your 75,000 bucks. Yeah. Oh, here's my car. Well, Evelyn, for a little while you were a rich woman. Now it's all gone. How do you feel? Well, I'm alive and in love. Yes, well, that answers my question. Good night, baby, and good luck. When I left the hospital, I wandered back to the old Venice Pier in Prince Constantine's Gnazdo. It was five in the morning, and the police had finished cleaning the place up. But the word had gotten out. A crowd had gathered. They always do. A curious, restless, sordid crowd, equipped with everything from grappling hooks to homemade diving helmets, all climbing over each other for a chance to fish for the mermaid. She would brought death to three people, Injury to two others in the course of one night. And suppose they found her. What then? A lot of glittering pieces of white coal set in a metal frame we call precious. Look at the suckers, grab. That's all, Marlowe. Home and to bed. <laughs> Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Donnelly, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Rita Lynn, John Daner, Michael Ann Barrett, Wilms Herbert, Junius Matthews, Herb Bygren, and Mark Lawrence. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oran. <laughs> Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started with a terrified woman lost in a maze of memories she couldn't explain. And waiting for her outside an open window was death. Another show has joined the CBS Sunday Night Parade. It's the Contented Hour, starring Buddy Clark and featuring the finest in popular and semi-classical music. It comes to you on most of these CBS stations for the first time tomorrow night, making its debut on CBS the same night as Red Skelton and Edgar Bergen and Charles McCarthy. Yes, this fall, you hear them all on CBS. This is Paul Masterson speaking. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This started with a terrified woman lost in a maze of memories she couldn't explain. And waiting for her outside an open window was death. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in 
The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Open Window. California's a year-round kind of place, where each day blends into the next with a sort of sunny indifference. But the one just past had been a little special. It was the cool, crisp autumn weather that reminded you of the east, where autumn meant kicking your way through knee-deep drifts of brown and yellow leaves, along a rutted country road that hinted at adventure at every turn. Yeah, that's the kind of a day it had been. But now, at a little past eight, as I stood at the window of my third-floor apartment, stared out over enough improved Los Angeles real estate to house maybe half a million people that tonight I wanted no part of, because the world was out there minding everybody else's business, while I was in here minding my own. In here, everything was in order and cozy. I could read if I want to, write a letter if I want to, or just relax with... Oh, no. Your name Philip Marlowe? Yeah, why? Because I have that name and this address written here on this card. I think I was supposed to see you. Do you know me? Well, no, frankly, I don't. What were you supposed to see me about? Who are you, Mr. Marlowe? I mean, what sort of business... I'm a private detective. Private detective? Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not that bad a racket. Is it? <laughs> oh, now, look. Why don't you come in and we'll talk this over, huh? Come on. All right. There. Sit down, won't you? Mm-hmm. You look like a new... You can use a drink. Do you want one? Oh, no, thank you. I just need to rest a moment. Oh. I've been walking for hours. Well, now... Tell me, what is it? A man, I think. Someone's been following me. I was followed here, I'm sure. I, I don't know why. Really? This is Los Angeles, California, isn't it? Yeah. I keep thinking... That is, I feel as though it should be Vancouver, British Columbia. Oh? I don't know how I got here or why I want to see you, but I've walked until I'm nearly exhausted, and I, I found that I'd written your name and address on this card here, so I, I decided to come and try to find out. Well, now tell me, do you know who you are? No, I don't know who I am. Uh This man you're afraid of, do you know him? No. But I believe he knew me. He he reminded me of Vancouver and that frightened me. I seem to remember I saw him a year ago. Maybe it was just the day before yesterday. See how crazy that sounds. But I can't help it. I, I can't remember. Here, here, I take can't. Take it easy. Now you better lie down on the divan. That's it. Come on. That a girl. Now look, I think we ought to call a hospital and see it. <laughs> Stay where you are. It's company in the hall. Maybe for us. Now just take it easy. Hey, hey, you hold it. Hold it up there. Oh, great. Who was it, Mister Marlowe? I couldn't see. Don't let it bother you now, honey. It's probably just one of my clumsy neighbors. He never watches where he's going. You know, the other no, night... stop, please. All right. Whoever was out there was looking for me. I know he was. I know it. Now, look, honey. Isn't there something you can tell me? Don't, don't you remember anything? No, I don't know. Here, look in my purse. There are things in it I don't understand. Maybe there'll be some help. The key. The address on a piece of brown paper. 8,400 North Virgil, Tompkins. Does that mean anything to you? No. Mm. A little snapshot album with one of the pictures missing. Wait a minute. I remember now. That was stolen. Good. But I don't remember what the picture was. Oh, please, please try to find out who I am and why I'm being followed. Please try to find out why I'm afraid. All right, baby. Now, you stay here till I get back, huh? I won't bother anything. I'll wait right here. Oh, I'm so tired. I'm so 
I figured what she needed most was rest, and she was getting that fast, so I dropped the items from a purse into my pocket, snapped the lock on my apartment door, and left. My first stop was the phone downstairs in the lobby, where I found out that the missing persons bureau had no one on file answering her description. My next stop was 8400 North Virgil. A half hour later, I found it. A crumbling stucco rooming house in a welter of knobby hills, huddled with other ramshackle houses that years ago had abandoned any hope of beauty. In the face of the leaky, bobbing oil wells that had invaded the neighborhood like a horde of huge, greasy grasshoppers. I walked past one of the creaking monsters in the front yard, then down a grimy hall to a door marked manager, Jacob Philpotts, below which some neighborhood wag of pencil stinks. It wasn't funny. But neither was Jake Philpotts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what is this? Speak up, Sporty. I'm very busy killing a soldier. What's on your mind beside your hat? <laughs> okay, comic. I want to see Tompkins. Oh, you want to see Tompkins? That's what I you? said. Well, you're too late, Sporty. He's gone. Blue. Flew the coop. Took the 500 berries and shoved off two hours ago. For where? Well, for his hometown, I guess. Vancouver. It's way up in Canada. Which is a long walk, Sporty, so you better get started by... Wait a minute, Jake. Huh? Where did Tompkins get the 500? Where did he get... Why, some classy guy gave it to him. Classy guy. And why? Why, to get out of town and stay out. So he does. Uh-huh. But first he pays back all his back rent and buys me a bottle besides. <laughs> Wasn't that sweet of him? That stuff over there? Yeah. He must have hated you. Who was the classy guy? Why do you want Tompkins out of town? Why do you want Tompkins out of town? Well, how, how do I know? What am I, an encyclopedia? Hey, look, Nosy, my whiskey's getting cold, so why don't you run along? I want to know who the I guy was, know. and I want it now. Oh, so you're going to stop pushing, huh? You want to fight, huh? Okay, <laughs> put him up. Come on. Take it easy, him, Buster. Take it easy. You'll beat yourself to death. Now, let's negotiate. Huh? Prop up against the wall, and I'll talk to you. What about a price for another bottle of that stuff? I wouldn't like to see uh, another bottle. That's what I said. Oh, well, that's, that's different. That's really nice of you, Sporty. Not really, kid. I'm trying to poison you. Now, what was Tompkins' racket? Oh, a uh, gardener, carpenter, handyman. Nothing much. Uh, what else? Who was the classy guy that bought him off? I uh, let's see. I um, had his name right on the tip of my tongue a minute ago. A red-headed, flashy dresser who had a sort of a... Oh, oh, Palmer, Palmer. Yeah, boy. Yeah, 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 that's it, Palmer. Very good. Now, one more. Where can I find it? Well, he said something about running uh, uh, the pearls. Uh, you got it? Yeah, it's a dive on Highland. Thanks, Phil Potts. Oh, but don't thank me, Sporty. You bought it, remember? This brand comes to seven fifty with tax. Don't kid an old kid at Jake. You can squeeze that junk out of sour potatoes. Here's sour a spin. potatoes! And have a happy hangover. Outside, the smell of the oil well as I passed it was welcome by comparison to Jake which made it tough to reconcile anything I'd seen at 8400 North Virgil with a girl asleep on the divan in my apartment. As I drove back to Hollywood, then down Highland Avenue, the night was still strangely quiet. Everything seemed to come in whispers. Even the hunch I had that the vanishing Mr. Tompkins had sold out dirt cheap to the boss of the Pearls. Near 3rd Street, I spotted the place, parked a ways beyond it, and walked back. It was one of those dumps that dealt in bad bar whiskey, second-rate bop and a lot of darkness. I shook off a brace of lost weekenders on my way through, made it up the stairs to the offices where a block of orange light on the floor and a two-tone conversation told me to stop, look, and listen. Time, baby. Alan, as they say in Missouri. I have to show you, huh? Uh-huh. All right, and all my will. You're not easy to get over. I still love you and I've missed you. So when you dropped me for your stuffy broker friend, I did a little checking up, and I found out plenty. About Cooper? About Cooper Gerard. I don't believe you. Oh, but you should, honey. You see, Norma, it's not about him specifically, but about a woman. A woman who's all wrong, who spells trouble this deep, and I can prove it. I went to work on it tonight, and things are going to be different from now on. Hey, I'm buddy. Sh- buddy, I want to get, get you Get out of here. Get out of here. Go on. Hey, now, wait a minute. All I want to know is where I said you? beat it, and I meant... Never mind, Buster. It doesn't matter anymore. My presence is now known. Come on in, Junior. You can hear better inside. I doubt it. I'll inhibit the performers. But thanks anyway. Buddy, all I want to know is... Try the end of the hall, then left. It's usually there. Okay, thanks. That's all I want to know. Hello. Hello. What do you want, mister? Make it snappy. Okay. Why'd you pay Tompkins to leave town tonight? Tompkins? Who are you? Marlowe. Going to answer the question formally? 
Oh, I certainly. I didn't pay him to leave town. I paid him for some work, carpenter work. Why? What's the matter, Alan? Feel the whip handle slipping? Not a bit, baby. Look, why don't you run along now? I'll call you later. Oh, uh, here's your cigarette case. My cigarette case? Yeah. Take it with you. We'll get in touch later. Okay, Alan. Good night, Marla. Good night, Miss... Uh, uh... Picasso. Not that it'll do you any good, Junior. <laughs> That's a cute kid. Smart, too. All I'll right, bet, all right. Why are you interested in Tompkins? Because a certain lady's interested. And a lady's name? None of your business. Okay. Go on. This key. What door does it fit, Pomley? How should I know? Have you got anything else? Isn't that enough? Uh, not enough to worry about, Milo. So I suggest that you leave. And in case you have any doubts, this thing goes off awful easy. I see your point. Yeah. And I'd just as soon shoot as not, so start down those stairs and don't look back. I bust for a couple of the boys. They'll be at the bottom to help you out the front door. Oh, and Marlowe, take some advice. I don't like your type, so don't come back. The boys escorted me politely as far as the sidewalk and gave me a send-off that piled me into the gutter. It's my own fault for letting Pommelie get the drop on me, but he was farther ahead of me than I figured. In fact, I was lucky all I got was the bounce. I limped back to my car, got in and started home, but something about the trio of Norma Lacasso, Pomley, and a broker named Gerard was off-center. And Gerard's connections were too strong to pass up. So I decided to let the pale woman asleep in my apartment go right on sleeping while I stopped at a phone booth, found only one Cooper Gerard listed, and he at 8112 North Orange Drive. It was a lonely house up in the Hollywood Hills. I tried the bell and got no answer, but I knew he was there. I slipped the enigmatic key out of my pocket and listened to the music coming from inside. I stuck it in the lock. It turned, just as the footsteps inside, so I pulled it out fast and let the party on the other side of the door do the honors. What is it? You're Mr. Gerard? Yes, I'm Cooper Gerard. What is it? I'd like to come in and talk to you. My name's Marlowe. I'm a private detective. I've got a key that fits your front door, plus a little photo album full of a girl. Here. Why, that's Margaret's album and her key. You, you found her. Where is she? What's happened to her? She's safe. Come in the upper room. Right. So her name's Margaret, huh? Margaret what? Veasy. Margaret Veasy. But where is she? I've been frantic. I just called the police. She left the house this morning and didn't come back. It's late now, and in her condition, I'm afraid that What something... is Margaret's condition, Mr. Gerard? She was injured in an auto accident a year ago last July, up near Vancouver. It affected her mind. Oh, but please, where is she? Just I must a minute. Get... There are some questions that I'd like answered first. Exactly what is Margaret Vesey to you? Well, until July 9th, 1948, when that horrible accident happened, nothing. Merely a hitchhiker. My wife and I were motoring back from a vacation in Canada. We picked Miss Vesey up on the road. When the accident, Grace, my wife, was killed. Miss Vesey seriously injured. All I knew about her was that she was alone in the world, so there was no one to help her. Well, since I was driving the car, I assumed that responsibility. It was the least I could do. Stayed with her in Vancouver until she partially recovered and then brought her here. She's been with me ever since. Now, will you please take me to her? But the story doesn't end there. What do you mean? Margaret Vesey's in trouble and she's scared. What do you know about a man named Tompkins, Mr. Why, nothing. I don't know any Tompkins. You do know a Norma Lacasso, don't you? Norma? Of course, Miss Lacasso and I are quite good friends. Mm -hmm. What about Alan Parmley? Heard of him, he... Runs a nightclub, I believe, That's but... right. Now, tell me, can you tell me why a third picture is missing in the album? What's that? Let me see. This is very strange. Margaret cherishes every picture in this album. She thinks that one was stolen. Any idea what the picture was? No. I can't imagine why it was stolen. All the pictures were simple, harmless snapshots. I can't remember the one that's missing, but... Marla, what does all this mean? What's it all about? Well, as near as I can tell, there's some kind of nasty shakedown brewing. I don't know how or why, but Alan Pomley's behind it, and Margaret Vesey's caught in the middle, so it involves you, too. Come on, let's go get her. She's asleep in my place. You didn't leave her alone. Oh, yes, I did. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. Couldn't you tell from her mental state that she isn't responsible? For two days, she's been moody. She's been talking about suicide. She might... Marlowe, if anything's happened... Save it. Come on, Gerard, let's travel. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe, 
But first, by the time you've listened to Johnny Dollar, Philip Marlowe, Gangbusters, and Escape and the CBS All-Star Saturday Night lineup, you may be in the mood for some sleuthing of your own. So try it with Sing It Again and The Phantom Voice. Don't always let the other guy or gal solve the mystery. Try it yourself with Sing It Again on most of these same CBS stations every Saturday night. Tune in, tune in this fall for the show that you love best of all. Listen carefully. Here's the address. It's CBS, CBS. CBS. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Open Window. It took ten minutes to get from Gerard's house to my place. I knew because he reminded me of each one as it passed. But when we turned on to Franklin where we could see my apartment house, the word hurry stuck in his throat. An ambulance was pulling away from a tight knot of people standing on the concrete driveway beside the building. And three floors above them, glowing like a single ugly unblinking eye, was the window of my own apartment wide open. Even before I could stop the car, Gerard was out and running toward the crowd. Listen, that ambulance. The woman, mister, it was terrible. She fell out of that open window up there. Did you see it? No, nobody saw it happen. Yeah, it's bad, brother. They say she'd been laying here on the concrete for at least a half hour before anybody got to her. It's been so quiet around here tonight. I'm surprised. Wait, they... tell me, was she, was she dead? Just about. They don't give her a chance. Come on, Gerard, let's go upstairs. The police are up there now. They're trying to find out this say the woman came here to your apartment, Mr. Marlowe, and asked you for help. Is that right? That's right, officer. She was frightened and exhausted. When I left, she was asleep on the divan there. Was the door locked, Marlowe? Yeah, it's got a night light, Gerard. I snapped it myself. And you left her alone, right? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, take a look around, will you? See if you can find anything to indicate that an outsider came in while you were gone. What makes you think there was an outsider here? Because I don't think she fell. Margaret was in mental turmoil, officer. She's been despondent. It's possible that she jumped. Yeah? How many people have you heard of that jumped out of a window backwards, mister? I think she was pushed. Pushed? Yeah. Come here, both of you. I want to show you something. He went over to the window and pointed to five scratches where fingernails had clawed the paint off the casing. The one that had to be made by her thumb was the lowest. It was true. She'd gone out backwards. As the officer explained that to Gerard, I stared down at the dwindling knot of people three stories below. Then up again at the five jagged scars ripped deep by a terrified woman's nails. Stared at them until they screamed at me as a sick mind must have screamed when she fell. Now, Mr. Marlowe, what about this cigarette stub with lipstick on it? Cigarette stub? Hey, that's exactly what I'd like to know. Gerard, where does Norma live? Why, the Hillcrest Apartments on Sunset, but surely... Never mind what I think. You go to the hospital and find out about Margaret. I'm going to pay a call on Norma Lacasso right now. She's the type to be jealous enough to... Marlowe, listen, you're making a mistake. That cigarette stub must be Margaret's because Norma doesn't smoke. But... Norma doesn't smoke. And what about the cigarette case? Hey, Buster, you better check with Lieutenant Matthews at Homicide. I'll see you later. Hey, hey, come back here, Marlowe. The Hillcrest Apartments fit Norma LaCasso to a T. They were sleek, soft tones of burnished wood, streamlined in glass, and just enough chrome around for glitter. And when she answered a door in glossy green, lounging pajamas edged in gold, smiled and tossed a head of hair that was almost burgundy back from her face, I knew what Alan Parmley meant. Loving Norma LaCasso would be hard to get over. Hello, Junior. Don't tell me you're joining the league, too. It's fast, you know. Skip it, baby. I'm coming in. Do you mind? No. <laughs> Did it do any good? Mm-mm. Get comfortable. I'll make sure you drink or something. Hey, Norma, you know Margaret Vesey, don't you? That peculiar girl that stays at your odd place? Yeah, I met a while. A little while ago, she dropped three floors from an open window to a slab of concrete. Oh. Lay there over 30 minutes before she was found. Oh, Marlo, that's dreadful. I'm sorry. Don't look at me like that. I, I mean it. I like Margaret. So do I. What's more, she didn't fall. She was pushed. Oh. Got a cigarette? For sure. Yes. Catch. Thanks. Oh, just one cigarette tossed like that? You manage a lousy. You're supposed to pass the kids Ow. and let the guests help themselves. Marlo, you're hurting. Oh. I'm going to keep right on twisting until that solid gold cigarette case drops. That's what I adore about men. They're full. <clears throat> That's better. Gorilla. All right, to help yourself, the picture's there under the bottom layer of cigarettes. But why it's important to be on me. It's important to Pomley, baby. Had you smuggled out of his office so I couldn't find it. Oh. 
Margaret and Gerard at some little amusement park. Huh? Mm-hmm. Near Vancouver, probably. She told me how I used to take her out while she was recovering from that accident. So what? Even the autographs ought to make no sense to me. Yeah, this one's hers. Yeah, we had fun this day. This must be his, even the hottest day in Vancouver's history. Now, that's it, Muscles, all of it. Now, will you apologize for these wealth on my arm? I don't get it. Whole deal screwy. The only way it would make any sense is if... Norma, where's your phone book? Over there, under the phone. Mm -hmm. Why? What have you got, Marlowe? Just an idea so far. Stick around. Let's see, U.S. government. War assets, war assets, war assets. Weather Bureau. Climatological records, yeah. Mutual six four four two one. Weather Bureau records. Hello, listen, can you tell me what the hottest day on record in Vancouver has been? I mean the date. Do you have that information? British Columbia? Yeah. Yes, we've got it here, I'm pretty sure. Just a minute. What's that supposed to prove, Bob? I'm not sure yet. Yes, we've got it. it uh, hello? Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. The book says the hottest day up there was on July 3, 1948, when the July temperature reached 3. 92 degrees. Some heat record, huh? That's a nice place, Vancouver. I was yeah. up there one year. Yeah, thanks, friend. The Weather Bureau has just lifted a cloud from a lady's mind. I hope you did it in time. So long. You found out something big, didn't you? No works. Well, uh, aren't you going to pull a gun? They always do about here. Not me. I've got concealed weapons. You've also got dollar bills in your bloodstream instead of corpuscles. Mm. But you're smart, baby, so take a tip. Stick close to home. Don't even use the phone. You're a real nice, shiny item. I'd like to keep you that way. Thanks. I'm going to take your word, Junior. But what does it mean? Trouble. Just as soon as I can stir it up. Good night. From Norma's and the time that had gone by, I figured my best bet was Gerard's place, but I was wrong. It was deserted, so I took the next best, which was Alan Pomley's The Pearls. It was well after 2 o'clock when I got there, and the club was closed, but the lights were on, the offices upstairs. I parked, slipped around to the back, and up a flight of iron stairs to a metal door at the top. I pressed my weight against it and very gently turned the knob, and tugged softly, and it swung open without a sound. Voices in the same square of orange light on the floor said that Pomley's office was open again. So I eased my gun into my hand and moved until I could see him. A pair of jackals coming to terms over Since the carcass of a Since I know your little form. secret, Mr. Gerard, the proposition I'm offering you is perfectly fair. What is it? First, that you stop seeing Norma Lacasso. And I mean stop. Go on. Second, that you deliver $5,000 here to me by the end of the week. You must have got a lot of insurance on your wife, Gerard. Double indemnity, too. Am I asking too much? Blackmail leaves me no alternative. You're so right. How did you find out that she's not Margaret V.C.? Ha, <laughs> ha, a beautiful break. When you started seeing Miss La Casa, I began checking up on you, and two days ago, that checking up led me to the strange woman you called Margaret Vesey and a character named Tompkins. Ever hear of him? No. An itinerant gardener was looking for work at your place. Also, Gerard, an itinerant gardener who knew your Margaret Vesey, who knew her as someone named Grace, and Grace Gerard, lest we forget, was your wife. When he called her, Grace had scared her. She couldn't do it, but I could. So I see. Where is this Tompkins now, Palmley? Oh, don't worry about him. I sent him away. He'll keep his mouth shut. He used to be a gardener on the wealthy side of Vancouver where your wife lived. Small world, eh? Very small world. Look up. Now, 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 wait a minute, your heart. I'm going to kill you, Palmley. I knew something like this would happen someday. My wife was getting her memory back. She was beginning to remember things, to realize that she wasn't really Margaret Vesey at all, but that Margaret Vesey had died in the accident. And tonight, I pushed her out of an open window. Doctors practically assure me that she'll be dead by morning. She won't be missed, and neither will you, I'm sure. Next must be your belly, Gerard, if you move one inch. You, Palmley, come around here. Wait me a desk. Come on. This time I'm glad to see you, Marlowe. You're the lesser of two evils. That's great. Well, it was a sweet story, fellas. Between you, you left out only one thing, the picture. You got it from the little album because you needed some tangible proof, didn't you, Palmley? And it cinched the deal because the accident happened on the 9th of July. But Gerard here had his picture taken with a supposed hitchhiker on Vancouver's hottest day, which was July 3rd, six days before he claims to have met the girl. Picture. How'd you manage the master stroke, Gerard, the switch in identities in the first place? Come on, talk! What are you in? It was a mistake. Both Miss Beasley and my wife were in the car at the time of the accident. The car burned. Then, somehow or other, later at the hospital, Margaret Beasley, who died, was identified as my wife, Grace. And since her memory was gone, you made the switch complete and called your wife Margaret Beasley and left it like that. You know, Gerard, I hope you make a break for it. Just once, before we get to headquarters. Let's go. 
You too, Parmalee, move. All right, but you'll have a hard time sticking me, Snoop. I haven't done anything. Oh, yes, you have. Attempted extortion as of right now. You just incited a rat. <laughs> Dr. Gray to receiving ward, please. Dr. Gray. She's in here, Mr. Marlowe. Sure it's all right if I see her now, Doctor? After what you've just told me, I think it's a good idea. Her condition has changed somewhat. She's responded better than I expected, but she can use some fighting spirit, some spunk. Maybe you can give her that. We can't. I hope so. Don't stay too long, that's all. Hello, Grace. I'm Philip Marlowe, remember me? What? Yes, I... I think I do, Mr. Marlowe. Glad to see you. Oh, good. I, I just stopped by to tell you that I have all the answers to those troublesome questions in your mind. You don't have to be afraid of them anymore. You've got nothing to worry about now except getting well. Thank you. It's all hazy back there. I can't remember where I've been. Now well, you've been away, Grace, for a long time. But now you'll be going home soon to your friends. Believe that. I'll run along now and come back tomorrow when you're feeling better. We'll have a long talk, then. Wait. Huh? Who is Margaret Vesey? A girl you knew once, briefly. And what I'll never forget. Went to sleep one night on my divan. I don't remember. You will. Don't think about it now. Just think about home in Vancouver. You'll be there soon, I promise. Oh, that sounds wonderful. It's lovely in Vancouver. Yeah. That's what the weatherman says. Good night, my dear. When I finally got home, the air in my apartment was thick, full of stagnant fear and stale tobacco smoke. So I went over the window to open it up. But there I stopped because... I remembered standing at that same window earlier that evening. Standing there thinking how happy I was that the world was out there. And how happy I was to be inside, looking out. And then I saw again the five deep scratches on the casing. Inside looking out, huh? (laughs) There was a guy once, a long time ago, who said something like, No man is an island entire of itself. Yeah, about 300 years ago he said that. Any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind. Yeah, sure. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Ed Begley, Lillian Bioff, Paul Dubois, Jay Duvello, and Harry Bartell. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oran. Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time it was a wrestler on the skids, a quick change artist in an alley, and a girl with an eye for angles. All met destruction because a hundred thousand easy bucks caught him in a stranglehold, which none of them wanted to break. Next time you're in the woods, make sure that cigarette butt, that match, or that campfire is completely out. Only you can prevent forest fires. This is Paul Masterson speaking. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. and get it straight.
Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This time, a wrestler on the skids, a quick-change artist in an alley, and a girl with an eye for angles all met destruction because a hundred thousand easy bucks caught him in a stranglehold which none of them wanted to break. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Stranglehold. Sometimes men climb all over themselves for a purpose, sometimes for relaxation, and most times for no reason at all. Take professional wrestling. I watched in the ringside while two gargantuan hulks contorted their features in mock agony and bulged muscles at each other on a mat surrounded by tears of onlookers screaming through their half-chewed popcorn. While the fans, as usual, howled for blood, booed the decision, hooted the departing contestants and waited for the next comic act, laughingly called the main event. I went again over the letter I'd received two hours ago by messenger from one Manny Faber. It had included a ringside ticket to L.A. Wrestling Arena, a check for $200, and the request that I catch as much as I could stomach of the match between John, better known as Peachy King, and Jules Caesar, the Emperor of Brooklyn, after which I was to come to Faber's house for instructions that involved John Keen plus 100000 bucks of Manny Faber's money. So I watched a little closer as something that looked like a Sherman tank in a toga and leather sandals crowned with an olive wreath lumbered into the ring and sneered at the crowd. And since I'd long ago given up wrestling as a sport, I turned to the fan next to me wearing a derby on the bridge of his nose, waved a cloud of cigar smoke aside, and got some information. Oh, Caesar? Ah, you get your money's worth out of him, all right. Hey, what about this John Keane? How does he stack up? Ha-ha, <laughs> Peachy! You kidding? He's a bomb. Stinko! No show! Oh, uh-huh. off! A blink down! <laughs> look, look, you're fixing the ring up for him now. Get this! <laughs> What's that, flowers? Yeah, yeah, peach blossoms! <laughs> They threw peach blossoms all over his corner. <laughs> eh, with stuff. Two years ago, the stuff was okay, but now it's tired, you know what I mean? Eh, he won't even put on a show, little old wrestling. He's still called a champ, isn't he? Champ! Him! <laughs> he won't even give you a laugh anymore. He's afraid of getting his pretty nose bent. What a bum. Eh, see, he's time up a nut. Here he comes, bugger. Yo ho, Peachy! <laughs> you bum! Ah! See what I mean with that profile? He ought to be a ribbon cloak instead of a wrestler. Yeah. Hey, what's that on the back of his robe? Are you kidding? That's a big peach, of course. Embroidered in gold on black silk. How do you like... Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, come on. Hey, look, I hear them robes cost them a thousand bucks a piece. He thinks they make them hot stuff with the dame. Maybe they do. Who's a brunette in there talking with him? How oh, should I know? There's always something like that. Around. Look, right down. Will you make your talk so much? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the peach of event uh, on tonight's uh, program... Uh, a free fall, uh, no limit contest uh, of a wrestling uh, in this corner at 278 uh, pounds. Uh, the outstanding contender from the Atlantic Seaboard uh, and Emperor of Brooklyn, uh, the Jules Caesar. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? And uh, in this corner at 225 uh, pounds, the undisputed champion uh, of the Western Hemisphere, John. Uh, as the match got underway and Peachy started out of his corner, a good-looking brunette shouted something at him that stopped him cold. He turned to glare at her and Caesar slapped a hank on him that put Peachy flat on his back for fall number one. Three minutes later, with his head in a gilligan, Peachy was well on his way to the mat again for fall number two, which was enough for me, so I got up to leave. The brunette, I noticed, was leaving too. And at the end of the exit tunnel, we came out side by side. You got a match? Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. It's a mess, isn't it, huh? What's a mess? <laughs> the way things are going inside there. Uh, Peachy ought to change his line of work, don't you think? Oh, what's it to you? A laugh so far. What's it to you? You said something to him that knocked him for a loop, baby. What was it? A personal matter. Oh, how personal? Oh, about like that. <clears throat> Thank you, and step down, Philip Marlowe. And you'd better step out, too, or I'll whistle for a John Don. <laughs> Nighty night, nosey. <laughs> So saying, she flashed a couple of daggers at me from her snapping black eyes, spun on four and a half inch red patent leather heel, and was gone. So I drove up to Hollywoodland in the house of 2000 Beachwood Drive, where I was to meet my client, Manny Faber. 
The house looked like a two-room cottage from the street, but it ran for three stories down the backside of the hill. And all I did was touch the bell when the door flew open. Uh, you're Marlowe, uh-huh. am I right? Come on in, Marlowe. I'm Manny Faber, head of Faber Transcriptions Incorporated. Produce radio shows, you know. Yeah. So you saw him, eh? You saw that big, crooked, four-flushing, stupid, mat-pounding mastodon that calls himself Johnny Peach Keen, huh? Yeah, I saw him. Uh, oh, have a chair. Oh, thanks. Well, what do you think? You just summed it up. What's that got to do with your 100,000 bucks, Mr. Faber? You haven't seen the late editions? No. They're full of it. Peachy Keen is suing me for 100 Gs for slander. <laughs> How can you slander a guy like Peachy? It's impossible. I know that, and you know it. But does a court of law know it? No. In fact, they're going to make it stick. Well, how did it happen? I'll tell you. A very sweet guy named Frank Gaynor. Yeah, I know. I'm a sports commentator. Yes, yes. He's been doing five a week on my label and going big. But three days ago, what we've been expecting for months finally happened. Rest his soul. A weak ticker. And just like that, he dropped dead on the street. Heart failure. Yeah, I read about it. Well, Frank always kept five broadcasts ahead, see? Made tape recordings in his own little studio. So I've been running his last five shows as a final tribute to him. Well, what happened? Uh, yesterday, the whole 15 minutes of his broadcast was devoted to ripping apart John Peachy Keen. Here, listen. Uh, I've got the tape here on the machine. Mm. This is one part. Applied on the sports world. And furthermore, I have proof that Get John that? Peachy Keen has it's sold out to the highest bidder in small-time gambling circles in his last three matches. Now, I know for a fact that he has become so blatant in his underhanded dealings that even as dubious a business as professional wrestling cannot stand the street. And officials have threatened to bar him from the ring. Strong I can show beyond a doubt that John Peachy Keen has falsified medical reports to evade tough competition, and that he eventually... Yeah, it goes on like that, Marlowe. Some of it opinion, most of it fact. And it's the facts that my lawyers tell me I've got to find the proof for or be a dead duck. That's why I asked you to come up here. I... Oh, excuse me. This sure. is probably Ruth, Frank's wife. <clears throat> nice show people once. Oh, hello, Ruth. Come in, honey. Hello, Manny. I haven't been able to find a thing yet. I can't imagine where Frank got his information. I... Oh, Ruth, uh, shake hands with Mr. Marlowe. He's the detective I told you about. Uh, Mrs. Gaynor, Marlowe. How do you do, Mr. Marlowe? Glad to know you, Mrs. Gaynor. Manny, here's the key to Frank's private studio at 6122 Sunset. It might be a good place for Mr. Marlowe to start. Yes, all his files and equipment are there. Frank didn't like to work at home or at my plant on the strip. Wanted his own private setup. Uh, we looked there, but maybe we missed something. Okay, I'll see what I can find. Oh, by the way, do either of you happen to know a good-looking brunette connected in some way with Peachy? No, but he's quite a ladies' man, I understand. Why, Marlowe? That's uh, just a hunch. I saw him talking to one at night, a fireball. may mean nothing. Well, I hope you'll be able to locate the proof of Frank's statements, Marlowe. We've got to find it for Frank. Uh, <clears throat> uh, also, it'll break my heart to pay a hundred grand to a no-good meat heaver named Peachy Keen. <laughs> I promised paper I'd keep in touch and left. I found Gaynor's little recording studio tucked into the second floor corner of a small office building on Sunset. Unlocked the heavy soundproof door and went in. The room had a busy, cluttered look, as though Gaynor himself had just stepped out. A row of filing cabinets and a desk sat along one wall, and opposite them was the glassed-in booth with the tape recorders and microphone by which the solitary sportscaster had canned his radio programs. I dug through the files and found a folder labeled John Keene that held only a sketchy history of the wrestler. Some publicity pictures and a few clippings, one of which rated a long second look. Because it was topped by a picture of the same brunette I'd seen at the ringside. It was captioned, Carla Bennett leads for West Coast. I started to read the story when there was a sound at the door behind me and the lights went out. Don't move, mighty. I'll kill you on the spot if you do. Up against that window, you make a perfect target, you know. So don't try anything, kid. What do you want? A little more than I'm getting, that's what. I'm entitled to it, I am. The service is rendered, you might say. I can't help you, Busty. You've come to the wrong man. Oh, no, but not to the wrong place, huh, Mighty? So, first things first, like I always say. Turn around, Mighty. It's not. Oh! Right, he'll get me. Sleepy boy. <laughs> Showing up here to put this. Oh, oh, put the slug on me. 
lie me? Yeah. Who was it? Why'd he slug you? Good questions, Faber. Hey, does the name Carla Bennett ring any bells? Carla Bennett? Yeah. No, no, I never heard of her. I... What? Oh, just a minute, Marlo. Here's Ruth. Huh? Marlo, I remember that name. Yeah? I'm sure Frank interviewed her once. Carla Bennett used to be Mrs. John Keene. Peachy's ex-wife? Yes, I'm positive. Why, is she mixed up in this? I don't know. But Limey, who slugged me, apparently took a newspaper clipping about it when he left. At least it's gone. Marlo, this Limey, was that all he was after? Yeah, he said he wanted more than he was getting. Hey, but look, Faber made this call. What do you want? To tell you that he'll be out checking on a few things himself. That's all. Oh. Well, by the way, Ruth, any idea where this Bennett Dane might be found? No, I haven't, Marlo. No. I think she was staying at some woman's hotel on Vermont Avenue when Frank interviewed her at that time. Vermont. But that was over a year ago. Maybe she's a lady of habit. I'll try it anyway. Thanks, Ruthie. There were three exclusively female hotels on Vermont. And the second one I called had a Carla Bennett registered. So I went out to my car and babied my aching head down Vermont to the Victoria Plaza Ladies Only Hotel. The lobby was done in ivory and pink with desk clerk to match. And the nameplate tagged as Mr. Seymour Pratt. I started over but stopped when I spotted about an acre of peach-colored suede coat wrapped around John Peachy Keene himself, lumbering up the stairs at the back of the lobby. Mr. Pratt saw him at the same time and darted from behind the desk like an angry canary after a rhinoceros. Just a minute, you. This is a lady's hotel. So what? I got to see the one in 212. Not this way, you don't. Why, it's after midnight. If Miss Bennett wishes to come down to the lobby, that's her affair. But no men are allowed upstairs after 10 p.m. Okay, okay. How can I get in touch with her? Use the house phone, naturally. Over there in that booth. I'll go right back to the board and plug you in. I'll be with you in just a moment, sir. Ducky, I'll wait. A call for you, Miss Bennett. Good listening, huh? But... Now, see here, you know perfectly well you're not supposed to come back to this desk. This is for employees only. What about eavesdropping? Is that for employees only, too? Oh, uh, why, how dare you? Save it, Seymour. The guy in the booth there is a professional wrestler. If he finds out you're listening in, he'll tear your arm off and beat you to death with it. Better let me take over here. Give me the earphone. Now, wait Come a minute. on, give it to me. Hey. Okay. Now, sit there like a good boy. Keep the key open and your trap shut. Well, no surprise. Where are you now, John? In the lobby, in a phone booth. You better come down, Carla. No, no John, better. I'm tired. Will you call me tomorrow? No, wait a minute. What do you mean by that crack you made tonight when I was in the ring? Just what I said. I want a nice big slice of that hundred thousand you're getting from Manny Faber. Why, uh, you're crazy. What makes you think I'd give you one lousy penny? Yeah, you will, gladly. You see, John, I know all about those visits you made to the Lyceum Theater. Bottle's come back to L.A., hasn't it, darling? Why, you sneaking... Oh, shut up. After the life you led me for four years, you big ape, I'm entitled to all I can get. And that'll be plenty. So I advise you to run right back now and tell your friend that I know all about your little scheme. And talk it over good, John. I'll be waiting to hear from you. All right. I'll do just that. And you're sure going to be sorry you stuck your nose into this one, Carla. Mm, real interesting. Are you quite, quite finished now? Yes, and you were a big, big help, Mr. Pratt. Oh, there he goes. Peachy sway coat and all. So long, Seymour. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Horace Height and his famous youth opportunity program have joined Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen, Red Skelton, Jack Benny, and the other top-ranking entertainers who make CBS Sunday nights a must. Enjoy these 30 minutes when Horace Height takes over on most of these same stations Sunday night this fall. Tune in, tune in this fall For the shows that you love best of all Listen carefully Here's the address It's CBS, CBS Now with our star, Gerald Moore We return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story The Stranglehold Peachy Keene slammed out of the phone booth. He was burned to a crisp. He stomped out of the woman's hotel via the back door that opened onto the parking lot. And when I got there, it was already out of sight. I stopped in the shadows to figure out which way he'd gone, but skipped that as the back door opened again. This time, it was Carla Bennett. She ran across the lot, hopped into a new green convertible, and got as far as switching on the lights before still another character pranced into the headlight beams like a veteran ham making for upstage center. Miss Bennett! Hey, Miss Bennett, wait! I gotta talk to you! I couldn't tell where the first one came from. 
I only heard it. It brought the little man up on his toes and arched him like a drawn bow. I saw the flash of the second one. It came from the alley and crumpled it into a pile. A moment later, a mole roared, and I ran to where I could see, but a pair of taillights twisting onto the side street. It was all the good it did me. I went back to the body of the little man as Carla Bennett climbed out of her car. She was white from shock, and in the headlights, her makeup was garish. It belonged on a clown. The back alley harlequinade was suddenly very grim. He, he was shot, Mr. Wright, in front of me. Who's the little guy, Carla? I, I don't know. I never saw him before. You know my name? Yeah. We met at the wrestling arena early at night, you remember? Marlowe, private detective. Now, come on, Carla, let's have it. What's his name? I don't know, I tell you. Okay, we'd better find out fast. Let's take a look at his wallet. No! It's none of my business. I'm getting out of here. Wait a minute. He wanted to talk to you pretty badly, baby. Very likely about a hundred grand. If I were you, I'd stick around. You've got awfully big ears, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah, better to hear phone conversations. What? This guy's an actor. He's got an equity card. Name is Seth Cameo. Mean anything? Not to me. Unless... Unless what? Unless he happens to work at the Lyceum Theater? As you said, Carla, Vaudeville's back in town, and that brings up another point you better explain. what's going on out here anyway? I thought I heard oh. shots. You did, Pratt. They came from the alley oh, there. Oh, and... so it's you again. I might have... Th- that man. That man there on the ground. Good heavens, is... Is he dead? Yeah, he's murdered. Oh, no. Help! Help me! Murder! Hey, jerk. I'm getting out of here. Not alone, you're not. I'm going with you. Listen, Big Ears, I can take care of myself. Will you beat it? That's not the point, sister. I still want to talk to you. Get in. I go out that way to the street, not too fast. All right. Since you're running things, where are we going? Lyceum Theater. On the way, you can tell me why your ex-husband Peachy's been hanging around there. I don't know why. Who's the friend he's been seeing? Was it Cameo? I don't know that either. Now, look, for Pete's sake, do I have to draw you a picture? A man was shot down right in front of you. Doesn't that convince you? Bucking the same opposition, baby, and believe me, this is no time to hold out. Not in this league. I'm not. All right. Well, that stuff you overheard on the phone was pure bluff. I accidentally ran into John a couple of days ago near the stage door of the Lyceum. He, well, he acted funny like he was waiting for somebody and very nervous about it. You didn't see who it was? No. I waited until three girls and two men had come out one after another, but they were cagey. I couldn't tell which one John was waiting for. Mm. And then I heard about this slander suit of his, and I figured something was screwy. He took a swing in the dark tonight and connected, huh? Good and solid. When I told him on the phone to go back to his friend, I knew he'd be just stupid enough to do it, and that's why I came out so fast. I wanted to follow him and find out who else was involved before I got in too far. You're already in too far, baby. You got more nerve than good sense, even for a hundred grand. You don't believe me? Ask Cameo. There's a theater park here. We'll walk over. Look, tell me something big here. Suppose Seth Cameo did work here. What's it going to prove? All depends on what we find to go with it. He was killed to keep him from upsetting the apple cart. One way he could have done that would be to have proof of what Frank Gaynor said in his broadcast about Peachy. Sure, but fitting a vaudeville actor at the Lyceum into that slot doesn't make sense. No, but... Yeah, there it is. Cameo's placket. We were right. Yeah. Seth Cameo, the one-man all-star cast. See Lionel Barrymore, Betty Davis, Harry Drucker... Humphrey Bogart, James Cagney, and many others in East Glen played in a split-second changes by the world's most versatile one-man cast. Seth Cameo. Sure, he was a mimic. A guy like that would have dialects, lots of them. So? So maybe Seth Cameo was the boy who slugged me in Gaynor's studio. He was careful to turn out the light first, then he threw that limey jive at me to toss me off the track. And what's more, he... Uh-oh, we got company. Where? The little geezer over there. What are you doing there? Theater's closed. Last show's been over for hours. I know. You're the night watchman. That's right. Now, you better move along, kids. No loitering. Run theater. Now, just a minute, Pop. This Seth Cameo, does he have a limey number in his act? Why don't you come back tomorrow and ask him? Well, that's tougher than you think, mister. How about it? Does he do a limey? Limey? Well, now, let's see. Cockney. Uh, English. No, I don't think so. Might have at one time, though. Been in the business for years. Good man, too. Best quick changer i ever seen. Mm. Has he got a scrapbook or something in his dressing room, do you know? Well, yeah, yes, he has. Got a box there with every bill he's ever played on in it. Most actors do. But the theater's all closed now, fella. Well, you've got a key, haven't you? Look, Pop, it's important. We've got to find out right away. Oh, but I'm sorry, son. I can't do it. Look, I... it's real important. Take a good look. Very important. Ten bucks. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I guess it wouldn't do any harm if you just want to look. <laughs> The old man slid the ten into his pocket like he wouldn't admit it even to himself. Then let us in the stage door, down the stairs, and with his flashlight along the dark hallway to Seth Cameo's dressing room. He unlocked it, reached in, and turned on a tired little lamp and pointed out a box on a trunk near the back. We picked our way over to it through a jumble of costumes that had been period pieces at the turn of the century. The box was lined with sentimental posters. 
And inside was a man's life. And stacks of programs and playbills. It began with a crisp current appearance and then ran back through all of Seth Cameo's dusty yesterdays. Didn't take long. Maybe five minutes. Here. This is it, Marlowe. Exactly what you're after. Let's see that. Parthenon Theatre, Kansas City, September 1940. Seth Cameo of London. In Piccadilly Circus, Majesty Navy Limehouse. Sure. This is it, baby. Seth Cameo and Limey were one and the same. And where does that get you? Yeah, it gives me an idea. It gives me one, too. And you found what you wanted. Now, let's put everything back like it was and get out of here. In a minute, Pop. I want to check something else. Now, look, Sonny. This is dead against all rules. I'm getting jittery. Wait a minute. Two... Hold it. I heard something upstairs. Did you lock the outside door, Pop? Oh, come now, fella. Be a sport. That's an old stunt that oh. just won't work. That door's got a snap latch. Shut up. And... I heard it, too, that time. There is somebody up there. Huh? Yeah, you're right. Uh, Dad, blame it. I was afraid of something like this. Now, 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 look, you two. You stay right here and don't touch nothing till I get back. You hear? I'll go see what it was. Better switch off the lights, Carla. The brakes are going against us. What do you mean? Well, that is, all this after-hours theater business can't be coincidence. Whoever came in upstairs, there's trouble on his mind. Oh. You asked for a payoff, baby, and that's what you're going to get. Only the bank won't handle it. The morgue will. Hey, you. What you doing here? You the night watchman around here? Oh, that's Marlo, right? it's John. Yeah, what put you your keen. No pun intended. Oh, the girl that's in here. I want to see her. Oh, hey, no. Take it easy. Here. Now you go on. Get out. Don't lie to me, Grandpa. Our car is parked across the street. Well, you know Keep that. Keep she could be. Now, where is she? Come on. I mean business. Now, listen here. Don't you give me none of your sass, son. You just clear her out there. Oh, oh, oh. You got the watchman. You better clear out, Carly. He'll be down here in another minute. Oh. Now, look, go up that way and cross the stage. Go to 2000 Beechwood. It's the one place Peachy won't go. Many favors. And stay there till I call. You understand? Well, but, but, Never mind. Beat it, will you? Go on. Be careful, big ears. When Carla moved off into the darkness, I saw at the other end of the hall the inquisitive beam from the flashlight poking you to dark corners as Keen eased down the stairs. I got my gun into my hand, plastered my shoulders against the wall beside the open door, and waited. I didn't have long to wait. I heard him stop in the hall outside, and then the beam of the flashlight crept over the floor and up to the wall, and then slowly, carefully circled the door frame. Carla? I heard him move in closer, and the barrel of a snub-nosed revolver inched into the room. I know you're in here, Carla. I waited until I could see the big fist wrapped around the gun, and I brought my thirty-eight down hard! <laughs> His gun flew to the floor and I swung again for his head. Why you? The rest are only blinking lunge for me. I'll kill you. Not tonight, PC. I may need it. I get my hands on you. That's I'll... your problem, big man. Fall down, will you? I'll get you. I'll get you. Go down and stay down. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, you gotta chop that guy down like a tree. It had been short but vicious. And the one punch he'd landed had shaken me to my shoelaces. The wreckage of costumes, props, and a lifetime of old theater programs was scattered over the room like big moldy snowflakes in the crazy ankle high glare from the still burning flashlight. As I sagged down onto a trunk to catch my breath, I saw something that brought me right back to my feet again. An illustrated program from the King's Theater in Buffalo that gave me a new slant on the whole mess. It billed Seth Cameo as the man with a thousand voices, the perfect mimic. And the act that had followed him for a 30-week run was a girl whose face I knew well. I ran out of the theater into the nearest cab stand where I sent one driver to get the police over to the theater. And with another, I headed for Manny Faber's place on Beachwood in what I was positive would be another murder. When I got to the front door, I knew there was no need to hurry. It was all over. Come on in, Marla. I've got news for you. It was Carla with a gun in her hand. And on the floor in the corner, her face tight with pain, was Mrs. Ruth Gaynor glaring hate up at me like a wounded panther. There she is, Marla. I recognized her as soon as I saw her. She's the one Peachy was waiting for outside the Lyceum Theater. They've been working together all this time to frame that slander suit against Faber. Yeah, yeah, I know. But I didn't expect to find you like this. What happened? She knew I recognized her and pulled this gun on me. The one she used on Seth Cameo, no doubt, huh? Uh-huh. She was going to use it on me, too. But I was way ahead of her. She's only in love with John Peachy Keen, but I was married to him for four years, and you don't live with a professional wrestler that long without picking up a few tricks. They call you the weaker sex. <laughs> what is it, Ruthie? Your elbow? Is it broken? Let me alone, you two-bit flatfoot. I'll call a doctor and get you fixed up. For one reason only, I don't even like to see a black widow spider suffer. Uh... 
coffee, Miss Bennett? No, thank you, Mr. Faber. Well, I don't blame you. I've got no appetite either. You know, Marlowe, I always liked Ruth. And I thought she liked me. As long as you represented a buck, she did. And I've got to admit that she and the wrestler were clever, though. That stunt almost worked. She was clever. John Keene is 225 pounds of solid jerk. Yeah, it was all her idea. She was in love with Peachy, and when Frank died, she saw a great opportunity. Especially with that mimic being in town. Sure, Seth Cameo is an old friend of hers. She and Peachy wrote a highly slanderous script. She got Cameo to record it on Frank's machine, imitating Frank's delivery. Yes, and I broadcast it and stabbed myself in the back. Exactly. And we'd never found out any of this if a couple of other characters hadn't tried to cut in. First Cameo, who felt he'd been cheated when he learned the job he'd done was worth a hundred grand. Ruth had to shoot him to keep him quiet. Second little caller here. Oh, Marlo, uh, please. With me, it was just good, healthy spite. Spite, huh? <laughs> What's stronger, baby, spite or dough? Well. See what I mean? Good night, Mr. Faber. Good night. Come on, Carla, let's go. We didn't go home directly. We went on our Beechwood Drive high into the Hollywood Hills and parked where we could look out over the sparkling, sprawling city. And then we talked about color, her life, relative values, the city below us, and the dark hills above. And then, as we watched the first faint glimmer of dawn rise in the east, we both realized something. Not original, not very complex. And certainly not sophisticated, but very gratifying. In the final analysis, the best things in life, we both agreed, are still free. You know what I mean? Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Ted Von Elts, Charlotte Lawrence, Barney Phillips, Tony Barrett, Peter Leeds, and Junius Matthews. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oran. Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... I didn't know it, but I was caught in a smokeout that led from a search for a lady in black, past murder at a highway inn, to gunfire in a crumbling warehouse. And all for a girl, already dead in the morgue. This fall, you hear them all on CBS. Red Skelton and Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen have joined the parade to CBS on Sunday evenings. And be sure to hear the contented hour with Dinah Shore tomorrow and every Sunday over most of these same CBS stations. This fall, you hear them all on CBS. This is Paul Masterson speaking. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison of the grave. I didn't know it, but I was caught in a smokeout that led from a search for a lady in black, past murder at a highway inn, the gunfire fling warehouse. For a girl already dead in the morgue. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Smoke Out. It 
never seems to fail. A sleepless night that leaves you with raw nerves and sandpaper eyelids. It's always followed by a day that never ends. A kind of long, tough day that keeps you on the move until life in the city is finally reduced to no more than a confused, clatterous sink of exhaust fumes and an aimless mob of shallow people milling around looking for nothing but a chance to con each other out of a lousy butt. And this was no exception. Because when I finally decided to quit to get out of it to go someplace quiet and relaxed, I found myself instead in a hurry all over again. I was on my way to a very public building on Spring Street at the sub instigation of one Detective Lieutenant Matthews of Homicide, whose phone call 20 minutes ago had caught me as soon as I opened my apartment door. Uh, where you been, Marlowe? Don't you ever check in at that office of yours? And on days like this, Matthews, they don't give me a chance. What's up? Tell me all you know about Vera Hamlin. Who's Vera Hamlin? A girl. No fool. Are you real sure you don't know her? Positive. Am I supposed to? Uh-uh. Maybe she used another name. Pretty blonde, about five, six, a sweet kid, apparently. I can think of a lot of women who fit that description, Matthews. Yeah, you could. But mm-hmm. this one wrote you a letter yesterday. I didn't get it. Then I haven't been in my office at all today. Why? You wanted your help. How do you know? Well, we picked it up from the imprint in an open pack of stationery in our apartment. Oh? Uh-huh. Better come down and take a look at her, Phil. Take a look at her? Where is she? In the morgue. Oh, Car last night. Accident? What makes you ask that, Marlow? Your dubious tone of voice, Matthews. Well, was it an accident? Uh, I guess so. Maybe I've been a cop too long. I get suspicious myself on dark nights. Can understand it. Come on down, Phil. Right away, I'll meet you there. <laughs> Glad to know you, Mr. Marlowe. Is this your first visit? No, I've been here before, Connor. Well, Matthews, for what good do you think this is going to do to the police department? Let's see her and get it over with. All right, let's go, Connor. Uh, Step this way, please, gentlemen. Uh, Follow me. Happy fella, isn't he? Well, civil friend. Here, to the right. Now, let's see. Eggroom, Barnigan. Now, here we are. Hamlin, Vera. There. Well, Mama? Mm. You know her, Mama? No. Okay, that's all. All right, Lieutenant Matthews. Come on, son. Get out of here. Yeah. Now, look, Matthews, I told you on the phone I didn't know. What'd you get me down here because for? Because there are some angles on this death I don't like to look That letter to you is one of them. Got the letter? No. No, I read the whole thing in from the lab and that imprint they worked on. She was worried. She wanted you to investigate something for her. You were supposed to call her today. Know anything about her? Yeah, she came to L.A. about six months ago from Omaha. Mm-hmm. She worked for a guy named Brasso, a produce wholesaler, 77 Market Street. Lately, she was seeing a lot of him after office hours. What's wrong with that? Nothing. But she was killed in front of Brasso's house at 2 a.m. as she was getting out of her car, and Brasso wasn't home at the time. Oh? He has a fair alibi. Puts him out on Highway 101 north of Santa Monica. Hey, excuse happened. me, gentlemen. I'd better get the phone. Yeah, yeah, do it. Uh, what about the motives, Matthew? No motives. Well, then why are you so upset? Well, do you... Why was she so upset? What did she want you for? That's not enough for you to go If I had on. that one answered, I'd know where to oh, go from I know, but you're pinning yeah, a murder rap on somebody. What do you mean murder rap? I'm not upset. Uh, it's for you. No. No. All right, thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Hello, this is Matthew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A witness. Says it was murder. Still get a load of this. Why? Yeah, give me that again. Yeah, a woman. So what happened, huh? Great. Who was it? The lady in black. Where'd you get that? It sounds corny. Where did you get that? It sounds... What? You mean there's a story about it out now in the L.A. Journal? Yeah. I'll be back there in five minutes. And listen, get a hold of the reporter who wrote that story and hang on to him. I want to talk to that wise punk. How do you like that? How do you like it? Yeah, Vera Hamlin murdered with an eyewitness to prove it. Only the police department is the last outfit in town to know. Come on, Phil. Where to this time? To buy a newspaper. Find out what's going on. Matthews was boiling as we left the morgue and headed to police headquarters. We made one stop on the way to pick up a copy of the journal which he read as I drove. The kind of smoky, well-illustrated sensationalism that caused issues, oh, double police work, and false papers. exclusively to the journal tonight that she was an eyewitness when a mad killer purposely swerved his speeding car into curvaceous blonde beauty Vera Hamlin outside her lover's Brentwood home late last night. If that's journalism, I'll eat my bag. Keep reading. You're a cop, not a critic. Yeah, but I got taste. 
The lady in black will appear at police headquarters at 9 o'clock to reveal license number and description of the murder and the shocking death which police have already labeled accidental nuts. Come on, Mullen. I thought it was sorry for Matthews because the way things were breaking, the Vera Hamlin deal was a cinch to become one of those involved screwball affairs. But nothing goes according to the book, and I was glad I never got a letter. Now it was none of my business. All I wanted to do was drop Matthews off, get away from the whole thing, and try to forget about it. But when we piled up behind the waiting squad car at headquarters, the gang of night beat photographers draping the stairs stopped us. Don't give you a fine. Lieutenant, is your witness going to show? It's nine on the button. Where's the lady in Oh, no, I know. I didn't find out there was a witness until I read it in the journal. Yeah, that was a dirty trick. Hiya, Mullen. Hiya, Abbott. You're an old-timer, Abbott. You guys ought to keep pumps like a journal squirt in line. They just make it tough on everybody. Oh, don't blame us for that guy. He's burned up, huh, Mullen? You blame him? You know as well as I do, the journal picked up that witness right here. Kept her under wraps until they had time to break the story. Well, he shouldn't let it throw him. You know guys like that usually hang them. Sure, down. after the damage is done. Now I've had enough today, Matthews. Besides, nobody in City Hall signs my check. Good night. to the corner where one of the reporters told me that the green sedan had had a lady in black in it. Whoever had fired the shots had gotten away clean. So, with that to say about, I drove back to Hollywood and tried a double scotch in a quiet bar. Yeah, it didn't work. Half hour later, I ended up in my office with Vera Hamlin's letter open on my desk. The clothes were five ten dollar bills and a souvenir postcard from a place called Moon's Point on Highway 101. Penciled across the back of the word. I think this place means trouble for Dave Russell. I don't know why, dear. Maybe it was the memory of the girl's face in the mall. Oh, maybe it was a stack of wrinkled tens on my desk that made me do it. But whatever it was, I went to my car, drove out past Santa Monica, and it took me an hour to get to Moon's Point on Highway 101. An isolated huddle of grimy filling station, rickety six cabin auto caught and weather-beaten lunch counter and bar, squatting beside the highway. I pulled up at the parking lot and went into the bar where the source of the quaint name Moon's Point met me. Moon himself. <laughs> he was round, pale, and soft as a lump of green cheese. What can I do for you, mister? Dave around? Dave who? Grosso. Want to see him on business. What kind Private of business? business. Oh. Okay. Sure, Brussels here. Out in cabin number four there, Mr. Stipple. Oh? You can get that back there, there, there if you want it. But I don't think I'll have much time for you, fellas. Why not? The late paper just come in, the L.A. Journal. Is that all? I got much later news than that for him. Hey, 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 you. Who's there? Pull it down, will you? My name's Baggett. I didn't sign asking for Dave Brasso. Well, I think you're a cop, and I might be able to do you a little favor. What do you got in mind, Baggett? Well, since there don't seem to be much love lost between you and Brasso, I'll tell you. I believe in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, see? I used to be a driver for Dave Brasso, only yesterday I got canned. Thrown out. Pull off my truck and fire for no reason at all. So? Oh, so I've been sticking close to him, just waiting for a chance to pay him back. And I've been finding out things. Things you might like to know. Give me a for Well, for instance, he had a fight. A knockdown, drag out argument with that uh, Vera Hamlin girl last night. Just an hour or so before she was run over. She claimed he was seeing another woman. What's that proof, Baggy? She was found dead in front of his house, bud. You ended up. And that's not all I need to find the why he's hanging around out here. Also, why it ain't gonna do him one bit of good. I got plenty to tell about. Wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. Okay. Yeah. That's my yeah. stipple who opened the door to number four here. I gotta get out of here. But I got plenty to tell, bud. So when you're finished in there, come on over behind the grease rack at the filling station. I'll be waiting for you. Well, how you feel, Dave? You're on edge. You got reason to be, but running back into town won't help you any. So they got a witness. He's already told it. Wait a minute. There's somebody outside here. Yeah, that's right. I want to see Dave Brasso. Uh, Mr. Brasso is pretty busy right now, mister. Not too busy to see me. Oh, you uh, a cop? No. And you must be a crummy reporter, so scram. Uh, you look Mr. Brasso up at his place of business some other time. You mean after he skipped town to keep the witness from putting a finger on him? Why, you Hold snooping. Up, Wait. Who are you? What you die, told you? Name's Marlowe, private detective. I'm here because Vera Hamlin wrote me a letter yesterday. Vera? Monty, get lost for a couple of minutes, will you? I want to talk to this guy. Don't you think you better go on, beat it. Well, okay. All right, soldier. Come on in. You wanted to see me? I'll take a good look. Well, 
Well. Okay, so you're big, Bresson. Husky enough to run over somebody and kill him. Without even getting into a car. I'll let that one go by, soldier. Where's the letter? Locked up in my office. What's you say in it? Wanted something to look into. And said this was a good place to start. Ah, uh, jealous little fool. Is that what the fight was about last time? Fight? You do find things out, don't you, soldier? That's my business. Well, maybe you know who this lady in black here in the paper is. And what she's going to tell. Maybe. Might even know who was jumping up to try to kill her tonight and shut her up. Who is that? You mean somebody... Come on, Brasso. Let's stick closer to the truth. You're a lousy actor. For instance, Vera wanted me to come to this dump because you and Sipple are holed up here. Why? That doesn't concern you. It's business. Sure, and when a girl accidentally gets in the way of business, she's run over by it. Is that the way you work? You keep talking on the same thing, soldier, and I don't like it. I was in love with Vera Hamlin. Maybe you're trying to use that to nail me in a frame. Maybe you're a sneak for that stinking louse weather. Maybe you didn't get any letter from Vera at all, so get out of here and think up a new one. Your theories are getting way ahead of you, Buster. Who's weather? Jerk. I said get out. I take that back for an answer, soldier, and you can get more of the same anytime you want it at 77 Market Street. That's a hair trigger left with 200 pounds of shoulder behind it. Piled me out of the door and flat on my back in the gravel. It was tallied my interview with him at zero with one minor exception. My spiteful informer Baggett had some basis and tact for his story, so I dusted myself off and made for the rear of the deserted filling station where the grease rack stood. There was nobody around. I waited a few minutes for him, and then I skirted wide around the auto court and looked in at the scaly window at the bar. Stipple was there with his nose in a beer glass, but no Baggett. I circled the building quietly, found nothing but indignant spiders in dark corners, and decided to try the grease rack again. When the back door of the bar opened and... Moon came out with a flashlight and a pail of garbage. He was halfway to a rack of cans when he froze. Like a bird dog with one foot in the air. Holy mackerel. The flashlight stabbing at a man's hand, hanging out over the edge of a shallow ditch. Look. Look there. There's somebody laying in the ditch. Yeah. No wonder I couldn't find him. It's Baggett with a knife in his back. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we continue with the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Smokeout. hardened the hand at the edge of the ditch, the wheezing, pudgy circle known as Moon was already worrying less about why murder was sprawled at his feet and more about what the violent playing of the truck driver was going to do to his roadhouse business as usual. Didn't make the host of listening. Dave Brasso, that Monday skipper, all of them. They can take their trade and their trouble summers up. I gotta make a buck like the next guy, but I sure ain't gonna do it this way. For overnight, it just... Wait a minute, Moon. What troubles are you talking about? Brasso and Tipple, I mean. What is it? Come on, speak up. It may be important. To who? To me and the law. The Baggett here. Maybe a girl who died a little ahead of her time. A girl who what? Hey, Mr. you talking in circles. Yeah, sure I am. And we don't have time for that, do we, Moon? Here, let go. Are you going to talk? Well? Okay, okay, I'll tell you. There's no international secret. Now, get your hands off of me. All right, we'll make it fast. The setup, what is it, Moon? Too much competition. Another produce outfit run by a guy named Mike. Uh, he, he's been picking Brasso's trucks off along U.S. 101 every other night. Sometimes it's a well-planned accident, and sometimes it's sloppy hijacking, but all this is trouble. Trouble Brasso can't prove, is that it? Yeah. That's the reason for Monty Stipple and the meeting right here. Stipple's supposed to get the proof for hey, Brasso. There's a guy going to the car next to mine. Oh, that's Brasso, Marlow, and like I said, I've had enough. For my dough, it's time to call the cops. Good luck, sucker. Dave Brasso was out in front by no more than 30 seconds, so as I ran toward my car on the wall of dust as high as it kicked up, I figured I had an even chance of catching up with him before he got back to Santa Monica and into heavy traffic. But I figured differently when I had one hand on the door of my car. I had to. Company said so. I'm holding a gun. Please don't move. 
She was standing someplace behind me, and when I did a toll, she moved around in a wide, careful arc until we faced each other across a chunk of dark night. It revealed only two things. One, she was holding a gun, and two, there was no mistaking her. This was a lady in black. Those car keys there in your hand. Throw them here, please. Now, wait a minute. I'm sure we can talk... Please, let me have them. Okay. Now what? Now, whoever you are, you can look for these when I hey, talk. Hey, well, listen. I don't want to be interfered with. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I get it. You're afraid something will jar the sale price you've set for Brasso, huh? Yep. What are you talking about? That ever-sinking routine known as blackmail. But to be very specific, a mystery witness, you, the lady in black, who almost gets to the police to tag a killer. Almost so she could scare said killer into a generous frame of mind when next they meet. In other words, baby, it was all an act of pressure play on Dave Brasso. Now it's time to collect. Do I go on? No, you don't. You just do as I say. You just turn around and walk. And think a little. Think about the pistol shots that you neglected to mention, which somebody took at me while I almost went to the police. Or did I do that myself? Also for the sake of Mr. Brasso's frame of mind. It's possible. I don't think so. Now go and start walking. You don't make much sense standing here. Then moved away from us. She backed off quickly toward a car that was nuzzling a high hitch near the far side of the roadhouse. So I knew that any move I intended to make had to be done right then and there. But she must have known just as much because that was when the gun she held got mad enough to start spitting my way. I dove for the gravel with my feet, then practically burrowed my way across a dozen uncomfortable yards of chopped rock to the shoulder of a line of trash cans. All of which left me scarred, safe, and in time to do nothing more effective than swear. I had a pair of teasing tail lights on a green sedan that were already winking out of sight. Didn't help much. <laughs> Detective again. Well, what's it this time? Bill Brasso simple as he in? No, he isn't. That's funny. No, I don't think so. I only think you're funny. The panic model. Uh, Moon and I have been watching you comb that gravel out there searching for the key. We couldn't catch the chatter, but she certainly made you look stupid. And just so you don't go on looking that way, don't bother playing so wide-eyed about Brasso being in here either. You see, I know you know he isn't. <laughs> it won't work, sonny boy. Maybe a little pressure will. Um, I doubt it. I don't bend easy, Marlowe. Also, I don't happen to know where Brasso went. But just so nobody gets too upset or quick with a gun, maybe we have to go back over to the bar to chat. Mm -hmm. Moon's expecting me. Besides, it's cozier there. It won't be once the cops start pouring in. Incidentally, it makes it your turn not to play dumb. Huh? I mean, Ernie Baggett being very dead out in the back. <laughs> Even Stephen. Hey, Marlowe. Yeah. Okay. I know about Baggett. From Brasso? I said I heard you. <sighs> nice night, hmm, Marlo. You know, Skipper, you're making a big mistake. Hmm? Why? Protecting Brasso can't pay off anymore. Well, you said I was protecting him. I worked for Dave Brasso, period. If he knocked off a couple of people, and I'm not saying he has, it's got nothing to do with me. What's done is done. Which doesn't include the girl, hmm? True. That witness? What's the difference? What happened to her? She's living on borrowed time right now, anyway, look at him. Why? Because of what she knows? No, no. Because of the way she handles what she knows. All that gab in the papers. Now, she's lucky those three shots that were thrown at her only came out of a pistol. Could have been a howitzer, considering the advance notice she gave. Hey, Moon. What? The cops here yet? No, they ain't. I will patrol take five minutes, ten minutes to go. I sure wish they'd get here. <laughs> well, don't worry, they will. Tell them I'm over Hey. Hey, private detective. Come out of it. What's up? Around here, sip or nothing. Nothing at all. Where are you going? To 77 Market Street. The Brasso Produce Company. I think it's where both your boss and the lady in black are going to get together. And what gives you that idea? A hunch, Stipple. Just a hunch. Goodbye. The Brasso Produce Company was a half a block of corrugated metal warehouse parked behind a wide loading ramp which at 2 a.m. bustled with enough noisy, fresh vegetable business to turn night into day. And when I was out of my car, clear of the whirling electric hand car, I was making my way in between sided leather crates toward a cage marked with stature. I kept wondering how a guy who built an outfit like this single-handed could have possibly made the mistake I figured was his. I stopped wondering when a face that had been stolen from a hawk pressed himself close to the inside of the cage and yelled at me. Well, what is it, mister? Talk up there. Will you? I'm busy here. Wait, please. Take 31 out now. Oh, that's 
Well, if there's nothing in the office, mister, I, I'm not sure where he is. I'm not sure. You are a cop? No, a private detective. With express account. Will five help? He just paid ten. Oh, let it ring. Come on, Buster, this counts. Here's ten. The lady in black? Yeah, yeah. Keep it down, will you? She stood around for maybe 20 minutes before she got talking to me. Not a bad-looking doll. All right, right, all right. Now, where'd you send her? Come on, you got your ten talk. Hang on just a minute. Where? The old shed in the back. Used to be a warehouse. They've got a real private office there. You'll probably catch up there if you run. I'll probably try. Thanks. Warehouse turned out to be an ugly huddle of parched cobbled teetering at the edge of a deserted cobblestone alley. And quietly dying of old age. And except for a flicker of light from an open door deep inside, it was as dark and as quiet as the lining of a frock coat. Until I stepped in and in front of a gun, it was no surprise. When I told you that I didn't want to be interfered with, I meant just that. Now, without shouting, who are you? For one thing, a private detective named Philip Marlowe. Another, a guy who's still working for Vera Hamlin. You, you were working for Vera? That's right, but not swinging in the dark. Which means what? That you never saw Vera Hamlin killed in the first place. And that all this lady in black razzle dazzle strictly a smokeout. Vera was my sister, Marlo. The letters told me all about Dave Brasso. About what he meant to her. About the runaround she was getting from him. So you added that to a phony hit and run accident and decided to pose as a surprise witness. So that Dave Brasso would try to pick you off and reveal himself as your sister's killer. If you live through it. Right. And now, Marlo, you'd... Marlo, quick. Get back. Brasso just turned that light off in there. He's coming out. And I'm going to meet him. No, don't. Look, listen. If you want to help stay where you are, keep quiet. Oh, brother. I'd better be right. She moved one slow step at a time toward the long, thin triangle of light the open warehouse door spilled across the sawdust flooring. I slid my 38 from shoulder holster to the right hand and the hair on the back of my neck started to crawl. And suddenly there was nothing to do but wait. You can stop right there, Mr. Brasso. Huh? Who's there? Who are you? A girl named Hamlin, Mr. Brasso. Friends with Hamlin. A girl who knows all about how my sister really is. It was only I a sudden splash of light that the room was taking it. It was a pistol raised and aimed at the back of Francis about. Hamlin's head. I was it was all the cure I needed. Stop it! Stop it! Stop shooting again! Stop shooting again! Come on, let him cook you, Brasso. Get out. Yeah, but he's harmless, honey. He and Stipple aren't on the same team as far as your sister's concerned. Did you hear that, Brasso? Yeah, I heard you, Marlo. Then Stipple killed my sister. Why, Marlowe? I don't know. He's the one to ask about that. All right. Why, Stipple? Dave, why did you do it? Dave, stay back. Why? Why? Uh, I did it because she caught me on my place, caught me talking to Mike Weber. You worked for Weber for the guy who was wrecking our business? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Dave, please. I didn't know what I was doing. She was going back to you to tell you what she saw. You lousy. Oh, no, you would be double crossing her. Oh, Dave. Hey, no. hey, that's enough. No. No, it isn't. Please, I've got something to finish. Well, now, the guy who was too good at this isn't even on the city payroll. He did all right tonight. Hey, the doc, oh, where Doc Matthews? Uh-oh. Lieutenant, how about the story? We're pushing our deadline on a bulldog at this Yeah, yeah, we work for daily papers, Matthews. You've been holed up in that warehouse with Marlo and that heavy for a half hour now. What is? Hey, how bad is Stipple's wound? Look, the wound is nothing. It's a scratch, although I wouldn't say it hurt. But the story, you'll have to wait until I'm down at headquarters. I haven't got it all myself. Oh, oh Lieutenant, you're kidding. Sure, I got lots of time for it. Listen, Abbott. Monty Stipple killed both Vera Hamlin and Ernie Baggett. Got he it. killed the lady because she finally was crooked, and he killed Baggett because he was afraid Baggett knew so much. Well, now, so long. Oh, but Lieutenant, Anna, tonight I got something less than love for the gentleman of the press. Hey, oh. Phil, come on. Miss Hamlin's over there. All right, look. Well, up before it's impossible for me to stay away from those dear boys any longer. Tell me, where did you run across the switch? I mean, what tag must be Stipple for? The mistake he made, Lieutenant, calling the shots when he was blindfolded. Or in other words, what? Matthews, I'm tired. Tomorrow, huh? No, 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 we can no, no, talk no, no, then. No, no. Come on, Frank. Oh, please. Okay. Well, it's something like this. Back at Moon's Point, Sybil told me how lucky the lady in black was. Only three shots were thrown at him. And he had no way of knowing how many shots had been thrown, huh? Yeah, a boy. Unless, of course, he threw them himself. Sure. Francis had a smoke-out plan, which was an inspiration to me, because... Knowing Stipple was a liar and proving it were two different things. So you led him to the warehouse, and while Miss Hamlin here guns for Brasso, Stipple guns for her. You're so right, and good night, Lieutenant Oh, no, Matthew. no, listen, Marlowe, I got Good night, you. Lieutenant. Okay, okay, good night, Phil. Good night, Lieutenant. Good night, Lieutenant. 
Thanks, Mama. And... And what? More questions? Uh-huh. But not under vital statistics. Oh. Uh, Marlo, one way or another, my crazy plan has worked, right? I guess so. Well, then tell me. Now that Stipple's caught and well, it's all over, am I supposed to feel good? I don't know, baby. Maybe that's what's so screwy about revenge. It's got all the permanence of a smoke ring, even when you're positive it's justified. Cigarette. <laughs> been dog-tired when it started. With fed up with a city and the aimless milling mob of shallow people. Always hungry for a buck that made it move. But now as I drove through the quiet, empty downtown streets and listened to Francis Hamilton talk about her sister, who had never been anything but nice, I stopped thinking about those money grubbers and thought instead about the ones like Vera. All the people all over the world who Sometimes get in trouble because other people won't realize the world is not for sale. Yeah. The Vera's are the ones to keep in mind. And that was when I decided that I was only tired, not whipped, not fed up. (laughs) All I needed was a good night's sleep. So I went home and got it. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lynn Allen, Barney Phillips, John Boehner, Jack Crucian, Polly Bear, Edgar Barrier, Byron Kane, Hugh Thomas, and Bill Raleigh. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oran. <laughs> Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time she had hair spun from a red sunset, skin as smooth as warm honey and a generous mouth that laughed without moving. She was beautiful, except for her cold green eyes. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Green Witch. Once upon a time, Halloween had been a day and a night on which mortal man had tiptoed over the face of the earth, holding cold hands with fear and starting at each new shadow which the harvest moon cast. There's still another twisted, grotesque goblin thirsting to drink dry a human soul. <laughs> I read that in a book once. Read something else, too. The Vigil of Hollow Mass is a genuine spook show. It definitely started downhill with the Romans, as did almost everything else. Until now, Halloween has come to mean gate stealing, trick or treat. And of course, the malpractice of soaping and chalking everything in sight. So today, unless you're really on your toes or under 12, and I'm neither, the 31st day of October, 1949, could easily have appeared as just that and no more until a worried man named John Bishop entered my office. I said trick or treat, and so he unfolded a $100 bill and came right to the point. Marlowe, four days ago, a man I once knew broke out of an Illinois prison. My testimony in court a year ago sent him to that prison. Now, I'm afraid he's coming after me for revenge. Uh, His name is Dale Estes, and I want you to protect me from him. Is he here in L.A., Mr. Bishop? Uh, I'm not certain. However, this morning, a friend of mine told me of a man in a shabby brown tweed suit who asked about me, but wouldn't identify himself. That's all the description he could give. But uh, here, Mr. Morrow, here's a picture of Dale Estes. It was in last Thursday's paper. Uh It's a prison identification picture. When you change the clothes and remove the number, it doesn't leave much. Uh, no. But... Tell me, Mr. Bishop, what do you want me to do? I want you to locate this man, Estes, and keep him from killing him. Police will do that for nothing. Uh, yeah, nothing plus a lot of noisy publicity, yeah. and I don't want. 
Because in the first place, it won't help my real estate business any. And also, I... Well, I... It's somebody you'd rather not have worrying about you, maybe. Uh, yes. Madeline Hughes, my fiancée. Mm -hmm. uh, please, Mr. Marlowe, will you try to find Estes at once? Uh, as soon as possible. Before tonight. Why? What happens then? Our masquerade. The Pacific Palisades Country Club. It's um, a lonely spot out there. Well, why go to the masquerade? Because if I didn't, Madeline would know there was something wrong. She'd worry, and I'd defeat my purpose. Mm. Now, Mr. Marlowe, all I can give you to go on are three things. First, Dale Estes was once an able-bodied seaman. Second, he likes Spanish food. He could eat it three times a day. And third, he'd gladly give up both to watch a prize fight. He'll kill me, Mr. Marlowe. I know he will. <laughs> Maybe the magic of Halloween night has something to do with it. I don't know. But when I started looking for an escaped convict who might possibly be someplace in the sprawling city of Los Angeles with murder on his mind, things began to change. First, it were ten-year-old girls prancing around in their mother's high heels, lipstick, and affectations. Then, gangling boys screaming home from school via the great mischief rough. <laughs> that much was fun. Then it got dark everywhere. The kids went home and took their laughter with them. And I went looking for Dale Essie. I seemed to meet people who wore everyday faces that I was sure could be masked. People like the old lady who ran a Spanish restaurant located off a crooked alley below the street level. It started with her at the entrance to a damp, cold cave. No. No, senor. I did not ever see any man like that picture. But if I were you, I would look for him no further. There is death. In his face, Senor. I know. <laughs> and there it got worse until, in my imagination, even the scarred, brute face on the sweating hulk in the distant, dusty corner of the third gymnasium I tried seemed to belong less to a 20th century man and more to a prehistoric brute out of some dark, long ago jungle. Nah, nobody like that ain't been watching me today. Nobody ain't been watching me at all for as long as I can remember. And finally, after two hours along the Santa Monica fishing piers, a hundred withered pounds of ancient mariners staring out to sea had more to say. Yes. Yes, I know Estes. Estes was standing next to me when the boiler exploded that night off New South Wales. He was killed. But I told the skipper all about that once already. His name was F.C. too. And so was the first mate, Dale F.C. Everybody's name is F.C. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bishop. I haven't run across any... Uh, Hello, listen. He's been seen again. Estes. What? Yes. Or at least a man in a shabby brown tweed. This time near my office. Uh, Marlowe, get over to 3130 North Havenhurst Drive as soon as you can. 3130, huh? Uh, yes, it's a costumer shop. Alberto Zingaro. Zingaro. I'll meet you there. Goodbye. Bye. Alberto Zingaro, customer, had at least a tangible name and occupation. His shop was tattered on in grimy windows and scarred wooden doors. All immodestly marked with the proprietor's name in handsome twelve-inch high gold lettered, with a card dangling from the front doorknob reading, "Back in ten minutes, Mr. Alberto Zingaro." There was nothing left for me to do but wait, until from some place within arm's reach the conversation was declared open. You have a match, please. Yeah, I guess so. <clears throat> Here. When I raised the cup, flame toward a smiling face, sporting a mid-July sunburn topped by blonde crew-cut hair. I got ready for trouble. It never came. Thank you. Good night. Uh huh. Keep the change, though. Marlowe? Yeah. Uh, Marlowe, uh, is that Mr. Zingaro going off? No, uh, just a guy out of matches. Oh. Oh. Well, I wonder where Zingaro is. He said everything would be ready and waiting for both of us. 
Me is Mephistopheles and you. Uh, are... Just a minute. We said nothing about me going to that masquerade, Mr. Bishop. Not a word. Uh, Mr. Marlowe, please. I'm sure Estes is going to try to get me tonight. Uh, yeah, I know, but when you want... Gentlemen, good evening. I'm sorry to be late, but there was a costume that had to be delivered. Uh, Mr. Zingara, this is Mr. Marlowe, the gentleman I called about. Oh, yes. Uh, you'll be able to fit him all right. Uh, I don't know. It depends, Mr. Bishop. On whether or not I'll stand still. Oh, uh, Marlowe, please. Now, I'll, I'll pay you anything. I know, but I... Okay. Fine. Wonderful. Uh, Zingaro, open the door. I am, I am. Now, where is that light switch? Oh, yes. There. And now, here is your costume. This, this is uh, my costume? Yes, yes, yes. You like it? You do. Oh, no. No, I, it's pretty grotesque, even for Mephistopheles. Uh, beast with wings? My uh, finest creation. It will surely bring you the first prize at the masquerade. A fiery bear's head, horns and all. It is as false for the devil, the lord of darkness. And look, hunched high on your back, a black wing. You pull this cord here, and the wing flap. And uh, as for you, Mr. Marlowe, oh, let me think. There's something you can whip up quickly, Zingo. Now, uh, look, Marlowe, I'd appreciate it if you'd stop on your way to the club and pick up Madeline. The shoes, your fiancé? Uh, yes, pick her up at my place. 2341, Uh, state law. 2341. Gentlemen, I have just the thing. Today, Mr. Marlowe. Tonight, Count Alessandro Cagliostro, 18th century imposter, criminal, and lover par excellence. That's me. All in all, it was another hour, and I was just about rid of the afterglow of today's goblin when... I finally pulled up and parked in front of John Bishop's neat redwood and glass square in suburban Pacific Palisades. When I was out of my car and walking toward the thin stream of light that leaked out of the front door, which was open inches, the Halloween goblins started coming back fast. They whispered to me of what I might find across the threshold ahead. It took only a fingertip to weave the door open. Then inside, in the middle of the living room floor, a framed picture of a girl face up. The glass over it smashed into a huge starburst, and around the edges, a trickle of blood. Ah, but the girl was beautiful. Hair spun from a red sunset. Skin as smooth as warm honey. A generous mouth that laughed without moving. Beautiful. Except for her eyes. They were green. The green emeralds, clear and wide and deep. They laughed, too. But the sound you felt somehow wasn't nice. You approve, Mr. Marlowe? Mr. Marlowe? Eh? Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, forgive me. It's uh, the first time I've seen a, a green witch. <laughs> oh. Well, it's Halloween, remember? Yeah. Of course, I know I'm missing the black dark teeth and the bushy eyes. My sister, what happened to her? Oh, it's probably the wind. What? But if I may, Count Alessandro Cagliostro awaits your pleasure. Oh, oh, Count Alessandro. Oh. Oh, that's you. Yeah, that's me. Oh, how nice. And uh, how handsome for so bad a man. All John said was you were an old friend. Your arm, please, Count dear. The green witch is ready. Do we drive or fly? <laughs> Satan himself couldn't have done a better job in the West Palisades Country Club. The building, which was long and pasted too close to the edge of the cliff that plummeted 200 abrupt feet to the churning sea below, was flooded in a sickly green light. While skeletons in the trees, hanging in the restless wind by the narrow neck, danced a shadowy jig to the accompaniment of the crashing surf. A long, narrow path which ran along the cliff's edge leading to the Country Club entrance was labeled Dead Man's Walk and every 50 feet a life-sized dummy of an infamous man perched on the balustrade and stared blindly out to sea. Somehow, you couldn't quite laugh. However, inside, life was more pleasant. The lights were brighter, the costumes five parts fun to each part fear, and Madeline was a little prettier than possible. And when she marched me up to a grand dame who was dressed as Marie Antoinette, but who was wide enough to have also passed for four of the ladies in waiting, I couldn't make my eyes let go. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, Your Excellency. As a lady of the section committee, 
I welcome you to our club. I said I welcome you to our club. Hello? Oh, excuse me. I mean, thank you. I, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I was looking for a friend, a, a beast with wings. Oh, oh, that one. John's over there near the punch bowl. That's oh, the oh, Over there, a giant-sized rum bottle for a costume. <laughs> Quite appropriate, my dear. The only demon the gentleman on the inside knows is rum, believe me. And if it only... Oh, pardon me. You punish. <laughs> no wonder Marie Antoinette was executed. Hmm. Hey, look. Still that man in armor, the one with the hump on his back, heading for the veranda. He's a heavy too. Uh-huh. Gentleman's the notorious Duke of, um, Gloucester. Most historical heel. Mm, looks perfectly ridiculous with that beach boy complexion. Yeah. And crew cut. Madeline, uh, you haven't potted your nose yet, huh? Mm, but it doesn't need it. Oh, yes, it does. Honest, honey, besides, I need a breath of fresh air. <laughs> I feel faint. Oh, mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, all around the town. If I fall down and break my crown, I'll... I, I'll bet I'll ever spill a drop. <laughs> it doesn't rhyme. No, no. Hello. How are you? It is not. I just fell down and broke my crown. What? No, 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 no. Say, Duke. Uh, yeah? Hey, Duke, I'd like to talk to you a moment, please. What? Talk to me? Uh, who are you? I can't tell. Your mask pretty good. Quite deceptive. Yeah, well, maybe I can help you. For one thing, I'm an international villain of sorts, but another, just a nice run-of-the-mill guy. The kind who'd never refuse a stranger a life, remember? What? Oh, are you the guy? Uh... Yeah, the guy you asked for a light when he was standing in front of Albert Zingaro's costume shop. And before you can start talking about a smaller world we live in or start lying about how natural your appearance was there, let's have the truth. Come on, Tin Pants. Was it because of Dale Estes? Dale Estes? I... Uh-uh, you slipped. All right. What's the difference? Yes, it was because of Estes. I know that he's an escaped convict. I also know he's the one way I can get Madeline away from that worthless Mr., shall I say, Bishop? Or would you prefer the full name, John Estes? Bishop and Estes are related? Yeah, like in Brothers. Oh. Thanks, Duke. I'm much obliged. Hold on. Where do you think you're going? Keep your hands off, Iron Man. Your face is hanging out, you know. You'll not interfere. Not if I have... Get your hands off! When I dropped the Duke of Gloucester, his face twisted and hurt surprised, and his suit of phony armor landed on a flagstone path like a truckload of tin cans with him in the middle. He was still clanking as I left him and went back to the ballroom where I spotted my client. A beast with wings at the punch bowl again, making himself even more hideous looking by pouring punch down a slit in his neck under a long paper mache chin. When I got close enough to speak his name, he spun toward me like I'd stuck a pin in him. What? Uh, what, uh, what do you want? Hey, you're getting pretty jumpy, Bishop. You better take it easy. Uh, I'll say you're getting a little thick tongue. Don't you think you're riding the punch bowl too hard? That's really none of your business, is it? Certainly is. This is my business, too. You hired me to protect you against their lefties. But you didn't say one word about Estes being your brother. How about it? Well, um, I didn't think it was necessary. How'd you find out? I'm your sunburn friend with a crew cut, a hunchback, and armor. Oh? He's been checking up on you because he doesn't think you're worthy of Madeline. Oh, that's so. Mm-hmm. Where's Madeline now? I think a broom saddle, maybe. I don't know. Broom? Oh. Oh, yeah. I better go find her. Now, listen, I think things are going to be all right. You can take it easier from now on. What gives you that idea, Bishop? Well, nothing's happened so far. Maybe nothing will. I'll check with you later. <laughs> oh, oh, don't tell your story. I simply must tell you. It's a scream. Now, Beth, what's got your funny bone, Marie? <laughs> well, sorry there. The bottle, you know, a demon rock. Uh-huh. Well, he just told me that one of our wax statues out of the terrace is bleeding. Oh, is that terrific? Yeah. Oh, it's being loaded. I saw now, nobody believes me, but I'll tell you anyway. It's bleeding, real blood, too, and that, that's too much. It's all right to have decorations, but using real blood is going too far. Well, you're going too far, Harry, with the punch as usual. You better leave it alone, and God will get you before the other... No, no, wait, 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 wait. No, nobody believes me. I just... Hey, you, you believe me, pal. Got a wax tummy bleeding? Not really, Harry. Well, you should, because I saw it. The one way down at the end, by, by the stairs. The one in the brown blue suit. 
bleeding real blood out of a gash in brown the chest. Brown tweed suit. Oh, it was dreadful. Wait I a minute. Did you for... say brown tweed suit? Did I say brown tweed Yeah, brown tweed suit. Yeah, but that's nothing. The real blood is the important thing. Hey, you, you believe me? Yeah, come on. Okay, come on. It's right over there, pal. Behind those bushes over there. Come on, you see. Nobody believe me when I, I do it. Well, where is it? Hey, I'll... Hey, it's gone somebody when I moved it on me. Oh, no. Oh, listen, listen, it was right here, popped up against the railing. It had a hat pulled down over his face, but I could see the gash in his neck from the light there on the top of the stairs. Right, come on, Harry, let's get... Hey, wait a minute, Bottle, you can be right. Well, what do you mean? What's There's blood here on the rail. Look, tell me, do those stairs go all the way down to the water? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, but it's an awful climb. But in 200 feet, there's a little boat landing down there. Well, I guess there's, there's more than that down there now, Harry boy. The bottle of rum stared at me out of the peak holes in his label until I started down. Then he insisted on following. The stairs chopped from solid rock along a natural path that wound over the face of the cliff were steep and rough and slick from wisps of fog that moved me quickly across them like wet, nervous fingers. But the bottle behind me was enchanted just enough to slip and skid with every step and still managed to keep his footing. Halfway down, we saw a crumpled hat, only a teeth of what we found at the bottom and the winking yellow light of the lamp on the boat landing. He had struck on his face after plunging down 200 battering feet of jagged cliff. All that was left of the man in a brown tweed suit. The rum bottle costume beside me was still intact. But the little man inside of his liquor was wearing thin was beginning to come apart. <laughs> that's real funny. <laughs> Some joke on the rest of them all, because that's no wax dummy, man. <laughs> oh, hey, that's, that's a real man. It was a man. Oh, I don't feel very well. Put yourself well. together and give me a match. Yeah, yeah. boy. Yeah. A fall like that can do a lot to a man's face. Hey, hey, this guy looks familiar to me. Well, from the back here, he looks like John Bishop. He should. It's his brother. I wonder if Bishop figured things would be okay from now on. Huh? What are you... Hold what it, hold it. Listen. What, what's the matter? I didn't Shut know. up, will you? I didn't hear. Yeah, somebody's coming down the stairs. Get over there out of sight and keep quiet. As I made to the foot of the stairs, I looked up in time to see a hunchback monster in armor, half hidden in the writhing yellow mist, stuck back from the edge. He eased himself down the stairs. It was the Duke of Gloucester again asking for another punch on his front pan jaw. So I took the slippery steps two at a time as far as the first blind corner where I found out that he beat me to it. Oh, oh that even the stop, mister. Not for long, bud. Shake your head next time. I knew you meant trouble. Now I know what kind. That's enough out of you. Stand still. What? A gun. I know you don't. You killer. Sudden lunch in the dark caught me off guard, and my 38 went spinning away into the night. He turned and ran. The fog in the night coupled with a useless three-minute search for my gun was all he needed. By the time I got up to the clubhouse terrace again, the Duke was gone. I was met instead by the ever merry Marie Antoinette, only this time without giggles. What is going on out here anyway? Funny, baby. Did you see that phony hunchback, the Duke of Gloucester? See him? Oh, I certainly did. Oh? He practically ran over me, shouting something about a phone call. Oh, when I see that group right Where'd he go? Out. Inside? Don't you boys know it's dangerous? Later, baby, later. Right now, I want to know. Hey, wait a minute. That bracelet there on your wrist, where'd you get it? It's the band of the ladies auxiliary of the West Palisade Minutemen. The what? The City Settlement Club. Look, do, do all members have a thing like that? Of course. It's got the club crest on it here. The ladies have bracelets, and the men... I know what the men wear. I just saw one. And if it means anything like I think it does, I'd better find Madeline Hughes, but fast. Have you seen her? Madeline? Well, now, let me see. Yeah, she's oh, the witch, the witch, the green oh, witch. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, the last time I saw her, she was walking down toward the fountain with that wonderfully horrible Mephistopheles. Oh, she and John Bishop, Bishop are a perfect couple tonight, don't you think? But I think right now would scare you cross-eyed, sister, but thanks for the tip. I'll see you. past the row of wax stools, guarding the terrace railing and over to the gate where the flagstone path started. And I walked as fast as I could without stirring up echoes, down into the little sheltered alcove where the fountain was. There I saw them standing close together beside a pale marble bench, half hidden in the shadows. A beautiful green-eyed witch and a horned nightmare with huge, leathery wings hulking over Will you listen to me? John, Bishop, you're drunk. I've never seen you like this before. Well, I've got reasons. Dale is here in town right now. What? Yes. That means one thing. He's found out about us. 
He knows what we did to him. Wait a minute. I didn't lie in court about him. You did. But you didn't object when you found out. Instead, you celebrated by getting engaged to me. All right, John. Are you sorry? I said it the way I saw it. I've got me to worry about. But he went to prison with the idea that you loved him, Madeline. In fact, he was trying to get his hands on enough money to keep you happy when the cops caught him. Okay, I'm expensive. If he couldn't afford me, that's his problem. And his love, Madeline. Whose problem was that? John. John, what are you doing? John. I'm not John, what? Madeline. I've already taken care of John. I'm Dale. Oh. And you really are a witch, Madeline. So I'm going to strangle the life out of you like you did me. Hey, now, Effie. Huh? Uh, stay back, you. Take one more step and I'll plug you. Just a laugh, Effie, because it won't be any good. You're trapped here. Yeah, well, I'm going to get you, Nosy. And then her. And after that, all I got to do is walk across the dance floor in there and out the front door. And in this rig, I won't even be noticed. You won't make it, sucker? No. <laughs> well, drop, will you? Your gun jam, sucker. Now what? Are you lousy? Here. Take it. Oh. My shoulder and arm went numb from the bullet. And I could feel my shirt front getting warm and sticky as I tried to follow him. But the flagstone pass was ten miles long. And my legs were melting. I saw him go to the ballroom door and I made it over to the side of the building for support. But I knew I'd never catch him. I looked in the window and I saw him start across the floor. A garish horned beast with wings shoving his way to freedom. A milling mob of prancing demons. I was passing out. I knew it. I tried to yell to stop him. But the crowd inside was going crazy. Laughing and cavorting around the beast with wings. Clawing at him. Holding him. Shoving him back to the door. I saw him fighting and then go down as a horde of screaming creatures closed over him. And then everything went black. out in the terrace before the dance began. He traded his brown tweed suit for Bishop's Mephistopheles costume so he could move around inside. Yeah, that's right. Thomas was caught there by little Harry, the rum bottle, remember? Mm-hmm. But when the coast was clear, Esty threw the body over the cliff and went in to dance in Bishop's Mephistopheles costume. Fine Madeline, yeah. Now, look, I know this already, but after he shot me, he was a cinch to escape. That's where it gets fuzzy. What happened then? Brother, as handsome a piece of irony as I've ever seen. The Mephistopheles costume that Bishop wore. Don't tell me. Yeah. Well, first prize. That's all. The crowd wouldn't let Estes leave until he received the award and unmanned. Oh, it's quite a scene. Police I called when I thought you were a killer showed up to take him away. Then we found you and Madeline out on the terrace and brought you here. And a happy Halloween to you, too. How's Madeline? Fine, thanks to your efforts. She's waiting outside now. I'll send her in, huh? Mm. He's awake now, Madeline. Oh, okay. Uh, don't wait for me, Bruce. Oh. Hello, handsome. Hello, beautiful. Your throat's bruised. Yeah, it could have been worse. You figured it out just in time. Uh, Dale even had me fooled. His voice was so good. How'd you manage it? Yeah, the corpse was wearing a wristwatch band from the Palisades Minuteman Club. It gave me the switch. And I knew it was Dale in the costume. I figured his only reason for impersonating his brother would be... And he didn't even have a gun when you cut in on him. That took a lot of nerve, handsome. Well, don't mention it. Uh, where'd you get the license you leave? Not so fast. You heard some pretty bad things about me tonight, and probably thought up a few of your very own. Matter of fact, I did. You got that kind of face. You cast spells. Gotta be careful with it, baby. Now, uh, will you catch the lights on your way out, please? Wait I, I... a minute. I'm going to tell you something, too. I've been sent scared in the middle of the night, and I've been thinking things are going to be different from now on. Yeah? Who's next, Bruce Wiley? 
I haven't decided. But whoever he is, Marlo, he'll be the only one, and he'll know exactly where he is. Does that help? Mm. I'll have to see it happen first, baby. Okay. I'm going away for a while, but I'll be back. Watch for me next Halloween. Yeah, would you touch your light light on the way out? When Madeline left, sleep left with her. I got out of bed, went over to the window, and looked out. The sky and the ocean were still dark. But over in the east, the first glow of dawn was starting on the horizon. And the goblins flew screaming into the mist until next Halloween. At that moment, something moved across the fading moon. Something that looked very much like a beautiful witch with hair red as a sunset and cold green eyes. And then, then I saw something else on the white sand of the beach. A discarded witch's costume in green, and beyond it, just for a moment, I thought I saw Madeline leaning against the rock and looking out to sea. I never found out if it was Madeline or not. Because then the sun came up. And she and the costume and the light were gone. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Eve McVeigh, John Daner, Paul Fries. J- get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. There was a broken body in a quiet house, gunplay on a merry-go-round at midnight, and a boy and a girl in love running away, all because of one man's fine Italian hand. <laughs> From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starring as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Fine Italian Hand. Laughter hiding heartbreak, a woman dying of loneliness in an overcrowded city, a man who sacrificed everything to make a fortune and shot himself when he got it. The messed up byproducts of our hopped up civilization. The thought of them stayed in my mind as I drove over the freeway to San Fernando Valley because the job I was on promised no change in the day's pattern of combining things that didn't belong together. When I parked at the corner of Magnolia and Van Nuys Boulevard, I was still trying to reconcile my new client, the owner and operator of a little amusement park for children, with a panicky voice on the phone that had begged me to come at once. It wasn't hard to spot. A heavy-set old man moving among the stampeding merry-go-round stallions and picking crumpled tickets like plums from the fists of laughing kids grabbing for brass rings. We never change, do we? When he saw me, he hopped off. Please, please, take off me. Take off me. You, Mr. Marlowe, maybe? That's right, Mr. D'Angelo. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, come with this way to my little office. Right. We've got to talk right away. No time to waste. Oh, oh, that's a nice little boy. I'm very proud of you. Now, you take your free ride with Nick. i got to talk from the business. Goodbye. Come in, Mr. Marlowe. Please, uh, sit down. Thanks. Mr. Marlowe, I'm a very worried man. Yeah, I know about your son you said on the phone. What sort of trouble is he in, Mr. D'Angelo? He's a good boy, my Bernardo. He's been to college. He's a veteran from the war with two bronze stars and a purple heart. <laughs> Look, there's his picture in his uniform. Ah. He's a good boy. Sure, sure. Now he's in a jam, is that it? Yeah. He's in a jam with a gambler. A man named Safran. You know this man? 
Yeah, slightly. Frank Saffron's a bad boy. Did you send over money or what? No, 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 no. My boy no throw his money away like that. No. It's about a girl. Oh. Which way does it go? She's Saffron's girl and Bernardo's making a play for her? That's or... right. That's right. This girl belonged to the gambler, and my boy is taking her out. Oh, fine. He won't tell me nothing. I find out just the same. Maybe he's just playing the big shot. And maybe he really loses his heart. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But it's gone too far. Now there's a trouble. My boy's going to be killed, or he's going to kill somebody. And I don't know what to do. Well, what makes you think it's gone that far, Mr. D'Angelo? Maybe Saffron will just get tough and scare Bernardo off, huh? Scare off? No, no, Mr. Marlowe. My boy don't scare off. He's a pretty tough. He's a champion with the golden glove. Really? Yes. But tonight, that no help him. Bernardo come home tonight with his face all beat up. He won't tell his papa nothing. All he says is that the red-faced dog, I'm going to get even, I'm going to kill him. He's just a crazy man. My Bernard, he, he won't listen to me. He push me away and he go out again. Red thing. Doesn't fit Saffron. You sure he was the one who had your son beat up? Oh, sure, of course. Who else? Mm. And just because of this dancer, this Paula. I don't even know her last name. Paula, huh? Yeah. What do you think I can do about this, Mr. D'Angelo? Chase Bernardo down and bring him home? No, no, that's no good. My Bernard, he's too, too headstrong. No, Mr. Marlowe, I must find out something. I must find out if this girl is using my boy for a plaything or if she's really in love with him. What difference does that make with Saffron? Well, if this girl really loves my boy, then I'll do anything to bring them together. Anything. Now, if this is only a game she plays, then... What does that mean, Pop? Oh, that, that means if it goes that way, that's the way it goes. Uh-huh. And I know what I got to do. So you find out this for me, please. Well, I don't know, Pop. It's not the kind of thing I like. Look, I... look I'm not asking you to spy on somebody. Just to find out for me. I can't talk so good. My, with you, it's not so hard. I know, Pop, but please, really. Please, please. My boy's and mama die, and now Bernardo's all I got to let. He's a good boy. He should not get into trouble just for a cheap game of love. Don't you understand me? I understood. And from what I knew of Frank Saffron, he had plenty to worry about with a hot-headed son who didn't know when to quit. Or maybe it was Saffron who didn't know when to quit. That thought plus the 50 bucks in advance sold me. Mr. D'Angelo gave me a description of the girl he'd seen, but once told me that Bernardo had moved away from home, he didn't know where. That the park closed at 10 and that he'd be there all night, and that was all. My first step was to locate the dancer named Paula. So outside, I said nickel to a phone until I called everything from ballet to burlesque. But got no Paula, which left only Frank Saffron's easy money mill. It was a ranch house, California style, tucked under the hills south of Ventura, on a dead end called Sunburst. After I got the nod at the peekaboo window, I wandered through the bar and past the dice table to the door at back marked private and went in. A tuxedoed rock yeah. pile with a boiled lobster yeah, complexion frowned up at me from the telephone as he Listen, talked and waggled a thick, hairy go. finger. So I took the hint and waited quietly for him to finish. The whole thing over again. I don't care if it takes you a week. This joint don't soak up no five grand shortages. You guys find it. Goodbye. Well, what's on your mind, Toots? I don't seem to remember you being announced. It isn't a formal call. I'm just looking for an old friend. We don't have any old friends to spare, Toots. That figures. Mine's Paula. She's a dancer. I understand that Mr. Saffron knows her quite well. He might tell me where I can get in touch with her, huh? Oh, so you're a friend of Paula Baker's, huh? Yeah, that's right. From way back. Well, that's all, Toots. You're through. Her name's not Baker. That came right out of thin air. Now, what do you really want? Take it easy, boy. She just caged you with last names. That's all. She gave us Joan. Who's that? The Duncan Department Store, credit section. 300 bucks worth. I got this far in her references, and I want to see Mr. Saffron. Well, he's not in. I'll take it up with him later. If it's worth his time, you'll hear from us. Take it easy on yourself, Max. Just tell me where I can find it. Out that door there. You got the whole city to look in. And take your crummy business. Okay, okay. Go okay. on, no, you're blow. Pushing. Hey. Hey, blushing boy. One thing more. Yeah. What's your name? I want to get it straight when I think I've done it. <laughs> 
But though it wasn't a total loss, I'd managed to keep the back door open long enough to snap off the night latch. And I'd met the red-faced man who no doubt supervised the beating Bernardo had taken earlier. I kicked plenty of noise out of the iron steps going down, and then I crossed the parking lot, leaned back against the wall, and waited. Halfway through my first cigarette bunker came out, got in his car, and drove away. I watched him out of sight. Then slipped back in quietly, located Saffron's 8x12 desk, and started through it. In the top drawer, I found first a letter with a gambler's home address on it. And under that, a picture. One of smiling lovelies posed in front of a dance studio on Wilshire. She wore a Paula's description like a snug pair of slacks, and dance instruction was a field in the fine art of hoping that I'd overlooked completely. I closed the drawer and started out when I heard someone coming. I jammed my cigarette into the ashtray and ducked back against the door frame as the cleaning woman bustled in. Smoldering cigarette butt. <laughs> the wonder this trap don't burn to the ground. Hey, somebody's been in here. Hold it quiet, baby. Shut up and I'll let you have some air again. Is it a deal? Okay. Hey, you don't belong here, mister. Neither do you, beautiful. Let's forget we saw each other, huh? Look, I'm a trusted employee uh, here. Silence is golden. How golden? Five bucks worth. And if I hear one peep out of you before I get out of here, I'll come back someday and put glue in your soap bottles. <laughs> Goodbye, baby. The dance studio was presently glossy from a social modernistic facade on Wilshire Boulevard to its far from old-fashioned receptionist inside, who signed me up, expressed sympathy over my rusty rumber, and assured me that since I'd heard so much about her... I could have Paula, that is, Miss Calvin, while on duty as my instructress, if I'd only be so kind as to step this way. So I stepped this way, into a ballroom with a black burnished floor that looked as deep as the night sky, and after a deft hand signal from the receptionist, Paula Calvin glided toward us. Introductions were made. How do you do? And suddenly, the room was filled with the soft beat of a rumba band, and we were off. <laughs> Rusty or not, it would have been fun. If I hadn't had work to do, that part was tough. You're doing beautifully, Mr. Marlowe. Just loosen up now and relax, huh? Yeah, I'll try. I'm glad I drew you as my instructor, Miss Calvin. Mm -hmm. Bernie said you were top. Told me to insist on you and accept no substitute. Bernie? Uh-huh. D'Angelo. You remember him, don't you? Yes. Yes, of course I remember him. Nice guy, Bernie. Good kid. Don't you think so? Uh, keep your feet a little closer together, Mr. Marlowe. Don't be afraid to use your knees. You know, baby, Bernie's got everything. Look, brains, even a temper, just to keep life interesting. Isn't that right, Paula? Guy thinks a lot of you, doesn't he? Hey, I'm talking I to you. I heard you. The next question, I suppose, is how do I feel about him? Yeah. Now it's your turn to loosen up and relax, baby. Listen, I resent being checked up on by anybody. When I want Bernie D'Angelo to know how I feel, I'll tell him. And when I want Frank Saffron to know, I'll tell him too. If you came here tonight for a rumba lesson, and I'm old Mother Hubbard. Okay, Mother Hubbard. I want to find out one thing. Are you in love with Bernie D'Angelo? That's nobody's business but mine, mister. You could be real wrong about that, baby. Then it's my mistake that I'll make it all by myself, huh? Have you seen Bernie tonight? No, I haven't. And that's all the conversation you get. You can have the rest of your room, though, if you want it. No, thanks. I'll see you around, Paula. <laughs> Next best bet for finding what my client wanted was a talk with Saffron. I stopped and called his gambling client, but he was still out. So I drove up into Coldwater Canyon to number 8100. The first real hint that something was wrong was a curtain dangling at a crazy angle over one of the lighted windows. Next it was the front door, standing six inches open, and inside, the legs of an overturned table sticking up in the air, and then pieces of a broken lamp littering the floor. That was only the beginning. I nudged the door open and stepped in. It was a mess. I saw his feet first from behind the couch. 
Billy took one glance at his face. Frank Stefflin had been literally beaten to death by a pair of very fast, very deadly fists. Don't move one inch, Jocko. Do I take three guesses or turn around and look? Bernardo with gun. Oh, I got it all right. It was his. Automatic, caliber 45, and I'll use it if I have to. Who are you? Name's Marlowe. One of Saffron's boys? You got a real talent for being wrong, haven't you, kid? Who are you? A private detective hired by one Ambrosio D'Angelo. Papa? Yeah. Because he was worried sick about his boy. But I told him to stay out of it. I told him it was my business. And you did a nice, thorough job of handling it. You did this, didn't you? Yeah. Saffron had it coming to him. I was beat up tonight on his orders. I came here to pay him back, but I didn't intend to kill him. Well, what'd you stick around for? I didn't stay around. He looked to me like he's been dead over an hour. I left, then I got worried, and I came back just a few minutes yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, I... I know. You found out he was dead, huh? Well, I guess I better call I the guess police. you better stand still. If you're really working for my old man, if you really want to help him, the best thing you can do is to get out of here and shut up about this until tomorrow morning. I don't work that way, kid. I'm going to call your old man and the police. And we're going to sit here until they show up. You won't give me a break. Not that kind. If you run, you haven't got a chance. We'll just have to see about that. I'm sorry it turned out this way, but it didn't. I got a lot of things to do. So take your ethics, Marlowe, and sleep on them. Oh, hurry, hurry, don't run. Come back. Just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, with thousands of dollars of wonderful prizes, Sing It Again is fun for the whole family to play. Make a date to listen over most of these CBS stations every Saturday night. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Fine Italian Hand. Turned out to be second floor rear, and all that went with it. 
From the south landlady to the very public payphone to the faint line of naked, unfrosted light bulbs. So weak to disturb the shadows in the corridor. Plus, of course, the unhappy marriage of a half a dozen distinct cooking odors sneaking out of the transoms of as many rooms where cooking was strictly prohibited. Bernie had room nine at the end of the L-shaped hall. And when I turned and started for his door, I was glad to see yellow light oozing out of the cracks. And to hear a tinny phonograph making not so grand, grand opera. When I knocked, I did it with a barrel of my 38. Yeah? Who is it? Connor! You better turn that phonograph down. We can't hear ourselves think out here. Okay, I'll take care of it. Goodbye. Not so fast, Junior. Take care of it now. I don't want to have to come out here again. It'll make me feel nasty. Does that come across? Yeah, real clear. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, Ma, don't get back all the way. Cut it off. Quit shoving. Go. Quit shoving. What do you want with me? Conversation for a starter. Turn that thing off. Now, we're going to talk, Bernie. About what? Not my old man again. That's a waste of time. What's done is done, Marlowe. You know that. Yeah, and I also know you'll never get any place running. Unless we try real hard. Don't turn around, Marlowe. Oh, fine. Madame Lazanga. Take his gun, Bernie. Throw it over there. Yeah. If you please, Mr. Connor. How stupid did you think we were, Marlowe? Or had you forgotten all about Paula here? No, I hadn't forgotten. Just figured she might be on the other side. Then you figured wrong because there's never been any other side. Never been anybody but Bernie from the moment we met. Which is why you kept dating Frank Saffron? Which is exactly why I kept dating Frank Saffron. I didn't want him jealous and gunning for Bernie. I didn't want trouble. Mm. Now that you got it, you don't want to let it go, is that it? What do you mean, Marlowe? Yeah, I mean if you turn yourself in now tonight, there's still a chance you'll get off easy. Yeah, and a better chance that he won't. All right. But even then, it'll only be manslaughter, prison for a few years. This way, it's got to be worse. Hide and seek from here on out for both of you right up to the end. No matter when that is. Look, honey, maybe No, Marlo... maybes, Bernie. I don't want you rotting away in jail and me rotting away on the outside because you accidentally killed Frank Saffron. Now, come on, Bernie. Let's get out of here. Put him in this closet here. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, look, Marlo, if you, if you do go back to Pop, tell him I wish it had been different, will you? Why? We can eat his heart out a little more? No dice, kid. Shut the door. The sight of you is making me sick. Okay, fella. Shut it in. And shut it in. Best had been swinging wild, hoping that a lucky punch, no matter how low, would connect and jar some sense back into the kid. But it would play differently, and as I started to kick the lock on the closet door... I knew now that Bernie D'Angelo resented me and probably his father along with the rest of the world that it wouldn't give him an even break. All in all, it was the kind of thing that made me mad enough to do the trick! Well, that's a fine way to treat a house. What's the matter? A handsome or fight over the girl or don't you like the way the furniture's arranged? Which? Neither. Before you get too upset about this land lady, I'll cut you in on something. Hmm. A minute after I get to your phone, every cop in town is going to be looking for your star border. Because tonight, Bernie D'Angelo killed a man. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with the stuff you've wrecked. Come on, handsome, let's settle up. There's one splinter door and a oh, thin door and a lot of little pieces that used to be a vase. That broken box, box over there with them papers in it ain't mine, so it's no charge. Okay, uh, how much... How, uh, how much do you want? How much? Well, uh, um... 20, 25, uh, 30 with the bait. 30 bucks and all. Well, Hanson, what is it? What you staring at? Hmm? Oh, uh, this slip of paper here. Fell out of the box. Mm, so a lot of other papers. Can't hurt you. It's only a receipt. What's the fuss? Because it is a receipt, Granny, from of all places of the department store. A receipt for a what? present delivered a long time ago. What? Yeah, it's got to be. All right, Granny, here. 30, you said, huh? Mm-hmm. 10, 20, 25, 30, 30 bucks. And if I'm right, sweetheart, I'll send you another vase come Christmas. Now, forget what I said about the phone and Bernie's being a killer. Because a mistake may have been made all the way around. What kind of mistake, handsome? A big one, abuse. And I can't be more specific than that until I find the elder Mr. D'Angelo. Good night, Granny. By midnight, the San Fernando Valley is always sound asleep. So I covered the five miles back to the amusement park and close to as many minutes worrying all the way that either my hunch was wrong and I was heading no place or that it was right and I was too late to keep murder from happening again. 
when I was out of my car and moving quietly in between the dark machines and stopped being gay, bobbing animals when the kids were gone. I knew that I could quit worrying altogether. Because standing ahead, in close to the merry-go-round, was Mr. Ambrosio D'Angelo. And opposite him, holding a gun that I'd already seen once tonight, was Lou Bunker, the man I figured had killed Frank Stafford. And when I was within a dozen yards of him, it played okay, just stop like that. that. Far enough. Stop right where you are and turn around. Why? So you can hit me over the back of the head and kill me like it was accident, huh? I fall in the dark while I work on the merry-go-round, huh? Pretty smart guy, mister. That way, no Ambrosio D'Angelo to testify that you killed Frank Safron. No, my boy, for Turn around and quit yapping. Nobody told you to go peeking in the windows and to play drop the hanky when you went inside to make sure that I killed Frank Safran. It was all your own idea. Yeah, and brilliant. Drop it, Bunker. Mr. Marlowe, look out, Mr. Marlowe. You won't get far, Buster, believe me. Mr. Marlowe. Mr. Marlowe, look out, look out. He's hiding over there on the, on the merry-go-round. All right, Pop. I know, I know how to get him out of where we can. Yeah, so we'll get down. Pop, Pop, are you all right? It's all right. That's okay, Mr. Marlowe. This is scratchy. Don't worry about me. Just to get ready for Bunker because... I'm going to go over there next to the switch. Uh -huh. He can't hide no more, Mr. Marlowe. I'm going to start the merry-go-round, make him join us all wrong. I go now. Why, you fat old fool! There, Mr. Marlowe, he's the wrong to stop me! With pleasure! Ah, oh, my leg! Oh. That's enough, Marlowe. Not quite, Bunker. You want to make it to our hospital? Fill in the blank fast. Come on, why did you kill Saffron? Come on! Okay. I dipped into the till at the club and dummied up the books to cover. He was going to find out about it, so I went to his place to get him. Bernie got there first, huh? Yeah. They had a fist fight, and after he left, I, I went in and... And finished him off with your feet. I see that. I went there, Mr. Marlowe, because I was worried about Bernardo. I had to do something. How did you know that the Angelo was there, Bunker? Oh, Marlowe, please. Come on, keep talking. Well, I, I heard a noise when I was inside. So I left and doubled back. He was inside then, but I only knew that it was an old man. I didn't know who he was until later when I came back a second time when you were there and saw that handkerchief. It hadn't been there before. Then when you talked about the old man here, I, oh, I figured that D'Angelo initials could fit him. Ah! Oh, that's my boy, Bernardo. Bernardo, don't look me. Hey, Over here, Bernardo. Hey, I can better go around. Look, 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 Mr. Marlowe. The girl is with him. They didn't run away, did they? No, they didn't run away. That's it, Mr. D'Angelo. Welcome your boy home. going to be tomorrow morning before all the policemen are finished talking with my boy and Paula. That's right. But after that, everything okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, just because you talk smart to do both of them at the Bernardo's flat. Just because of what you said. Well, that and what they were smart enough to do, D'Angelo. I don't think it was easy for them to change their minds and come back to what could have been prison. No, I guess not. My, it's also on account of you that there won't be no prison and there won't be a funeral for me. <laughs> but, you know, that's what, the, that's what I don't understand, Mr. Marlowe. What? When you tell the policeman that you know where to come and find the loot bunker at my place because of the department store receipt, I get all mixed up. Hello. I can... Uh, oh, uh, I get off of here, please. All right, Pop. Well, the receipt was for handkerchiefs monogram D.A., Mr. D'Angelo, which would have been sent to you as a gift from your son. That put the idea in my mind that the handkerchief I saw at Frank Saffron's could be yours, not Bernardo's. Oh, I could see it. Well, Mr. Marlowe, we are forever you good friends. Now I say goodbye in here. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Pop. This is miles from your place. I don't mind driving you home. Oh, no, 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 no. That's all right. That's all right. I, I just want to go around the corner. Uh, an old friend of mine is there. Oh. Yeah. I, I want to tell him all about uh, D'Angelo's good luck. Thank you just the same, Mr. Marlowe. I'll be there, Chief. I watched him walk away. A quiet old man in a quiet, empty street. A grateful old man 
who at 3 o'clock in the morning had to find his friend and tell him all about the D'Angelo. Good luck. And then, when he was around the corner and out of sight, I found myself wondering who the old friend could be. But a minute later, when I had driven as far as the corner and could see which way Ambrosio D'Angelo had gone, I knew. It was less than half a block away. A familiar Gothic architecture. Stone, stained glass. And the steeple reaching to the sky. And, yeah, his old friend. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Jay Novello, Paul Dubois, Barney Phillips, Ann Morrison, and Vivi Janis. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oran. Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time I took a beating from a clever Chinese, ran into a twisted corpse in an alley, and watched death strike on the railroad tracks, all because of an open-toed banjo which was jinxed from the start. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. They dress in red, white, and blue and jump from an ancient biplane at 3,500 feet. Twice a day, every day, and nobody worried. Until five million bucks went along just for the laughs, and death went along for the ride. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Birds on the Wing. It had been the kind of quiet, workless week that speaks well for human beings and their relations with one another. But it doesn't do much for a private detective's bank balance. So when at exactly noon, the telephone call had jerked me out of Chandler's new novel, The Little Sister. And a voice edged with anxiety had dangled a hundred bucks worth of negotiable bait my way. I had snapped at it. But then, I wondered if I'd done the right thing. Because it had been my much Hattie Pembroke, guardian of the millionaire thrill-seeking screwball Paige Pembroke. And now, an hour later, I left the sunlight and felt my way into the gloom of the carefully tucked away Hollywood bar where she had suggested we meet. When I could see again, I spotted her at a corner table. That the old girl would be the other side of 50 and doing a little too much to disguise it, I had expected. But that she would be drinking her whiskey neat, I hadn't. When I approached her and introduced myself, she started to come right to the point, but didn't quite make it. Oh, how rude of me. I'm sorry. You're probably dying for a drink. Oh, wait here. Well, frankly, no, Miss Pembroke. I'm not exactly oh, dying. Oh, no, I... no, no. I know you men in your early afternoon appetite for a friendly drink. There's no harm in it. Matter of fact, I've already had... Well, I've had a small drink myself. No fooling. Oh, waiter. Uh, this gentleman's order, please. Well, uh, yes, ma'am. Well, what'll it be, sir? Scotch and soda. If the lady will join me. Oh, no, no. I couldn't. Die. Really? Well. All right. It's, <laughs> it's scotch for me, too, waiter. Johnny Walker. Yes, ma'am. Now, Mr. Marlowe, let's get down to business. Have you ever been to Oxnard, California? Uh-huh. Good. Because that's where my nephew is. Also, it's where the Calumet Valley County Fair is being held. Really? Whatever that may be. Most important, it's where you can probably find out what kind of trouble Paige is in. You see the poor boy... Down to his last five million bucks. Now, I'm sorry, Miss Pembroke. I don't think I want the job after all. Well, now, 
one moment. Why not? Well, frankly, I hope you'll excuse the reference to actual living persons, but your polo-playing, motorboat-racing, daredevil nephew is a jerk. <laughs> I know. Paige Pembroke, the third, is an unmitigated ass, a virile egomaniac, an idiot who's never done an honest day's work in his life. Wait, the way is that dream? Right here, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Now, Mr. Barlow, sit down and drink your drink. When I referred to my nephew as a poor boy in trouble, I was only trying to avoid saying all this. Oh. Your health, sir? Yes. Uh, well, my health. Now, your next question. Since I obviously share your sentiments about my nephew, why all this concern over him, correct? Uh, close. Right. I want to help Paige Pembroke, Mr. Marlowe, because it's my job. My, shall I say, bread and butter? All right, say it. You see, I'm executor <laughs> of his estate, which my brother, Paige's father, left for him. Well, as such, I get $20,000 a year until Paige is 35, another six years. But if Paige should die, disappear, or be committed to any kind of a public institution... Hmm? Institution. Oh. Before then, the entire estate goes to charity and... I go find another job. And specialized jobs like handling $5 million estates are hard to come by these days, huh? Now, Mr. Marlowe, this letter here is all you have to go on. It was postmarked last night from Oxnard. Beep, beep. Oh. If you want your precious nephew to keep on being healthy, you better come and get him at once. The three of us had a nice little act going here at the Calumet Valley County Fair before he joined us just for laughs. We intend to have a nice little act going after he's gone. And one way or another, he's going to go. A friend, then. Huh? Yeah? Well, what do you think? Oh, it's five to one. It's nothing more than a woman spurned. Very young woman, Miss Pembroke. So you might be wasting $100 sending me up there. Then you'll go. Good. Yeah, but only because of my bank account. Mr. Marlowe, there'll be another $100 for you if and when you get all this straightened out. Now, now, call me at my home, Beverly Hills. Crestview 5412. 4124? Uh, yes, it uh. does. As soon as you find out what's wrong, and oh, uh, oh, Mr. Mark. Yes, Miss Pembroke. On your way out, signal the waiter for me, will you please? The ride to Oxnard was a pleasant but frustrating hour and a half drive along the kind of beckoning sun scrubbed Pacific shoreline that always demands to know why you have to work for a living. The ride through Oxnard to the sprawling county fairgrounds located at a semi-retired airport was the past ten minutes. So all in all, it was a little better than three o'clock, and there was still a measure of boyish bounce in my stride when I started past the prize cows and plain and fancy leghorns and headed for the midway, looking for the act Paige Pembroke had joined just for laughs. But it was four o'clock, and I had checked a half a dozen death-defying numbers before I was standing in front of a banner Columbus could have used for a sale and said I was getting warm. In iridescent orange cloth on black, it read... The Plunging Comets. Taffy Star and Midge Maynard on wings of death with fearless Eddie Knapp at the controls. The greatest parachute act in the world, admission free. 5 and 9 p.m., north end of the midway. Come one, come all. <laughs> yeah, this had to be it. At the north end of the midway, just outside of a sagging weatherfield hangar, I found the World War I biplane that went with the Plunging Comets being mothered by a mechanic who didn't have grease on his face. And beyond that, on an inside wall of the hangar, were the parachutes used in the act, each on a separate hook, its owner's name carefully block-lettered on a card tacked above. Taffy, Midge, and Eddie. And then, scrawled in black crayon, the name I wanted most of all to see, Paige. Lost something, mister? The voice went with the woman and the woman with the act. At the top, there was what used to be called the boyish bob sticking out of a white aviator's helmet circa 1918. Then a bright red leather jacket opened wide at the throat. Black riding breeches, black boots. A color of hair that stuck out and said this one was taffy. I asked if you lost something. Have you? Well, come to think of it, yes. Six foot two, eyes are blue, and carries a big, big checkbook. <laughs> Seen one around? Maybe. Why? Who are you? Name's Philip Marlowe, the millionaire's friend. I'm a yacht salesman. Here's my card. Never mind your I, uh... card or the very funny jokes. Now, what do you really want? Page Pembroke, before he breaks his neck in your act, or isn't he in it yet? I don't remember. Now, your point, what is it? A letter you could have written. A letter that says Page is in trouble. Where is he? Goodbye, Mr. Marlowe. Take it easy, Wings. 
Now, you wouldn't want to hold out on somebody who's only trying to help Brother Page, would you? I mean, what reason could you possibly have? Other than five million bucks you might want for your very own. Why, you... <coughs> I said goodbye. What's the matter, Taffy? You having problems? Yeah. This Mr. Yacht Salesman is Emmett Kingston, head of affairs Midway. And you'd be surprised how popular he is with the concessionaries. Now where you going? What else? Good day, Miss Taffy, Mr. Kingston. You know, sometimes it works. Lead with your chin, ride with a punch and watch for your opening. And I figured I'd try it just that way. So ten minutes later, when Emmett Kingston, who was carnival people from checkered vest past on eight, watch fob the high-button shoes, and shaped like a bowling pin, left Taffy and started trundling down the midway, I went after him. When he stopped in front of a lunch wagon, I stopped too. And when he went in and approached the man playing pinball machine, who was maybe five foot four, and from where I stood conscious of it, I was still behind him. At the pinball machine, a stranger with a thin face that wore a nervous toothpick was also watching the little man's game. Oh, boy, Doc, it's preaching. So when I moved closer to the trio, my face turned away from Kingston. Nobody well, seemed to mind. Well, I see. Jack of many trades, I see. What? Oh, oh, Mr. Kingston, uh, how are you, sir? Fine, Hershey, just fine. Eight hundred more is jackpot, Doc. Come on, come on. Uh, uh, you wanted to speak to me, Mr. Kingston? No, Hershey, nothing important except about last night. Uh, uh, last night, sir? Uh, you were working late for a parachute rigger, weren't you, boy? Or uh, am I wrong to consider two o'clock in the morning an odd hour for you to be folded in these silks? Hey, Doc, you're going to shoot it, aren't you? Which? Of course she is. Go on, I'll shoot for the uh, gentleman. Uh, yes, sir. Hey, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Hey, that's great. Now do that again with your last bullet, Doc. Uh, uh, was there something else, Mr. Kingston? Yes, yeah, she. Why were you near the shoots at that hour? And uh, don't bother denying that you were because Eddie Knapp saw you there. Well, son? Well, I I was there to double-check the riggers, Mr. Kingston. Hey, look, I'm sick and tired of Midge Maynard complaining about the way I pack her shoot. It, it's a stupid excuse, just trying to cover the fact that she's losing her nerves. Uh, hey, boys, don't ignore me. There's half of the jack. I have you and get going. Uh, Rosie, uh, get this uh, stumble bum out of here, will you? Sure, Mr. Kingston, whatever you say. Oh, yeah, this social, huh? All right, all right, Doc, I'm going. Of my own free will, too. I could stay if I wanted to. Ah, uh, Hershey, you were saying... Well, just this, Mr. Kingston. Uh, Mitch Maynard and Taffy Star fighting because of that Pembroke fellow, or, or because Eddie Knapp is crazy about Taffy, is one thing. But but bringing me and my work into it is different. Meaning? The parachutes Mitch and Taffy use are identical. In the act, both girls jump from the plane wing at the same time. But Midge always gets scared and opens her shoe sooner than Taffy. So Taffy is on the ground long before Midge. But this has nothing to do with the way I rigged the shoots, and I think it's... All that right, you're... all right, Hershey. Nobody's blaming you. And I... uh, say, you. Yeah? You uh, wouldn't be trying to sell another yacht in here, would you? Just waiting for the finish of an exciting pinball game. <laughs> that all right, or is it time to call Rosie again? No, no, it's quite all right. We're leaving. Uh, you try for the jackpot. Uh, come on, Hershey. It's about time for the five o'clock show. Oh, yes, Mr. King. Hmm. Only 40000 to go. <laughs> well, it's the first time I ever hit the jackpot. Oh, that's pretty good, Mr. Marlowe, considering that it wasn't your nickel you won on. Oh. Now that you mention it, Mr. Pembroke, it wasn't. We should take care of the introduction. Yeah. Huh? And that leaves very little. But something. But definitely. Marlowe, you can tell Aunt Hattie from me that at the moment I don't need a watchdog. And when and if I do, I'll go to the nearest city pound for one, not to a private detective agent. I told myself it was foolish to slam the door on my way out. So I slammed the door on my way out. I started north down the midway toward the open stand and the five o'clock sharp performance of the plunging comets. When I got there, the act was already underway with the silver biplane taking off. Eddie Knapp and White at the controls, Taffy in a red jacket and parachute crouched on one wing, Mitch Maynard in blue jacket and shoot on the other. Then as they slowly gained altitude, high button shoes himself took over the PA. They did it up well. And by the time the plane was at about 3,000 feet, every pair of eyes was riveted skyward, and an expectant hush thicker than winter fog had settled everywhere. Star and Mitch Maynard with Pierre and Eddie Hammond. 
They will not open their parachutes until they are within 500 feet of the ground. Now watch. They should be ready. Yes, Cindy. Yes, there we go. Knees drawn up tight, arms close into their sides, they jump. Specks in the sky growing bigger as they fell. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 feet, and then from taffy shoot cloth, long and colored, a huge flag rippling in the wind from the end of a long rope. The flag seemed to rise above her as she fell until the slack was gone, and then suddenly a chute opened, billowing. And then Midge, another flag rippling from the end of a long rope, and then... Then the flag drifting free. Major's shoot not open. Miz plummeting down. Down to the hard ground. The thud slammed home all the way around, kicking hard at every stomach. A minute ago, a girl, very much alive. Our smashed still body. Someplace near me, a woman cried. There was a bitter, sick, sweet taste in my mouth as I headed for the hangar where I'd first met Taffy. At the moment, I figured the guy who packed the parachutes was a good man to see. When I got there, the only one present was Emmett Kingston. Stop right there, boy, and tell me straight and fast just who you are. Philip Marlowe, Los Angeles private detective, Mr. Kingston. You can prove that? Sure. Here. Here's my business card, state license, county permit. I'm working for Paige Pembroke's aunt. She wants his nibs kept out of trouble. Which has what to do with your being here now, Marlowe? Here at this hangar, I mean. Close to where the parachutes are kept. I'm not sure, Kingston. I've only got a hunch. A hunch that Midge Maynard's death was no accident. Yeah, I've got more than that already, Mr. Detective. I've got proof. Oh? You see this flag? It's uh -huh. the one that came off Midge's chute. There's a long rope attached to it. Yeah, I know. I saw the egg. Pulls the chute open after the flag's flown a while, right? Sometimes, but not tonight, Mr. Marlowe. Tonight it couldn't. Why not? Wasn't it attached to the chute? It was. One end of the chute release cord, the other to the base of the flag. What went wrong? Nothing. Nothing, Mr. Marlowe, except that the long rope on Midge's chute was cut in two by a very sharp knife. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first... Sunday nights on CBS. The biggest bargain in show business today. Skelton, Bergen, and Benny without spending a penny. Amos and Andy, Eve Arden, Corliss Archer. Four A's, four star entertainment. The Family Hour with its Hollywood stars and stirring dramas. The Contented Hour with its musical stars and brilliant form. Horace Height with his rising stars. Eight great shows heard on most of these same CBS stations every Sunday night with the ninth Jack Benny, being heard on them all. Hear them all this Sunday night. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Birds on the Wing. When Midge Maynard's grim accident turned out to be grimmer murder, I left Kingston and headed for a phone to call my client. Everywhere the chill of the viciously spectacular death lay like a soggy blanket. At the exposition office, I found the phone and finally got through to Hattie Pembroke. She listened up to the word murder and then, between gasps, insisted on coming out to help me. When I hung up, I turned to see that the pilot, Eddie Knapp, had been standing in the door listening. He looked sick. What's it to you, mister? What's what to me? Midge. The long drop she took out there. And Pembroke. I heard you say Pembroke. What do you got to do with him? Just a minute, fella. I'm not sure it's any of your business. It's my business, all right. The kid gave me a big grin up there just before she jumped. And I watched her fall every inch of the way. So did everybody else. Look, I know how you feel, You Eddie, don't have any you... idea how I feel. Don't try to kid me. That mob out there loved it. That's the only reason they come to watch, the hypocritical buzzards. You've got a finger in this pie. and angle all your own. I'm going to find out what it is. Take it easy, Nap. You're talking yourself into something real silly. Yeah? Listen, ever since that louse Pembroke showed up here, there's been trouble brewing. Now Midge is dead. She was a friend of mine. Best friend I had. Aren't you pulling a switch, Buster? What happened to your red-hot passion for Taffy Star? Oh, you nosy... Come here, you jerk. Look out for my arm. Yeah, boy, boy, and unless you want to take off with a busted wing, stand still. 
Now, get this, Eddie. I've got no beef with you yet. In fact, we might even be on the same team because I want Pembroke out of here just as much as you do. Now, hold on. Who are you? A private detective named Marlowe. I got news for you. Midge fell because her shoot was fixed. She was murdered. Mur- you heard me. Where? Where's Hershey? He packed the shoots. Have you talked to him? No, I can't find him. You mean he's run away? With that filthy half pint Now, listen, for your own sake, Eddie, leave Hershey to me and the police. You know where he's staying? No, no, I don't. In town someplace. Well, didn't he ever tell you where? Come on, think, Eddie. Well, yeah, he told me he had a buddy in town. Some guy who runs a pool hall. I didn't pay much attention. That's enough for a starter. I'll find him. And keep a lid on your temper, Eddie. I'll see you. As I crossed the grounds to my car, I looked back once at Eddie Knapp standing in the office door, rubbing the shoulder I twisted for him. I hoped he'd stay out of circulation until I got back because... The barnstorming flyer was charged up like a high-tension wire. The way he felt there'd be sparks no matter who he touched. Taffy, Pembroke, or Lyle Hershey. But my immediate worry was the location of the lambing parachute packer, so I drove into Oxnard, found a phone booth, and went through the book calling pool parlors. I finally hit pay dirt at a joint called Pindy's. It's 212B Street, upstairs in the back. 212B Street was an apartment, second floor rear over a boarded-up fish market. I went up the stairs to the half-open door with my hand around my 38. But the shooting part was all over. Because Lyle Hershey was crumpled in the bedroom door with the slovenly abandon that violent death always has. And the look of the puddle of blood under him had been that way over an hour. I started backing out. Just as someone else started up the stairs. So I flattened myself against the wall beside the kitchen door and waited. Lyle! Wow. Lyle, it's Taffy. I... Come on in. Take a good look, Taffy. What are you doing in here? Where's Lyle? It's a great egg, baby. Holds water like a duck's back. What do you mean? That wherever there's murder, there's also motive, and you've got it, Taffy. Lots of it. Me? What are you talking about? Maybe he's dead, and maybe you killed him. Keep him quiet, because maybe he fouled up Midge Maynard's parachute on your orders. Consequently, he had you over a barrel. On my orders? You're out of your mind. And maybe you had to get Midge out of the way because you objected to Paige Pembroke and his idle millions honing into the act. Objected so strenuously that she was doing something about it, such as sending threats to his Aunt Hattie. Let's face it, baby, it fits. But not tight enough, Marlowe. Oh, Paige, darling. Taffy, I got worried when you didn't come back to the car, so I decided... Don't move, Marlowe, or I'll shoot. Pembroke, if you got any sense in that gold-plated skull of yours... I show it, Marlowe. I stood outside and listened to enough of your crackpot theories to know you're nuts. I don't need any advice from you at this point, so keep your long nose out of my business. Now listen, you half brain dope. Now just stand there like a good little boy. Taffy and I are leaving, and don't try to follow too fast. Go on, Taffy, outside. I'll follow you. So long, detective. I let him go. Spent 20 useless minutes searching the almost bare apartment for any kind of an answer, but came up with nothing. Hershey's body at my feet convinced me there was nothing in Oxnard for Marlowe. And the sooner I dumped the whole mess into the laps of local law and order, the better. So I kicked out the 10 cent lock on the flimsy door and went down the stairs. I cut through an alley to the street and started across to where my car was parked. And I was bracketed by a pair of headlights on a sleek Nash convertible. Hey there, Marlo. Marlo, what you doing here, boy? Nothing. Even that's an exaggeration, Kingston. What about you? I thought you had a show tonight. I certainly do, but the police don't give a hoot about that, boy. No. They insisted that I bring the rest of Midge Maynard's parachute harness in for investigation. Mm-hmm. Uh, get in and come on, will you, son? Maybe you can help me out. Okay. I want to see the police myself. Oh, is this Midge's stuff in? That's it. Don't mind holding it, do you? No. Uh, you know, this is a waste of time, boy. All they have to do is pick up Lyle Hershey and they'll get all the answers. They'll have to pick him up, all right, but he'll give him problems, not answers, Mr. Kingston. Lyle Hershey's daddy was murdered. You say Lyle... Yeah, yeah, I just came from his place. Somebody shot him. Great suffering sardines. Well, uh, that means there's another killer. And uh, still on the loose. Uh, I knew I shouldn't let him do it. But who do what? Why, Taffy's going to give an air performance tonight. They pulled me into the grounds just as I was leaving and told me that uh, Pembroke fellow's going up in Midge's place. You mean those two showed up out yeah. there? It doesn't make sense. Well, Pembroke's got plenty of nerve in his own shoot, so I guess... Shoot? He... Yeah, he's... Uh... Wait a minute, wait a minute, Kingston. Stop under that street light, will you? Why, uh-huh. What is it, Marlowe? What are you looking at? Sure, sure. Red smudges on the inside of these straps. 
There's something wrong here, Kingston, but I can't quite peg it. Say, Kingston, what time is that performance going to start? Wait, nine o'clock. Five minutes and five miles to go. Come on, boy, turn the heap around and romp on it. We got a killer to catch. Swing out in front of the hangar, Kingston. Hurry. It's empty. They're already out on the runway. Yeah. There's one parachute still on the rack. Why, that's Eddie Knapp shoot, and he never goes up without it. So who's at the controls of that plane out there? I don't even have to guess. It's Eddie Knapp, all right, but he figures a suicide doesn't need a shoot. But... Pile out, Kingston. It's as far as you go. I'm taking over from Brad, here. What are you talking about? Come on, about? move. Get out. They're turning around now. Yeah, he's going to make us run back this way. So long, Kingston. Here he comes. Oh, what are you doing? There was no possible chance for a miss. And I headed the car straight into the path of the plane, pulled the hand throttle out as far as it would go, and jumped. From there on, it was easy. The plane sort of stumbled over the car, rolled up on its nose, and stayed there. Quick work by the volunteer crash crew took care of that. A box of bandages took care of the collection of minor cuts and bruises all around, and the... Oxnard police took care of Eddie Knapp. Everything had come out more or less even, except my client, Hattie Pembroke. She showed up at the finish line slightly on the bias, which no doubt was her normal late evening state. Also, she was as full of questions as an insurance adjuster. Now, young man, I paid you a substantial sum of money for this day's work, and therefore, as your employer, I'm certainly entitled to a comprehensive report of the entire business. And I insist... All right, all right, Hattie, Hattie, whoa... (laughs) I'll run through it once more, and that's all. Now, look. First, the threatening letter you got was written by Midge Maynard because she was afraid Paige was going to break up the act. You get it? But the real screwball was Eddie Knapp. He was crazy about Taffy's tar and insanely jealous when your nephew and his money showed up. Knapp decided if he couldn't have Taffy, nobody else would because he'd kill her. And yet Midge Maynard was the one who got killed. You catch on quick. Knapp killed Hershey because he was afraid Hershey had seen him tampering with the shoots. You get that? No. Oh. On second thought, Milo, maybe you better submit a re- written report tomorrow. Yeah, with adding machine and clothes. Now, look, Hattie, it's not hey, that... Hey, Milo. Milo, Paige and I want to apologize. We treated you pretty badly tonight, and, well, you did save our lives. Business is business. Yeah, that's right. He was hired to do a job, dear, and he did it. I'm only interested in one thing, Marlowe. How'd you know it was Eddie Knapp? Well, nobody had a really good motive for killing both Midge and Hershey, so... When I realized the shoots had been switched, I knew Midge's murder was a mistake. And there it was easy. How'd you find that out, Marlo? From red smudges on the inside of the harness shoulder straps. Red that had to come from your leather jacket there, Taffy. The one Midge always wore was blue. Mm Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Well, Hattie, write the detective a check so he can go. That's the best idea you've had to date, Pembroke. And include on it the price of a repair job on Kingston's car, a new tweed suit to replace this one that lost knees and elbow on the runway when I jumped. And also, don't forget the bonus you promised for keeping your job alive, Hattie. Oh, just a minute, Marlowe. As for you, Pembroke, the only reason I'm not filing an assault and battery charge against you is that you've got great grounds for a countersuit. What do you mean? This! Bless you, my boy. Mail me the check. Good night. Well, a few informal cups of coffee at the Oxnard Police Headquarters cut through most of the paperwork. But at that, it was after two when I finally picked up my car and drove the inland highway for home, past dark, quiet farms, where down-to-earth people made down-to-earth livings and slept at night. Yeah, the countryside was full of it. So it was with a real sigh of relief that I finally opened the door to my apartment... And look forward to some peace and quiet. Hello, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, aren't you Gracie Allen? Yes. Well, how'd you get into my apartment? Well, you see this key? Yeah. Well, it didn't fit, so I opened the door and walked in. Yeah, well, that figures. Uh, what can I do for you? Uh, Mr. Marlowe, you're a famous detective, and I think you're just the man to handle a very important case for me. Oh, really? Well, I'd be very happy to, Gracie. What's your problem? Well, you see, Mr. Marlowe, our sponsor won't let my husband, Sugar Throat Burns, sing on our program. Mm-hmm. And I want you to investigate the possibilities of another radio program George can sing on. Mm-hmm. 
And then our sponsor will realize he's wonderful and let him sing on our show. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, Gracie. And the next time you pass my house, I'll be very grateful. Oh, thank you. And I'll be looking for you, too. Goodbye. Goodbye. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lois Corbett, Rita Lynn, Don Randolph, Junius Matthews, Jack Moyles, and Jimmy Eagles. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started with a kid hawking papers on Hollywood Boulevard and moved from there to a house full of hate on a quiet street, a blonde liar on ice skates and a corpse in a burned-out shack, and it all wound up right where it began, in the heart of the kid on the corner. music programs that make your Sunday afternoon listening a delight and a pleasure are the Symphonette and the Coraliers. The Coraliers sing popular and semi-classical songs in stirring style. The Symphonette brings you excerpts of great orchestral works. Hear the Symphonette and the Coraliers tomorrow and every Sunday, as well as Sammy Kay's Sunday Serenade, now heard exclusively on CBS. All of these outstanding music programs are heard on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows immediately on most of these stations. This is CBS Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This time it started with a kid hawking papers on Hollywood Boulevard and moved from there to a house full of hate on a quiet street, a blonde liar on ice skates, and a corpse in a burned-out shack. And it all wound up right where it really began, in the heart of the kid on the corner. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Kid on the Corner. After a day jammed full of heat waves in December, actresses who passed mascara in long A's off as talent, and producers with glossy convertibles and holes in their shoes, the world looked as phony as a $7 bill. And when I finally closed my office, stepped out onto Hollywood Boulevard into the glare from miles of sheet iron Christmas trees on lamppost trunks, and watched a loudspeaker Santa Claus with neon reindeer trundle by in a cloud of artificial snow... I'd have gladly traded all of Hollywood, California for one quiet Vermont hillside and thrown my license in to boot. All of which convinced me that what Marlowe needed most was a martini in his own apartment, a good book, and a night's sleep in that order. So I started home after them, but only got as far as the middle of the street. It was the kid who sold papers on the corner. Mr. Marlowe, can you spare a minute? I've got to talk to you. Okay, Tommy. Let's get out of the street first, huh? <laughs> I'm not so good at dodging fenders. Oh, yeah, sure. What's on your mind, kid? That's about my Uncle Bert. Bert Larson. He, he's gone, Mr. Marlowe. Well, what about your family, Tommy? Don't they know where he is? Oh, I don't have no family. I've been living with Uncle Bert in a flat down in Van Ness. Hey, if you haven't had your dinner yet, maybe you'd eat with me in the cafeteria, huh? It's, it's real important to me, Mr. Marlowe. Anything that's important to you, kid, is important to me. Let's go in. Oh, swell. I 
should have known something was wrong when I heard him walking around. Late last night, you know? He said he was after a drink of water, but he's got those metal plates, kind of like taps on his shoes, so I knew he was all dressed, only I was too sleepy to think anything about it then. Well, maybe he just got an early start and he's been busy today, huh? No, it's not like that, Mr. Marlowe. Something's wrong. Well, well you have, gentlemen. The pork's nice tonight. Stew's the best deal for the money, Mr. Marlowe. Oh. I'll uh, have the stew, please. Yeah, you better make it too, miss. Okay, a couple of stews coming up. See, when I got up this morning, I found this envelope on the dresser. There was 200 bucks inside, and this was written on the front. Huh? Let's see it. Dear Tommy, must leave town on business. I'll send more money soon. Be a good kid and take care of yourself, Uncle Bert. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. I spent all day trying to find out where he went. I checked everything but the airport. I know he wouldn't take a plane. He gets dizzy just standing on a curb. No luck, though. Milk, Mr. Marlowe? No, I'll have coffee, Tommy. I feel rugged. And hey, there's a table over in the corner. Come on, huh? Okay. What really makes it fishy is that Uncle Bert's got no out-of-town business. Besides, he's never been out in front more than 20 bucks in his life. I can't figure it. Well, now, look, Tommy, if you're really worried, you don't want me. You ought to go to the police right away. Cops? Yeah. No, I can't. Why not? Well, Uncle Bert's been awful good to me, but, well, I guess he's really kind of a bum. You see, he's a gambler, Mr. Marlowe, a bookie. Uh -huh. Just a harmless small time, is sure, but I'd get him in an awful jam if I called the cops. Will you try to find him for me? I got dough. I'll pay you whatever you charge. Don't worry about the money, Tommy. I got one lead for you. This name here in the back of the envelope. See? Yeah. Lester Carney. And the number 3,004 and a half. Does that mean anything to you, kid? No. Oh. I'd have looked that guy up my cell phone. You know how far a kid could get. Sure. Gee, Mr. Marlowe, I'm sure my uncle didn't leave town. It's something else. It's got to be. He's in some kind of trouble. Now, Tommy, you know that he might be on the wrong end of it, don't you? Yeah. Well, if that's right, I... I want to find it out fast, Mr. Marlowe. Here's a picture of him. Mm-hmm. Scared, son? Me scared? Nah. Not for myself, anyway. I... Yeah. Yeah, I guess I am, kind of. Well, okay, Tommy, eat your dinner, and then get back to work. I'll see what I can find out, huh? <laughs> I my new client on the shoulder and left the cafeteria. But I was sure of one thing. The dry rot that gets to most people in Hollywood wouldn't touch a hard-working kid named Tommy Lawson. It was already smarter at 15 than a lot of citizens get at 50. I stopped in a phone booth and found the name Lester Carney listed in the book at 8110 Cherokee Street. That turned out to be an oversized California Spanish model that had taken lots of old-fashioned wealth to build. Halfway up the curving walk to the already open front door, I heard the voice. All right, Susan, if that's the way you feel, I don't want you in this house another night. Well, I'm sorry, Mom, but I don't think that Spion and Helen Lies are a part of the maid's duties, so I'm leaving. But I would like to know about my back salary first. You'll Mr. get your back salary, my girl. Don't worry about that. Now get out. Very well, Mom. Excuse me, sir. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, what do you want? I'm looking for Mr. Lester Carney. Is he in? He is not. Oh, would you mind telling me where I can locate him? I don't know. And I don't care uh, anymore. Just a minute, just a minute. Is he with Bert Lawson, maybe? I don't know what you're talking about. Now get out of here. And good night to you, too, Mrs. Carney. <laughs> hey! Hey, Susan! Just a minute, baby! And who are you calling, baby? Well, I call anybody baby when they're as cute as you are. Uh, you're not so bad yourself. Well, now that that's established, let's get friendly. I'm always friendly. But they're not, huh? Oh, there's going to be trouble in that house. Oh? Good night, Mr. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll give you a lift in the car. <laughs> Let me have your bag. Well, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Say, uh, what about that trouble you spoke of, Susan? What did you mean? Julie. Oh. She isn't as pretty as she used to be. She's turned a rancid. She's driven that poor husband of hers out of his mind. He almost never comes home nowadays. Practically lives in his studio. Studio? Huh? What kind? Photography. Oh. It's way up in the Hollywood Hills someplace. Susan, did you ever hear either of them mention of Bert Lawson? No. Why, who's he? A gambler. I gather from Julia that Connie's blowing the family fortune, eh? Sure he is. And that's not all she's driven him to. No. What else? What do you think? Another woman, of course. Oh. An ice skater named Carol King at the Igloo. 
That's that nightclub with the skating show. Yeah, I've been there. Does Mrs. Carney know? Oh, she suspects. That's why she wanted me to spy on him. But I wouldn't because I don't blame him one bit. Not with Julia being like she is. Yeah, maybe you're right, Susan. But then again, maybe you've got your cause and effect backward, huh? Yes? Well, I don't know anything about that. But that poor man's been driven so crazy, he's threatened to kill her. Well, here's where I get out. And stay out. I dropped Susan off at the car stop and headed out Sunset Boulevard for Westwood in a club called the Igloo, which looked more like a down-at-the-heel Taj Mahal than an Eskimo's bedroom. Inside a line of fast-moving ostrich plumes with rye crisp waistlines and imitation sable zipped over a short sheet of tinted ice toward the climax of chorus numbers. While I bluffed my way backstage and intimidated the call boy into sending over one Carol King. She turned out to be left end in the lineup out front, so I sat down on a cold trunk and waited until the curtain fell. And I got up to greet an athletic blonde with more than healthy face, who sidled dubiously toward me, ice skates and all, and I introduced myself and told her I was looking for Bert Larson. Why are you looking for Bert Larson, Marlo? Well, because people say he's disappeared. Now, I know he's a bookie. You don't have to protect him on that score, and I'm no cop. Just want to know where he's gone. Okay. I hear he made a real killing yesterday, the first one in his life. Oh. I understand he's leaving town to retire. Hmm. Who's going to make book for you from now on? Nobody. I never play the horses. My friends do. Oh, friends like Lester Carney? Lester. Oh, well, now we get down to business. You smell like you're working for a wife, Shamus. Yes, again, sugar. I'm after Bert Larson, nothing else. That's why I want to talk to your friend. Where is he? Lester Carney is no friend of mine. You know, you should be smart enough to know you're just wasting your time with that pitch. Look, bud, he was my friend, sure, but that's all off as of an hour ago. They're all through, washed up. I gave him the boot. Why, did he run out of blank checks? I ought to bust your shin I wide I open, I keep those skates on the floor, honey. Then skip the cracks. I threw him out because I got sick and tired of waiting. He kept me on the string for months. Okay, sugar, that's where we'll leave it for now. But in making that clean break, be sure it's not your neck. I'll see you around. I had nothing tangible to base it on, but as I left the igloo and drove back to Hollywood for some reason, I kept thinking that Tommy Lawson was right, that his uncle was still in town and in some kind of trouble. And I was sure that at least half of Carol King's story had been lies, but why, I couldn't figure. And another idea hit me and hit me hard. I turned on to Cherokee again and drove up to Carney's house at 8110, parked, and went in. There the vague hunch began to shape up like grim fact because the front door was wide open and spilling a pale glow from the one light in the house, the hall lamp. I saw the note propped under the lamp even before I went in. I left it where it was. It said to whom it may concern. I have paid all my just debts, my affairs are in order, and since life has been made intolerable for me, I... I've destroyed that which made it so, my wife, Julia. Now there's nothing left I shall dispose of myself, nor am I sorry, Lester Carney. And I looked up beyond the note and saw her lying at the edge of the circle of light from the lamp. Julia had been strangled by a silk cord that was still embedded in her swollen throat. I turned and started for the phone. There we are. Oh. So I got here a little too late, huh? Or is it too soon? My wife's dead, so what's the difference? Better stand still because I'll shoot fast. Who are you and what are you doing here? Name's Marlowe, and I assume you're Connie. All right, I'm a private detective trying to find Bert Larson. In the process, I got mixed up in your little fiasco from one end to the other. Bert Larson. Just a cheap bookmaker. He's one of the very few people who ever gave me a fair break. Where is he, Connie? Do you know? No. Does it matter? Too bad you bunted in here just now. The man's going to do what I've decided to do. It's a most personal, private affair. It's your party. But maybe you better think it all over again, huh? I've already thought it over. Thoroughly. Turn around and walk through that door to the kitchen. Go on. Sure, sure. All right. Stop there. Now, open that door on your right. This one? Yes. Yeah. Years ago, that cellar was filled with the best wines the world had to offer. What happens? You pull too many corks? Find out for yourself, Marlowe! Oh! Oh! <laughs> In 
in just a moment the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, will Tyrone Power listen to Jack Benny's siren song? Will Ty consent to portray CBS's great Sunday night musician and lover in the movie The Life of Jack Benny? Tune in tomorrow and find out. No, there's never a question about the quality and quantity of comedy and sheer entertainment on CBS on Sunday night. And remember... Found neither confessed killer nor car any place in sight. Which made my next step a return trip into the house and a call to Lieutenant Matthews. All right, Marlowe. From your client to Julia Carney to that ice skater and back to Julia Carney, now dead, I follow. But the why, I don't. Where's the connection between the newsboy's uncle and this guy you say is on the way out? This, uh... Lester Carney, Matthews, I don't know. You don't know? You're not saying which, Phil? Well, maybe it's a little of each. Now, look, Lieutenant, I... Just a second. What is it, Marlowe? Hold the wire, will you, Matthews? Okay, but make it snappy, will you, Phil? Killer on the loose isn't such a good idea, even if he's promised to knock himself off. Might decide to take somebody else along. 3,004 and a half North what? Westmore. 3,004 and a half. I can't hear you, Phil. What? What? Oh, a, a piece of paper, Matthews, in a dead woman's hand. Oh, now you're fine. It's got an address on it. The same address that was on the back of the envelope Tommy's uncle left for him. Well, this address could be the connection I asked you about. Yeah. Yeah, the hook between Uncle Bert and the Connie's. Well, we'll get right over there. We'll uh, Matthews, wait a minute. Let me try it alone first, will you? I, I think it's it'll play better that way. And keep the kid's uncle out of the police lineup that yeah. way. Yeah. Uh-uh, Marlo, I can't. Oh, now, wait a minute, Matthews, please. I'm thinking of the kid. Yeah, well, I'm... Okay. That a boy. Just don't make it too long till I hear from you again. Goodbye. I knew that the 3,000 block on North Rossmore wasn't even close to the Hollywood Hills, which meant that the address couldn't be the dilettante photographer studio that the Connie's ex-maid had described. And 20 minutes later, when I was out of my car and standing next to the doorbell marked 3,004 and a half, I knew something else. Because the name underneath was Carol King. A light showed from someplace deep inside, and my leaning on the doorbell only proved that it worked. There was no answer at 3,004 and a half, but 3,004, the other twin to the duplex, was different. It featured a sweet old lady who shattered the illusion the second she opened her mouth. I suppose you're just another one of that King girl's friends, eh? Why, do I look the type, Granny? There is no type, young man. Miss Carol King entertains all sorts. Oh, which might include a recent someone who's gray at the temple, short, and maybe talks a lot about the ponies. Huh? How would I know what her guests talk about? Oh, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> Look, honey, a woman's been murdered tonight. And that murdered? Thing, uh... I knew it. I knew it. No, she wait had a to come to a bad wait end. A minute, Granny. Only yesterday Whoa. I told Henry Hold that it. if that Hold it, her... Granny. Carol is not the one who's dead. Oh. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. It sticks out all over you. Now, look, what about that man? Well, he was here about 30 minutes ago, just the two of them drinking that hard liquor like it was water and making enough noise to raise the devil itself. A farewell party, they called it. Oh. Did you see him leave? No, no. Henry made me come in then, and I... Well, I mean... <laughs> yeah, but... I know what you mean. You missed it. Okay, Granny, now look, how do we get in here without kicking the door down? Come on, sweetheart, it's important. There may be a body inside. Uh, a body? Oh, well, how awful. Here, here. Over here, behind this ledge. That's better. You always kept a spare key. Yes? Yes, here it is. Uh, you do it. I'm too shaky. You shouldn't be. Just think of tomorrow, Granny, and the news you'll have for one and all. The light switches. is on your right there. Uh-huh. See anything? No. How many rooms here? Bedroom, kitchen, and bath, aside from this. Anything in there? No. You suspect foul play, all right, don't you? The foulest. Don't let it worry you, because... Hey, those photos there on the wall. They're taken from Mulholland Drive, aren't they? One by day, one by night, both in the same spot, the Hollywood Hills? Sure, sure. That's where he has a studio, that Lester fella. Yeah, that Lester fella. Granny, do you know where it is? I mean, Mulholland Drive and where? You know, that street runs for miles along the top of the mountain. Well, of course I do. I was born and raised here in Los Angeles. Granny, where? Mulholland and where? Mulholland and Laurel Canyon Boulevard, just ah. south of the intersection. Thank you, sweetheart, and goodbye. Oh, wait, one moment now, if you please. What's the matter? What's your name, officer? I know my rights. Your name and your division. Granny, dear, I'm no cop. Huh? I said I'm no cop. Oh, not a police officer. Well, then who are you? Just a passerby. A stranger in the night. Good night, Granny. All the way from Rossmore to Sunset, then west to Laurel Canyon Boulevard, I kept worrying about Tommy Lawson and the uncle, who, from where I stood, needed at least worrying about no matter which way things played. 
But when I was on the strip of macadam that twists its way upward toward Mulholland Drive like a snake writhing from a long, long bellyache, I forgot about both client and relatives alike. Because at the top and a little to the south where Granny had said it would be, was Lester Carney's studio, all right. But burned to the ground. Well, he's your last flyway point. You'll go fast, huh, Chief? Yeah, it wasn't 20 minutes on this one. Hey, mister, where are you going? Some of that metal stuff's still pretty hot. Who are you, with the law? No, Chief, I'm a private detective named Marlowe. I was wondering if Lester Carney was caught in there. He owned this shack. Yeah, I know. Is he a friend of yours? Uh, no, it's strictly business. He's wanted for murder. Yeah, he was wanted for murder, Phil. He was burned to a crisp in there. Hello, Casey. Hello, Matthews. Well, what's your guess? He started on purpose? Oh, uh, suicides hardly ever burn themselves to death. No, no. He probably took some sleeping pills or poison and then a cigarette he left going did this, you know. Hey, by the way, Phil, you saw Connie tonight. You think you might recognize him? Might. Yeah, he's over there. There isn't much. Oh, see you, Casey. Right, Matthews. Hey, Garson. Hey, you tied Connie and this fire together kind of fast, didn't you, Lieutenant? <laughs> I just found out about this place. Yeah, but you work alone, Marlowe. I got help. Oh. Oh, there it is. All that's left. See anything? Yeah. That ring. I noticed it earlier tonight. Uh-huh. And the watch? No, I'm not sure. I don't remember what kind of... Hey, Matthews. What is it? What are you staring at, Phil? Come on over here. Come you on. What? See this little piece of metal? Yeah. I think it's... Don't watch, old oh. Phil. Uh, you know, fire makes things hot. Yeah, yeah. Hot things burn and... Yeah. Marlo, what is it? It's an idea. Yeah, like what? Like this isn't suicide after all, like it's murder, Matthews. Oh. Come on, we gotta get to our phone quick. Look, miss, this is important. I'm calling for Detective Lieutenant Matthews at police headquarters. What passenger flights have left in the last half hour? Passenger flights? Yeah. Well, there have been two, sir. One to Dallas, Texas, and the other to Chicago. Uh, both American airlines. Nothing out of the country? Well, what are you getting? Will you wait you a know, minute, Matthews? Sir, however, there is a flight scheduled to leave at 1010. Uh-huh. But that's just five minutes from now. Uh, that's going to Manila. Mm. Mercury Airways. Shall I connect you? Yeah, hurry, will you please? Yes, hey, Matthews, sir. this may be it. I'm glad for you. Mercury Airways. Central Dispatcher's office, Mercury. There's a call from the police here for you. Uh, go ahead, sir. Look, your 1010 flight from Manila, is it going out on schedule? Uh, yes, sir. The plane's standing by for the top signal now. Oh, then tell me this. Is there a passenger aboard named Bert Larson? Uh, Larson? One moment, please, please, sir. Hurry, will you? Does Larson kill Lester Conley? Then he... Will you hold it, Matthews? Oh. Yes, sir. We have a Bert Larson aboard. Oh, good. Keep him there and don't let that plane get up in the air. Do you hear? The man's wanted for murder. But don't do anything else either. Just let him sit and wait for us. You got that? Uh, yes, sir. I understand. Fine. We'll be there as soon as we can. Goodbye. Come on, Matthews. It's your show from here on in. Sirens included. Okay, Marlow. Okay, enough. So we're on our way to the airport. We're going to catch her. Kill everything is great. But first, how do things add up? And... Yes! Mooney, take it easy. Five seconds, more or less, never yet turn the trick. Okay, Lieutenant. Were you Sorry. saying something, Matthews? Yeah, yeah, I'm saying I don't know which end is up, Phil. Look, Lester Connie killed his wife, right? Right. Why? Because he wanted her out of the way so that he and a cheap little monster named Carol King can live happily ever after. Oh, well, divorce wouldn't do that for him, huh? No, Mooney! No, I don't think so. Probably because Julia Connie had a real tight grip on the purse string. Oh. Maybe something more, like it's not very nice pass for a guest. Yeah, yeah, but the purse string is the money. That's where Bert Lawson figures in, huh? A bookie with a claim. No, no, blackmail. Now, I figure Bert Lawson knew about Connie and Carol King. He must have stopped by once to pick up or pay off a bet at the right time. Yeah, and from there, what? And from there, the team of Carol and Lester kill Lester's wife. Yeah, which we've covered. But not in detail. Now, listen. You see, after the murder, Lester planned to kill himself. Yeah. Or at least make it look like that. Yeah. A suicide note from Mulholland Studio burned down the works. Yeah, yeah, and the body we found. So That's an went... added attraction. Bert Larson included in the last minute. What? The wife and then the blackmailer? Ah, you're getting it. Drugged while drinking at Carol's, where he thought that he was going to get paid off in money, yeah. then up to Mulholland Drive, ring watch, and flames added. Oh, and then, then out here at the airport, headed for Manila. Lester Carney. Uh-huh. Hey, Mooney. We're getting close. You better kill the siren. Okay, Marlon. Now, Phil, how do you know all this? I mean, the switch. You know, what makes it so? That piece of metal I burned my fingers on, Matthews, yeah. it was a tap from a shoe. 
And Bert Larson wore taps. The rest of it adds from there. Yeah, including Connie at the airport now as Larson. Sure, who'd be looking for a beat-up second-rate bookie who decided to leave town? Aside from a nephew, that is. Yeah, aside from a nephew who tried every place but the airport. Uncle Bert couldn't stand planes. The brakes, Matthews. Oh, here we are. Yeah, just you and me and Mooney and the killer. Aren't you coming, Phil? Uh, no, I think I'll wait here, Matthews. I, I, I got some thinking to do. About the scum you sometimes meet in the night? No. About the kind of a kid I almost never meet in the night. See it. Yeah. All right, come on, Mooney. Maybe our boy will make a break for it, I hope. Lester Carney didn't make a break for it, and an hour later when they picked up Carol King, it was the same thing. Each of them was surly, ugly, but they talked. So when I finally left police headquarters, where try as he would for Tommy's sake, Matthews had found it impossible to skip over Bert Larson's connection as a blackmailer. It was pushing midnight, and I was dog-tired. There was something worse than that when I was back on the corner near my office, walking toward Tommy Larson, who was untying a stack of fresh newspapers. Then the headline. Read all about it. Hollywood killer nab. Blackmailing bookie. Jealous wife slain. Hiya, kid. Oh. Hiya, Mr. Marlowe. Lieutenant Matthews tells me you had kind of a rough night. Kind of? When would you talk to him, Tommy? After the first edition hit the street, I... I wanted to know if you were okay. The story didn't say. Pub, publicity no good for your business, huh? Not much. Look, kid, does the lieutenant say anything about you? I mean, uh... Oh, I'm gonna stay with a neighbor, a friend of Uncle Bert's. Oh. He had friends, you know. He, he wasn't really bad at heart, Mr. Marlowe. Not really. I, I believe that. So do I, Tommy. He was just mixed up. Yeah. Sure he was. And you know Why? The way he thought the world owed him a living, that's why. And I couldn't tell him otherwise. He... Excuse me, Mr. Marlowe. I... I gotta get going. Thanks a lot. You were swell. Sure. Extra, extra, Bookie and Babe slain in Hollywood Triangle. Two dead in Hollywood playing. Extra... There's nothing more pathetic than a kid. The first time he's really slapped down by life. We, the older ones, the tired ones, Learn to roll with a punch. Because we've got time in our corner. Watching us. Counseling us. Teaching us how to save ourselves. So that in the final gong, we're still on our feet. But a kid... A kid steps into life's arena expecting to find his opponents all he was taught to believe they would be. But instead he finds the old one-two below the belt. But if here he finds a good guy, and there a great girl, the going suddenly becomes not so rough. The fight becomes worth it. If only to help the next generation of Tommies find their ring a little cleaner. And the brakes not quite so tough. <laughs> Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Gil Stratton, Jr., Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, Joan Banks, and Vivi Janis. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. 
The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It started with laughter on a bright morning, in a battle over a chicken, and got better as it went along. It could have lasted a lifetime, but it didn't. It stopped on a gray morning, with a little wishbone broken. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This started with laughter on a bright morning in a battle over a chicken, and got better as it went along. It could have lasted a lifetime, but it didn't. It stopped on a gray morning with a little wishbone broken. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Little Wishbone. Sometimes the sun doesn't shine at 9 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes everything's just gray. The sky, the buildings, the streets. The face is going by, gray in a man's mind. And when I parked in front of the politely landscaped Seco Square on Sunset Boulevard and got out of my car, I knew that this was just such a morning. And that was right as it should be, because what I had to tell her, what had to be said, belonged in gray to the chilling half-light that leaves everything and everybody something less than real. To the half-light that maybe a moment before birth, maybe a moment after death. I'd like to see Miss Jones. Miss Cordelia Jones, please. I called. My name is Philip Marlowe. Oh, yes, Mr. Marlowe. I'm Mr. Early. Come in, please. I, um, the police told me what happened, sir, I'm saying. Yeah, thanks. May I see you now, please? Yes, of course. It's the last door down on the right-hand side. Uh, This way, Mr. Marlowe. The front carpet that ran the length of the corridor was also gray. And that fit, too, with the morning and with what I had to tell Miss Cordelia Jones. But, well, it didn't fit with another morning. Three weeks ago, a morning that was bright inside and out, and it didn't fit with Jonesy. <laughs> oh, not Jonesy. The stranger in the butcher shop, the customer with the enchanting green-gray eyes, the girl who wanted the same sewing chicken I did. And in no uncertain terms. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, no, you don't possess the life, friend. It's nine cents for the law. And that young lady is just what I'm holding. Namely, one wing, one neck, both legs. Yes. No, I got here first. Oh, no, you didn't, Mr. Marlowe. There. Ah, but neither did you, Miss Jones. Ah, it was a tie. A photograph finish. Now, who really needs this funny little girl the most? Me. Me, I am the one who needs... We're not all talking together. Now, you first, Miss Jones. I, I, I'll be the judge. No, Fair please. enough, Mr. Ford. Your Honor, early this morning I was inspired. I woke up thinking about chicken cacciatore. Chicken cacciatore? What do you think I was thinking oh, about? Please, I was thinking please, about... Please. No, no, no interruptions now. Now, young lady, you woke up thinking about chicken cacciatore. Go ahead, Nancy. Nancy? The chicken cacciatore, you need chicken, and since I cook for one, I need a small chicken and the testimony. Aha. Uh-huh. And you, Mr. Marlowe? The same, Judge. Honest to goodness. From inspiration, do I also cook for one? Come in. Is... Not even spoken for. You? Uh-uh. What good? Then that does it. I don't know. Solves the problem. Tonight, you have dinner together. Oh, no, we couldn't. We don't even know each other. Why, this Mr. What's your name again? Marlowe, Phil Marlowe. What's yours? I don't know. I don't know. I don't spare you the first part I answered with him. Oh, dear. Yeah, now you know each other. You as well? Take me. Don't you? Oh, no, I... 
to 100 years here now. Eight o'clock. Don't be late. Um, send your bird out, please, Mr. Schwartz. Aye, aye. Goodbye. Oh, goodbye. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, yes, Mr. Schwartz. Uh, you can put the chicken down now. We are the only ones in the shop. <laughs> well, that's the way it started. And it had gone along at about the same steps from the chicken cacciatore, which was the best I'd ever eaten. But only because I could look at the lovely chef while I ate it. Passed a wonderfully gabby evening that I didn't want to see end. But end it did. The lunch the next day and the day after. Oh, yeah, as long as you were something, all right. By profession, an artist around the edges. She painted beer cans in the light for an ad agency downtown. So her place on Sheremoya was half studio, half apartment, and all cozy. You know the kind of cozy that makes you want to curl up the second you walk in? <laughs> Always makes you hate to leave. But leave you did because Jonesy liked to go places. And Jonesy liked to do things. Like to play miniature golf and badminton and, uh, of course, bowling every Wednesday night. Okay. Tomorrow on front it is, but the lady still has one car left. All right, let's see it. Here we go! <laughs> hey! Now, tell me, am I great or no? Quick. Great, baby. Real great. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before we start through the observatory proper, and tonight was fighting trip to the moon. Oh, the ball that's just a double crossing deal. Yes. Talking I'm talking about you. You, you, you call my office. Fool, dear, tonight, you say. Let's just look at the moon. Ah. Yeah. Are you Mr. Mulholland Drive? You bet I expected Mulholland Drive. Yeah, park car and all. Oh, come on, don't be. We can still get out of here. You. Uh, have you two quite finished your little chat? Uh, <laughs> quite. I, uh, you just... <laughs> we'll try. We'll be very quiet, we promise. Thank you. You want to stay with the others? Okay, we'll stay with you. <laughs> Something breaking you up, Junior? Yeah. Young love, my friend. What was that? Now, excuse me, but I don't think I can listen to a charming guide anymore. Good night. Oh, you're going to do the rest of us? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That man going to the door. Yeah. Who is he? What did he That he was leaving, but young love always broke him up. Why? Because I... I don't know. I guess I thought he was somebody else. But come on, I think he wouldn't listen to him. Or the moon over Mulholland Drive. Yeah, be tactful, boy. Maybe a few things. Oh, Most inimitable trial, Jonesy was crazy. But there, too, I went right along with her. Because in those three weeks, I passed up a half a dozen jobs for every one I took. Never stuck my chin out very far when I did go to work, and all in all, tried my best not to behave like the high school sophomore who suddenly realized that spring can mean something more important than baseball. We were at her place one night. The evening plans had called for me to sit as a model, from the wrist down exclusively. All I had to do was hold a bottle of Johnny Walker in the pouring position while she kissed it. But I just couldn't get with things. Well, I'm yeah, and I'm not going to get any steadier. How much longer, Jonesy? Don't think about it. What about tomorrow? Sunday. Can we play? Loads of them. Yes. What happens first? I come over here. Breakfast, no doubt. Mm-hmm. And after hot cakes, bacon and eggs, coffee and lots of cigarettes, we can, uh... Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, come to think of it, I have. <laughs> Grapefruit broiled. <laughs> we'll start with that. Then the eggs basted, oh, and then... Oh, you're impossible. <laughs> I'm helpless. What next? After you've gorged yourself, I mean. Yeah, well, after I've gorged, we'll get in my car and take a ride. Say, uh, Laguna Beach? Oh, no, not that, you. Not Laguna. Uh-huh. You what? What is it, Jonesy? What's wrong with Laguna? Nothing, Phil. I... It's just that I don't like it there. It's an artist calling in the night. Right. And it's where I couldn't make a go of it once. <laughs> I'd have a nice back. I'd rather go someplace else. Anything. All right? Sure. Yeah, I thought it was something more serious, Jonesy. I mean, not that your work doesn't count, but... You're but... a detective without office hours, huh? Yeah, I guess so. 
Do I go back to the bottle bar? Uh-uh. You don't move an inch down. Well? Give me that stuff. That will board paper all of it. We'll put it over here and I... Oh, you can't. I'm crazy. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what it Yeah. Oh, no diamond, Sam. I don't think. Glad it wasn't your watch. That's broken. Mm-hmm. Hey, baby, it's kind of cute. Me and your ice skates, huh? For my kid brother. Oh. I think we were going to be a great skating team when we grew up. Really? And uh, the four-leaf clothing? Oh, well, wish it. Stay back at college. A girl. Mm-hmm. Hey, hey, kid. Tear our hearts and twine. I'm out there. Oh, so back at college and none of your business. Okay. And this thing? Hmm? Here, where the piece is broken off near the chain. What was that? Well... It was a... A wishbone. Mm. Go when I lost it. Can you put the bracelet on my wrist, please? I must remember I gotta finish this set. Do the first thing Monday morning. Tonight? You mean I gotta close them on? No, no thanks, Phil. I, I can finish it alone. I'll I'll look for you tomorrow morning with you. All right? All right. Good night, Jonesy. home, I floundered someplace between pouting poor Marlowe. The girl he goes for keeps secrets from him. And plain male pride. Goodbye, Jonesy. You live your life and I'll live mine. But by the next morning, I sold myself on the switch. Some things just weren't my business. It wasn't a private detective where Jonesy was concerned. It would all work itself out. Life would go on. And it did. Breakfast was wonderful. Boiled grapefruit and food. And the ride to what turned out to be Santa Barbara perfect. So in the days that followed, no more was said about it, and nothing unusual happened. Until the following Friday night, that was the night before last. We were at a square dance to the local daughters of something or other lodge. The exercise would do me good, she said, and I was learning in a hurry. I thought. <laughs> The guide in her throat, and we swung into a grand right and left, which abruptly brought her up against a tall, fat man with a circle of sweating face without the cold, black buttons for eyes. Almost no nose and thin, pale lips that were twisted as far away from a smile as possible. Without saying a word to me, she ran from the floor towards the check room. And I started after her until suddenly I remembered the face that had just frightened me. The man who had laughed at young love that night at the observatory. The man Jonesy had thought she'd known. I turned back just in time to see him walk off the other side of the dance floor. I'd calmly leave the building by a side entrance, which was all the cue I needed. Hey, hey, you, hold it. I want to talk to you. Yeah, who are you, friend? And let's not bother with the routine we played at the observatory. <laughs> Oh, yes, I remember you now. Good. What else do you remember? Come on, the girl in there. I want answers, mistress. They mean a lot to me. <laughs> yes, so I see. So you saw before and I'll start talking. All right. That's just what I planned to do. And you can tell her that for me. And also remind her that I was on the corner of Third and Oak, too, on Armistice Day. Third and Oak. On Laguna Beach. L- Laguna Beach? Yes. And if you don't mind, give her this, will you? Gold wishbone. A charm. Uh-huh. A charm that can't miss for me because both ends are in my hands, see? So when I pull it apart as I make my wish, I can't lose. Damn. Now the pieces, Mr. Big Talk. I turn them to the lady and tell her that I'll be heard from again. Good night. Good night. Yeah. They'll hear from me again, too. Oh, wait a minute, a customer. Call you back. Yes, sir. You check? Yeah. But first, miss, there was a girl. About your height, dark hair, pretty green eyes, a green dress, oh, cut yeah, like... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, are you Mr. Marlowe, maybe? That's right. Did she leave a message? Yeah, she said to tell you she was going, but not home. Just going. Just going? Yeah. Just going. For good. Oh, uh... 
Want your hat and coat now, mister? Yeah. My hat and coat. Jonesy was gone. With no other word than that, she wasn't coming back. I spent what was left of the night looking for her, checking from one place to another, but it was no good. And the next morning early, when I tried once more at a studio or coffin, all I found out was that she'd never returned. I decided there was one place left to look. The street corner in Laguna where over a month ago something had happened that wouldn't lie still. I got in my car and headed south, and all the way down for once the Pacific surf looked cold and hostile. And the dreary desolation that hits all beach resorts out of season settled on Laguna like a thick hangover. I finally found the intersection of third note. With two sleepy drugstores, a tying bar, and a pottery can closed for the winter. Nothing else. The only sign of life was a black fretted old man on a bench, whittling listlessly at a piece of gnarled gray drift which had matched his hands to perfection. It looked as though he'd been there for 20 years. So I decided to give him a try. What's that to say, you know, fellow? I said things are pretty dull around here, huh, Pop? <laughs> I don't know. Generally, somewhere there's something happening. People come, people go. Like you. They've all got things on their minds. Uh-huh. They ought to come and go more often, Pop. You take a dead corner, huh? Dead? Well, I don't know about that much. Seems like this corner gets a good share of life. Oh? I'll bet you nothing's happened in this corner in the last six months worth talking about. You're wrong, son. It's run the gamut. For instance, last August, a baby was born over in front of the drugstore there in a taxi. Mrs. Wright, Gail Wright it was. Uh, Old Cy Lemley, the druggist, delivered a fine job. Drew an eight-pound boy. And uh, on the other end of life? Yeah, that too. A fellow named Peters. He was a kind of belated war casualty, you might say. How do you mean? Well, he went through the First World War without a scratch. And then he got himself killed by a hit-and-run driver right over there in front of the tavern. And it happened just a month ago. An armistice day. Hit-and-run. A man dead. Yes, yeah, about 2 o'clock in the morning, they say. To this day, they haven't caught up with the driver. That... Say, what's the matter, sir? You're white as a sheep. I felt like I'd been hit hard below the belt. I don't remember what I told the old man. All I could think of was Jonesy on Armistice Day. A hit-and-run death and a slimy maggot breaking a wishbone charm between fat fingers. But my next step was mechanical. I started checking rooming houses. The catered strictly to artists, and the third one paid off. More than I expected. Cordelia. Yes, I remember Cordelia. Come in. Thanks. And she did have a room here, Mrs. Winkle. Yes, she did. Now, what was it about Cordelia, Mr. Martin? Well, I am a friend of hers, Mrs. Winkle, a good friend. I'm trying to locate her. I see. Well, Cordelia left quite suddenly in the middle of the night, Mr. Marlowe. Left a half-finished canvas behind the beautiful thing. Yes, sometimes artists have to spread their wings and fly. Even in the middle of the night? Nah, yes. I used to myself when I was younger, heaven knows. Tell me, Mr. Marlowe, is anything wrong about Cordelia? Why do you ask that, Mrs. Winkle? Because the morning after she left, it was the armistice day, I think. A man came here asking about her. A fat man. Did you know him? No. And from what I read in his face, I don't think I like him. Look, Mrs. Winkle, i got to find out all I can about the guy right away. You mean the trouble for Jonesy, uh, Cordelia. You see, she... Oh, what I mean is... Don't that... bother explaining how she got in this As it turned out, this fellow used the telephone while he was here. His name is, uh, oh, now, uh, Orland, uh, something we can live in, like it. Begley, that's it. Orland Begley. He made a reservation at the Beekman Plaza Hotel in Hollywood. Begley, Beekman Plaza, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, now look, did you tell him anything about Jonesy leaving like she did? Oh, goodness, no. I said she planned on leaving. Uh, I even told him what we had for breakfast. He just smiled. <laughs> then he went to bed. That's all I know. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mrs. Winkle. Thanks a lot. Good luck, Mr. Marlowe. Good luck, she said. Sure. All the good luck Marlowe and a girl named Jonesy had coming was burned out on a street corner at 2 o'clock in the morning a month ago. That was just a chance. I could only talk to Jonesy. 
All the way back to L.A., I worried because... For that, I had to find her first. I was halfway down the hall to my apartment when I heard it. My phone. I ran to the door and practically ripped it off the hinges before it stopped ringing. Hello? Hello, darling. Jonesy. Jonesy, where are you? Oh, that doesn't matter. I just called to say goodbye, Bill. I couldn't leave without that. Now, look, you're not going any place. You're going to sit tight right where you are till I get there. No, it's no use, Phil. I'm in a bad jam. I should have told you about it long ago, but... Well, it's too late now. It's not too late, baby. I just got back from Laguna. Honey, I know all about it. Look, look, you're in love with a good private eye, you remember? Don't run, baby. That's not the answer. There isn't any answer, Phil. I never was, Phil. Jonesy, please, will you shut up and listen to me for a minute? I can't, Phil. I've thought it all over. My mind's made up. So I'm going to have to get out of this mess my own way. Honey, we've got to talk. Come on, where are you? Please, Phil. Can't you see I'm having an awful tough time with this pinch as it is? Jonesy, baby, look. Don't make it tougher on me. I'm sorry for you, but thanks for the buggy ride. You should as well while it lasted. You can't run. Don't try it. I know that, but I... Come on, Phil. Okay, Jonesy. We'll make it the hard way. Since I couldn't stop Jonesy from running, I figured I could at least stop the guy who was chasing us. So I called the Beekman Plaza and found out that all in Begley was still registered. I got in my car and started for the hotel, but then I got another idea. There was a good chance that a sleazy, blackmailing crumb like Beggy carried a record of his own. Anyway, it was worth a try and would pay off better now than a beating. So I went to police headquarters and said where Detective Lieutenant Matthews was his old sympathetic self as usual. So, you got some citizen all faked out and now you want to find out if he's a crook. Now, well, what is this, something new in crime detection? Now, look, Matthews, I'll come down some quiet Tuesday and we'll make all the jokes all afternoon. But right now... Now, wait a minute. If you're going to dip into police files, I would like to know a little bit more about it. Huh? No joke. All right, the guy goes by the name of Alden Bagley. Fat, dark, six, one, about 40. Could be anything from a badger to a bum check artist. Right now, he's shooting an angle that includes me. So I find him in the files. I want an exclusive on him for 10 minutes, and he's all yours. Yeah? And what's the hook? Why are you included? Because of a brunette named Jones. Oh. Jones? Sir. Yes, Jones. I'd like to make it Marlowe someday. Don't fool, Matthews. This time I'm serious. Okay, sir. Okay, help yourself. You'll find about 3,000 fat guys in there. You know, 2,000 of them with dark hair. Go ahead and start. I'll send in one of the clerks to give you a hand. Matthews' gift was close. With a clerk's help and hard work, we narrowed the field down to a few hundred cars and started through. Street lights have been on our side for an hour before we finally found it. Forty pounds lighter and sporting a mustache, but there was no doubt about it. James Orland, alias Jim Orlo, alias Orlin Biglow, was now all in Begley with charges that ran from petty thievery in Louisiana to one that even got Matthews on the ball. Begley was wanted for murder in Rhode Island. What are we waiting for, Model? Let's go get him. Piled into the squad car and headed up Sunset Boulevard, I began to feel good again. For the first time, Jones had run away at the square land. When we turned up Whitley, Matthews cut the siren and two blocks above the boulevard, we stopped. Around the corner from the Beekman Plaza. It was a two story frame hotel held together by countless coats of cheap paint only. And inside, a line of empty sweet air bottles said it took something more than ordinary ventilation to keep the musty smell from getting thick enough to chew. The jittery night clerk managed to tell us that Bagley had room 212 and left his mouth hanging open while Matthew sent him outside. Marlo, you mentioned ten minutes alone with him. You still want it? Yeah. It's important to me, Matthew. Okay. Somebody's got to go up and get him. Might as well be you. Look, the boys will cover his window from outside and both ends of the hall from the landing. If it gets tight, just whistle and duck. Go ahead. second floor where the only light was a red bowl with the far end of the hall marked fire exit. Just then, midway down, I saw a figure backing out of the door. A fat figure who was having trouble with a lock. He turned. The three fast tests caught me before he realized I was there. It was all in Bagley. When he saw me, he stopped and began slowly backing up. You, uh, What do you want? What, what are you doing here? Where is she, Bagley? I don't know. She went out, I guess. It's all off, anyway, I... I go through it, and I, I changed my mind. Sure you did. Come here, you! You lousy, murdering pig, Begley. Get up! How, how did you know that? How'd you find out? Police filed bulletin from Rhode Island. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. I, I'm hot. I had to have a dog. That's the only reason I tried to shake the kid down. Hey, but listen, man. You got me now, so let's make a deal. I'll keep my yacht shut. Not one word about that hit and run. You let me out of here. Bad chance. You're slimy. Oh, but... hey, sucker. I've killed him more than once. But you won't stop me. Nice going, Marlo. You got him. Light on his face where he belongs. Hey, where you going? Find Jonesy, Matthews. I got to talk to her. Hey, what's up? Yeah? Well, you hear that, Marlo? Brunette. Well, let's go. It looks like you can do your talking right here and now. Come on, boy. I went along with Matthews, all right. But it didn't work out like he expected because what I had to say to Jonesy then just couldn't be said. Not in a cheap hotel with a bunch of tough cops standing around it. I had to wait. Wait for the hours of a long night to pass. The night I spent pounding the sidewalk two miles of back streets while I tried to get hold of myself. But all that had been 12 hours ago. Now it was morning. Now I could look at her again. Yeah, and now as I followed Mr. Early down the great carpeted hall to a door, I figured I could tell Jonesy all I wanted to say. She's here, Mr. Marlowe. She's been here. Thanks. Well, Jim, I guess you didn't understand me. The two people are in love, they share everything. You didn't even chance, Jim. You see, I found out Begley was a killer. After you'd already gone to his hotel to get him. You're a crazy kid. You should have trusted me, Jim. Played it straight. Because no matter how you add it up, we had something worth waiting for. Well, as you said, thanks for the buggy ride, baby. It was great. Oh, here's your little charm. Wishbone. Sorry, it's broken. Bye, Jonesy. Is there anything else I can do to help Mr. Mono? No. Nothing. Thanks. Good day, sir. Hillcrest Mortuary, Mr. Early is speaking. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Gene Bates, Bill Johnstone, Jane Morgan, John Daner, Edgar Barrier, and Ann Morrison. The square dance was called by Paul Pierce. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard O'Rourke. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a tobacco-chewing engineer... A redhead running a bulldozer and a leprechaun on a drag line all added up to death at an unfinished trestle. And there could have been more. But then I found out which one had actually submitted the lowest bid. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Gerald Moore, comes to you every Saturday evening at this same time, transcribed. I was up the coast with two murders behind me, telling all to a nice white-haired old lady when the clock struck 12. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, 
with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The House That Jack Willen Built. They say the end of an old year and the start of a new is a good time to take stock. To stand back and give yourself the once-over. Do a reissue on that tired list of resolutions. But for a private detective, that routine only means tallying up the times you've dirtied your hands on someone else's murder. Or dirtied your brain with their schemes. So you let the hide on your heart grow a little thicker. Pull the part of your mind that feels things a little farther back into its shell. And maybe plan on later hunting up a cup of kindness or two someplace. But even that has a price tag on it these days. So there was work to do and a fee to collect before I could pick up the tab on an evening's fun. Hey, you're a detective? That's not a fair question. Won't you sit down? Oh, that's I... fantastic. I tell you, I'm going crazy with this. With this horrible trick of fate. What's the matter? What's going the on? The house, it's gone. It's vanished. What and house? All the papers with it. Years of research, months of grueling work in the jungles, volumes of preciousness, all gone. Whisk away from the very heart of a teeming city. An entire house. Now, look, if you just sit down and tell me who you I are, I... no object. I must have action. I must locate. Who are you? The... Professor Felix Piper. Well, what's all this talk about jungles and research? Yeah, botanical research, tropical herbs in South America, years of it all for nothing now because the house has disappeared. Look, you said that several times. Now, look, You Professor... investigate things. You've had experience. I want to hire you now. I go to where a house should be, a house in which I myself have stood. And what do I find? A vacant lot, a hole in the ground. And all I... Oh, 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 oh Professor, take it easy. My heart. Here, come on over to the couch it's and lie down. Take it easy, will you? Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. It's all been such a shock. Oh, stabbed and sudden death. The long trip to get our papers and then to find the house gone. Yeah, I know. Now, look, if you just lie there a few minutes until you feel better, we'll start over. A little closer to the beginning. That's yes, right. Well, Professor, what's the matter? What's happened here? Well, the date our house has disappeared and the professor's collapsed trying to tell me about it and I, uh, you... Oh. Who are you? I'm Professor Piper's assistant. What are you assisting with? Uh, Stephanie, oh, I'm glad you got here. Yes, don't worry, don't worry, it's nothing. I'll be all right, I'll be all right. But let's not waste any more time. You've got to find out what happened to that house. We Please, got to find Professor out. Piper, don't excite yourself. Oh. Let me explain to the detective. Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. I'm Stephanie Fraser. Hello. Hello. Yeah, please, the house, dive into the paint. All right, the Professor, paint. all right. Yes, sir. Mr. Marlowe, I presume he got as far as telling you that for over a year we've been in South America in the interior of Brazil studying tropical earth. Yeah, part of that got in there somewhere, I think. Yeah, but just of course it did. Uh, tell him about the house. Oh, one step at a time, Felix. Now, look, Professor, I've got something here that'll do you the world of good. Ah. Me too, I think. <laughs> now, try this. Take your time about yes, it. Yes, I will. I Mr. Marlowe, could I speak to you in the other room for a moment? Of course. I'll be right back, Mr. Piper. Yes, yes, sir. But hurry, hurry. Volatile, isn't it? Yes, but convenient, partner. As I was saying, Mr. Marlowe, we've been almost completely out of touch with civilization for over a year. Really? You never know it. Beauty parlors before miracles. Mm. Please, Mr. Marlowe, let me tell you what happened. Okay. Professor Piper's collaborator and partner, Maxwell Stuyvesant, caught fever and died three weeks ago. Where was this? Brazil. Where the nuts come from? Nothing, huh? Look, Mr. Marlowe, they had worked together for years, and all their notes and papers were kept stored at Stuyvesant's place here in Los Angeles. We came here to get that material. And the house was gone. Fantastic, isn't it? Certainly is. We all thought mm. Maxwell Stuyvesant's wife, Catherine, was living in it. She owned it. In her name? Yes. Oh. Maxwell actually owned nothing. He didn't want to. He was gone all the time. That didn't sit too well with Catherine, huh? Right. She wanted Stuyvesant to stay home, and he always promised her that someday he would, and they'd live a happy life together. But, well, she was a young woman, impatient, I guess. Yeah. Where is she now? Well, one of the neighbors, an old woman, said she thought she remembered hearing that Catherine went to Nebraska. Nebraska? Mm. And, and that's all we know. Professor Piper and I are stumped. We came to you because we want action and want it fast. Will you help us? Well, the whole year's been screwy. There's no reason why this should bother me. Tracking a runaway resident through the metropolitan wilds of Los Angeles didn't sound so tough. So after Stephanie gave me the address, 8840 on Orange Drive, and told me that she and the professor could be reached at Villa 3 in the Wilshire Garden, I got in my car and drove out Orange Drive to where a house numbered 8840 should have been. I found that said house had been moved out six months ago, and in the middle of the night, too. But where, why, or who had done the job, nobody knew. Until I got around to a Mrs. Elma Lathrop, whose house backed the Stuyvesant place from across the alley. She blocked her front door with a waistline that said she'd never heard of Rye Crisp. 
Gave me an eye as warm and as sympathetic as an ice cube. Remember that? Huh. I should have to tell you I remember. Craziest thing I ever saw. Them men working all day and all night getting that little house up on rollers now to there. I'd like to know what all the rush was about. So would I. You wouldn't happen to know where they took it, huh? No, I wouldn't. That Catherine Stuyvesant wasn't a very sociable type person. But if that's the way she wants to be, it's all right with me. That's good. Now, look, I don't suppose you'd know who she sold it to. No. What company did the moving? Oh, wouldn't I, though? It's the Gilligan Reckon and Moving Company, and believe you me, the name fit. Mm. Them clumsy oxes. In such a rush, they backed a big truck over my pomegranate tree. A beautiful, full-grown tree in the pink of health. Did I make them pay? I'll bet. Now, uh, you listen. Have I a choice? I tracked that outfit down and made them shell up through the nose for that. Was I burned? Well, bully for you. Now, look, where is the Gilligan Outfit's office, Mrs. Lathrop? At Adams and Rampart Street. 410 Rampart. 410, huh? But say, what's going on anyway? Why are you asking me all these questions? Well, frankly, I'm a pomegranate fancier myself, Mrs. Lathrop. Happy New Year. Yeah, this is 410 Rampart, isn't it? That's correct. Well, your sign outside says Bloopman's Novelties. Are you one of them? Ashtrays, paperweights, okay. bonds, and silver papers. Okay, honey, okay. Mm-hmm. Now, look, yeah, I'm looking for the Gilligan Wrecking and Moving Company. I was told they had this place six months ago. That's right. But they're out of business now. They went broke last September. Oh. Boss left town in a hurry. How do you like that? Not much. Mr. Gilligan, Gil- Gilligan owed everybody wages, including my boyfriend. He used to work for Mr. Gilligan. That's, that's how we met Bat. Bat? Mm-hmm. They were moving out as we moved in. Small world, huh? Getting smaller all the time. Now, look, I'd like to talk to your boyfriend, Miss, uh... Bessie. Bessie. Well, um, Bat lives real close to here. The Beekman Room. Oh, thanks, Bessie. What's Bat's last name? Battenschlag. Who? Battenschlag. Yeah, anybody'd know that. Well, you better just call him Bat. All right. And, um, uh, tell him to drop around, will you? <laughs> I wish I was a tender apple for Lata Meh. Or Spanish I wonder who wrote those lyrics. Uh, who is it? Name's Marlowe. And want some dope on a job the Gilligan Company did, Bat. All right, just a minute. Well, uh, how did you get to me? Bessie. Oh. By the way, she said to you to drop around. Oh, yeah? Dumb dame. Don't I every night? Uh, come on in, buddy. Excuse the robe. I, I was in the shower. Sure, sure. Now, look, Bat, were you working for Gilligan six months ago? Uh, yeah, yeah, why? You remember moving a house from 8840 Orange Drive? 8840 Orange Drive. Yeah. I've seen now. Oh, yeah, that one, too. I, that was the screwiest deal I ever saw. Where'd you move it to, do you remember? All the way to San Pedro. Big hurry-up job. The boss kept saying we were racing the weather. Nobody could figure it. Racing the weather? Why? That beats me. We set the house off down at the end of Front Street in the Harbor Salvage Company yard. Harbor Salvage in San Pedro. Uh, eh? Tell me, Bat, was the house empty? Well, certainly. You don't think No, 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 people... Bat. I mean the furniture. Oh, oh. Well, why? What's all the fuss? Now, well, some people are interested in locating that house. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's too bad. How come? Uh, I got a big hunch it didn't sit very long where we left it, buddy. The Pacific Ocean was only six inches from the back door. <laughs> I'm beating my ass, mate. What's on your mind? Well, if you're the head man of Harbor Salvage Company, a house is on my mind. That's me. But I don't want any more house jobs. I did one this year, and that's plenty. Six months ago, house delivered by Gilligan? That's it, mate. And I did a masterpiece, if I do say so myself. Sure wouldn't chance it again, no too shifty. Never mind your career. What happened to that house? What happened? Why, I loaded it on that old woman's barge. What old woman? As I was saying, I loaded it on that old woman's barge, battened it down, ship shape in the last two days, good sailing weather, and sent her out to sea. You mean that house left here on a barge? Ah, that it did, mate. Bound for the Golden Gate in the upper arm of San Francisco Bay. Oh, fine. Little shrimp fish in town in the backwater there called Wilson. If I remember right, it's on San Pablo Bay, about 15 miles north of Berkeley. Oh, now do you mind telling me who the old woman was who owned that barge, Nias? Not a bit. Kindly old soul, she was named Jacqueline Beatty. Went aboard with the house and waved goodbye from the front door. She pulled out. 
All smiles, too. What's the matter, son? You look like a deckhand who's lost his sea legs. What had started three short hours ago as a checkup on an L.A. residence had evolved itself into a chase up the coast after a houseboat, which was a project I distinctly did not want to jump into without first a nod from my clients. In fact, I was ready to scuttle the whole business. I found a phone and called Villa 3 at the Wilshire Garden. Yeah, hello. Hello. Is that you, Matthews? Yeah. This is Marlowe. Oh, hiya, Phil. What can I do for you but make it snappy, will you? I'm up to my ears. Hey, wait a minute. Phil, look, you called up here expecting someone else to answer, didn't you? Who? A guy named Felix Piper, maybe. Nice fit. What's the connection? Client, what fit? Ex-client, Marlowe, he's it. Somebody huh? tagged him. Yeah, with a knife. A very fancy knife like some Indians in Brazil use, the boys tell me. Oh. You better drop in here. Where are you now? Uh, San Pedro. What are you doing down there? Yeah, well, you, you wouldn't believe it, Matthews. Really, you wouldn't. See if we can get all of that belt up now. Okay. Oh, hello, Marlowe. Hi, Matthews. Any progress? Uh, too soon. Oh. Anyway, I'm counting on you for that. Come on inside, have a look. Okay. When did it happen? A couple hours ago. Mm -hmm. What was his dodge, anyway? We found a club membership card lists him as a botanist. True? Yeah, as far as I know. Spent a lot of time in research in Brazil. Where did nuts come from? Nothing. Oh. Well, there's your client, Phil. Professor Felix Piper and somebody nailed him right between the shoulders. Hey, Matthews. Hmm? Something's awful haywire. What do you mean? That's not the man who hired me. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe, but first... One fellow who made a New Year's resolution years ago not to get married certainly saw it blow up with a bang a couple of weeks ago. A fellow by the name of Andy, of Amos and Andy, opened his mouth at the wrong moment, and there he was, married to the wrong woman. Listen for Amos and Andy and Andy's Bride on most of these same CBS stations tomorrow night. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The House That Jacqueline Built. I told Detective Lieutenant Matthews that the crumpled form at our feet identified as Felix Piper, and the Felix Piper who had hired me were not one and the same. He arched a single eyebrow slowly. When I told him the rest of the story, both eyebrows practically leaped from his forehead. So all in all, it was 30 minutes of steady gab, my solemn word that what I had said was nothing but the truth, and a blunt reminder that a private detective's license is revocable before I was free to go back to my apartment on Franklin while the police went to work. That made it exactly 4 p.m. When key in hand, I reached my front door lock just as it swung in and away from me. Come in, Mr. Marlowe. Well, the globe-trotting Stephanie. How'd my place care to get on your map, baby? Please, don't joke. Come in. Thank you. Lovely apartment you've got here. Mr. Marlowe, please, this is no time to be funny. Why not? Everything else plays funny. Your lost L.A. house turns up floating on the outskirts of San Francisco. What? A screwball botanist from South America who's maybe also a killer... Wants a bunch of hocus pocus papers. Oh, so a killer. Well, what do you mean, Mr. Marlowe? Felix Piper didn't kill Corday. Corday. That's his name, huh? You get around, don't you, yes, kid? Yes, Martin Corday. He was on the floor of my villa when I got back. That's why I came here. The, the janitor left Yeah, me, yeah, let's was... not change the subject. This Corday, who is he? Or was he? A scheming, ruthless man when you were in South America. An importer. Wait a minute. An importer wants a botanist paper? Come on, baby, tell me the truth. Mr. Marlowe, there are no papers. Oh, that's great. You mean that all this about the house is phony, make no, believe? No, 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 it's true. But? But no papers. Only jewels. Only jewels. Oh, no. Ruby's, Mr. Marlowe. In a little pouch. $30,000 worth hidden in the house. Where in the house? The fireplace. Behind a brick somewhere on the right-hand side. You see, those rubies belong to Felix and that Maxwell Stratton I mentioned. Now they belong to Felix alone. They were for their old age. Or, the expression's nest egg. So they could carry on their work. Hmm. You don't believe me? No, not quite, no, no. 
And for two very valid reasons. One, why'd you lie in the first place and say it was papers? Because we didn't know if we could trust you. And I was a man dead, you have to, is that it? No, I don't have to, but I do trust you, Mr. Marlowe. Well, it may not be mutual, Stephanie. What do you mean? Well, if I buy all this, the jewels, Piper and Stuyvesant's unique retirement plan, Corday posing as Piper to some way cut in as a new hooker. Which is what? Corday is murderer. It should now be you or Felix Piper. No. Then who? Corday's partner. A, a swarthy-looking little man. I, I don't know his name. I last saw him with Corday in South America. You, you see, the original plan was that I come up here ahead of Felix. But he, he was too anxious. He couldn't wait. He, he followed almost at once. So? So, somehow or other, Corday and this swarthy man found out about our plans and decided that Corday should pose as Felix and as for their scheme. And, and what? Well, there must have been a double cross. Corday probably trying to do away with the swarthy man, but getting done away with himself instead. Mm. Where's Felix Piper now? In a second-rate hotel on Santa Monica. Phone Bay. number there, do you know it? Uh, yes, I, I have it right here in my All place. right. Crestview 8 something. Yes, here. Crestview 8 4 1 4 4. 4 1 4 4. Okay, here you talk to him, Stephanie. My nerves won't take the chatter. What, what, what should I tell him? Um, Mr. Felix Piper, please. Well, tell him for the time being we're going to skip the police. Mm -hmm. But you and I are going up to San Francisco on the next plane and then out to a place called Wilson to look for a houseboat. No less rubies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also tell him to meet us up there at the Crystal Auto Court. Mm -hmm. Got that? It's mm -hmm. the place I've stayed at a little beyond Berkeley. On the road to San Pablo Bay. All right. Um, Stephanie, Felix, one moment. Yeah, yeah. Tell him to stay clear of swarthy men tonight. Especially small ones. They're dangerous. <laughs> It was two hours and 30 minutes later when Stephanie and I drove into the quiet fishing village of Wilson on San Pablo Bay that hugged the bend of the sloping shoreline like he was afraid of falling in. My best bet for information would be the local gas emporium. So I drove my rented car in at a round-shouldered one-pump station. Something freckled and gangling with a shock of flame for hair pulled himself out of a fence. Arms and legs working independently, wobbled over, braced himself against the car. Gas or just information, folks? Don't be ashamed, everybody from out of town gets lost in Wilson. <laughs> it's so big. <laughs> Made it funny. <laughs> Look, if that's the case, we'll own up right away, Red. We're looking for a houseboat. Yes. Hey, well, then you better dry the water. <laughs> this boy kills himself, doesn't he? Look, Red, we're in a hurry. This houseboat had belonged to a lady named Jacqueline Beatty. No more jokes, huh? <laughs> yeah, don't worry. There's nothing funny about that. Screwy old widow. Believe me, she's sad. Sad? Why? Well, about six months ago, she took every cent she had, went down to L.A., bought a house and bought a barge and put them both together and come back here. To do what? To sit. To do nothing. All day and all night long. She never leaves. You know why? Nope. Neither does nobody else. Except that her husband was an artist, painted sea pictures, so she likes it around the water. But she's nuts, I tell you. Acts like the place is... Well, acts like it's made of gold. So oh. Now, look, Red, tell me, how do I get there? We're reporters from L.A. doing a story on her place. Oh, newspaper people, huh? Your reporters usually are, boy. Well, that's different. Smart, Ellie. It's one block straight ahead, then right, and down to the bay. Thanks, Red. Happy New Year. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> John went ahead and three right and were down to where the town and the bay trickled up to meet one another, we saw it. A white three-room cottage of floats surrounded by fishing boats and a sort of barge. The front door opened it on not. Not tugboat any, nor the scraggly pioneer woman, rifle cradled in bony arms. Just anybody's grandmother. And under a white lace shawl at that. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Well, uh, yeah, I believe so. You're Mrs. Beatty, huh? That's right. Mrs. Jacqueline Beatty. Oh, well, I'm Philip Marlowe. Mrs. Beatty, this is Miss Stephanie Fraser. How do you do? We're reporters from L.A. Reporters? Mm. We uh, were going through Wilson here when we heard about your houseboat mm. and how you brought it all the way up from Los Angeles. You uh, had a particular reason for wanting this house, Mrs. Beatty? Oh, my, yes. What was that? <laughs> well, that's a long, long story, my boy. I see. Well, tell me, Mrs. Beatty, the house is exactly as it was in Los Angeles, huh? Oh, to a tea, Mr. Marlowe. Would you like this to see? Oh, yes, we'd love to. Fine. Then, shall we say lunch tomorrow? Uh, well, Mrs. Beatty, we're on our way back to Los Angeles now tonight. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. But, uh, well, you see, I simply have to tidy up some before company. Well, perhaps another time. Well, uh, 
I, I, I think lunch tomorrow will be splendid, Mrs. Beatty. Of course. Good, good. Then until midday tomorrow, we'll have a buffet for the three of us in front of the fireplace. Good night, Miss Fraser. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. Good night, Mrs. Beatty. Well, is it just a sweet old lady? I don't know. But when will we? Don't worry about midday tomorrow. Come on, let's get back to the crystal auto caught in your boss. The Alex Piper out and alone is a combination that worries me plenty. No, Mr. Marlowe. Mr. Piper hasn't shown yet, but he should any minute now. He called a half hour ago from someplace in Berkeley and said he was coming out here in a taxi. Well, now, let's see. A single cabin <laughs> for Miss Fraser here, mm -hmm. number six. And a double, number 11, for you and Mr. Piper. Right, Mr. Marlowe? Yes, that's right, Mr. Crystal. Okay. Now, Miss Fraser, if you'll come along with me, I'll show you the way. Be back in a minute, Mr. Marlowe. I I'll just tidy up, Phil. Then I'll come back here and wait with you for Felix. I'm so worried. Yeah, I know. Well, he'll be all right once he's with us. I hope so, Phil. Oh, uh, Mr. Crystal, can I call L.A. on this phone here? Oh, sure, Mr. Marlowe. Long distance is 110. Operator, I want to call a Los Angeles person to person. Party I want is Detective Lieutenant... What? Delay. Oh, yeah, New Year's Eve. Well, look, honey, I'd like to put the call through anyway. Oh, no! Come on. Get hold of yourself, Crystal. What'd he look like? Take it easy, fella. Hold on tight. Did you see him? Was he small, swarthy? Uh, I'm not sure, Mr. Marlowe. Think, Crystal, think. What'd he look like? Well, uh, he was kind of short. Uh, maybe, maybe swarthy. He was also fast. I couldn't tell. All right, all right. Come on. Come on away from us. We'll go back to your office. Now, listen to me carefully. You phone the police. I'm going to a houseboat on the San Pablo Bay where I think we'll find a small, swarthy man. We'll push a nice old lady around without batting an eye. But why? About 30,000 bucks worth of rubies. After I'd met Felix Piper and told him what had happened to Stephanie and brought him up to date on everything else, I slammed my right foot down hard on the accelerator and kept it that way until we were back at San Pablo Bay out of the car and running toward Jacqueline Beatty's houseboat where I figured the swarthy man who seemed to know every move might show. There I was wrong, because Jacqueline was all alone, safe and sound, and surprised. Why, why, Mr. Marlowe, you weren't expected till midday tomorrow. And, and that girl, isn't well, she? She won't be with us, I'm afraid, Mrs. Uh, Beatty. By the way, we're not reporters, Mr. Beatty. The lady in question is dead, and so is another man. Oh. All because of 30,000 bucks worth of rubies in a pouch that's behind one of the bricks in that fireplace. Uh, yes, yes, and I'm going to find them right away. They've got to be here. And this poker should sound them out in a hurry, yes. What's that you? Mrs. Beatty. We've been too long. The news of these oh, rubies doesn't seem to surprise you. I... Hey. What is it, Mr. Marlowe? A hunch, Mrs. Beatty. Get out of the way. A gun. Yeah. For a man named Corday. Yeah. What is it, Marlowe? What did you say? Corday. As in Martin Corday, and it looks like I was right. Yes, yes. But it may not do you any good. <laughs> I, I, I sure, sure. Oh, Mr. Yeah. Marlowe. Mr. Marlowe, yeah. is he going to die? Not until the state gets its hands on him. Yeah. You see, Mrs. Beatty, he's killed twice tonight. Right, Corday? Come on, if you want an ambulance, talk. Yeah, they, they, they had it coming all of them. Stevenson was double-crossed by Piper and his deathbed. Stevenson wanted the rubies to go to his wife, Catherine. Why? Hold it, Mrs. Beatty. Go on, Corday. The real Piper was a crook, huh? Decided to get the jewels himself, is that it? Yes, but he was also dumb. Oh, no, no. So Stephanie, his secretary, crossed him for a pretty deal with me. It was all her idea. Uh, going to you for help with me, posing as Piper. Oh. Go on. Oh, Mr. Marlowe. Go on, Corday. Yes, yes. yes. And Stephanie decided to double-cross me. After you stabbed the real Piper because he got up to L.A. in your villa sooner than expected, yes, huh? Yes, yes, yes. But she couldn't cross me. I was I was following her all the time. No, no, she didn't phone you from my place? No, 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 no. I was outside your door then. And she was talking to a number she made up. And you're lucky you handed her the phone when you did if you hadn't, she would have shot you. It was all lies. It was lies. The swore the man included. There isn't one. Oh, oh, Mr. Marlowe, he, 
Nancy. That's unconscious, Mrs. Beatty. I'll get an ambulance. Nancy, yes, hurry. I'll show you where the phone is. Yeah, after you tell me about the jewels, huh? The rubies, Mrs. Beatty. Your lack of surprise about them being hidden in the fireplace, I mean. How come? Well, I found those six months ago when I bought this house from Catherine Stuyvesant in Los Angeles. By the way, Mr. Marlowe, how did you know that man was for day? Fireplace, honey. <laughs> he went to the wrong side. It was worth a shot in the dark. Well, the phone's over there. You know, I noticed the loose brick on the right-hand side of the fireplace the moment I walked in. You see, I built this house with my own hands. Really? Why'd you move it up here, honey? Because my husband and I spent our honeymoon in this house. And we found our happiness here at San Pablo. Oh. You also found the rubies and sent them back to Catherine Stuyvesant? Yes, Mr. Marlowe. Well, happy New Year, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> happy New Year, Jacqueline. By the time I'd said goodbye to Jacqueline and walked outside, the first sun of 1950 was glinting across the waters of the bay. 1950. Another chance for Marlowe and for the world. I hope we both do better with it this year. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lois Corbett, Howard McNear, Georgia Ellis, John Daner, and Parley Bear. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oran. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time each carried a torch, and each was burned by it. The heel, the hero worshiper, and the hard-bitten blonde. And all because of a woman already two days dead. Hit this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This time, each carried a torch, and each was burned by it. The heel, the hero worshiper, and the hard bitten blonde. And all because of a woman already two days dead. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. In just a moment, tonight's story. But first, a message from the Ford dealers of America. Tonight, more than 110,000 enthusiastic motorists own new 1950 Fords. Here's what Donald L. Gibson, a pilot from Kansas City, says about his 50 Ford. As a pilot, I'm naturally interested in engines, and that's why I bought a 50 Ford. That V8 really ticks along, and ticks is just the right word, because it's as smooth and quiet as the Swiss movement and a good watch. And it's not just the Ford engine that's fine. The ride is just like flying in smooth air, and the car handles like a dream. Anyone who's thinking of buying a new car should certainly take a check ride in the 50 Ford. We Ford dealers are swamped with comments like that. But don't take anyone's word for this new 50 Ford. Prove it for yourself. Look up your nearest Ford dealer in the classified phone directory. Or perhaps you know him personally. He'll arrange a test drive in the 50 Ford. Test drive it for comfort, for power, for safety, and for the quietness, which is its mark of quality. Yes, before you buy any car at any price, test drive the 50 Ford at your Ford dealers tomorrow. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Torch Carriers. The eight hours that had just slipped away had been a noisy assortment of big people with little troubles I hadn't wanted to help. 
and little people with big troubles I hadn't been able to help. So by the time it was all over and I was heading for home, a cozy, quiet cocktail lounge at the Wilshire Gardens Hotel seemed like a good idea. When I was there, up at the bar with one down and one to go, the strain that had been with me all day began to ease up. But even as I relaxed, the tension between the couple sitting at my left became more and more apparent. I looked down the bar. The girl was young, pretty, and obviously afraid of the little man with her. Who had only asthma where her voice should have been. Now, have I made myself clear? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, look, sister, Larry Sower doesn't go for people snooping after him. And neither do I. It gives me work to do that sometimes rough on a party. Brave boy. All right, little man, you've had your busy day. Hey, take your hands off. As soon as you relax. Okay, okay, get your mitts on. Now, now, gentlemen, please, no fighting. I can lose my license for it. Now you, you leave at once. Wait a minute, Baldy. You heard him, Buster. Okay. I said what I come to say anyhow. Walter, Walter, stop playing. You all right, miss? Yes, yes, thank you. Are you sure? Would you like another drink? No, no, thanks. I think I'll go back to my villa. Oh, you're staying here at the Wilshire Gardens? Yes, Villa 12, it's just around the corner. Maybe I better see you as far as the door. A little pal of yours might still be around. Well, thank you. It's all right, come on. This is really very nice of you, Mr. Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. What about you? What? Oh, Claire Osborne. Well, now look, Claire, I'm not trying to pry into your business, but in a way, people like Larry Salter are my business. Larry Salter? So- how did you know about him? Your little pal in the bar wasn't whispering. Oh. I'm a private detective, Claire, and I see a lot of people get in over their heads. I hate to see it happen to you. You know, these people play rough, usually for keeps. Maybe you better tell me about it, huh? Well, th- this is my place. Oh. Mr. Marlowe, I'll be frank with you. A month ago, I got into a jam. It was an investment I'd made, some stock, a sure thing I was told. Yeah, they usually are. Anyhow, the certificates weren't quite gilt edged, and they took a dive, a deep one. And to protect myself, I needed more money, so I I took a bracelet. I had a diamond one and got a loan on it. From Larry Salter? Yes, from Salter. A friend, a person I thought was a friend, recommended him to me. So, so you cast your bracelet, covered your investment, got your money back, and now you want the bracelet again, correct? Yes, but Salter isn't around. He's hiding. How do you know? Well, I went to the club he runs up on the strip. I overheard it there. Oh. The two men spoke of him as being on a, an extended vacation for his health. But, of course, I didn't believe that, so I went around the back, found the door open, and got into Salter's private office. Maybe that in itself is a wonderful way to get into trouble deep. Yes, I know, but I just had to find out where Salter could be located so I could pay him and get my bracelet back. Huh. Here, look, this, this paper. Mm-hmm. It was folded under Salter's memo pad. On one side, it says, Madge, Gladstone 274. The last number's missing, torn off. And on the back... Meet at 1010. Can this help us any? Yeah, it might. But first, Claire, a couple of questions that might help even more. Who was that Ursot's little Caesar who slapped you in there? One of the men I overheard talking at Salter's club. He must have seen me and then followed me here. That figures. Now, look, honey. You're scrambling awful hard for a thousand buck bracelet. What's the rest of it? The rest of it? What, well, you're out of your. Honey. Oh, what's the use? That's better. I might just as well tell you. The bracelet isn't mine, Mr. Marlowe. It belongs to my aunt. I live with her in San Diego. Oh, you borrowed it while she was away, maybe, huh? Yes. Oh, please, I've learned my lesson. I only want to get that bracelet back now, Mr. Marlowe. Please, please, will you help me? I'll pay you anything. Never mind that now. Oh, please, I I must know where Larry Salter is. Okay, Claire, we'll try to find out, but I want condition, huh? Which is what? That you go inside, lock all doors and windows, sit next to the phone, and until you hear from me again, do absolutely nothing on your own. Agreed? Oh, yes. Agreed, Mr. Marlowe. Thank you very much. Maybe it was because the sweet young kid had the kind of voice you could still hear long after she was gone. You know, one of those lingering sounds like... like the echo of a train whistle hanging on crisp early morning air. But when I was at a payphone, I stopped wondering and started dialing numbers prefix Gladstone and followed by 274 and then in order 123 and so on until after no answer once, wisecrackers twice, and a babysitter who thought I was a masher from a high school, I finally scored at number five. The answer took me to a dame named Madge Gilbert at a place called the Beekman Plaza. It wasn't the kind of place you'd go for mother, and Madge Gilbert wasn't the kind of girl mother would put up with. However, she must have been nice to look at once. 
and from the smile, pleasant to know. Okay, Mr. Busy Guy, now that we're together, what is it? Well, for one thing, the name's Kirby, and you can drop the fancy handle. Uh-huh. And for another thing, Kirby? I want to find Larry Salt of it quick. Why? Got a proposition for him. He won't be interested. Sit down. Uh, how can you tell? You don't know what it is. No, but I do know what at the moment Larry is. Yeah? And in three letters, my friend, the word is sad. He lost his lady love. Drink? No, thanks. What do you mean, his lady love? I heard that you and Never Larry... Never mind were... what you heard. Uh, All that's used to be. The pre-Janice trial period. Uh, and the sad comes from Janice finding a better deal, maybe, huh? No. She was killed. Automobile accident. Night before last. Sold her with her? No, again. She was alone and drunk. And that's probably the way Larry is right now. A blind fool. <laughs> Fill it up, will you? Sure. Look, baby, believe me, it won't put out the torch you're carrying. Shut up. I'm sorry I brought the whole thing up. Now, what was that proposition you mentioned? For Larry exclusively. Where is he? At the foundry on Cushing. Where? The foundry in least Los Angeles. Hey, wait a minute, Kirby. You seem kind of lost for a friend of Larry. <laughs> I'm just fuzzy on locations, that's all. Well, how about numbers? The address down there, what is it? Come on, fast. Ten, ten. Unless it's been changed recently. It hasn't. Okay, busy guy, you still all right. Thanks. And if you play it real close, I think you'll be too. See you, Madge. Cushing Avenue in East Los Angeles is industrial, literally wrong side of the tracks and about as non-Hollywood as an honest day's work. And all the way there, I kept blessing the dumb luck that had made me answer 1010 for the address before I'd even had time to think. When I pulled up and parked away from the place, I hoped that luck would continue. Because ahead was the foundry, or what remained of it, and in no sense did it look like friendly territory. I found a metal staircase climbing from what had once been a loading ramp up to the yard foreman's office where a single staring, unshielded light inside said that somebody was home. And when I'd quietly gone up those stairs, I saw through a glass door who that somebody was. Larry Salter, alone next to a telephone and pitching darts at a smiling face on a calendar across the wall that read, January 1928. And I knocked with the barrel of my 38 on a dirty glass door. He told me to come in without looking up. Make yourself at home, neighbor. Be with you in a minute. <clears throat> Aha! Ha, I did it. Her front tooth have been trying for that all night. So glad you made it. Now it won't be on your mind while we talk. About what? Bracelets. Bracelets? Uh, neighbor, this is an iron foundry. What you want is a jewelry shop. Let's save each other a lot of time and level, huh? I'm a private detective named Marlowe Salter, and at the moment working for Claire Osborne, and now has the price of a bracelet. Wants it back in a hurry. Do we do business? No, we don't. And it's not because I don't like you, neighbor. But... But because, one, I never heard of any Claire Osborne. And two, bracelets are stuff for second-story men, which I am not. And three, you ought to get yourself a pair of sneakers, stupid. You've been followed all the way through the yard, up the stairs, and into this room. It's an old gag, Sully. No, no gag. So while you still can, you better put that gun away, because my boy Cover takes a strange delight in messing people up real bad. You bracketed, chum. You better drop it fast. Yep. That's better. Now, Marlo, without any double talk about babes and bracelets, let's have it. You're one of Freeman's best boys, aren't you? You think I had something to do with him getting knocked off in that ditch? You're here to square things away. That's it, isn't it? No, it isn't. Get your hands off me. Okay. I won't touch you again. But that's more than I can say for Cover. Yeah, lots more. <laughs> oh. It was a toss up whether Cover's gun on the side of my head or the side of my head on the floor had done the damage. But either way, it didn't seem to matter. Because I couldn't make it back any further than Larry Salter's voice. It sounded like it was coming from the bottom of the well. Even though I could see him talking into the telephone. Okay. My place later. It's 
8100 North Lucerne in Hollywood. But then, I couldn't even see that anymore. Listen, I'm over in East Los Angeles. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, did you find him? Do you know where Larry Salter is? Yeah, I think so. 8100 North Lucerne. It's up in Hollywood near you. Now, listen, Claire, about the bracelet. There is no bracelet. What? There was no odd, no trouble on the stock market, and no loan made. Why do you want to know where Salter is? What do you want from him? His life. Goodbye, Mr. Marlowe. Wait a minute, Claire. Claire, listen to me. I... Oh... I wouldn't try it, Sean. Hey, Cova, listen, Shut I... Shut up. You don't have to go no place until Larry Salter comes back and says so. Now relax, chum. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, a brief message from the four dealers of America. Over 100,000 motorists are experiencing the engineering leadership built into the 50 Ford. As owners, they already know that it's the one fine car in the low-priced field, and it's personal experience that counts in buying a car. That's why the Ford dealers of America are issuing this special invitation to test drive this new 50 Ford for yourself. In the classified phone directory, you'll find the name of your nearest Ford dealer. Perhaps you know him personally. He'll be delighted to arrange a test drive tomorrow. So get behind the wheel and test drive it for the comfort of its midship ride and its unmatched roominess. Test drive it for the power and quietness of the only V8 in the low-priced field, the kind of engine found in America's costliest cars, yet priced lower than ten different six-cylinder cars. Test drive it for the safety of its own king-size brakes, largest in the low-priced field. Before you buy any car at any price... You'll find it to your advantage to test drive the 50 Ford at your Ford dealers tomorrow. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Torch Carriers. I turned to the poker-faced cover in the 45, both staring at me from across six dusty feet of concrete floor that... Made the ancient East L.A. foundry seem colder and even more lonely. You don't stay put so good, do you, sweetheart? You're kind of heavy-handed with that gun, aren't you, Cobra? You want to try again, sweetheart? I'll pass. Standing here staring at each other is apt to get dull, don't you think? That's entirely up to you, sweetheart. You bleed pretty. You'd like that, wouldn't you, kid? Look, just so I don't get plugged by mistake. You better let me sit down before I fall down, huh? Help yourself. Over there on that box, though, we keep me between you and the door. That's right. You're a good boy. You've got no idea. Hey, come on. How long do we play like this? I'll tell you better when Orville the Squeak gets back. What's Orville the Squeak? She runs errands for Larry, like finding out what's phony about a certain young babe and her bracelets that don't exist. So that's where the bird with the whiskey soprano fits. That's the way the punk operates, huh? Well, that way, Kovu, we'll both die of old age before... Oh, well, you hear that? Somebody moved downstairs. Maybe this is visitor's night in the old foundry. <laughs> Don't get your hopes up, sweetheart. Those live here. They're rats. They eat small dogs. And one thing more, Mahla. <laughs> What's that for, punk? Dropping your hands out of your lap where I couldn't see them. Don't try it again. I'll put it on your bill. You know, Cova, you're holding me here on Larry Salter's orders, and yet I'm the only one who knows what schedule I happen to him tonight. Maybe you better tell me. Sure, sure. Only first I want to know something. What about the late Mr. Freeman Best? Freeman was scum. Low, stinking scum. Nobody misses him. I mean nobody. And Larry didn't kill him. That's out. But he was connected, wasn't he? And there was a girl named Janice Trow. How does she figure? Uh, you better let that one set, sweetheart, for your own sake. Now let's have your end and fast. What's supposed to happen... 
Did you hear it? Yeah, what? Don't tell me a tough boy like you gets jumpy. Skip it. All right, Gib, come on, wise boy, jabber. Look, Culver, won't do you any good. Anyway, I'm the only one who Shut can... up. There was something. Maybe your rats are big enough to wear shoes. Now. Shut up, I said. And sit right there, or I'll blow you in two, and I mean it. Orville? Orville? Hey, Squeak. Is that you? Who's out there? Answer me! As Cobra edged out of the room, I felt along the side of the box I'd been sitting on for a jaggy chunk of metal slag I'd spotted earlier. It was about the size of a baseball and heavy. I picked it up and moved across to the opposite wall near the door. You! Get out of here! The boss is through with you! Now beat it! I stepped out and saw Cobra standing at the head of the stairs his back to me. I threw the lump of iron slag with everything I had. <clears throat> Caught him like a hammer between the shoulder blades. His head flew back, his fingers clawed at the air, and he pitched face first down the stairs. <laughs> I caught a glimpse of a woman ducking out of sight behind the foundry furnace. It was Madge Gilbert. You killed him, didn't you? Cobra's dead? I don't know, and I don't care. What are you doing in this boarded-up rat trap? There's nobody else here. Just us and Cobra. Creepy number they call Oval a squeaker's do any minute. That nasty little loss gives me the willies. You made your bed, baby, but let's not get lost. What are you after in here? Well, I've been thinking plenty about that torch you're talking about. I decided if you carry the same old one long enough, you're bound to get burned. Finally felt the heat, huh? Yeah, plenty. So I came here looking for you, or Larry. Couldn't make up your mind. Certainly. I wanted to tell Larry I was through with him. He'd have beat you to it, but you found me, so... Okay. But if Larry or the squeak come back after what I'm going to tell you, you got to help me get out of here. Larry'd kill me. Okay, kid, let's have it. Well, you wanted to know about Janice Trow. Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you. She was beautiful. I'd be the first to admit it. A brunette like every woman wishes she was. And Larry fell for her. She took him away from me just like I'd been dead ten years. Only she was rotten. Never once a clean thought in her twisted, dirty old brain. So says the jealous lover. Jealous? Sure, I was jealous at first. And just hurt and disgusted. She was double-crossing Larry. Every time he turned around, but there was nothing I could do. I tried to tell him... So he... far, it's strictly stock, Madge. Yeah. All but this. One time I made it stick. She borrowed Larry's car to take that slimy Freeman best out for a ride in it. With extra laughs because it was Larry's car, mind you. And and Freeman best, in case you haven't heard. I've was... heard. Well, I got a lead that they were going to wind up at the Bridge Cafe. I made Larry take me out there to prove what I'd been telling him about Janice was true. You proved it? Sure. We waited for him at the bridge. They showed up all right, doing 90. She couldn't make the curve and they hit the bridge railing. I killed them both. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're stretching, baby. Freeman Best's body was found 30 miles south. Sure, sure it was, because Larry couldn't bear the idea of Janice Trow being found with Freeman Best. He tried to protect her and keep everybody from finding out what a tramp she really was. He pulled Freeman's body out of the wreck and hauled it clear down to Long Beach and dumped it. I watched him do it. And all this business is just to keep that secret about Janice Trow, huh? Sure. Gee, can you imagine a love like that going to waste, huh? Why, even with her dead, even now, he won't as much as speak to me. I'm not so bad. I've tried and I've waited. But he won't drop it. So it's all yours, Kirby, and take it. I hope you put it right where it hurts him the most. No dice, baby. Kirby was a stall. I'm Marlow, private detective. What? Gee... How cheap did I sell out, anyway? It depends. The only axe I'm grinding is for a girl named Claire Osborne. Ever hear of her? No. That's funny. For some reason, she hates Salter even more than you... Listen. It's horrible. It's horrible. You stay where you are. I'm scared of him, Mom. I'll pull his fangs. Just don't get absent-minded about which side you're on. Hello, Orville. Where's Larry? I don't know. I've been waiting for him. Where's Cover? Then I got something important. Cover? Oh, why? He he went out for a few minutes. Yeah. I don't like this, sister. You in here all by yourself. Something's wrong. What is it? Come on. What's the matter? Hold it, Orville. What? You. 
I want a gun. Yes. What do you know about Claire Osborne? I don't think I know the party. Sure you do. A cute little brunette named Claire Osborne. I want the straight dope on her, and I want it now, not later. It's over. Hi. Answer my questions, you creep. You won't get anything out of me. Larry will take care of both. (laughs) You jerk. Now, maybe there's something on it will give me an answer without talking back. Look, he always wrote things down in a little notebook inside his jacket. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Here it is. Let's see. Oh, sure, sure, this is it. Claire Osborne arrived from San Diego last night by plane. Registered at Wilshire Gardens as Claire Osborne, but according to driver's license, her real name is... For Pete's sake, no wonder. I'll see you, kid. <laughs> It took me 20 minutes to get from East L.A. over to Lucerne and another five to find the bleak white bungalow that belonged to Larry Sulver. Its front windows were dark when I drove past it, parked on a side street, and walked back. But in the rear, one window showed a light. The screen door was open, so I eased myself into the service porch where I could see Sulver sitting at a kitchen table. A look on his face of hurt defiance like a small boy accused of something he hadn't done. I couldn't see who was facing him, but there was no mistaking the voice. It was Claire. All my life, Janice was everything to me. And now she's dead and you killed her. That's true, isn't it? I've already told you once, kid, you're making a mistake. Oh, no, I'm not. You're going to pay for my sister's death. No court will ever call it murder, but that's what it was. You did it just as surely as if you'd strangled her with your own hands. And now I'm going to get even for Janice. Claire, hey, what but, is... Marlo, you crazy fool, why did you come here? Give me that gun, Claire. I know you stay out of this. You can't stop me. Nobody can. Even if you shoot me, Marlo, I'll kill him. Now first. listen to me. Before you start pulling that trigger, you better know all the facts. Everything Salter here has done since your sister's death has been to shield and protect what little she herself left of a good reputation. She turned bad, Claire. She... You're lying. No, no. What reason have I got to lie? I'm telling you this because it's true and I can prove it. I don't believe you. You're trying to trick me. It was your big sister who tricked you years ago. She was no good. She was a double-crossing dirty cheater wouldn't shoot square for five minutes. Stop it. No, there's more. The night she died, she was two-timing Larry. But even in spite of that, he risked his neck to move the body of the other guy just so so she wouldn't be found with the kind of cheap trash she'd been running around with. And do you know why? Because Larry Salter there loved your sister, loved her every bit as much as you did. Loved her? Yeah. I know. No, this, this can't be true. Yes, it's true, kid. All of it. I loved her all right. Just too bad that Janice went like she did. Oh, Marlo. Okay, baby, the hard part's over. Come on, come on, give me the gun. You don't want to shoot anybody. Not now. Feel better now, Claire? Yes, I... I'll be all right when I get used to a few new ideas. Yeah. What's going to happen to me now? Well, that's pretty much up to you. How do you mean? The world spins like mad, honey. You have to keep up or get lost. Like I was tonight. Mm-hmm. I was lost, Marlowe, terribly. Everything I had any faith in was, was gone. Yeah, I know. That's because you had blind faith, Claire. You know, that's okay for kids, but... You're a big girl now. Oh, yes, I get it. From now on, it's me, on my own two feet, and my eyes wide open. (laughs) Well, take it easy, baby. It's uh, fun to close them once in a while. After I dropped Claire off at her hotel, I... I remember the drink I'd started out to get and left half-finished on the bar. But it was too late now to stop anywhere, so... I drove home and poured myself a nightcap in my own apartment. I carried it over to the window and... looked out across the city at the endless miles of winking lights. Each one a torch. Everybody carries a torch for something... Some for a love they can never have. An ideal that's out of reach, and some just... Just for memory. Funny thing. So many dark corners get their only light... from the torch that somebody carries.
Philip Marlowe will be back in just a moment. But first, here's a message from the Ford dealers of America. More than 110,000 delighted motorists were already driving the new 50 Ford. Here's what Jack Farrell, hotel manager, says. I did a lot of shopping around and chose Ford for styling. And I'm certainly glad because I found there's plenty of car beneath its beautiful body. There's plenty of power under the hood, too. And it's as comfortable as a high-priced car. I could go on for hours about the quietness, the economy, and the comfort of my car, but it all adds up to this. The 50 Ford's a mighty fine car to own. We Ford dealers are not surprised that new owners rave about their 50 Fords. We've studied this new Ford from stem to stern. We know every detail of its 50 ways new for 50. But until you get behind the wheel, you won't be able to believe how good it is. That's the reason we want you to test drive the 50 Ford. The classified phone directory will give you the name of the nearest Ford dealer. Or perhaps you know him personally. Why don't you phone him tomorrow? Before you buy any car at any price... You owe it to yourself to test drive the 50 Ford. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time, everything that happened from the orange-haired man with a map past the oak for the pitchfork to the body at the covered bridge was wrong. Dead wrong. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Sammy Hill, John Daner, Vivi Janis, Harry Bartell, Wilms Herbert, and Edgar Barrier. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard O'Ront. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison or the grave. This time, everything that happened from the orange-haired man with a map past the oaf with a pitchfork to the body at the covered bridge was wrong. Dead wrong. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Covered Bridge. <laughs> Every once in a while, into the life of one Philip Marlowe, a little peace and quiet must fall. A day marked by neither murder nor mayhem. No phone calls, just nothing. I was just beginning to like it, too, when the door opened and a head full of slick orange hair walked in. It was on a man wearing a new flannel suit, a hand-painted tie, and a reckless grin. He shoved the telephone out of his way, sat down on the corner of my desk, and sized me up with a pair of careful gray eyes. Got a proposition for you, laddie. Tell me about it. Let you know if I'm interested. You should be. There's good money in it. It's not always the answer. Go ahead. You got a good car? Good enough. I don't keep it in the office. You like Mexico? Look, is this a social call or a quiz program? Well, this is business. I asked you a question. Yeah, I like Mexico. I don't like you. Well, that's good, because you're going to drive a couple of friends of me down there. Uh, name your price. Not interested. Thousand bucks? Not interested. That's too bad. Would have been nicer to work this out without a gun. Listen, you're too big, Talk jerk. easy, laddie. This gun is bigger than both of us. Now, you're going to drive across the Mexican border tonight with three passengers. And there won't be any difficult questions. Because you are the well-known Senor Philip Marlowe, a respectable private detective. Somewhere below the border, your fellow travelers will catch a boat. But this, you don't have to worry about. Now, look, just a minute. Look, I... laddie, I came to you for several reasons, one of which is that you're smart enough to know when to quit fighting the problem. You've got to make a stop first, so let's go. Uh, and leave your artillery in the drawer. Come on. Yeah, sure. 
Since I'm now an old pal of yours, what do I call you? You pick it. Believe me, you won't like it. Um, how about George? You like George? Not particularly. Good. Just call me George. Let's go, Milo. We nodded at the elevator girl, waved goodbye to the kid in the parking lot, and headed south on Highway 101. All with the front of that Mauser nudging my kidney. It was screwy, but I was on my way to Mexico. Uh, don't get ambitious, Marlo. Not too fast, not too slow. Just keep it rolling nice and steady. I did what I was told and watched for a break. For every foot of a hundred miles down the coast. At Oceanside, we cut inland past Escondido and up into the citrus country. Once he dug a little map from his pocket and studied it while we headed into the hills where farms were farther apart. George was busy looking for a turnoff when my chance came, and it came fast. My foot slammed down hard on the brake. George had the windshield, and the gun slipped out of his hand. I dropped two wheels in the ditch, but I got the gun. He took one look, then jumped out and ran in a low crouch from the back of the car. Before I could follow him, I heard the truck coming. It was a big two-section job rolling fast. It topped the rise just as George pivoted toward the road. The truck driver must have seen him just as he hit but the air brake blocked on all 26 wheels at the same time. I ran to where George lay like a discarded doll at the side of the road. The truck driver was out of his cab before it stopped rolling. I didn't see him. I didn't see him. I come over the rise there. I, I didn't see him. Take it easy. Honest, I didn't see him. Is he all right? He ain't dead, is he? No, no, he isn't. He won't be walking much anymore. It wasn't my fault, Mr. Honest. I know it wasn't. Get hold of yourself. Uh, gosh, what should we do? I want you to drive to the nearest phone and get the police and then come back. Here's my card. Give it to the troopers. Oh. Tell them they can reach me at my office. Yeah, what are you going to do? I can figure out how to read this map of his. I'm going to pay a call on a couple of people who are expecting oh. this guy. Oh. Maybe it's just a stubborn streak, but when I'm being used as a patsy, I like to meet the people involved. Oh. As I drove, I studied the map, and two miles down the highway, I found the first landmark dead tree. There I left the highway and followed a rocky trail seven corkscrew miles up a canyon to the next landmark, a bridge. One that looked like it had been lifted out of some rustic Connecticut woods and dropped across the California gorge purely by mistake. Because it was covered complete to roof and walls and made entirely of lumber. And on the hill beyond was a lonely house where the trail marked on the map ended. I drove slowly through the sagging wood tunnel and at the other end, deliberately killed my motor. And I got out, raised the hood, and went to work on the distributor. I don't know where he came from, but when I glanced up, he was standing there watching me. A bull in overalls with a pitchfork clenched in a pair of hands as thick as four-dollar steaks. We didn't like each other's looks. You picked a bad place for trouble, mister. That's so. Why? Nobody almost never comes up this road, especially strangers. How come you took it? Really want to know, or are you just killing time? I wouldn't be too smart if I was you, mister. Uh, you live in that house up there? No, not anymore. I got canned for drinking. Well, why are you so interested in that place? The only farm around here. Maybe they got a mechanic. Yeah, maybe. Where'd you say you were from? L.A. Uh, Los Angeles, huh? You real sure you don't know anybody up there on the hill? Like who, for instance? A certain party who took a trip to L.A. not so long ago. And another thing, city boy. Don't get out of line or I'll fix you good. Understand? I mean, how do you do? <laughs> you want something? Uh, yes, my car stalled at the bottom of the hill. Sorry. Sorry, who is it? Who's there? Uh, a man, Uncle Walter. He says his car broke down. What's that? Your, your car broke down, you say? Yeah, I don't know what went wrong, Mr. Uh... My name is Brule, Walter Brule. Oh, I'm glad to know you. I'm Philip Marlowe. What are you doing on this road, Mr. Marlowe? I thought it was a shortcut. Did you? Well, you were wrong. It's a dead end. Oh. Come inside. Thanks. 
Look, Mr. Brule, I'd like to have somebody who knows motors come down and look at my car, huh? Mm-hmm. All right, then Ed comes in. I guess he could go down with you. Oh, I... That's I, my I... new hired hand, Ed Fry. Oh. I don't know, Uncle Walter. It's getting pretty dark. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing myself. As a matter of fact, if you can accommodate me, Mr. Brule, I'd just as soon rest up a while and shove off in the morning. I want to pay you for everything, of course. Stay overnight? Oh, I, uh... I'm afraid that's impossible. We... Impossible? Why? What's the matter with you, Dolly? If necessary, I'm sure we can arrange to take care of Mr. Marlowe some way. Well, okay. Well, that's better. Now, if you want me, Dolly, I'll be out in the barn. Make yourself comfortable, Mr. Marlowe. Your uncle, huh? He owns this place? That's right. My mother was his favorite sister. Oh. You want a cup of coffee? Oh, I'd love it. Haven't had any farm kitchen coffee in ages. You, uh, you don't seem to have any visitors up this way, Dolly, huh? No, not many. Nice farm, though. Stinks. Is that why you run off to L.A. now and then? How did you know about that? I guess. I ran into a friend of yours at the bottom of the hill. A pair of overgrown shoulders with a pitchfork. Said he used to work here. Him. He did up until a month ago. That's Noah Bickman. Big dumb goof. Here's your cup. Oh, thanks. By the way, Mr. Marlowe, where are you heading? Oh, Mexico, maybe. Mexico? Yeah. You kind of came a long ways out of your way, didn't you? Did I? Dolly! Dolly! We're in here, Eddie! What's the matter? A car at the bottom of the hill. Whose is it? The car belongs to me. It's stalled. Huh? Who are you? This is Mr. Marlowe, Eddie. He's uh, on his way to Mexico. Well, ah, you don't say. And since his car broke down so late, he may stay all night. Uncle Walter said it'd be all right. Is that a fact? I'll uh, go get some blankets, Eddie, so you can take them up to the spare room for Mr. Marlowe. Oh, okay, Dolly. Mr. Marlowe, huh? Where are you from, Mr. Marlowe? L.A. You? Uh, points east. Uh. You know, this road don't go to Mexico, Marlowe. In fact, it stops about a mile up the draw here. Kind of funny that you wound up on it, isn't it? I don't see you breaking up over it, Eddie. Don't let my poker face throw you, pal. Traveling alone, are you? I am now. Meaning what? That there's nobody with me. That's simple, isn't it? Not in my book, pal. I might even want you to draw me a picture of that one. Here's the blanket, Eddie. Sheet. Oh, okay, okay, it's fine. Come on upstairs, Marlowe. I'll show you the room. You want me to go with you and make the bed? No, you stay here and put up some more coffee, Dolly. All right. Got a hunch I may want lots of it tonight. Let's go, Marlowe. Right behind you, Eddie. How's the weather been in L.A.? Some might call it hot. Uh-huh. Get the door, will you? Sure. Uh, okay, how come it's you, pal? I got good credentials, a car, and a tight yap. You better be right on all three. How'd you find me? Little map, Eddie. From Escondido to the dead tree to the covered bridge, and then up here it's a cinch. Why'd you show alone? Where's Red? Got to meet us at the border. It's a bum fit, pal. It's not in the book. Why? Uh, yeah, some kind of a last-minute jam with a boat. Oh, that jerk. He's had a month to line this up while I've been holed up out here in the sticks making like a farm hand. Well, better work, that's all. If we're picked up this time, it's curtains. Oh, uh, incidentally, you got a gun, haven't you? Yeah, sure. Let's see it. Uh-uh. No dice, Eddie. Red didn't tell me everything, just enough. So? So you'll get your money's worth. I'll do what I'm supposed to do and no questions asked for my little automatic and I stick together regardless, real close, together. <laughs> okay, Marlo. Suit yourself. I will. And something else. The rest of the company is going along. Is that all set? Well, we'll see about that when the time comes. You're not leaving any loose ends around, are you? It's not your worry, pal. We'll get out of here around 11. Oh, and that routine about your car being stalled, it is a gag, I hope. Oh, sure, it won't start. If anybody tries, but in ten seconds with a screwdriver, I can fix it. <laughs> You're okay, Marlo. Just keep playing your game. Yeah, I will. 
Maybe then I'll find out what the score is after all. Mm, you might at that. Come on, let's eat. Dinner at the Brule Farm was as loaded with gay chatter as a bad case of lockjaw. And when it was over, the participants scattered like everybody else was contagious. I wound up alone in the dark spare room on the second floor, which had one advantage. Windows that viewed both the front and the rear. The moon was bright, so I didn't bother with the lamp. I listened to Dolly rattle dishes in the kitchen until that stopped, and then I watched old man Brule pace his front yard. Once Ed Fry went out and talked to him briefly and then headed for the front door again. For a long hour after that, the big house was silent until from somewhere out in the back, there was a soft metallic tapping. Eventually, I spotted a heavy figure outside tossing pebbles against a window pane downstairs. And he edged back through the shadows to the barn. A moment later, I saw the girl slip out a rear door and run across the backyard and join her. I went down the back stairs and out along the house to a hedge and... I followed that until I was close enough it's to hear. I tell you. He's an escaped convict, a killer. He's been hiding out here on your place. I can't believe it. No, I just can't. Are you sure? Of course I am. I read it by accident just tonight in an old newspaper from Denver. The whole story with pictures. There's no doubt about it. Ed Fry is really Eddie Fillmore. He's a murderer. Plenty of times over. What? Well, what do we do? Should we call the police? No, uh, no. Not on your life. Listen, you want to get off this farm, don't you? More than anything in the world. Okay. Then we'll do it. Together, Dolly. I didn't tell another soul about this. You know why? Because they put out a reward. A big one for him. $2,500. And we're going to get it. Just us, you and me. But how, Noah? How can we talk? What's that? Did you hear that, Noah? That's nothing, nothing. It's one of the cats, maybe. Look. You've been taking walks with him lately, Dolly. Well, yes, I have, Noah, but... Well, never mind that now. Just get him to take another one right away. Get him to walk you down to Pritchett's house. I'll be waiting there, and as soon as you get inside, I'll jump him. You'll never know what hit him. Will you do it? Pritchett's house? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll try. You, you give me some time to persuade him. Sure, sure. Oh, I knew you'd see things my way, honey. Oh, no. Oh, boy, no. With, with that reward money, there'll be no stopping us. You better go in now before they miss you. Okay. I'll get him there just as soon as I can. Hey, Bickman. What? Who's there? Marlo. Listen, I gotta you talk to you. You were here listening all the time, weren't you? Yeah, and believe me, you're making a mistake. You're playing with dynamite, Dick, when you two are nuts to tackle that guy alone. He's too tough for you. So you want to help so you can cut yourself in on the reward, that's all. Well, it ain't going to work. Don't be a sap. He's covered himself. There's somebody else in with him. Somebody around here, he's got an ally. You two try to grab him, and you're going to be in trouble. You're lying. He's been hiding out all alone, and we're going to get him, Dolly and me, by ourselves. And if you try to horn in, mister, so help me, I'll beat your brain. Cut it out. Reward or no reward, you got to listen to me. I got to nothing. No. Maybe that'll teach you not to stick your nose in, city boy. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Fred Allen's first appearance on the CBS Jack Benny Show. Al Jolson sings, but the face is Charlie McCarthy's. Andy of Amos and Andy goes on trial for deserting his bride by mistake. Those are three headlines that guarantee you a world of fun on CBS tomorrow night. Yes, this third Sunday of the new year will be an all-time high in radio entertainment. Hear them all on CBS tomorrow night. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Covered Bridge. I didn't pass out. But my jaw hurt and my legs moved like they were rubber. Now I had to find the roving Walter Brule because he should know where Pritchard's house was, where the ambitious team of Dolly and Noah 
Might be biting off a lot more than they could chew, healthy 4 H teeth notwithstanding. Mr. Brawl! Mr. Brawl! Yeah? Hello? Who, who is it? Marlowe! Come here a minute, will you? It's important. Yeah, it's important. All right, is it, Mr. Marlowe? But... Ah, your face! What's this? Did your friend Noah, we had a few words. Noah Bickman? He was no friend of mine. Yeah, he's no friend of mine either. Look, Brule, I... I'm going to have to trust you. I've got no choice. Bickman found out Ed Fry is really an undesirable named Eddie Fillmore is wanted for the police by murder. Murder? And he wants to trap him for a $2,500 reward that's been posted and didn't want me in the way. No. Now, look. I'm not a passing tourist with motor trouble, but a private detective. Tell me, who is Pritchard and where does he live? Pritchard? Where does he live? Oh, Mr. Marlowe, somebody has been making a joke on you. Elihu Preacher died 20 years ago. He lived right in this house where I do today. This is Pritchard's house here? Oh, Pritchard's house? No, no, no. That is down the road near your car, the covered bridge. That is Pritchard's house. The bridge? Yeah, you see, Elihu Pritchard was from New England, and he had a covered bridge on his farm there, so he wanted one here. He built it himself day by day, a board here, a nail there. Oh, and, and since he spent so much time at it, people call the bridge's house, is that it? Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. But then, why is it important? Because of a meeting, Mr. Brule, a get-together that I don't think is going to be on the quiet side. Let me borrow your flashlight, will you? Sure. Now get back inside and call the police. But what are you going to do? Reinforce the reward, happy sweethearts, and keep an eye out for someone I haven't met yet. A third party Eddie Fillmore plans to tour Mexico with. It was a quarter of a mile romp, country style, back down to the covered bridge. When I was there, the Maserat recovered from George in one hand, flashlight in the other. I found only the moon-washed, gray-covered bridge itself. Trying to stand erect like an old soldier who has more pride than posture. Then as I stepped from the chalk road onto the sheltered oil soap planking, I found something else. Inside and face down was Noah Bickman. And lying nearby, the red-stained, icy fingers of the pitchfork that had killed him. I started to move closer. But then footsteps in the road behind suggested that I do different, so I moved quickly back to the bridge entrance, flattened myself into a narrow shadow and waited. you? It's Marlowe, Dolly. What? Mr. Marlowe, what are you doing here? Well, why are you down at the bridge at this hour? Where, where's Noah? He's dead, Dolly. Who's huh? dead? He's in there, but don't go inside. Look, I tried to stop him, believe me. Stop him? Stop him from what? Don't bother, baby. I know about Fry being Fillmore, the reward, all of it. Well, first of all, I'm a private detective from L.A. was dragged into this by an ex-buddy at Fillmore's. Second, I was in the barn when you and Noah made your plans. Oh. When you left, I tried to talk Noah into accepting my help. Why? Because I know what Fillmore's kind is like. I mix with them every day. I know how they work. Look, did you tell Fillmore to meet you here, yes or no? No. No, I couldn't find him. I've been looking since I left the barn every place. That's why you came down here just now? I wanted to tell Noah that our plan would have to be postponed. But what difference does all this make? I don't know. Maybe a little, maybe a lot. If Fillmore had known about this, this rendezvous you two planned, it'd be 20 to 1 that he got here ahead of schedule and took care of Noah. But since he didn't... Well, since he didn't, I'm betting on a third party, someone we haven't met yet. A third party? Yeah, now listen to me and do just as I say. Turn around and walk straight back up to the house, and when you get there, get inside and stay put. But, Marlo, what if... Go on, fast. All right. But be careful, Marlo. Whoever killed Noah won't hesitate to kill you, too. When she started back up the road, I turned toward the bridge again. My flashlight following the dusty white footprints on the freshly oiled planking leading to the dead man. I stood over in the circle of light sweeping the area around him. There was just one thing I had to know. Marlo! Marlo! Uh, 
it's me, Walter Bull. What are you doing down here? Well, I thought you might need help, so after I called the police, I got my rifle and came down here and I... Yeah, he's dead. The prongs on that fork went right through him. Oh, terrible. Yeah. Look, Brule, was this planking freshly oiled today? Yeah, why? Uh, right. I just wanted to make sure those chalk footprints were made today. But what do footprints... Brule, you stay here and see that no one has the bridge. But where are you going? Up to your house in a hurry, because I think I know who the killer and the third party is. <laughs> City bred legs and smog fed lungs, I made it up to the house in record time. But as I reached for the front door, I knew that time hadn't been quite good enough. The shot had come from somewhere in the house, and by the time I reached the living room, I knew I was too late to do any good. In a chair at the far side of the room, Dolly was slouched down, a surprised expression on her face, while her hands tried to hold back a small stain of blood oozing through her blouse. Little frightened words whispered out of her mouth. You shouldn't have done it, Eddie. Stand where you are, Marlo. She had it coming to her, the two-time and louse. Eddie. Eddie, I'm trying to tell you. You don't understand. I understand I... plenty of no good little... Eddie. I was in the barn, heard the whole thing. You and that Bickman planning a switch with me out. You're wrong, Eddie. Dolly didn't try to double-cross you, Eddie. She only pretended to so she could set Noah Bickman up and kill him. That's what she did. No, you're a liar. True. I thought I'd try to... Eddie. I don't believe it. I... I love... Dolly. She didn't cross me. She was trying to help me. That's right, Fillmore. Bickman found out who you were, wanted the 2500 bucks you were worth, dead or alive. Dolly had to play him along for your sake. should have listened to her. should have listened. How do you know all this, Marlo? I found Dolly's footprints inside the covered bridge. Proof she'd been there before I found Bickman's body. Yeah. And you know who I was, so you put it all together. Well, you're holding the gun, kid. What's the next move? Doesn't matter much anymore. I could still lam out of here for Mexico. Somehow I don't want to. Not without Dolly. Phone the police, Marlo. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Several hours before the county police and Eddie Fillmore had gone. Walter Brule and I sat at the long wooden table watching the light from the fire dance across the hanging skillets and pans by the grate. And nobody said anything for a long time. I... I suppose hot apple pie at four in the morning seems odd to a man from the city. Not at all. Or in the morning, sometimes the middle of the day in the city. Yeah. Yeah. More coffee, Mr. Marlowe? Yeah, yeah, please. Thanks. You know, Dolly wasn't really a bad girl. It was just that sometimes she didn't think. And... A woman who loves like that doesn't think, Mr. Brule just feels. Maybe in some way it is my fault, the whole thing. No, no. It's nobody's fault, Mr. Brule. She was... She was trying to do the right thing for the guy she loved. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your bet is still ready if, if you care to stay. Oh, thanks. Sure, I'd like to. If, if you can find your own way up, I, I think I'll sit here just a minute longer. 
sure. Night. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. sat looking out over the starlit countryside. I thought of all the great love stories written about the good people who love, live, and suffer. And then the pathetic face of Dolly and the pain-wracked face of Eddie said, what about us? And I had no answer. Yeah, chalk up another one, Marlowe. Another one of those things for which there is no answer. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Ben Wright, Jack Moyles, Wilms Herbert, Jack Crucian, and Barney Phillips. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a twisted mind, a hole cut in a wire fence, and a corpse in a storeroom. All added up to freedom. But only for the one who had it coming. The event you've been waiting for. Fred Allen's first visit to the CBS Jack Benny show will take place tomorrow night. Yes, the most famous guest appearance in radio, the Fred Allen Jack Benny Act, will be heard in all of the CBS stations tomorrow night. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows over most of the same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road. And those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This time a twisted mind, a hole cut in a wire fence, and a corpse in a storeroom. All added up to freedom. But only for the one who had it coming. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Bid for Freedom. Never fails. When you worry over your bank statement, then hug your office phone from 9 to 5, anxious for business... Nothing happens. But the minute you decide you'll get rich another day, chuck the puny balance sheet into a bottom drawer and make plans, you want it. And that was exactly the way it played when at 3 o'clock on the kind of slate gray afternoon that makes the beckoning Santa Fe Railroad vacation billboards look a little more so, I left a note on my office door and headed outside and across the street for some real Hungarian goulash. Very good today, too. The second after a waiter disappeared into the kitchen with my order... She was standing at my elbow. Not quite young, not quite pretty, not quite blonde. And when she spoke, not quite sure of what she was going to say next. You, you're Mr. Philip Marlowe, aren't you? I mean, the private detective whose office is across the street? Yeah, that's right. 
I... My name is Helen Asher. Oh? I have to find someone. You, you do that kind of work, don't you? Finding people, I mean. That all depends, Miss Asher. Who's the person you have to find? Leon Rodell, a friend. Uh-huh. You see, I just got into town. I had his address in my handbag, but I lost it. The handbag, that is. And I don't exactly know which way to well, turn. Well, just a minute, Miss Asher. Let's take it a step at a time, huh? Uh, yeah, now sit down. Oh, and... no. No, thank you. I, I, I'm in a hurry, Mr. Marlowe. Leon Rodell isn't listed in the phone book. I've tried that, and I don't know the name of his firm, his business name. He, he deals in ceramics. Is that all you can tell me? Oh, no. I have something else. It's a name and an address here in Los Angeles. Fortunately, that wasn't in my handbag, but here in my coat. No. No, no what, Miss Asher? Outside there, on the street. What's on the street? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. I... Hey, me, Miss... Miss Asher. Wait a minute. There'd been a sort of sad look about Helen Asher that made me want to help her. So after an even sadder look at the plate of goulash that was coming toward me from the kitchen, I followed her to the street. Mr. Marlowe, the goon! When I reached the sidewalk, she was across the street in a cab and away. That might have been the end of it if something small and ugly that had been standing just outside the restaurant hadn't turned and moved into the alley alongside the building. On a hunch that he'd had something to do with the sudden exit of Miss Asher, I followed him and found him standing next to a line of empty ash cans, calmly lighting a cigarette. You always run into alleys to light your cigarettes? Are you always concerned? What do you know about Helen Asher? Helen Asher? I haven't any idea who you're talking about. Come on, little man. I'm talking about the gal who just got into that cab. Do the words begin to flow? Or do I ring him out of here? Get your hands off me. You're ripping my pocket. You're lucky it isn't your nose. Come on, talk. All right, all right. It's no secret. Here, it's all in this letter. Look, right here. Oh! Toe of his sharp pointed shoes and caught my shin where it really hurt. By the time I was out of the ash cans. Back on my feet. I knew the damage had been more to my dignity than anything else. I knew also that the little man was gone and I had no idea where. I was halfway out toward the street before I realized that I still had the little man's letter clenched in my hand. It was from an Omaha Life Insurance Company and addressed to one Eldon Hook, 31 Marlboro Drive, Sunnydale, California. Sunnydale wasn't just around the corner, but the fear I'd seen in Helen Asher's face plus a score to settle with... Eldon Hook said the 20-mile drive into the San Fernando Valley was a minor point. Under the gray sky overhead that thickened by the minute, Sunnydale, about the size of the hole in a candied lifesaver, looked as warm and cheerful as crepe paper. And number 31 Marlboro Drive, also gray, was no improvement from the ponderous, bleak stone buildings which said Queen Victoria should have slept there. Past the high, thick wire fence that surrounded it, the wrought iron gate in front of me labeled Hillcrest Sanitarium. Keep out. Took ten minutes of softly phrased questions and answers to get the boss man, a Dr. Chinetti, to the gate. I told him who I was and what brought me to him, including a description of Eldon Hook. I... I don't understand. Come in, Mr. Marlowe, please. Eldon Hook has been with us as an attendant for more than a year now. And his behavior has always been satisfactory. Uh, nothing would surprise me anymore today. Oh, Helen Asher. Is it possible that she was once a patient here, Doctor? No. Oh. What about Leon Rodell? Leon Rodell? Hmm. How do you know that name? From Helen Asher. She was looking for him. That's why she wanted to hire me. She knew he was here in Los Angeles. Mr. Marlowe, this woman, was she young... About 30, blonde? Yeah, that's right. Why? Why? Because this morning, earlier, about 6 o'clock, one of our patients escaped. A woman you know as Helen Asher, and we know as Charlotte Rodell, Leon Rodell's wife. Oh. She's insane, huh? Temporarily, yes. Come over here, near the fence. Oh. I'll show you how she got away. But how she managed to cut through enough of this thick wire link fence to make a hole large enough to crawl through... It's beyond me. Here, look, behind this ivy. Uh-huh. Even with a good wire snipper, it would take hours to get through all these strands. Huh? Wasn't she missed inside? Yes, but she was only gone minutes. 
Apparently, she had been doing a little at a time during her recreation period, at night, whenever she could. Uh, be careful of the burrs in those bushes there, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah, I see what you mean. Tell me, Doctor, have the police been notified? Of course, at once. The law compels us to. And, frankly, Mr. Marlowe, I'm terribly worried. Oh? You see, it was her husband, Leon Rodell, who had her confined here a year ago. Six months after their marriage, she began to act strangely. He felt it would be only with our help that she could ever regain her mental equilibrium. I thought that we were accomplishing that. Apparently no, huh? Obviously no. <laughs> but, Mr. Marlowe, we must call the Los Angeles police right away and tell them that Leon Rodell now lives here, not in San Francisco. He must be protected. Yeah, I see your point. Yeah, she did break out. She is trying hard to find Leo, and three she ran from Eldon Hook, who was very close on a trail. That's right, Mr. Marlowe. That's why I suggest that Leon Rodell discontinue seeing his wife as of last month. He always left Charlotte very upset. But now I'd better call the police. Yeah, that's a good idea. Although Charlotte didn't know where her husband was staying or what the name of his ceramics business was, she... Say, Doc. Doc, she claimed that she lost a handbag. Have you found it by any chance? Yes, we did. We found it in the brush near the hole in the fence. I've got it right here in my desk. Oh, good. There was an address on the card, Miss. 3840-something. Uh, yes, here it is. 3840 Lookout Terrace. Lookout Terrace. Lookout Terrace. That's right here in the valley, up in the hills, south of Ventura Boulevard. Mr. Marlowe, if possible, I'd like to avoid having the papers get hold of this, this story. This is a rather exclusive nursing home. So? Well, in a sense, you're already in this case. Could you try to find Charlotte Rodell and bring her back here before the police do? Well, Dr. Chinetti, I... It I, would I... be doing a great service for the woman and her husband. I'll pay you your fee. All right, Dr. Chinetti, I'll try. I'll call you as soon as I have something. I first started from Marlboro Drive in Sunnydale, it had been a combination of interest in a sad-eyed girl and a strong desire to punch Eldon Hook on the nose. Now it was business. It took 20 minutes of fast driving to get over to Lookout Terrace in the hills to separate Hollywood from the San Fernando Valley and 3840 itself. The house was a squat chunk of overly stuccoed, archaic California architecture at the top of a steep driveway. And when I was out of my car and walking toward the front door, everything was black except tiny pinpoints of light sparkling up from the floor of the valley I just left. Good evening, sir. I hope I didn't startle you, Mr. Rodell. Mr. Rodell? Oh, I know your name. Yes, sir. And I know some other things as well. Like what? Oh, incidental facts. Like, uh, well, it's cold in there. So you haven't been home in hours. And? And the refrigerator's empty, so you're only staying here off and on. Also, the old mail inside, phone bills, etc. They don't have your name or this address. So this is probably a friend's house. Which totals to what? To zero, maybe. Zero, Mr. Rodell, like you're going to total if you don't pay the money you owe to my good friend in San Francisco. Yeah, you know who I mean, don't you, Mr. Rodell? Yeah, yeah. What I don't know is how good friend thinks I'm going to raise that kind of dough. <laughs> I made it funny? Oh, you're kidding. Uh, What's 15000 to you? You, uh, shall I say, an intimate friend of Ordeen Blackburn? Oh, uh, Ordeen Blackburn. Yeah, Ordeen Blackburn. Come off it, boy. I'm thorough. An eager sort. I know that the lady from Bel Air is loaded and that she's nuts about you. No fooling. Now, before I leave, a word of advice, Rodell. One can't run away from his obligations forever. And you won't be able to walk away after 24 hours. Unless, of course, you pay. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Eager. Till we meet again. <coughs> oh. There'll be some heat in here somewhere. Information. Oh, operator, I'd like the telephone number of a Miss Ordeen Blackburn in Bel Air. I don't have the address. Have you tried your directory, sir? Uh, no, I can't. The house burned down. One moment, please. Yeah. <laughs> we have an Ordeen Blackbird at 2321 Bell Air Road. Yeah, that's it. What's the number, please? Nevins, 31121. 31121. Thank you. 
house burned down. <laughs> Hello, Miss Blackburn. Yes, this is she. Miss Blackburn, my name is Philip Marlowe. I'm a private detective who at the moment is anxious to get hold of Leon Rodell. Do you know where he is? Well, yes, I do, but I don't think... Now, please, it's important. Leon Rodell's life is in danger. I want to help him. Leon's life? What's going on, Mr. Marlowe? Well, there isn't time to explain, believe me. That's what she said, but Who I... said? Someone who called about 20 minutes ago. A Miss Helen Asher. Oh? She said she was supposed to meet Leon at his storeroom about purchasing some ceramics. But she forgot his address there. Did you give it to her? Oh, well, yes, I did. Oh, great. She's the one who's after him. What's that address? Come on, quick. 3909 and a half Ventura Boulevard. Sure. It's in the rear of a parking lot. But tell me, Mr. Marlowe, what's well, wrong? Well, there's plenty wrong. For one thing, I... Talk to you again, baby, some other time. I doubt it, Mr. Rodell. Jumped to a hasty conclusion, didn't I? Uh, yeah, yeah, you did, Eager. You see, I'm really only a bill collector, just like yourself. So why don't we... Just uh... make up... Uh... <laughs> Not a chance, sweetheart. I wouldn't be happy that way. I wouldn't know when you were telling the truth. And when you were lying. <laughs> you know what I mean, Mr. <laughs> <Mr>. Marlowe? <laughs> now, as I said before, good night. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, CBS will bring you the earth-shaking premiere of a new opera tomorrow night. An opera written by Alec Templeton with Charlie McCarthy as a lovelorn singing Bengal Lancer. Templeton himself as a Maharaja and Ursel Twing as a flying carpet salesman. You can hear it on the CBS Charlie McCarthy Edgar Bergen show tomorrow night. And don't forget Red Skelton, Amos and Andy, Eve Arden, Horace Hyde, and all the other CBS Sunday night stars will also be on hand on most of these same CBS stations. Jack Benny, of course, has heard of them all on Sundays. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Bid for Freedom. Gun butt I'd been slapped with felt like a log chain. Next time would be different. I waited till Eager drove away and then went out and got in my car and unwound my way down the hill again to Ventura Boulevard. There I turned west and drove out to 3909 and a half. There was a glass and neon super grocery store closed for the night. And the only light showing at Leon Rodell's ceramic outfit trickled out on the ground in a narrow wedge to what had to be a partly open back door. And even as I watched it, the wedge danced into a crazy pattern and disappeared. I ran for it and got there just in time to see Charlotte Rodell dart down the alley. A second later, she vanished in the shadowy jumble of backyard buildings. I knew there was no use trying to follow her. Instead, I eased the storeroom door open and looked in at a room full of flower pots, lamp bases, and dishes. Nothing moved. Charlotte, I was sure, had had a reason for running, so I went in toward a table in the corner where the only light was burning. I was almost up to it before I saw the reason. Yeah, it was a good one. Eldon Hook, the sanitarium attendant, was on the floor behind the table, his body still trying to arch away from the knife in his back. When I bent over him, he opened his eyes. They were already cloudy. I, I was close. I found the hole in the fence, and I knew Ordine was... Ordine what, Hook? Who did it? Can you tell me? I never figured on... <sighs> I left Eldon Hook just as he was. Went to the door that opened to the front of the ceramic shop. A desk was there with a phone on it. I got halfway through the homicide bureau number when a silhouette showed up at the curtains at the front door. I put the phone down, stepped back into the shadows and waited. Well, that's funny. Could have left the work light on. Not necessarily, Mr. Rodell. Who are you? Name's Marlowe. I'm a private detective. You are Leon Rodell, aren't you? Yes. What are you doing here in my shop? You better finish taking your overcoat off, Mr. Rodell. Now, see... Your yes. wife has run away from Hillcrest Sanitarium. My... Charlotte is out? That's right. How do you know this? 
She came to me tonight under a phony name. Tried to get me to locate you. She'd lost her address. Oh. This is a shock, Mr. Marlowe. A terrible shock. Poor Charlotte, what an awful thing this is for her. Yeah. Excuse me, I, I need this. Sure. Oh, you? No, thanks. Yeah. You see, Marlowe, I've only been here in Los Angeles a month. And the last time I visited Charlotte... That was about three weeks ago, and I hadn't planned to stay out. Wait a minute. My wife is the only one who had my local address. If she lost that, how did you find me? That's a long story. I got the address Charlotte lost, and I've already been up to your house, but the last step was a call to a Miss Ordeen Blackburn. Ordeen? Yeah, she sent me up here. Oh, then you know about Ordeen and me. A little. Well, I suppose under the circumstances, that's hard for you to understand, Marlowe, and even harder to accept. Not exactly, under the circumstances. Oh, well, the law is not as generous as you are. Has no room for understanding. Insanity isn't grounds for divorce until after three long years have passed. And maybe Miss Blackburn doesn't want to wait that long, huh? Well, to be frank, I don't know. I'm in love with her. I think she loves me. I haven't had the courage to tell her about Charlotte yet. Maybe you won't have to. Hmm? Charlotte called her up tonight before I did as a Miss Asher. She must have gotten Ordeen's name and phone number from you some way on that last visit of yours. No, no, that's impossible. Well, she got it some way. Marlo, do you know where Charlotte is? We've got to find her. She's not responsible. She might even be dangerous. It's an understatement, Rodell. She's deadly. Deadly? Hmm. I, I don't understand. Come here. Over behind that table there where the light is. What? Go ahead and look. Well, what's over there? When I showed up here tonight, I saw Charlotte running away. I came in and found that. Oh, my God. The attendant at the sanitarium. Yeah. He knew she'd escaped. He found the hole in the fence where she got out, and he's been following her on his own, strangely enough. He's dead. Marlowe, he's dead. Look, he's, he's dead. Rodell! Sorry. Mar- Marlowe, she must be completely mad. We've got to stop her. Why, she might go for Ordeen next door. Or you, what, yeah. What can we do? Well, you can go home. She doesn't know that address up there, so you'll be okay on that score. All right, but... Uh... Rodell, listen. Keep your doors locked up there, will you? Well, you should. You said Charlotte... I know, I know. I'm not thinking about Charlotte now. There's something else. The guy in San Francisco that you owe all that money to. What about him? Sent a mug down here who intends to collect it. I've tangled with him already. He means business. So be careful, Rodell, and I'll see you as soon as I can. Watched him go out the door limply, his head down. <laughs> he looked about as tough as a bowl of whipped cream. And I went back to the desk again and saw that he'd left his overcoat where he dropped it on the chair. I called the police, gave him the word on Charlotte, and when that was over, I had to switch on the desk light to check the sanitarium number before I could call Dr. Chinetti. That's when I saw the letter lying on the desk, an important letter. But for one reason only. It was addressed to Leon Rodell at his house on Lookout Terrace was an open invitation to anybody who'd come to the shop looking for that particular piece of information. There was no doubt in my mind that Charlotte had seen it, which made it long past time for me to get up there and on the double. I turned, headed for the door, and stopped all in one motion. As a pair of headlights slashed at the windows and then blinked out, I stepped back out of the circle of light from the desk lamp and waited. A second later, the hulk of Mr. Eager filled the open back door. He was still very sure of himself took in the storeroom with one long glance and then sidled through the clutter as deftly as a rumba dancer toward the door where the desk and I were waiting. The instant he got within reach, I swung! You again, you dirty lousy... Major pitch once, big man. Why don't you sit on it? You pig... That's where it's up for that clip on the chops you gave me. Oh, Oh, no. No, not quite, mister. Even Stephen now, big man... went down that time, he took the chair, Rodell's overcoat, and half the stuff on the desk with him. He was still moving, trying to free himself of the tangle, so I reached for him again, but got only a fistful of the overcoat Rodell had left behind. And suddenly, my hand stung like I'd grabbed the wrong end of a bumblebee. I jerked it back and looked at the palm. Something was stuck to my skin, something I couldn't understand. Until finally, realization oozed through the molasses in my brain. I left and ran all the way to my car and almost sprung the frame, twisting up Lookout Terrace. down the hill from 3840 and ran as far as the house next door where I got to the back, hopped the fence, and got my gun in hand. 
As I expected, Leon Rodell was there, and so was Charlotte in the coupe. The door open was poised at the top of the precipitous driveway like the lead car on a roller coaster. Why are you angry with I'm me? I'm not angry, Leon? Charlotte. Now get in the car. We haven't much time. I did everything just like you said, Leon. I know. I lost my hand the over car, your address, and I had, the car, Charlotte, I had yes. to find you, didn't I? You did fine. I did everything. And then I learned about your shop, and I went there. Well, you shouldn't have done that, Charlotte. Leon. Now get in the car. Leon. I saw what you'd done to that Mr. Hook the from the car, sanitarium. Charlotte, we rushed. You killed him with a knife. I had to, Charlotte. He'd been spying on us all oh. the time. He knew all our plans, and yeah. he wanted lots of money to keep quiet. It the frightens car, me, Leon. I wish you had. Stop it, Charlotte. It doesn't matter oh, anymore. It doesn't don't matter. kid yourself, oh. Rodell. Mr. Marlowe. Oh, I, I found Leon by myself, so I, I really don't need you after all. I only wish you were right, baby. Don't yes. move, Rodell. Oh, but you don't understand, Mr. Marlowe. Leon and I are going away together on I a trip. I understand, all right, more than you do now, Charlotte, and I think you better go in the house and wait for oh, us. No, huh? no, don't please, you see? Please, please, we... do as I ask. All right. But don't be long. Some trip you had in mind, Rodell. Your wife in this coop and straight down over the bank, strictly solo. She didn't even suspect. Uh, keep your hands off me. Sure, sure. I'd never get him clean again. But it'll give me great satisfaction to drop you with a bullet. And I'll do just that if you take one step before the police get here. So stand still, Rodell. Real still. <laughs> You were worried, and I'm awfully glad I'm back. So am I, my dear. And we'll talk more about it in the morning. What you need right now is a good night's rest in your own bed. Oh, you're right, Doctor. I'm very tired. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. And thank you. Good night, Charlotte. She still doesn't realize, does she? No, and it's a good thing. But plenty of time for that later when it can come gradually. At this point, she could tear herself to pieces over a thing like this. Yeah. Her husband who urges her to run away and helps her do it for the sole purpose of getting her out where he can kill her. Not much security in that setup, huh? No. You mentioned another woman, Mr. Marlowe. A Miss Ordine Blackburn. Oh, Ordine, yeah. Gullible rich girl without much on the ball. Rodell planned to marry her and solve all his money problems. Yeah. Oh. Believe me, Doc, he had them big ones. I see. Well, she's better off this way. Yeah. Six months of marriage to Rodell, and she'd have been a candidate for your sanitarium herself. He's that kind of a guy. And my late employee, Eldon Hook? Well, he knew that Rodell had been urging his wife to run away and that he'd cut that hole in the fence. Hook mm. found out that Rodell was interested in Ordine, and he tried to shake Rodell down. He signed his own death warrant on the spot. You know, it's sometimes frightening to me, Mr. Marlowe, to realize how many warped and twisted minds there are that never get help until it's far too late. Mm. But there's always some good in every bad thing, they say. What about this case? Charlotte. I expect her to recover completely soon, because now the main contributor to her neurosis, so to speak, is gone forever. Oh. That was Leon Rodell. Yeah, well, Doc, it's a long way back to Hollywood. i better get going, huh? Just one thing more, if you don't mind. Hmm? Charlotte would have died in a smashed car in what would have passed for an accident. Also, she'd have been blamed for Hook's murder if you hadn't found out the truth about Rodell. I'm very curious. You remember the burrs that grew along your fence outside? The burrs? A blasted nuisance. Yeah, but as you just said, Doc, there's always some good in every bad thing. Rodell told me that he hadn't been up here for three weeks. And yet tonight his overcoat was loaded with burrs. I got one in my hand from it. Oh. That gave me a hunch. <laughs> well, from there on it played. Disappointed? To the contrary, satisfied completely. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. Good night, Doc. As I left Hillcrest Sanitarium and drove back across the wide, flat San Fernando Valley, dark and quiet in the hour just before dawn, I found myself being grateful for a lot of little, orderly things. Things like the clear white line down the middle of the road, the rhythm of the motor in my car and the prospect of going home, and my own secure apartment. 
And then I wondered about Charlotte. And the sort of nightmare jungle the world must be to a mind twisted suddenly, out of focus, where there is no symmetry or logic. But nightmares can be banished, huh? Fears driven away. And in time, with Dr. Chinetti's help, she'd come out of it all right. But the others... Others like Hook and Rodell. To them, the jungle is home. No nightmare, that. They live in it by choice. Until, one way or another, they're destroyed. Choked to death by the very tangle they hide in. Well, that's fair enough. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Leffitt. Featured in the cast were Gene Bates, Larry Dobkin, Yvonne Patey, Harold Deerenforth, Jack Edwards, and John T. Smith. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a fireball, too handy with a target pistol, led me down a rocky road past a sleazy money grubber to a curly-headed corpse. And it might have gotten worse if I hadn't slowed down at the hairpin turn. Battered but unbowed by his bout with Fred Allen last Sunday night, Jack Benny will be back at the same old stand tomorrow night, jaunty as ever, and why not? Jack has just been elected the King of Hearts by the American Heart Association. Listen for Jack Benny tomorrow on CBS. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Philip Marlowe takes the case every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This time, a fireball too handy with a target pistol led me down a rocky road past the sleazy money grubber to a curly-headed corpse. And it might have gotten worse if I hadn't slowed down at the hairpin turn. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story... The Hairpin Turn. <laughs> hey, stop it. Put down that gun and listen to me. Stay back, Uncle Enoch. How do you like that? Well, if you could think just half as straight as you could shoot, I'd have nothing to worry about, but you can't. And it's high time you realize that... The... Oh, there's the house buzzer. Somebody's up at the house, Uncle Enoch. And this is Miles Knight. Oh. Well, all right. I'll answer it. I'm expecting a man from the office. But as soon as I finish with him, you and I are going to have a talk, young lady. Do you understand? I said... Oh, what's the use? Yes? Uh, I'm Philip Marlowe to see Mr. Vanneman, Enoch Vanneman. I, I have an appointment. Oh, come in, Marlowe. Glad you're here. Step this way, will you? We'll talk in the study. Okay, Mr. Vanneman. I, uh, why, I thought... Uh, those, uh, those were pistol shots? Yeah, that's, uh, Kay, my niece. Sounds like a squad of Marines. Yeah, well, she's a champion pistol shot. She's converted one of the garages into a target range. Well, I seem to recall a city ordinance that yeah, says... I that know she... all about that ordinance, Mr. Marlowe. Save your breath. Oh, just like that, huh? Precisely. Mm. Sit down, please. Thanks. 
Breaking a city ordinance is a perfect example of all the crackpot things that headstrong young fool insists on getting mixed up in. And you want me to get mixed up with the crackpot, huh? Yeah, she has no more sense in her choice of male companions than she does in her hobbies. And she's a very rich girl. Now, look, if this is a bodyguarding assignment, Mr. Vanneman, I want uh, to tell Hay you... has been going with a man named Cliff Lace. An unsavory type, at least. Professional horse player, I think. And it was quite an affair. Was quite an affair? That's right. She threw Lace over for a new love recently. A fellow I've never met. Hmm. He's serious, but refuses to tell me anything about him. So? So Cliff Lace doesn't like the idea because, from his standpoint, a very good thing has slipped through his fingers. Oh. He's going to do something about it, huh? Well, I don't know. But since about the time they broke up, a man's been snooping around the grounds here, Marlowe. Really? He's about 40, uh, short, greasy looking. He has a flabby kind of face with fat lips and a large black mole on the right side of his nose. Hey, I may know that character, Mr. Vanneman. I'll have to check to be sure. Morrow, I want to know who he is and why he's been hanging around here. Also, I want to find out all there is to know about Kay's new man. Mm. Tell me, uh, how old is Kay, Mr. Vanneman? She's 26. That's her picture there. Oh, well, blonde fireball. <laughs> Look, uh, Mr. Vanneman, if she's 26, maybe her love life is none of your business. It is my business. I'm her guardian and I'm very fond of her. But she's reckless, stubborn, and erratic. Yeah, well, money's great, but it'll never replace the old-fashioned parent. Well, it's also a big responsibility, you know. No, not firsthand, I well, don't. It leaves one open to every crooked scheme in the book. Here, look, Marlowe. I've written my personal phone number on this card. You can reach me there privately at any time. All right, Mr. Vanneman, I'll see what I can find out. I got in my car and I crossed the two acres of tailored flora the Vanneman's called Front Yard. I could see in back the squat, windowless brick building topped by a skylight that housed the target range. And a minute later, I drove out through the big Bel Air gate into Sunset Boulevard just as Kay Vanneman streaked past me in a sleek new Nash. I was sure I knew already who the snoopy little man who'd been hanging around was. The description of flabby face, fat lips, and mole fit tight on a guy named Mutt Pomeroy, who'd somehow been issued a private detective's license and somehow managed to keep it. He was just about as ethical as a stab in the back. I remembered he had an office in a fire trap on Bronson, so I made that my first stop. Climbed a flight of dark, smelly stairs to a tired door marked Pomeroy Private Investigations. Well, there was no answer, so I tried the door. Somebody beside Mutt had been there ahead of me. Turned the place inside out. It was a shambles. I spent five minutes going over his files, scattered like leaves in November... And we're still at it when the door behind me swung shut. Lose something, chum? Hello, Mutt. What's the big idea tearing up my joint, Marlowe? Hey, hey, you know better than that. I wouldn't touch the stuff you keep on file without rubber gloves. <laughs> Real funny. If you didn't do this, then who did? I came in and found it just like this. One of your clients must have gotten a little careless. Well, you're full of them tonight, aren't you? Yeah. What do you want here, Marlowe? I need a little help, Mutt. No kidding. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, chum, sit down. Glad to help out a brother sleuth any time at all. Now, what's your problem? Why are you so interested in the Vanneman place? Oh, the Vanneman place? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Quite a chunk of real estate they got there. I know. What's the fascination? A little simple investigation for a simple little lady. For purposes of conversation, what'll we call her? Mm. How does Estelle suit you? Estelle, Look, Marlo, you got in free. Take the scraps and be happy. Okay. But as you put it, the Vannemans own quite a chunk of real estate. We might subdivide. You might like to tell me how this Estelle ties in. Yeah. Yeah, I might at that, chum. She's worried about a guy. And from what I've seen of that jet-propelled blonde named Kay Vanneman, she's got plenty of reason to worry. Guy's name wouldn't be Cliff Lace, would it? Cliff Lace? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm. I don't remember, Marlo. Okay, Mutt, how much is it going to take? Well, now, that's hard to say. I'll have to let you know. You see, I've got an angle on my end, too. My uh, little client swears up and down there's no other woman involved. But, you know, the Estelles are always the last to know. You're beginning to smell, Pomeroy. And just how do you fit, Marlowe? I'm helping a guy worry about a girl. Well, that's real nice. And when your clients worry, the wrinkles make dollar signs, so you're always right, is that it? Thanks for everything. I'll see you around, Mutt. Yeah, but you don't go away mad, chum. Oh, of course not. That's why I'm leaving now. It's a 
took a friend at the phone company all of ten minutes to locate Cliff Lace's address for me, which turned out to be a snug bachelor's nest bungalow style at the foot of the Hollywood Hills, numbered 4300 Cherimoya. I parked, started to the front door, and on the way, passed an open window where the silhouette of a man at a telephone was cut into neat slices by a Venetian blind. Oh, but you better want But his voice me, came through in one piece, yeah. and you couldn't miss it. You see, Estelle, I know almost all about you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got your name earlier tonight from a mutual friend, Mr. Mutt Pomeroy. Yeah. I think it's about time we got together for a little business conference, huh? Now, right there at the plaza in, say, two hours... Uh, you'll still be registered as Ruth Bridges. Good. Goodbye, Estelle. When he hung up, he moved over to a bottle of Johnny Walker scotch. I waited until he'd helped himself, and then I went to the door. Yeah? My name's Marlowe, Mr. Lace. I'd like to talk to you. What about? Whatever it was you were looking for when you ransacked Mutt Pomeroy's office tonight. Do I come in? Yeah. Yeah, of course. All right. But I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come on. We both know that's a lie. Let's forget it and go on from there, huh? Just a minute. You a cop? No. But I'll call him at the drop of a hat. Make it easy on yourself. Yeah. What's Mud Pomeroy to you? Bag of worms. I want to know who he's working for. The fact that you had to break into his place to get information should let you out. So who is it? What makes you think I'd know? Because you found what you were looking for. What's Estelle's last name, Cliff? <laughs> you do get around, don't you, Bright? Yeah, yeah, I do. Only sometimes not fast enough. Look, Buster, why not chance at the door? Somebody's got his finger caught in a buzzer. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I told you I didn't... I stopped by to deliver something, Cliff. An ultimatum. I'm telling you for the last hold time... Hold it, hold it. We're not alone. I don't care what I have to say to you. I'll shout from the rooftops. We're through, washed up. Now get out of my life and stay out. Okay, please. Good evening, Miss Vanneman. I don't know you, Slim, but keep out of this. Look, look, Donnie, don't... Now you listen. I'm in love with Boyce Neely. Really in love this time. I intend to marry him, and I won't have... You... Marry Boyce Neely? <laughs> oh, don't be ridiculous. Cliff, I'm warning you. Look, you'll get this. You'll never marry Boyce Neely. That's one thing I'm sure of. I know a lot more about him than you do, darling. Believe me. When the time is just right, you're going to hear from me again, but loud. Why, you filthy. If you try to do anything to hurt Boyce and me, Cliff Lace, so help me, I'll kill you. I mean it. <laughs> Sometimes she's going to throw that temper at me just once too often. Who are you kidding, Lace? Ever see her use a target pistol? Ah, oh, she's too smart to trump her own ace. Don't count on it, mister. No, I'm not worried. Uh... Where were we, Marlowe? We were looking for some answers, which I just got. <laughs> Good night, Lace. Keep your head down. The way things were breaking, I was sure if I didn't get to the woman named Estelle before Lace did, I wasn't going to get anywhere. So I spent the next hour folded up in a phone booth, running down the list of respectable and semi so hotels with the word plaza either for or aft. Finally, a flute-voiced night clerk in a mid-Victorian number called the Royce Plaza confessed that they had a Ruth Bridges, which was the name that I'd heard Lace mention. She was registered from Santa Monica, but at the moment out, I was convinced that she was really Estelle, Mutt Pomeroy's client. So I drove over to the hotel, invested five bucks with the night clerk, picked up a newspaper, and waited. Halfway down the sports page, a prim brunette came in who would have been pretty without the overload of nervous strain snapped on her face. As she crossed the deserted lobby, the clerk gave me a nod, so I called her name, caught up with her at the foot of the stairs. You... you called me? Yeah, if you could spare me a minute, Miss Bridges, I'd like to talk to you. What do you want? Well, my name's Marlowe. I'm a private detective. A, a, a private detective? Yeah, look, honey, let's move over into the corner. You know, that boy on the desk is going to sprain his neck if we don't. But what do you want with me? Well, suppose we start off with your real name, Estelle. What's the rest of it? Neely, maybe, huh? <laughs> How did you know that? It's taken me all evening to get it. But that's the only way it figures. It's right, isn't it? You're married to Boyce Neely? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm Mrs. Boyce Neely, but what business is that of yours? Well, that's what I'm trying to find out. You hired Mutt Pomeroy to check on your husband because you're worried about him, right? Why? Boyce is in trouble. He, well, he, he's in a jam, that's all. Is it money? No. Boyce does very well. He's in real estate in Santa Monica. Oh, maybe with the law, huh? Yes. Yes, I'm afraid so. He, he's he been acting so strange. He, he wouldn't talk to me or anything. 
I just had to find out what was wrong. I see. Well, look, what's your connection with Cliff Lace? Why, I... I don't know any Cliff Lace. Oh, come on, baby. Take it a little easier and try again. Cliff Lace, I know you called him tonight, and he called you. All right. He... He wanted to talk to me about... About Boyce and... And some girl named Kay Vanneman, but... He's crazy, I know he is. Boyce is not mixed up with another woman. He couldn't be. I hope I meet your husband soon, Mrs. Neely. I'd like to punch him in the nose. What do you mean? But Pomeroy was right. The Estelles are always the last to know. Look, do me a favor. Will you go up to your room, go to bed, and get some sleep? You're going to need it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Marlowe. Mm. Hey, uh, Buster, where's the phone? Oh, right over there, sir. Good book? Uh Uh-huh. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, great. Chandler's new one, you know. Chandler. Chandler. (laughs) Where have I heard that name before? Hello? You know, Vanneman? Marlowe, Mr. Vanneman. Kay there? No, she's not, Marlowe. Listen. I want you to forget whatever else you're doing and find her immediately. Well, what's the matter? She left here about 15 minutes ago in a fury. Where was she going? Well, I don't know for sure. She left shortly after you did tonight. Then she came back about an hour I ago. I know, I know. I ran into her. What happened this time? She got a phone call from Cliff Lace. Something was said about him now being in the driver's seat, whatever that means. She was furious. That's not good, Vanneman. Believe me. Well, it's worse than you think. You've got to stop her. Because when she left here, Marlowe, I'm quite sure she had her target pistol with her. I hung up the phone, ran out to my car, and headed back to Cliff Lace's bungalow on Cheramoya. But Kay had a 15-minute head start, and at that hour, in her frame of mind, the drive in from Bel Air was a hop, skip, and a jump. The only hope was in Lace himself being smart enough to know that he'd overplayed his hand. The street was deserted when I pulled in and parked down the hill from the place. When I got to the front door and found it unlocked, I eased it open and went in. The living room was dark, but there was a light on in the bedroom, and I started for it. Before I saw the bulk of a figure leaning against the dark side of the frame. Come on in, chum. Make yourself at home. What are you doing here, Mutt? Easy, Marlowe. There's no hurry. Not now, there's not. School's out, chum. Where's Lace? Inside. It was nice, clean, accurate, and exactly dead center. He never knew what hit him. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, for a moment, let's look at the headlines on CBS's entertainment for tomorrow night. First, east is east and west is west. So, Jack Benny, on his way to New York, hasn't yet heard that the subway fare is a dime. Second, Charlie McCarthy, already in New York, rewrites Henry Fonda's tough-talking Navy officer in Mr. Roberts. And third, Andy of Amos and Andy, released from bail, jail, and Abigail, gets into new hot water. Besides these, you'll also find headliners Eve Arden, Red Skelton, Horace Hyde, and all the other great Sunday night shows on most of these same CBS stations tomorrow night. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Hairpin Turn. small, neat hole front and center in his forehead said that Cliff Lace had been shot to death. And everything from jealous motive to target pistol method pointed directly to Cave Vanneman. But that was still a long way from proof, and there was Mutt Pomeroy on hand. The kind who always figured only one way. To the right of the dollar sign. Now, let's not jump to any dumb conclusions, Marlowe. Like what? Like the look on your kisser that wants to know what I'm doing here. That I can explain. I got Cliff Lace's name from you, and a sawbuck to the right guy gave me a rundown on him. A sort of a character analysis, you might say. So? So I figured he was the guy who frisked my office to find out who I was working for. He must have tagged me out of the Vanderman place, followed me down to my joint, then turned everything inside out until he ran across something that added for him. Something like the name is Tell Neely, maybe? <laughs> you move fast, don't you, Marlowe? Yeah, when there isn't too much crowding. I've got most of it already, Pomeroy, so Spill? Spill? I don't know what you mean, Marlowe. I mean that Estelle Neely hired you to find out why her husband was worried. You come up with an answer, all right. It was called other woman. So? Estelle didn't even suspect anything about another woman. And you didn't tell her what you found out because it was Kay Vanneman, a gal with a million bucks, right or wrong. Suppose you're right, Marlowe. What are you getting at? 
A possibility that you could have done this. Kill Lace? Why? Because Lace was playing the same game that you are, chum, blackmail. Your motive was money and so was his. Plus the fact that he didn't like Kay giving him his walking papers. So when he wouldn't come to terms with me, I killed him, is that it? Yeah, it could be. Can you prove otherwise? <laughs> no, I can't. But other things can, Marlowe. Things, yeah. Like that lipstick smeared cigarette in the ashtray behind you. It's not my brand. And I don't drop hairpins on the carpet when I kill. Do I go on? Or are you just trying it for size because you hate to think that a gorgeous item like young money bags could be it? <laughs> right or wrong, Marlowe? You know, leveling with you, Pomeroy, takes the kind of talent that can cash a $7 bill at a bank. Who are you calling, Marlowe? The cops. It's the custom. Wait, wait. Look, don't be a sap. What'll that get you? A killer, maybe. Yeah, and from there on, a pat on the head. A well done from the law. Get smart, chum. Shielding a murderer is a lot healthier with a bank account than nailing one every time. Get your hand off the phone. Now, Marlowe, listen. Get it off. Okay, go on. Louse it up, boy scout. Who knows, maybe some bright day you might even run for Alderman, Marlowe. Without your votes, I'm sure. Homicide, Sergeant Becker. Bill Marlowe, Sarge. is a DOA waiting for you. 4300 Cherimoya. Name's Cliff Lace. Occupation questionably was shot. Any idea who did it, Marlowe? Yeah. Poor little rich girl named Kay Vanneman or her sweetheart, one Mr. Boyce Neely. Who lives in Santa Monica? Yeah. Where's the fit? I don't know. How long ago was this lace killed, Marlowe? 30, 40 minutes? Why? Neely's clear. We picked him up at his own home better than two hours ago. He's on a pokey now. What'd you get him on? Hit and run, a month ago. It's alleged that he knocks an old lady out of a crosswalk and into a hospital without even stopping to watch her bounce. Some anonymous tips to phone the dope in around six tonight. Said the repaint job on Neely's car would prove it. It did. So that just leaves this venom babe, huh? Yeah, I guess so. But you know, Becker, hey, there's... Mono. Come here, quick. Out in the backyard there. It's Kay Vanderman. I'll call you later, Becker. We got company. Get the lights, Pomeroy, and stay down. Don't worry, Marlowe. The driveway alongside the house is the only way out. All right, watch it from the front. I'll go through the kitchen and out the back door. I'll play it close. Check. But remember, Pomeroy, nobody gets trigger happy. Don't worry, chum. Hey, Come on, baby, you're cornered back there. Talk up. Who's that? Bill Amalo, the guy you saw here with Cliff Lace earlier tonight. I'm also a private detective who's working for your uncle and trying to keep you out of trouble. Now, let's have the target pistol, baby. Come on, throw it in. I can't. I don't have one. Uncle Enoch says different. He told me you left the house with it. I told you I don't have one. All right, come on out. But slowly, hands high, no jokes. I always lose my sense of humor right after murder. After... Yeah, yeah. Lace was shot to death. Never mind the carefully arched eyebrows. You're in too deep, honey. You don't think I had anything to do with Cliff Lace getting killed, do you? Oh, no, no. It's all one great big coincidence, huh? Why don't you leave, Vanneman? I... I said, why don't you leave? Well, I... How about it, Mr. Marlowe? Go ahead. I won't try to stop you. If you're guilty, you won't get very far. Well, all right. All right, Pomeroy, what's on your mind? A partnership, chum. Based on what, chum? Based on the fact that I saw you kill Cliff Lace. Fact? You what? Yeah. I saw you standing over the body with a smoking gun. Come on, come on. You don't think you can really make that stick, do you? No, but it would keep you busy explaining for a while, long enough for me to wind up my business. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, Marlo, what will it be? You and me as partners doing business with old Enoch Vanneman on behalf of the niece I'm sure he'll want to protect. Or me in business for myself. Well, which? It'll be partners, Pomeroy. <laughs> okay, chum. Let's get inside and clean up. Mm. The lady was kind of careless around the edge. Hey, hey, the split. Hmm? How far does it go? 50-50. Fair enough. Fair enough. <clears throat> After you, Phil. Now get that cigarette butt and the hairpin on the carpet there. Then tell Sergeant Becker that you were jumping the gun about the Vanderman girl because you just found out that she was at home all night. I'll check the rest of it. Okay, Mutt. First the cigarette butt, then the hairpin. Hey. What is it, Marlowe? 
What's with the hairpin? Why'd you say... Barlow, quick, get the light. Someone's out front. Don't shoot it. Maybe the law. In skirts? Look, get in that car over there. It's a babe, and five will get you ten that she answers the name of Kay. Oh, that jerk's going to be a Lulu to protect. Yeah. Well, we better go in. Hey, the hairpin you dropped into your pocket, Marlowe. What's so special about it? Oh, nothing. It it was just a hunch I had. Forget it. Marlowe, I want to see it. Okay. Here. Get a good look. (laughs) Partner... Last 20 minute drive back out to Bel Air and the Panaman place. All the way, I worried hard that the hunch I was playing was right and that I was going to be too late to do anything about it. When I was there, parked halfway up the pedal driveway out of my car and running toward the fluorescent light and the sound of a woman's voice that filtered through the heavy iron mesh over an air vent in the windowless target range, I slowed to a walk, switched the 45 from pocket to right hand, and then I moved up to where I could both see and hear. Kay Bannerman was huddled in a far corner, her eyes crowded with fear and riveted on the dainty but lethal twenty two automatic that Cliff Lace's murderer pointed straight at her head. Estelle Neely had her back to me, but with the grill that was designed to stop bullets between us, there was nothing I could do. You've got to listen to me. Please listen before you do anything crazy. I swear, I, I, I never knew that boys was married. I, I'd never have gone with him if I'd known. You're a liar. No, it's the truth, I tell you. It started like the others, fun and no questions asked, but then... I fell in love and it never occurred to me that you might have been married. Stop it! I don't want to hear anymore. I've already killed once for boys. The guy I turned into the police for something he did a month ago. You turned your own husband over? I did that so they'd put him away out of your reach. You'd never wait for him. You'd go your own merry, merry way a week after he was in jail. Boys would be glad to come back to me after five years of living in a cage like an animal. And he'd never suspect that I was the one who informed. I hired a private detective, Mutt Pongo. And made sure that he knew I never even suspected that Boyce could have anything to do with another woman. Then Boyce would never realize it was you who turned him in. Because you had no motive. Not Pomeroy would be your witness to that. I killed Cliff Lace because he traced me from Pomeroy. And then found out that I was the one who told the police about Boyce. He would have blackmailed me forever. And I'm not sorry. Nor will I be when I kill you. Now sit down, Miss Vanneman. And listen carefully. I couldn't shoot, but I knew that it would be disastrous to yell, but I had to do something in a hurry. I moved up quietly to the door. It was locked. That only left one chance, a skylight on the roof. The building was low, and a lawn chair nearby was all the help I needed. When I was up and over to the skylight, there was glass and no mesh underneath. I still hadn't made it, because from that angle I could see Kay. But only here, Estelle. Oh, now you know just what kind of a woman is going to kill you. But why me? I told you... I don't care what you told me. It was you, young and beautiful, that started all this. All this is almost over now because the other detective, that Marlowe, knows that I killed Lace. He found a hairpin there. I saw him from a window. I saw him pick up the hairpin, Miss Van. No, stay back. The black hairpin that couldn't possibly belong to a blonde like you. The hairpin that said Marlowe knows that I killed Lace. So I'm through and I know it. But before they get me, I... My... My hand, it... Marlowe, is she dead? No, just out. Well, fireball, any appropriate wisecracks? Wisecrack? Uh, not for quite a while, Marlowe. I'm too scared. Well, it was the usual hour and a half of questions and answers with client, followed by the same questions and answers with police before I finally closed the door on Enoch Bannerman's marble halls and started down past the manicured shrubbery to where I'd left my car. Outside, the night was cold and clear. And as I walked, I looked up at the vastness overhead and wondered. Wondered why I had the kind of job that made me no more than a houseboy with gun for a rich guy. With a badly spoiled niece. But I stopped wondering when I was at my car. And no longer alone. I just wanted to say thanks before you left, Phil. I'm going to do my best to stay out of trouble from here on out. 
You know why? No, why? Because I want to be good enough for the right guy who may come along someday. A guy like you, I mean. Oh? Thanks, Phil. <sighs> I'm very grateful. Yes, well, <clears throat> my job's all right nine times out of ten. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were G.B. Hunter, Jay Novello, Olive Deering, Ralph Moody, Tony Barrett, and Charles Russell. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It happened in a place called Bay City where I was unwelcome to a fat fry cook with a secret and a dapper gambler who smoked oversized cigarettes. But where to the long arm of the law? I was poisoned. <laughs> Philip Marlowe has a new night, ladies and gentlemen. Tuesdays. Yes, starting February 7th, the adventures of Philip Marlowe will be heard every Tuesday night at 9.30 Eastern Standard Time. Be sure and listen. Remember, Tuesday night, Marlowe night. And one week from tonight, at this time, you'll find one of your favorite radio families, the Goldbergs. Yes, Molly, Jake, Sammy, Rosie, and all their friends are moving from Friday nights on CBS to Saturdays, starting next Saturday. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Stay tuned now for Gangbusters, which follows on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where the Goldbergs and Arthur Godfrey's Digest will now be heard every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. It happened in a place called Bay City, where as unwelcome to a fat fry cook with a secret and a dapper gambler. But to the long arm of the law, I was poisoned. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Long Arm. I got my Sunday best on. Going strutting with Miss Laura Belly. Oh, fine. Every time I take a shower, I've never seen it. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Hello. Mr. Philip Marlowe, please. Yes, yeah, speaking. One moment, please, sir. Bay City is calling. Bay City. Where's I have your party, call? sir. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, thanks. Hello, is that you, Marlowe? Yeah. This is Ernie Parch, Phil, at Bay City. P Parch? Yeah, you remember me, don't you? No, I can't see. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ernie Potts. You're the guy who saved my life when the Bay City law left me beat up and bleeding all over the city dump, right? Yeah, 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 that's it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Marlowe, please, listen. What? I'm in an awful jam. Like what? I just got out of jail yesterday. A year and a day. Jail, Ernie? Yeah, yeah. A very neat frame, Phil, but... Oh? Not half as neat as the one they're trying to hang on me now. This one's worse. You remember my wife, don't you? Grace, tall, blonde... Yeah, yeah, what about her? She's dead, Marlowe. Oh, no. She was murdered. They're gonna try to pin it on me... You'll come right away, huh? Well, look, Ernie, I, I'm poisoned in Bay City. You know that. Uh, please. Rake Sturman would give a year's pay just to watch me break an arm. Five if I drown. But, Marlowe, you don't know it was Sturman who had you uh, messed up for sticking your nose into Bay City politics? No, no, but I can sure second guess it. It was tough cop but, tactics all the way. Uh, and you mean you won't help me? Yeah, well, Ernie, really, I'm sorry, kid, but you better get yourself an honest lawyer and... In and... Bay City? You know better than that, Phil. 
Who'd have the guts to knock heads with the police in this town? Especially when they got a custom tailored pigeon like me standing by with one wing already clipped. Phil, I tell you, it looks like I murdered Grace. Yeah, now look, kid. Phil, I, I saved your life once. Okay. What's your address, Ernie? <laughs> it's 38 Orlando Drive. <laughs> City was a snug seacoast town some 20 miles southwest of L.A. and about twice that distance from being on the up and up. Its string of gambling houses were politely winked at by some elements of the law and its gamblers in turn politely winked back while the folding money passed from sucker to slicker to crooked cop. But Bay City also was home to a lot of honest fishermen, retired real estate brokers and another element of the law, good cops. Which side Detective Lieutenant Rake Sturman was on I'd never been able to figure. He only added one way, all cop, morning, noon, and night. The kind of made any private detective feel a little less welcome than a leper. Well, an hour after dark, I pulled up and parked well away from 38 Orlando Street. Five minutes later, I was watching a nervous Ernie Parch wear out the carpet in his shabby living room. It was... It was at Art Minnelli's place, Phil, about a year ago. The little casino. It's out north on the edge of town. Uh -huh. I'd had a few drinks with some of the guys who worked at my gas station. One thing led to another, and... Well, finally, we were out there trying to pyramid 50 bucks into 50,000. That's when the cops came in, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know, one of those pre-election raids that look good in the papers. You, you want a drink? No, no, thanks. But look, that raid couldn't have gotten you a year and a day, Ernie. No, no. But the gun they found in my top coat pocket could have. Mm hmm And did. Yeah, 38 I'd never seen before in my life. Plant, huh? Yeah, a plant that I could only figure two ways, Phil. Either someone at Art Manelli's place just happened to choose my pocket to drop his gun into, or, or someone just happened to drop it in on purpose. Someone who was sweet on grace and wanted me out of the way. Now, look, you're sure you know what you're saying, Ernie? I'm positive. 366 days in prison with only one miserable letter from her convinced me. That and the word I got at Gumbo's place late this afternoon. Gumbo's place? Yeah, yeah, Gumbo's shanty. A, the chicken joint run by a fat fry cook named Lou Gumborski. Hmm. Grace worked there at... I stopped in just before I ran into Lieutenant Rake Sturman. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean, ran into Sturman? What happened? Well, Phil, I, I was on the street getting into my sedan, you see? Yeah. I picked it up from a guy who was using it while I was away. When Sturman pulled up alongside of me in a squad car, and he, he started to tell me how much he liked seeing ex-cons back in Bay City. What interrupted him? Oh, a call on a police radio. But before he left, he promised to drop around here sometime tonight and chat a while. Mm -hmm. And before that, at Gumbo's place? I found Grace. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've had enough, Ernie. No. I... You found Grace in what? We had a fight. She admitted running around, said I wasn't worth waiting for. But she wouldn't say who was. I slapped her. Hard. All right, take it easy. Grace is dead now, murdered, remember? Yeah. Yeah, she's dead. Yeah, and they're going to tag me for it. Maybe. Now, tell me what happened after you left Gumbo's. Uh, I ran into Sturman, like I said. Yeah. Then I drove around for a couple hours to cool off. When I got hold of myself, I... I came back here and... I found her. Strangled to death. In that chair, Phil. It was horrible. What'd you do about it, honey? I... I I'm not sure exactly. I, here. I changed my mind. Thanks, Phil. <clears throat> now, I... I decided to get her out of here. It was... Just getting dark, so I, I waited a little, and then and I carried her down the rear stairs, and I put her in my car, in the back seat. I put a blanket over her. She's still there, Phil. I was going to drive the car away, but, well, I, I, I guess I, I lost my nerve. What am I going to do, Phil? Sturman might be here any minute, and you got to help me. You must have Ernie, Ernie, kid. that won't do it. I'm sorry. I... All right, kid. Are the keys in the car? No, no, no. I, I got them here. What are you going to do? I don't know. But you get out of here. Do something. But what? Phil? Anything. Go to a movie. Act as relaxed as you can. Do anything. Except come back here for the, at least two hours. Now go on. All right. All right, Phil. Whatever you say, I, I'll go to a movie. Yeah. Right now. Right away. Thanks, Phil. I know you'll get me out of this. Ernie Parch's vote of confidence made comfortable listening for both of us. When he was gone and I was down the rear stairs and out to his car in the alley, keys in hand, I realized that it stopped right there in the back seat. 
Then in the light that spilled from a nearby unshaded window, I saw I was going to have company. Sharp pointed elevator shoes, careful blue flannel, and patent with a hair over a pasty face. All of it no more than five and a half feet and held together by a hand painted tie that sported a dapper knot the size of a cantaloupe. Good evening. I wonder if you could help me. I'm looking for Ernie Parch, uh, 36 Orlando Drive. I couldn't find any number on this house. Is this it? Yeah, but Parch isn't in. He just left. Oh. You know where he went? No, no. <laughs> it's all right, Cautious. I only want to talk to him. My name is Art Manelli. I'm a friend of his. Uh, an acquaintance. You? The same. He went to a movie, Mr. Manelli. I saw the picture, so I'm going home, back to San Diego. I live there. Oh, good. San Diego means U.S. 101 to the south, and right past my next stop. I came in a cab, or don't those keys in your hand there say that you're leaving? I mean, I don't want to appear presumptuous. Or wait for a taxi. Or wait for a taxi. Mm. Shall I get in, or do you want to slide over to the driver's seat from here? I want to slide, if that's all right with you. Mm, perfectly. Um, tell me, Mr. Uh, Crewshutter. Mr. Crewshutter? Yeah. You had business with Ernie? Personal business. You, Mr. Manelli? Yes, I wanted to see Ernie about a good location I have in mind for a new gas station. You know about such things? Uh, no, no, and I don't think you do either, Manelli. Unless, of course, the pumps can be converted into roulette wheels. Oh, you know who I am, eh? Yeah. I also know it's a little strange for you to show up at Ernie's place the day after he gets out of the state pen for a frame that took place at your little casino. What are you getting at, Mr. Crewshutter? An outside chance that you yourself were responsible for that frame? That you're anxious to see what, if anything, Ernie intends to do about it? The light's red, Crewshutter. No fool. Now tell me, uh, why would I want to frame Ernie Parch? I don't know. Could be, Manelli, that you did it accidentally, you know, a little gun hidden in a big hurry. Or it could be you had a tighter reason, huh? Like what? Like Grace Parch, very pretty girl. You're out of your mind? Yeah, yeah, sure I am, Manelli. Just plain nuts. So why don't you get out here? <clears throat> get yourself a nice, sane taxi cab. It'll be safer. All right. Just as you say. Uh -huh. Hey, Mister, me and my pal Little Liz going toward the highway. Sure he is. Hi, it's swell. Come on, Norm. We'll ride in the back seat. No, I got stuff in there. Close that door and beat it. Oh, okay, Happy. Thanks a lot. Stuff, Mr. Crewshutter? What kind of stuff? Rum, Manelli. I'm a bootlegger who never got the word, believe me. Oh, but I do. <laughs> the light's green, Mr. Crewshot, eh? So long. I went three short blocks and I got out of the traffic and drove as far back toward Orlando Street as a vacant lot that was only a block away from Ernie's. Thereafter, I wiped the wheel, the gear shift, everything else I'd touched clean of prints. I left the sedan as is and walked back to where I originally parked my own car. Behind the wheel of my coupe, I spent the next 20 minutes finding Gumbo Shanty, where Grace Parch used to work. It was a wooden daddy long leg standing knee-deep in the Pacific Ocean and circled at the waist by an imitation ship's deck for summertime outdoor eating. A gangplank led up from the street level, and when I'd gone about half the length of it, I saw something at the door ahead, shaped like a bowling pin topped by a chef's hat and encompassed by a yard and a half of Hickok belt that said, this had to be fat fry cook Lou Gumborski. He was turning the reversible sign from open to close. Sorry, mister. I'm closing early tonight. Food's all gone. Oh, then how about a drink? I only want a quick shot, Gumbo. Gumbo? You're a stranger here. How you know the name? Well, it's written overhead in four-foot letters. I keep my eyes open. Okay. Go on in. Make it fast. I want to hit the hay. Oh. You live here? Yeah. What do you want? Scotch. Anything with it? A little information. Oh. About what? Girl who works for you, Grace Parch. I don't know anything about her. Mm. Not even for five, Gumbo? Maybe it's ten. Okay, ten. And the drink's on the house, huh? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, mister. Grace Parch is five foot two, eyes are blue. Also, she could work at six tonight like she does every night, period. Uh-huh. Here's to you. <clears throat> now, tell me, where's she been going while Ernie's been in stir? For another ten... Yeah, for another ten. On one condition, no more lousy poems, Gumbo. Just a few straight facts, huh? Sure. <laughs> sure. Another drink? No, no, no. Facts first. Where's she been hanging around? A little casino. Oh, it's Manelli's joint, huh? Yeah, Manelli's place, where a lot of people hang around. What is it? 
What are you staring at, Gumbo? The window. I, I thought I saw someone out there on a the deck looking in. Probably seagulls. Forget it. Now, look, I'd Shut like to know... Sure, sure it is someone getting away in a car. Oh, any idea who it was? Huh? I said any idea... I heard you. Now, go on home, mister. Get out of here. Take it easy, big guy. You got 20 bucks. Give for... it. Yeah. Here's your lousy 20 bucks and the drinks on the house and good night. After one question. The guy in that car that just took off, was it Manelli? I'll repeat myself. Good night, mister. Okay. I'll let it go at good night, Gumbo, but just for now. I wasn't going to get any more out of Gumbo, so I went back to my car, pointed it north toward the edge of town in the little casino where I figured I might get a lead on Manelli's whereabouts. But 30 minutes later, when I was there out of my car and standing in front of what looked like an oversized concrete blockhouse alone in a parking lot the size of the Coliseum, I figured different. A huge sign out front read, Close for alterations will reopen soon, bigger and better than ever. <laughs> Gambling in Bay City was obviously on the QT like an artillery barrage. time I got back to 38 Orlando Street, nearly three hours had gone by since I'd last seen Ernie. As I started up the steps toward the light in his living room, I wasn't happy over the lack of information I had for him. But when I opened the door and saw what was waiting for me, that didn't matter. In one huge, beefy, freckled hand, there was the usual police department 38 revolver. Hello, kid. The ice-cold gray eyes, the thick, broken nose, the nasty curl of the lips... All belong to Bay City's toughest homicide detective, Lieutenant Rake Sterling. Hello, Marlowe. I've been waiting for you too long, kid. Why, well, I would have baked a little cake if I knew I was going to have this much time. Where's Ernie Parts, Sterling? He's under arrest, kid. We found his wife's body. He's under arrest for murder. And you know what else, kid? No, what else, kid? So are you. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Fred Allen's crack that it's no wonder comedians can't find work when singers go comical has had a fast reply from Bing Crosby. Bing has invited Fred to be his guest on his CBS show this Wednesday night. And you can get right into the very middle of the argument on most of these same CBS stations where Bing Crosby's show is heard every Wednesday night. Be sure to hear Fred Allen's visit to Bing's show this Wednesday following Groucho Marx and You Bet Your Life. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Long Arm. As Lieutenant Sturman moved toward me, he curled the thick fingers of his left hand into a fist. I braced myself, but the blow never came. <laughs> Instead, he shoved his face up close to mine and his mouth twisted into a one-sided grin that was as full of fun as a set of thumb screws. Well, you finally came through for me, didn't you, kid? I don't know what you're talking about. I've been waiting a long, long time for you to pull something in my town, Marlowe, where you can't run back across the line and hide behind the skirts of your cop friends over in L.A. You're having yourself a pipe dream, Sturman. Lieutenant Sturman! And don't forget it. Real sorry, officer. Now, do you mind explaining what this is all about? That's one of my rights as a citizen, you know, even in Bay City. As far as I'm concerned, killers ain't got any rights. Now tell me you had nothing to do with Grace Parcher's murder, so I can tell you why you're a stinking liar, private detective. Well, I suppose private detectives have no rights either, huh? None. Oh. We found the girl's body in a car parked at a vacant lot, and somebody overlooked a couple of fingerprints, which I'm going to match up with yours, Marlowe. How come you're so sure? Because we pulled Ernie Parch out of the movies five minutes after we found his wife. And jailbirds sing in Bay City, Marlowe. We don't horse around with him. Come on, let's go. Wait a minute. Boy, you pushed too far on the wrong track. There's an angle here you ought to know about. Uh, there's always an angle with you, ain't there, bright boy? Yeah, but you're going to like this one. First in that car you're so proud of, you're going to find prints from one Art Manelli. The gambler? That's right. The one who stays in operation when everybody else in Bay City is closed up. You better find out whose toes you're stepping on down at City Hall before you... Get out! We got problems in our town, people, but that's not one of them. Now, if you got something intelligent to offer, spill it. Without wisecracks. All right. Ernie Parch was framed a year ago in Minnelli's joint. No doubt on Minnelli's orders. Why? Because Grace Parch was a pretty girl with the end for gamblers. That's why. 
All the time Ernie was in the cooler, she was running down to Minnelli's place, and I got a witness to prove it. She also makes it a kind of little cheap tramp that gets out of hand. Go on, detective! <clears throat> Minnelli showed up here tonight with no satisfactory reason for it. What's more, you warned Ernie Potts just this afternoon that you were keeping an eye on him. Even if he wanted to kill his wife, he's not stupid enough to have done it tonight. But from Minnelli's standpoint, it was a perfect time, you see, because you guys would go for it just exactly as you have. So you think we're stupid. I did. Now, look. I, I know you got no use for me, Stephen. But you're a cop after all. And as long as somebody's got to take the rap, it might as well be the right guy. You know what, sweetheart? What? Your fairy story makes the average listening. Just average, nothing else. Now get to it! I was tired. Too tired to take what I know I'd be given. Once Rake Sterling got me inside the Bay City headquarters, I made my decision fast. There were three steps in the front porch of the wall, and he was right behind me. I took the first two, then turned and grabbed. He sailed over my shoulder, and I heard him land flat on his back on the sidewalk as I rounded the corner of the house. I crossed the backyard, bolted the fence, and put a hundred yards of alley between us before I even stopped to think. Then I went back to my car and drove down to the water again in Gomborski's chicken shanty. The place was dark and locked up tight. I went around to the back where his living quarters were and listened. A crocodile slithering over the floor inside would have made the same sound. I pushed the door open and went in. It was Gumborski, all right, but you couldn't tell it from his face. That had been worked over long and hard by an expert. He didn't know I was there until I touched him. Oh, oh, oh. Get away. Go on, get out of here. Who gave you the beating, Gumbo? Oh, way off, will you please? Am I took enough already? All right, come on, get up. Oh. <laughs> That's it. Now, look, Gumbo, you told me one thing about Art Minnelli, that Grace Parch went to his joint a lot. Yeah. And you spotted somebody outside the window and you clammed up. I come back now and I find you like this. Isn't it obvious you're wasting your time trying to protect him? Oh, shut up. Shut up and get out of here. Listen to me, you poor sap. Can't you see you're going to be living with this from now on? Every time he gets the jitters, he'll give you another going over to match this one. If he really gets jumpy, Buster, and then he'll do worse than that, don't you get it? Well, listen, mister, let's guess him. And I know what'll happen if I open my yap again. I'm just not going to take that chance. Don't you realize we'll never lick Manelli if we don't fight? Leave me alone. Hey, leave me alone. I'm not saying nothing. You understand nothing. Not one word. Now get out. Go on, get out. All right, you miserable sucker. I'm through talking to you. You'll think the other guy gave you a light massage by the time I'm through with you. Yeah, well, that's what you think. Hey, now stay where you are. I don't want to kill you, mister, but I will unless you beat it. I'd rather face that than talk. You're getting in too deep, aren't you, Gumbo? There's nothing else I can do. No nothing to me. I know which side my bread's buttered on. Yeah, but you made one big mistake already. Mistake? What? What do you mean? You left yourself wide open for this coffee pot. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, oh, fucker. Oh, I don't have much time. Drop the gun. Come on. Drop it. That's better. Now just tell me one thing and I'll leave you alone. All I want to know is where I can locate Art Minnelli right now. He's at his club, but the little casino. You're lying. I was down there. It's closed. It's being remodeled. I'm not. I'm not lying. All right. You need some more rubbing. Oh, okay. Okay. He's got a suite of rooms downstairs under the club. They're not being done over. That's where he lives. He ought to be there now. But you've got to protect me. Sturman and Minnelli will kill me. Up. He'll kill me. That's all I want to know. So long, Gumbo. <laughs> At the first phone booth I came to, I stopped, looked up a Bay City number, and made a call, which took five minutes. Then I went on to the little casino. I parked on a side street, then went down the ramp to the underground garage in the rear. There was a door between two ornate bronze urns, Alibaba size, and I started toward it. But on a hunch, I stopped and studied the decoration on one of the urns. I finally found it. A small hole in the side. I took my handkerchief out and stepped in into the hole. From somewhere inside the apartment, I heard a chime ring. I got my gun out, then tried the door, and it opened. Into a long, lush hallway, draped at the far end with a heavy gold curtain. I waded through a green carpet deep enough to mow up to the curtain and pulled it aside. Manelli sat at a wide, glossy desk, methodically filing his nails. His eyes staring straight at me. You got this far? Come on in. Don't tell me you're all alone here, Manelli. No, I got 500 dancing girls, smart guy. 
What's on your mind? You act like you were expecting me. I knew somebody was coming. There's an electric eye on those brass jugs over the door. Anybody passes, it rings that chime there. Satisfied? Now what's with the gun? Put it away. In a minute, maybe. Seen Lieutenant Sturman tonight? Why? Should I? You've been rubbing elbows with homicide. But I didn't kill anybody. No, I guess you didn't. But I've got a good idea who did. Ernie Parch, of course. Uh uh-uh, uh, no, no chance. It was your business partner, Lieutenant Rake's term and himself, and five will get you ten. He's got big news for you. Yeah? Hey, Rake. Steady, Marlowe. Don't move. Well, uh, look what crawled out of the woodwork. I'll get his gun, Rake. Sit down, Manelli. I'll take it myself. Yeah, that's better. Now, don't budge. Either one of you. Wait a minute. What is this? Shut up. You said you killed Grace Parch, but you were in love with her. We used to meet her right here in this room. Yeah, that was before she found out a couple of things and began to put the pressure on me. We got in a brief today, and I lost my head. Now, shut up. Okay, Marlowe. Let's have it. How'd you dope it? How? Domborski took a beating tonight just because he mentioned Manelli here. With a little more pressure, he mentioned someone else. You, Sturman. And why would you shut Gomborski up about Manelli unless you and Manelli were connected? That connection was all I needed. Uh-huh. Right on the button, sweetheart. For all the good it'll do you. Listen, I don't get this. I don't understand. You don't have to anymore. You're through. What are you saying, Rake? You know too much about me, Manelli. You know it all. Now, wait, you can't do this? Yes, I can. In fact, Marlowe here gave me the idea. He even worked out all the motives. So it's easy. I I came here to arrest you for Grace Parcher's murder. You you resisted, and I had to shoot you. <laughs> Isn't that a shame? But, but about this Ernie Parch. I intended to hang it on him, Manelli, but he's nothing to me. I don't care if he lives or dies. But you, you're, you're getting too big for your britches anyway. So this is better. And I get three birds with one stone. Grace, Manelli, and you, Marlowe. Uh, before you start pulling the triggers, Thurman, you better ask your boys. Huh? A couple of them are waiting for you behind that gold curtain there. Ah, you're a liar, Marlowe. The electric guy would have tipped us off if anybody else came in. I blinded that eye with my handkerchief on my way in. That's right, Lieutenant Thurman. Dirty. How long you been there? About long enough. Better drop it, Lieutenant. I don't take orders from you, Sergeant. You do tonight. Chief himself sent us out. Yeah, I took the liberty of going over your head, Lieutenant, just before I came in. Under the circumstances, you'll understand. Why, right? you... Better drop it, Lieutenant. Drop it! Okay, now, come on. You two guys, too. Come along quietly. Sure, sure. Always glad to ride with old Rake's Terman any time at all. Just as long as there's a couple of policemen in the same car. <laughs> Before it was all over in the Bay City, police headquarters, everybody from the mayor to the dog catcher had put his two cents in. And I'd given the same answers to the same questions at least 50 times. All about crooked cops and Rake Sturman in particular. But finally, hours later, I was free to go home. And as I drove through the quiet streets, I was still thinking about cops. This time, the other kind. The underpaid, overworked cops that pound the city's sidewalks day and night. You know the guys who do everything from telling kids the way to the grocery store to untangling the rush hour traffic. Yeah. And I thought about each one of those cops who someday chases a hopped-up gunman down a blind alley and doesn't get home that night. Or any night. Ever again. And then I forgot all about Rake's tournament. Because after all, he was just one bad one in a multitude of good ones. An insignificant sore on the long arm of the law. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Barney Phillips, Ted Osborne, Sidney Miller, Tom Tully, and Bert Holland. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It could have been perfect. Snowbound in a mountain lodge with a girl who was falling in love. 
but also present were a widow sick with rage, a bitter old woman, and a jealous man. All with reason to hate me more than anyone else in the world. Two all-star bouts are promised on CBS this Wednesday night. Bing Crosby faces Fred Allen across the CBS mic to battle it out on who's funnier, singers or comedians. And in the second attraction, Gracie Allen and a smashed fender team up against not-so-gorgeous George Burns and a guilty conscience. This Wednesday also brings you Groucho Marx, his ad-libs, and his teams of opposites on You Bet Your Life, and a Dr. Christian story about two redheads in love. Fun, action, variety, they're all yours with Dr. Christian, Groucho Marx, Bing Crosby and Fred Allen, and George and Gracie on most of these same CBS stations this Wednesday night. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Wednesday night is Bing Crosby night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. It could have been perfect. Snowbound in the mountain lodge with a girl who was falling in love. But also present were a widow sick with rage, a bitter old woman, and a jealous man. All with reason to hate me more than anyone else in the world. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Grim Echo. Pretty thick. Yeah. You're lucky you caught me, son. Yeah? It just goes up. Well, what do you have? Yeah, better fill it with a regular, huh? Okay. Does that mean that you're aiming to go on? That's right. Got to get back to L.A. I wouldn't advise you, son. Old Jacker and sure wouldn't. Liable to hit ten below, they say. Yeah? Where you been, skiing? Yeah, a week of it up at Angel's Roost. How's the road ahead? Well, you got 40 miles or nothing but mountains to the next town, you know. You're bound to get drifted over any time. Hey, why don't you blow that thing? Eh? Huh? Hey, what's the tariff? Oh, call it three bucks even. You know, I've been running this mobile gas station here for 20 years, and I know these storms are nasty. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'll be all right. Yeah, that's what you all say. Out on the road, you can freeze to death. Real easy. And this plaid shirt I'm wearing, you're ripping me, Pop. Uh, listen, that shirt won't even start to keep you warm on a deserted highway in this blizzard. Take it from old Jacker and son, I know. Yeah, well, thanks anyway. So long, old Jacker. solid nerve-wracking hour to make 12 miles. And I began to realize just how right old Jack Ernst, the gas station boy, had been when the road ahead was lost completely in a constant racing blur of white. Transformed every rise into a treacherous barrier I had to batter my way through. The chains on all four wheels chewing at the drifts, I 
managed to keep on the road somehow and plow out another five miles. And then I caught a glimpse of the first lighted window I'd seen in all that distance just as I started down the backside of a short, steep hill. And then it happened. First, the helpless feeling of a skid. Before I could do anything about it, I was off the road in the ditch, nose first and hood deep, in a culvert drifted full of snow. I forced the door open and floundered back up to the road. I knew there was no chance of getting the car out without help and lots of it. And the ten below zero that the weather bureau had bragged about was setting in. I looked back through the slashing snow for the lighted window I'd spotted and saw a lantern swinging crazily in the hands of somebody coming toward me. A minute later, I could see it was a girl. Hello! Hello, are you hurt? No, I'm okay. Huh? My car's stuck. Yeah, I skidded off the road. Yes, I know. I watched you. Oh, my. No chance of getting it out of there tonight. No. That's bad. Maybe tomorrow, if the prison lets up, we can get you out. Meantime, you better come on up to the lodge, mister. Lodge? Uh-huh. You mean I slid off the road right in front of a tourist lodge? Uh, oh, boy, how can I be that lucky? Well, maybe it's fate. We're not open for business in the winter, but on a night like I this... I know what you mean, believe me. I <laughs> really appreciate it. Could get tough staying out here. Oh, by the way, my name's Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. I want to pay what? you for... Did you say Philip Marlowe? Yeah, is something wrong with What's that? your business, Mr. Marlowe? Oh, well, I'm a private detective from L.A. I've been skiing. I don't care where you've been or where you're going. You'll get no help from me, Mr. Philip Marlowe, you understand? I'd rather get shot into a dirty dog. I hope you freeze, do you hear? I hope you freeze to death. She was a thin girl with black hollow eyes, full of hate for me. She didn't stop or look back all the way to the door, just ran in and slammed it shut. I couldn't understand it. Even on my worst day, my reputation never was that bad. I didn't wait around to worry about it because I was cold. Besides, I wanted to know why the good name Philip Marlowe was such poison at a place I'd never heard of before. I waded up to the heavy, rustic door and looked in through a tiny window. All I could see was one corner of what had to be a big room. It was log, leather, and Navajo rugs, dominated by an enormous fireplace that filled every nook with a warm, dancing glow. <laughs> poison or no, I wanted in. Bad night to travel. Yeah, it sure did. Oh, well, uh, won't you come in? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, I'm Donna. How are you? This is Echo Lodge. Uh, We're not open now, but, well, of course, you can't go on in the storm. No, I can't. Besides, my car's in the ditch. <laughs> well, uh, you'll be spending the night then. I'd love to, but there seems to be two schools of thought on that subject. Well, what do you mean? Well, I don't know why, but, you know, I don't think I'm very welcome. Why do you say that? Well, I... I'll uh... tell you why, Donna. Well, Helen. Oh, dear, what's wrong? You've been crying. Do you know who he is? No, we haven't gotten around to the magic of my name yet, Helen, but maybe you'll be good enough to tell me. Our name is Baraki. Does that mean anything to you? Baraki? Oh, Helen, yes, yes. Baraki. Virgil Baraki was my husband. Virgil Baraki was Donna's brother. And Virgil Baraki was the man that you shot down and killed. Do you remember? I remember it all right. Six months ago, a trail that led up a blind Los Angeles alley to a garage where stolen cars were switched. I remembered the pair of vicious blue eyes glaring at me over the sights of a blazing 45. I remembered shooting back fast. When it was over, I was alive and he was dying. And later, the coroner's jury decided I'd killed in self-defense. The savagery here in the eyes of the woman who had been Virgil Barucki's wife said that that decision meant nothing. Yes, is this true? Are you the one who... Yeah, yeah, it's true. I shot a man named Virgil Barucki. I had to or be killed by him. There was no choice. You liar. You killed him in cold blood. Now, get hard of you. You've done enough to us. Get out. Helen, stop it. Oh, Mama. Oh, Mama Barucki, listen, Mama. This is the man who killed Virgil. I know. I've been listening and I heard everything. Go find Ralph for me, Helen. Then you'd better go out to your workshop for a while. Did you hear me? I said this I is the man... I said go call Ralph now, at once. Tell him to open the cabin. And go back to your carving. Can't turn a man out in this weather, not any man. You stay, Mr. Marlowe. Thank you, Mrs. Baraki. Donna, go get some hot food. All right, Mom. So, you're Philip Marlowe, the private detective. You don't look much like I'd imagined you. Do people ever? Perhaps not. 
Oh, um, would you mind fixing the fire? It needs another log. Oh, not at all. You, uh, were stopped by the storm, Mr. Marlowe? Yeah. <clears throat> My car skidded into the ditch about 50 yards down the road. I see. Almost at our doorstep, you might say. Rare coincidence, isn't it? Almost too rare, Mrs. Barucki. I, uh, I'm sorry the circumstances are painful for you. I've grown used to that kind of pain, having lost both a husband and a son. Fate up to now has never been very generous. Do you believe in fate, Mr. Marlowe? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, well, some things happen for which there's no explanation, no maybe, explanation? but... No explanation? Who knows? Perhaps everything happens according to a prearranged schedule. And for a purpose. Oh, come on. You don't really think I was deliberately shoved off the road at exactly this spot for a reason? Oh, you might admit it's strange, though, that there was a house nearby just when you needed one. And that it was our house. Oh, thank you, Donna. Oh, it's only soup, but it's hot and good and it's fresh bread. <laughs> the coffee will be ready in a few minutes. Go ahead, Mr. Marlowe. Sit down. It'll do you good. Thanks. Looks wonderful. In the meanwhile, I'll check up on Ralph. He should have the cabin ready by now. It's small, but you'll be comfortable. There's a fine big oil heater in it. I haven't worked one for years. You won't have any trouble. Tell me, uh, uh, who is this Ralph? Ralph Tolman, young fellow who lives near here. Uh, Ralph works for us in the summer. And looks after us in the winter. He's staying over tonight because of the storm. He was my son's best friend. Oh, don't let the soup get cold, Mr. Marlowe. The soup was thick and delicious, and the coffee was rich, black, and steaming. Donna sat across the table and watched me eat. There was no hatred in her eyes. I looked for it closely. It wasn't even animosity. Only confusion and, for some reason, the shadow of fear. But as an hour slipped by and the conversation came easier, the shadow disappeared. Her eyes even began to smile a little. When I'd finished down to the third cup of coffee and started to help her clear the table, the cup slipped. We both grabbed for it, caught one slim inch from breaking, and wound up together on the floor. Our faces close. Why, Phil, we did it. What a team. A table waiters are jugglers. Oh, we could double his both and make a fortune. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Ralph. Yeah, Ralph. What's going on? Uh, we have almost dropped a cup. Uh-huh. And it sure would have been too bad, wouldn't it, Donna? You only got about 50 like that one. I, uh, I don't know why it's so important to you, but for what it's worth, I was the one who dropped it. It's not important to me. I guess other things aren't so important to Donna either. Think you can get it out to the kitchen now without any more help, Donna? Ralph, it's high time that you... Mrs. Barucki asked me to tell you the cabin's ready, Marlowe. Thanks. No thanks necessary, mister. It's just part of my job. Guess everybody's job has its lousy side, huh? Even a private detective. Some of them get trigger happy, I heard. I'll see you, Donna. You better get out there right away, Marlowe. Donna's got four whole dishes to carry out. And at the rate she's been going, she ought to get started or she'll never make it. Keep your fat trap shut, Buster. You're causing a draft. Tolman walked behind me as far as the door and pointed through the snow to a tiny square of light sitting apart from the rest of the buildings that made up Echo Lodge. As soon as I was outside, he slammed the door against my back and bolted it. I stood on the porch and thought about the setup for a minute while I lit a cigarette. And I stepped out into the snow and headed for the cabin. Halfway there, I could see it clearly. It looked snug and warm. And under the circumstances, I knew it was better for everybody that I was sleeping outside the main lodge. But then I saw a sudden flash and felt the impact before anything else. Right in front of me, the cabin lurched. One entire wall burst out and the roof collapsed. A second later, as I ran toward what was left of it, I could hear the others coming. Ralph, what was it? The cabin is the wall. Help me, Phil! Phil, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay, Donna. What happened, Marlowe? I don't know, Tolman. Something in the heat, but I, I can't understand it. Happened, Ralph? The heat exploded? Yeah, yeah, Helen, that's the way it looks. But it was working okay when I left. I guess it's not going to burn, though. The snow put it all out. Oh, oh, just another few seconds, and you'd have been in there. You'd have been killed. Yeah, maybe that was fate, too, huh? Maybe. Donna, get away from here. Oh, Helen. I wish you had been in there, Marlowe. You deserve it. Hey. Stop it, Helen. He's got no business here. Stop it. Oh, let me alone. Good Lord, after what he's done to us, how can you bear even to look at him? Oh, Helen, come back here. Never go. This is an accident, Donna. 
An accident, you hear? They happen. Don't say, Mr. Marley. Oh, sure, sure. Everybody knows accidents will happen, Mrs. Barucki. Of course, but... Oh, let's get back into the house before we freeze to death. You can have my room now. I'll sleep with Donna. Come along, all of you. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first... Groucho Marx, his famous ad-libs, and his teams of opposites will be back betting their lives on most of these same CBS stations tomorrow night. You've missed half your life if you haven't bet your life with Groucho Marx on Wednesday nights this season. Hear him on this top quiz show tomorrow night on CBS. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Grim Echo. It was a dreary little procession that trudged back toward the lodge again from the shuttered cabin. I said nothing and pushed hard against the storm as far as the front door. But when they were all inside, I ducked back into the biting blizzard and ran down to my car in the 38 I kept in the glove compartment there. I figured it would be a warning comfort through the long, cold night ahead. Until I saw that somebody else had figured the same way. The lock on the glove compartment had been sprung and the gun was gone. Now there was no doubt about the explosion. It had been no less accidental than Lucretia Borgia working over an after-dinner drink. As I hurried back to the lodge, I suddenly felt a kind of inside cold that you can't ever blame on the weather around you. But a moment later, that same cold began to thaw. Because huddled at the edge of the lodge steps ahead was Donna. Oh, where have you been? What have you been doing? Hey. Everything's going to be all right. Please. Why did you go down to your car? Well, I'll tell you, but you're going to be sorry. Sorry? <laughs> but you got so upset over nothing. I wanted to get some cigarettes out of the glove compartment. It was fresh out. That, that was your only reason? Cigarettes? Sure, sure. Now, come on, huh? You got to worry. Let's do it where we can both be warm. <laughs> come on over to the fire. I'm a city boy, you know. This cold isn't doing me any... Hey. Hey, Donna. Those tears in your eyes. There. I think from the wind, it... It always makes me cry. Uh, oh, Phil. Why do things have to be this way? An hour ago when you were eating, everything was so nice, so friendly. And then suddenly Ralph angry, the explosion, Helen screaming and clawing at you, Mama. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know what you mean. <laughs> but look, look, baby. Listen to me hard, huh? Yes? You see, the things you just spoke of, Ralph, the explosion, Helen, all of it, all the trouble... It belongs to tonight, like the blizzard out there. Oh, it's raging now, sure, but tomorrow, or maybe a little after tomorrow, it'll stop. Everything will look bright and clean to you. Honest, honey, that's the way it'll be. All the way around. Believe me? Oh, Phil, I... I want to, but... But what? But you're talking about tomorrow. I'm worried about tonight. I'm afraid, Phil. Awfully afraid. I spent the next ten minutes trying to convince Donna that there wasn't anything to worry about. And then when she'd gone to her room, I went to mine and started all over again trying to convince myself. The out-of-season fireworks at the cabin and a gun stolen from my car made that a very tough proposition. And then I checked the room, which was on the ground floor and close to the kitchen... And then I bolted the door and looked forward to some much-needed sleep. After that, I took off my shirt and shoes only, got into bed, and waited for sleep, which a weekend of skiing made more important than a cabin full of hate. Suddenly, I was wide awake and sitting straight up in bed. The footsteps could have belonged to my dream. The door that closed couldn't have. I scrambled out of bed and ran to it, but it was still bolted. So I turned to the single closet in the room and opened it sharply. It was empty. Except for a long, thin finger of light that streamed through a keyhole. A keyhole that belonged to a door at the rear of the closet that gave out onto the kitchen. Obviously, the closet had once been a pantry. I tried the door, but it was bolted from the kitchen side. I got into my shoes, grabbed my shirt, and ran out of the room around to the kitchen and smacked into a very surprised round. Marlo, what are you doing? Oh, 
are you doing up and roaming around? I'm a sleepwalker. What's your excuse? Come on, let's have it. I'm through playing target for tonight. Talk! Talk me, Marlo. But I know why you're here and exactly what's on your mind. I will not before. Well, have we come to terms? All right, all right. Let go. I'm here because my room is on the ground floor and I heard somebody cross through the house and come into this kitchen. So I decided to investigate. You're a liar. You're in my room, Tolman, and you know it. You got in through the door that leads into the closet. Come on, Buster, let's level. We're keeping each other awake. Listen, Marlowe, I don't like you. Honest? And I don't like the way you and Donna are... The way we're what? Come on, boy, get it off your chest. Never mind that now. Look at this. Wood shaving, so what? Yeah, found it near the door to the closet in your room. Might also be the answer to who your visitor was. She left her calling card. What do you mean, calling card? Helen, she's always covered with these shavings. She makes things out of rough pine. Where is this workshop of hers, Tom? Up in the back, just beyond the barn. What are you going to do, Marlowe? Not that it's any of your business, but I'm going to see the lady, and I'll see you. What do you want? Conversation, Helen, if you don't mind. Now, wait a minute, you were playing. Close that door. I will not. And I will. Get up there and sit down. We got a few things to clear up. Like what? The way you murdered my husband, perhaps? Cut it out. Stop it, Helen, or I'll push your arm off. No, Just as soon as you decide to behave. Those nails of yours draw blood, baby. What, are they going to be good? Yes. All right. Now sit down. Over there, away from those sharp chisels you work with, and keep your hands in your lap. Go on, that chair there. Very well, Mr. Marlowe. Anything to accommodate the man who murdered my husband. Which brings us right to the point. You deny it. You deny that you shot him down? I fired in self-defense. That's all right. Speaking lies. You did it to feather your own nest to be a hero to the police and the newspapers. You're wrong, Helen. I killed your husband because I had to. He was on the wrong side. Oh, don't make me laugh. You call trying to get money for his family, for me? You call that thing on the wrong side? So much that he should have been killed, shot down by the likes of you? Oh, Mr. Marlowe, you have no idea how through these past six lonely months I've thought of you. I wondered what you looked like. What the man who killed Virgil was doing. How you'd like to meet the same death you brought to my husband under the brave banner of law and order. Now, wait a minute. And don't think I didn't plan your death a thousand times over. Don't think I didn't approach Mama Barucki, Ralph, even sweet little Donna with a delicious thought of revenge. No. No, they talk like you talk, Mr. Marlowe. Virgil was doing the wrong thing. He was caught. It wasn't right or wrong. It was him or me. Oh, you shut up and listen. Sure. Sure, Virgil was stealing, all right was stealing from me, his wife. That's why he left here. That's why he tried so hard. That's why you had no reason to kill him. And that's why you should die, too. Oh, that's also why we had an accidental explosion at the cabin I was supposed to sleep in, huh? I was clumsy. I was hasty. I won't be the next time. You're completely out of your mind, Helen. Out of my mind? Of course I am. Did you think this existence is living without the man I love could leave me otherwise? Did you think me king these stupid stolen in? Killing me isn't going to bring him back. You get out of here. Go on, get out. And if you can, Mr. Marlowe, go back to bed. While you wait for a chance to get me with my own gun, the gun you stole from my car? I'm not going to shoot you, Mr. Marlowe. That would only further disgrace the Baraki name, no. No, I'm not going to shoot you. But I am going to get you. <laughs> For a long, chilling moment, I stared into the eyes of a half-crazed woman standing in front of me. The ice-cold, bottomless eyes that a cancerous hate had destroyed as something human. And as I turned and started out of the room, I knew that I'd made a mistake that night. And Virgil Barucki had died in my arms. A mistake I had to correct before it was too late. And there was nothing left of Helen but the ruthless machinery of a mind dedicated to murder. I headed back to the house for a talk with Mama Barucki, which I figured had to be the first immediate step... When I'd gone only a dozen yards from the workshop, I stopped. Bill, Bill, I'm over here. Donna, what are you doing out here? I couldn't sleep, Bill. I was too worried about you. And then when I saw you leave the house from my window and head for the workshop, I... Bill, Bill, your face. Oh, it was Helen. She, uh, she got a little upset in there. A little? I wouldn't look at you. Your pocket ripped off your shirt, Hmm? your face scratched. Oh, it's all right, Donna. No. Hey. Hey, my pocket ripped off. The gun. Oh, Bill, you tell me, please? I now, hold it, Donna. Give me a second. Yeah, yeah, sure. It adds, all right. Now, look, get over there inside the barn and scream. Long and loud, huh? Scream? Yeah, yeah. It's our only chance. Come on, do as I say, Donna. Scream. All right. I'll do it, Joe. Whatever you say. 
The second Donna cut loose, I stepped out of sight behind a tree that was opposite the barn, and I kept my eyes glued to the door of the workshop I just left. I waited for the shattering report of the gun I was afraid I'd hear. But then the door flew open, and Helen was running out toward the barn, and Donna screamed. <laughs> My 38 clenched in a handkerchief Daddy, in her right hand. A look of stark bewilderment stamped you? over her face. Donna, answer me. What's wrong? Donna, what are you doing there by the barn? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Save it to me. Why Helen, I'll have that gun back without further discussion. Yes. There. Now get back against that wall and don't move an inch. No. No. So what is all this? Attempted murder, honey. She's all right. Attempted murder? You mean Helen here was going to try and kill someone? Yeah, herself. Oh, suicide? Uh-huh, suicide. It would be called murder and pinned on me. It's going to be her way of getting even. I know, Bill. I, I can't believe She you. tried to once, honey, the explosion at the cabin. When that failed and everybody knew how she felt about me, a warped mind hit upon this little plan, and all the pieces would have fit tight, too. What pieces? What do you mean? That one we argued... So she came to my room tonight and ripped the pocket off this plaid shirt so that we'd find it clenched in her hand after she was dead. You see it? Oh. Three, she stole my thirty-eight, which has my fingerprints on it. And four, she left an obvious clue on the floor of the kitchen, a wood shaving that would bring me out here on the run. So everybody could find me close by when it happened. Oh, oh yeah, it was tight, all right. Tight as a hangman's noose. And then she was going to shoot herself, Phil, just after you left her. And that, that's why you made me scream? Yeah. And that's why now, Donna, later tonight, I'm going to tell her something that I intended to break to her gently. Oh. Something I was going to tell Mama Barucki first. Yep. Something I hoped would straighten her out. What, Phil? Well, your brother Virgil didn't die the moment he was shot, Donna. He, oh. he lived long enough to ask one thing of me. What are, what are you trying to say, Phil? That I never let Helen or you people here know about the woman he was in love with in L.A. He... The woman through whom I tracked him down. Oh, Phil. Yeah. Phil. Well, I... I guess it... It wouldn't be good for her if... if... I was around too much? No, honey, not for a while, anyway. Wouldn't be good for any of us, huh? Come on, Donna, let's get her into the house. Yes. Yes, Phil. <laughs> next morning. I went into the kitchen for some coffee and found myself all alone. Thought I wasn't any place in sight. So I got my things together and walked slowly down to my car and when I got in I didn't feel like leaving. Not right away. And I was glad that warming up my motor was the smart thing to do. Gave me time to light a cigarette and think. Look around. Back toward Echo Lodge where... I could see Donna waving goodbye from an upstairs window. Yeah. I'd see her again in a little while. It's a small world, all right. Full of echoes. And just think how the web of paths we call coincidence had brought me and those who knew and loved Virgil together. Someday, maybe, Donna and I would be looking for each other. And those paths would make it a lot easier. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Sammy Hill, Betty Lou Gerson, Verna Felton, Frank Gerstel, and Junius Matthews. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a peddler of pulp paper love, a blackmailer with muscles, a south of the border chiseler, a simpering prude, and a corpse in a bedroom all had one thing in common. Each was a woman. L. 
Paul Jolson will pay another of those wonderful visits to Bing Crosby this Wednesday night. And the gags and songs will again fly thick and fast. Bing and Al will team up to sing Waiting for the Robert E. Lee and Whispering. And as for the gags, well, just tune in on most of these same CBS stations. Remember, that's this Wednesday night, the CBS Bing Crosby Show. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS network stations. This is CBS, where you bet your life with Groucho Marx every Wednesday, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road. And those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison of the grave. This time, a peddler of pulp paper love, a blackmailer with muscles, a south-of-the-border chiseler, a simpering prude, and a corpse in a bedroom. All had one thing in common. Each was a woman. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Ladies' Night. And the moment the sauce is boiling furiously, which is right now... Add one full cup of tomato paste gradually and stir vigorously. Okay? One full cup of tomato paste gradually... Oh, no. No, not now. I'll be a minute. Yeah, I said I'll be... Oh, oh no. Ooh. Ow. All right. So I add tomato paste cup and all. Okay. Okay, I'm coming. Who is it? I'm giving you a telegram for Philip Oh, well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to but you. Kay Vanneman. Yes, darling, it's Don's friend Kay. Am I welcome? Me and my small Western Union joke? Oh, sure, sure. Come on in. Come on in, honey. We'll go in the kitchen. Oh, it's not Marlo playing chef again. What is it this time? Well, sauce a la Marino. Hmm? Mm. What's on your poor little rich girl's 14 carat mine tonight? You. It's Tuesday. Tuesday? Yes. This is meeting night in my crowd. The Greens Committee at the Country Club, the Beverly Hills Male Choir, the veterans of this and that. Mm. So, no men left. Oh, except staunch friend Marlowe, huh? Look, uh, Kay, baby, just because I... Uh... Da, 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 I know it by huh? heart, Phil. Just because brave private detective once saved rich Uncle Enoch's niece, Kay, baby, from lots of trouble. For which he was well paid. There's no reason why they've got to go on seeing each other. Well, mister, you're wrong. There is a reason. A big, fat one. I like you. Lots. You do? Especially on Tuesdays. I can't tell you how happy <laughs> that makes me. Now, I'm look... I'm not being too bold, am I? I did call, you know, three times. You weren't home all day. That didn't discourage you. Ah. Oh. If I can't have you, I'll take the doorstep. Tuesdays. <laughs> On Tuesdays. <laughs> now, uh, about this sauce a la who'd you call it? What do we do first? Fish out the cup or wait for it to melt? Well, it all depends. If we want to, uh... Hey. Hey, that thing's sticking out of your pocket. Real telegram or prop for gag? Oh, no, no prop. Real thing. Oh? I met the boy in front of your door. Here. Open it up, will you? My hands are greasy. So I noticed. Over there, self-reliant. It's called soap and water. Oh. Mm. Well, read it, dear. Straight like, huh? Okay, straight like. Uh, tried to reach you all day. Very important. Uh-huh. We get the tulip room. Sunset strip at 8 tonight. We'll pay tulip you room. triple your fee. Time means everything. Gigi Ar- Armstead. An hour? Give me the towel, will you? Yeah, I think... Sure, she's the demon editor for Passman House. Who published what? Magazines, torrid love, great passions. You know, the shop girl's encyclopedia. Uh Uh-huh. Well, now tell me, shop girl, where'd you meet editor Gigi Ormsby? At a cocktail party about a year ago. She's quite a character. 
sleek to look at. And listen to him? Oh, someplace between a career woman and a marine sergeant. Credit good? Mm, excellent. Mm. Uncle Enoch once shook hands with her, and that's better than Dunn and Brett. <laughs> hey, where are you going? The Don jacket and professional demeanor. Both are going to the tulip room. Oh, Phil, can but I... you're not. Phil, that's not fair. This is And Tuesday. the sauce a la Marino needs one measuring cup removed. <laughs> that delicate woman's touch from here on in. Bye bye, Kay. You're a staunch friend indeed. <laughs> The uh, tulip room was one of those extra chic spots, you know, curled up at the foot of the Hollywood Hills, where the velvet and the maitre d's tone of voice made you sure you had egg on your vest. But that plus the crew cut glamour girls who lined the booths and shrill darling, no matter what was said, made finding my prospective client that much easier. In severely tailored banker's gray flannel, she stood out among the neighboring naked shoulders like a wart on a cue ball, as did her voice which once it had gone through the introductions, came right to the point. Marlo, my problem is simple. I want to find a woman in a hurry. Her name is Henrietta Lawrence. She's a good hack writer who disappeared. I know not why. Health? Likewise. Now, here it is. One, two, three. A couple of weeks ago, Henrietta Lawrence showed up in my office from someplace like Seattle or Portland, I forget which, and handed me an outline for a three-installment serial story that was excellent, according to our standards. Mm. Three days ago, she brought in the first two installments, also excellent. But the day before yesterday, when the third installment was due, I was sitting in my office window when this happened. She only got as far as the front door. What happened? I don't know. She saw somebody going by slowly in a car. Scared the daylights out of her, and she hobbled for a cab. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you say hobble? Yes, she limps. Uses a cane. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she piled into this cab and took off. Haven't had a word from her since. I'm worried, Marlo. She's a nervous thing, the kind who'd go to pieces. Little ones fast. So I want you... She owns the hours I live in. Please, it's still microbed, darling. How are you? Ah, busy, Jeanette, busy. <laughs> so I see. And what fans and gentlemen's name am I supposed to get? It's Dracula, darling. We're uh, counting the white throats. Goodbye. Oh, Gigi, you're priceless. Goodbye, Jeanette. This is business strictly. Well, I was only being friendly. Excuse me, darling. Happy business. Oh, what they let loose after dark. <laughs> Anyhow, Marlo, I want you to find this girl. She may be in an awful jam. Now, what do you want to know? Well, description might help, Gigi. Okay. Henrietta's about 35 on the drab side. No makeup, no jewelry. Each time I saw her, she was wearing the same thing. A plain brown coat, a plainer brown hat, low heels. All in all, the sex appeal of a tumbleweed. Mm -hmm. Last address you had on her? The only one. The Brace Hotel for Women, room 7. Mm. It's over on Fountain near La Cienega. But she hasn't checked back there in two days either. The giggling flower of the old South desk clerk I talked to on the phone today hasn't the slightest idea where she is. <laughs> but I figure for you, she mm. might, Marlo. She's probably got a face like wet hemp. Her name is Clarice. Well, we'll try it. Where can I reach you, Gigi? At my home in Brentwood. Sunnyside 9, 1011. 1011? Yeah, I'll stay next to the phone. Mm. Really do your best, will you, Marlo? Okay, Gigi. It'll be my best, all right. Don't worry about it. I'll call you. Great Hotel. Miss Violet Moore? Oh, one moment, please. Go ahead. Oh, hello. Can I... <laughs> Can I help you? Are we alone? Is the switchboard closed? Why, why, yes. Good. You see, I'm a private detective named Marlo Clarice. A private detective? And you know my name. Oh, we find things out. <laughs> oh, how can poor little old me help you? Well, it's about Henrietta Lawrence, the girl with the cane. Mm -hmm. She's in trouble, and uh, I think it's a man. So do I. Who? Well, I don't know. You sure? Positive. She was always so quiet, so mysterious. It was enough to make a body curious. Oh. So one night I followed her. She went to Annie Stringer's Hollywood Health Club. Uh, that's a ladies' Turkish bath over on Santa Monica Boulevard in Doheny. Mm. Well, maybe she ducked in there because she knew you were following her. Oh, huh? no, I was very careful. Besides, she had something to say to a woman there. Uh, I know I saw him talking in the doorway when I went by. Couldn't see who it was, though. No man, huh? No. 
<laughs> but I keep my eyes open when she comes back. Oh, you do just then. <laughs> keep them wide open, Clarice. They're lovely eyes. Oh. <laughs> Good night, honey. <laughs> client was wrong. Clarice did not have a face like wet hemp. It was more like a batch of biscuits, but the body curious had provided a lead. As far as the corner of Santa Monica and Doheny, and into the white antiseptic-looking reception room of Annie Stringer's Hollywood Health Club. Women only. There I forgot about Clarice, hemp, and biscuits alike and thought instead about something a whole lot tastier. Like the girl who was leaning on the corner of a desk marked information while she made pencil marks on a chart. She looked up when I closed the door and started toward me. But when another door in the room opened and a woman who was built like a sack of cement bore down on me, she turned back to her chart. Yes, sir. Can I help you? I'm Annie Stringer. We don't have a men's section here, if that's what you wanted. No, it was something else, Miss Stringer. Annie will do. Oh. Name's my stock and trade. <laughs> something else like what? Henrietta Lawrence. I'm looking for her. Who are you, mister? What's your name? Philip Marlowe. I'm a friend of Henrietta's from Portland. They told me over at the Brace Hotel that Henrietta might be at your place. You see, someone had seen her come in here once. Oh, Henrietta Lawrence, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, name doesn't mean anything Mommy. to me, but... Mommy, Mrs. Gordon wants you to come be for a while. All right, Hilda, be right there. I, uh, don't recall anyone by that name, Mr. Marlowe, but you might check with my receptionist there. Uh, take care of the gentleman, will you, Mona, dear? Very well, honey. I'm coming, Mrs. Gordon. Um... I'm sorry, Mr... Marlowe, Mona, dear. Philip Marlowe. Marlowe. Well, I don't recall any Henrietta Lawrence ever having been with us, but uh, why don't we check the registration cards at my desk and be sure? I might be mistaken. All right. She's a woman about 35. She wears no makeup and... Never mind. Huh? I know her, amigo. What? Just listen. You see, Mr. Marlowe, the cards here list everyone who ever visits the club. Mm. Why do you really want Henrietta Lawrence? Well, I'm a private detective with interested clients. Who has money, amigo? It could be. What's your connection here? Receptionist. Oh. And good friend to Annie. Her, um, confident, you might say. All right, say it. Meet me in the alley behind the hardware store across the street in a half hour. We close then. Well, I I'm sorry, Mr. Marlowe, but we don't seem to have any listing of a Henrietta Lawrence. But perhaps in the... No, future... never mind. Thanks just the same. Well, you're quite welcome. Don't keep me waiting, amigo. I killed most of the 30-minute wait at an all-night beanery a block away where I drank bad coffee and listened to a special monologue from a waitress, which was worse. And at exactly 10.30, I stepped into the street and walked to the alley behind the hardware store. Moved cautiously, saw the dark shadow of the building until a hand that gripped like a bear trap snapped shut on my upper arm. While another locked my wrist high into my back. Oh, one inch, Mr. Marlowe, and I'll oh. break it off and hand it to you. I was a lady wrestler, oh. understand? Oh, do I still call you Annie? Uh, never mind the wisecracks. Oh. It's been a long day and I haven't got patience. Now, what's your angle, Flatfoot? Slip. Oh. Slip, baby, in more ways than one. Start talking. All right. All right. Henrietta came from Seattle, not Portland. So now some advice. Forget Henrietta Lawrence, Shamus. You can't do her any good. You're a liar, Annie, and you know it. You're wasting your breath, Shamus. That's bluff, Annie. Hot air. Yeah? I suppose that goes for the letter, too, I suppose. Letter? You slipped again, kid. What about it? You don't know what letter I'm talking about. But Mr. Marlowe, Henrietta Lawrence does. So tell her to call off the bloodhound, or that letter will go right to the cops. They'll know exactly what to do. Get going, sweetie. Hey. Hold the top of your head off, go on, sweetie, while you can still walk. Go. All right. But I'll be around, Marlo. So don't forget the message I gave you for Miss Lawrence. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, the kindly physician of River's End, Dr. Christian, will meet the spirit of George Washington in a most unusual way this Wednesday night when Dr. Christian tells his story on most of these same CBS stations. An elderly patient who claims to have a personal message from George Washington comes to Dr. Christian's office and presents him with one of his most perplexing cases. Dr. Christian, starring Gene Herschelt, is a regular Wednesday night feature. 
now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Ladies' Night. Kay watched Annie Stringer lumber out of sight down the alley. And she turned, tossed me, and I told you so, smile, and lit a cigarette for me. Here. Well, I guess it's a good thing I chucked that scullery maid routine and followed you after all, wasn't it? Look, I've already said thanks, so go ahead. Get real corny. Rub it in. Marlowe pinned by a woman. That was no woman, Phil. Mm. It was the late gargantuous cousin. Yeah, I was also outnumbered and surrounded. By the way, where's your gun, Kay? I don't have any gun. Just what? a lot of bluff and curiosity about what you were doing out here in the alley with a creature like that. I was taking a judo lesson. By correspondence, maybe? <laughs> what was all that about a letter? Well... For my money, the way things stack up, Gigi Ormsby's top writer, one Henrietta Lawrence, is being blackmailed by Annie Stringer, and that letter is Annie's protection. Goes to the cops if anything. Can't get out of sight quick. What? What's that? Marlowe, not another yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, my date, Tuck. Well, you're the one. It's important. All right, but don't forget you're a sucker for a hammerlock, so watch it. See? And you, Mona? Over here, Mona. Who's he? Here I am. Are we alone? Yeah, yeah, we're alone. Good. It is worth my life what I'm going to tell you. And we like me alive, no? Look, what is it, Mona? You know something about Henrietta Lawrence? She more than enough. There's a certain letter. Oh, you know about that, huh? Sure. I know where it is and what it says. Bless you, baby. Where is it? I want that letter bad. Nice. Nice? See, and I would love to give it to you for nothing, but... But what? But my poor mother, she needs an operation. My father, the mortgage on the ranch. Your little sister wants music lessons. Uh, come on, kid. How much? How much is the life of Henrietta Lawrence worth, Phil, dear? To me, to you, to Henrietta Lawrence. Her life, huh? I'll see what I can do. You better do real good, amigo. It's a very serious thing. I take a great risk. Any stringer is stupid. But she's also strong like a bull. You come to my apartment. 8310 North Ardmore, number D. One hour. D, huh? Okay, I'll be there. Good. And please, amigo, you don't hold hard feelings against me. Not for this. You know, business is business. Place is place, you know? <laughs> Maybe we can mix them. In an hour. I'll be waiting for you, Phil. How do you like that? It was as touching a little scene as I've ever witnessed. Skip it, Kay. This deal is liable to get rough before it's over, and I've got a call to make. Let's go. And I was dumb enough to warn you against the hot hammerlock. The kid, the, the hammerlock that that kid holds is like a pat on the head. Can I go with you just for laughs? Yeah, yeah. We're going to call on my client. You're scramming. Come on. <laughs> Marlo, Gigi, got a line on Henrietta, but you're not going to like it much. What do you mean? How does it go, Marlo? Trouble is, she's got blackmail. I don't know what the hook is, but I have word of one of the bargainers is plenty serious. Who's doing it, Phil? A female mastodon named Annie Stringer's the big wheel. I got onto it through a letter. A letter? Yeah. Annie wrote her protection letter. It's got all the dirt in it and goes to the cops if anything happens to Annie. It's a standard routine. Where is this letter? Who has it? There's a double-crossing little Spanish number named Mona. We're supposed to meet her again in an hour at her place. Phil, we must get that letter. Yeah, it's no sense, Gigi. Mona's not bright, but she's sly. It's liable to be expensive. That doesn't matter. Okay. Anything I can do to help Henrietta, I want to do now more than ever. What does that mean? I've heard from her, Marlo. She called me just a few minutes ago. Where was she? That's the tough part. She was crying. Said it was the end of everything. She tried to tell me about the last installments of the story, then she was interrupted. She gasped out something that sounded like American Airlines ticket office. Then the line went dead. There are three of those offices in town. Yeah. Well, we better check them. Look, can you take the one out in Beverly Hills? I'll get the others. All right. And Marlo, uh, where does this Spanish thing live? North Ardmore, 8310, apartment D. I'll meet you there in an hour. When Gigi hung up, I sent Kay to check the airline office in Hollywood for a woman carrying a cane and a big load of trouble, telling her to call me at the downtown agency within half an hour. Then I headed south for the office on 6th Street. Halfway down, it began to rain. You know, the kind of dismal, misty drizzle that makes your clothes smell like blankets at a fire sale? I spent a fruitless half hour peeking into corners and trading descriptions, and finally, 
When Kay called in a negative report from the Hollywood office, it was high time to beat it out to my appointment with Mona. The rain had put enough dazzling sheen on the pavement to make the going slow and slick. But I got out the 8310 odd more not over a minute late. Apartment B was the last on the right and completely dark. As I walked toward it, I found myself following a set of feminine footprints rapidly filling with water. And besides, each left print was a little round hole. By the time that registered on me, I was already at the door and could hear her crying inside. I didn't wait to knock. Mona! Mona, it's me, Marlo. For Pete's sake, what happened to you? Bill, that woman was here waiting for me in the dark. She had a big club. When I came in, she grabbed me and beat me with it. Yeah, it was a cane. Not that it makes any difference now. Hey, your apartment's a rest. She got the letter, huh? See, she got it and look. Look at this awful Later, later. Rules. Right now, I want to know what that letter said. You can forget about me paying the Mexican national debt for it. I want it free and fast. Come on, what's Annie got on Henrietta Lawrence? Right, right. She, she knows it. What? Somebody's outside there. Oh, it's Gigi. Come on in, Gigi. Hello, Bill. Who is this, the tortilla pounder you told me about? Just a minute, you. You can't All right, tell hold me it, me. hold it. Take it easy. You're a lousy housekeeper, sister. What happened? Your hat dance get out of control? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Henrietta scooped this, Gigi. She was here and got the letter herself. She what? Yes. We were just talking about the letter when you came in. Now, let's get on with it, Mona. What's Big Annie's pitch? Supposing I won't tell you now. Then I'll have you in the pokey for attempted extortion before you can say, Pancho Robinson, beautiful. Come on. Well... Okay. That's better. Well, you and me go out there. I don't know what Henrietta Lawrence means to this, this dragon here, but she's a murderer. Why, well, you lying little tamale tosser. That's impossible. Henrietta's a fine girl. You know what you're saying, Mona? Sure I do. I read the letter, didn't I? Henrietta Lawrence killed a woman in Seattle four years ago. Any saw her do it. She had names, dates, places, everything. I can't believe it. I just can't. She's such a swell person. Look. She even left this, the final installment of the story for me, in that Wilshire ticket office. What do we do, Phil? We gotta help her. Okay. Since neither she nor Annie counted on Mona here reading the letter, the best way to help her is to try to keep her from committing another murder. What, are you crazy? What are you talking about? Come on, Gigi, get with it. The letter was worthless, except as Annie String as protection. Yet Henrietta went to all the trouble of getting it. Why? So she could shut Annie up, and there's only one way to do that. Kill her. Holy mackerel, I didn't even think. You should, senora. You got nothing else to work with. Drop. Oh, stop it, stop Gigi. it. Both of you. Oh, crazy. Better stay clear of it from here on, Gigi. Go home and wait for me. Okay, Phil, whatever you say. Call me as soon as you can. Sure, you? sure. All right, come on, Mona. Let's go. Me? Yes. Oh, no, amigo. The letter's gone, and so is Mona's interest. I'm very tired. I now, listen, you. You cut yourself in on this right up the sombrero. You know, Annie, so you may be able to help me. It's that or spend the night in a cool add it up, sweetheart. On delay. Right. You're so forceful, amigo. Come on, let's go. Well, Annie's not in her apartment and she's not around the health club. What's next, Mona? Where else would she be? Search me, amigo. Thank, will you? Has she had any appointments lately that didn't fit with a regular routine? Well, she went out on Fountain Avenue in a big hurry a couple of Fountain days. Fountain Avenue? That's where Henrietta's been staying, in a hotel out there. The Brace Hotel? That's it, on the nose. Is Annie dumb enough to go there now tonight? Sure. She's stupid. And her strength makes her wreck. That's it. Let's go. Come on, Mona. It's here on the first floor. Hey, You again, Mr. Marlowe. Yeah, it's me again, Clarice. You're looking now... for that Miss Lawrence, yeah. number seven? Uh-huh. Well, you're sure in luck, Mr. Marlowe. She's in now. She came back about a half hour ago with a friend, the biggest woman I ever saw. Annie, it's true, amigo, you were right. Yeah, come on, let's get back there. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, you can't go back there. You're a man, and this hotel is for now, women look, only. Now, you've got a pass key there, haven't you? Yeah. Come on, this entire night from start to finish has been for women only. Getting sick and tired of it, present company included. Now, where's number seven? Hey. Right here. here. Henrietta! Unlock it, Corey's fast. Uh, Get back. Henry! Dead. With a knife. Yeah. Go ahead and scream, Corey's. Get it over with. Well, where? Where's Miss Lawrence? She no doubt left by the window here. Yeah, it's still open. 
Only five feet to the ground and a clear set of footprints in the wet dirt. Cane marks and all, just like... Just like what, Mr. Marlowe? I started to say like the ones I saw earlier. Sure, the last installment of the story, the letter at Mona's, the airline ticket. Now she's out of it slick as a whistle. Clarice, call the cops. Here, give them my card. I'll get in touch. Well, where are you going, Mr. Marlowe? To break the unpleasant news as gently as possible to my client. Hey, what about me? What will I do now? Just keep looking at Annie, you beautiful, chiseling, double-crossing jerk. Oh. Maybe you'll learn something, but I'm not going to count on it. Hey. Gigi had a lot of lights on in a glossy Brentwood house. And as I walked up the wet, curving flagstones to a door, I could see her inside, pacing slowly back and forth. An impatient cigarette in one hand, a stiff brace of brandy in the other. Whatever Gigi Ormsby really thought or felt about Henrietta Lawrence then, I couldn't tell. But I was sure that before I left, she was going to despise her. Phil, I've been waiting for you to phone me. I... Something bad, isn't it? I can see it in your face. We found Annie Stringer's body, Gigi, in Henrietta's hotel room. Ah, what a dirty, dirty shame. And Henrietta? Gone. But she won't get far, not this time. The circle gets smaller every time. She can't keep on killing. It's got to stop someplace. Yeah, I suppose so. But I'm sorry for her, Phil. I hope she got a plane ticket tonight and is miles away by morning. I hope she gets a break this time. She didn't buy a ticket. She's not even running. And she won't get that break. You talk as if you know where she is, do you? Mm Mm-hmm. You've been to Seattle, haven't you, Gigi? Of course, but not for years. You lived there. You were a writer before you became a publisher. Why? What is this? You knew Annie Stringer long before tonight, too, Gigi, huh? What are you driving at, Marlowe? That your real name is Henrietta Lawrence, that you killed a woman in Seattle once, changed your name and got away, but there was a witness. And a couple of weeks ago, purely by chance, that witness, Annie Stringer, ran into you, recognized you as Henrietta... And grabbed at the chance for blackmail. Stop it, Marlowe. So you had to bring Henrietta Lawrence back to life just long enough to get rid of the witness. But first you had to get a letter she'd written and also have someone who'd tell a straight story to the cops. So you hired me, planted the right leads along the way. You get away from that test. Don't try it, Gigi. You can't win, so at least lose gracefully, will you? <laughs> this was in one of my books. No one would believe it. You're right, I can't win. It's all true, Phil. Where was the loophole? It started only as a hunch. But everything fit. I got it from the cane you used, Gigi, at Mona's place. The cane marks were on the left side of your tracks. But outside the hotel window, they were on the right. Anybody who really has to use a cane couldn't do that. Such a little thing. As a matter of fact, it was. Look, Mono. You're the only person between me and that break. I got more money than I know what to do with. I can bid high, really high. You wouldn't be for sale, would you? No, baby. Just for hire. Get your coat, Gigi. We're going down to headquarters. Getting the whole business down on police stationery, one orderly step at a time... As a process as full of, well, as full as the fiscal report of the First National Bank. Took twice as long to whip up. But finally it was all over. I was on my way home to my bachelor apartment. And then, I remembered something. Never mind explaining what took you so long, darling. You're here now. Dinner is ready and waiting. And the martinis are ice cold. Just come on in and... Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, G.B. Hunter, Constance Crowder, Lillian Bayef, Gene Bates, and Michael Ann Barrett. 
The special music is composed and conducted by Richard O'Rant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a friend with millions, a myopic chemist and a long-haired piano player were thrown into a panic because a brilliant young lady with a gun was taking a big step in the wrong direction. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This time, a friend with millions, a myopic chemist and a long-haired piano player, was thrown into panic because a brilliant young lady with a gun was taking a big step in the wrong direction. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Big Step. figure shoes are uh, just like faces. How's that, champ? Well, they make it old and they make it wrinkled, but they're still okay as long as they got a shine on them. <laughs> yeah, it keeps that right condition, huh, champ? <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, let me just spank up this one again, eh? Sure. Oh, come in. Mr. Marlowe? Yeah. That's all right. Okay, champ. I guess it does it. Here you are. Oh, thank you, Mr. Marlowe. I'll uh, see you tomorrow. Eh? Right. Well, now that my shoes have a new lease on life, won't you sit down? Miss, uh... Cantor. Mrs. Betty Cantor. Oh. I'm a waitress at the Shelton Cafe. I need your help, Mr. Marlowe. There's something you could do for me. You free to take a case? Well, I'm free, depending on the case. What is it? Well, today, this friend of mine, Shirley Vitello, comes into the restaurant where I work. Yeah. She takes her usual table, and while she's waiting for her order, she starts reading the paper. Well, it's all quiet so far, Betty. Yeah, but just when I'm bringing in the tomato juice, it happens. She sees something in the paper that scares her. Scares her bad. What was it, Betty? Do you know? I don't know. She muttered something, and then she runs out of the place. Her face was gray like ashes. Later, I got to worrying. I called her at home, then at the lab where she works. Even her husband's studio. No luck. Now, wait a minute, Betty. I, I don't quite get the connection. You and Shirley Vitello, I mean. Oh, I don't know. We're social. We're only chummy at the restaurant. She's been eating there for years. Well, that's a basis for friendship. Yeah. Well... About six months ago, I was in bad trouble. And Shirley came through with 200 bucks when it seemed like more money than I'd ever seen. Yeah. It kept me and my husband together. So, you see, she means a lot to me. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, look, Beth, what was this about a lab? Well, Shirley's a technician. She works as an assistant to a chemist named Softman. Abraham Softman, out on Melrose someplace. Mm -hmm. What about Shirley's husband? Do you know him? Gilbert? Oh, yeah. He comes in with her a lot. He's a piano composer and a real nice guy. Mm. He lives for his work. He's unknown now, but he's a real genius, oh, Shirley. Sure, sure. She'd do anything to keep him and his music going. Yeah, well, tell me, this friend of yours saw something in a paper you said that scared her. Now, that's all you know, huh? Yeah. And I want you to find out why and help her. Here's 50 bucks, Mr. Marlowe. That's what you charge, ain't it? Uh, more or less, yeah. <clears throat> By the way, Mrs. Cantor, where's your ring? Uh... I sometimes take it off when I'm working. You do? Huh? Yeah. Or perhaps when you hock it to raise 50 bucks? Look, Betty, I'm a careless guy. You, um, you better hold the money, huh? Oh, but Mr. Marlowe... Where do the Vitellos live? But Mr. Marlowe... We're in a hurry, Betty, remember? Where's the address? Well, it's 3140 Veteran Avenue. Mm -hmm. And in case you want it, Gilbert's studio is Benedict Canyon, 510. Thanks, Mr. Marlowe. And you call me at Empire 17087, huh? When Betty Cantor was gone, I got in my car and drove out to Veteran Avenue. <laughs> you know, she was a pathetic little creature. And with a little effort, she could have that touch-and-glow look. Oh, well. 
3140 was one of those small but neat houses that grow like mushrooms overnight on a post-war California landscape. And it was locked, dark, and quiet. I went around to the back and started on the windows. The third one opened when I tried it. I climbed in, turned on some lights, and made the grand tour, then entered in the den. The only indication that anyone had been there all day was a current issue of the L.A. Star crumpled in the wastebasket. I pulled it out and started through it. On page five, I found the hole where a two-column story had been clipped out. And then somebody was at the front door. I started toward it, but changed my mind at the sound of the key in the lock. And instead, moved back into the den and watched. A head that belonged on a gopher wearing a battered fedora and inch-thick glasses above a fur-colored coat peeked in. Gave the place a myopic once over and headed straight for the den. So I stepped out where he could see me. I have never seen you before. What are you doing here? You tell me first, Pop. I'm bigger than you are. I'm Dr. Abraham Softman. Softman? Oh, the chemist Shirley Vitello works for. Is that why you have a key? Yes, yeah, she leaves unfinished. She leaves work here for me to pick up. It's a convenience for both of us. But now you. You can also explain, maybe? Well, a friend thinks your assistant's in trouble. I'm trying to find out. The name's Marlowe. Aha. Uh -huh. I suspected now I'm right. What? Shirley came to the laboratory late from lunch today. and Very much upset. She left again soon, right in the middle of our most important crimson test. Your what? Our crimson test. Oh, yes. Without one word to me, she left. Never does this happen before. In all the five years, she has been my loyal right hand. Uh, well, tell me, what's the nature of your research, Dr. Sopman? Uh, we are developing new commercial dyes. Oh, such a beautiful crimson we have now. Really? Shirley knows as much as I do about all of it. Mm. Mr. Marlowe. Hmm? Was it you who opened the desk drawer there? De no. <laughs> I didn't notice it till now. Two boxes of 32 caliber ammunition. Nine shells gone from the top one. She kept a gun there. I've seen it before. That's gone too. What kind of trouble needs a gun, Mr. Marlowe? Oh, I could think of a few. And they all say we better locate Shirley and soon. Now look, Doc, I want to ask Just you... Just one moment, what? please. Maybe you will know if this means anything. I found this under her work table after she left this afternoon. Is it maybe something? I don't know. Let me see. Empty reservation envelope from Federal Airlines. L.A. to New York. Departure 11.35 tonight. Made out to Ruth Britton. Ruth Britton? Who's that? Well, I don't know her, but she must be something to Shirley. Perhaps this Ruth Britton is the problem. Well, the airline number's here. Where's the phone? It's out there in the other room. No. There on the stage. Yeah, I got it. Hmm. Hudson Gray six one oh. Good evening, Federal Airlines. Agent Frederick Stowe speaking. Frederick, do you have a Ruth Britton listed on your eleven thirty five flight to New York? Oh, just one moment now, sir. I'll check. <laughs> oh no. Yes, yes, we do. Yeah, well, I, I've got to locate it. Do you have an address or a phone number there? Oh, no, sir, I do not. And even if I did, I'm look, afraid Freddy I could Look, Freddie boy, Freddie boy, this is important. I need that information. Now, describe it to me. What does she look like? Oh, dear, I'm afraid I can. Oh. I must have sold the ticket. I'm the only agent on duty, but I just can't seem to think where I am. Try, will you think? I am. How do you expect oh, me to remember awful. 75 or 80 faces every day? Now, listen, Good I... Good heavens, don't you think I get confused? Yes, I every do, Every time nine or ten jerks come in here at once, all wanting tickets at the Never same mind. time. Do you think I have Skip the right Frederickson. Now, look, Doc. Now, look, do me a favor, will you? What is it? Stay right here and wait for Shirley. If she comes back, hold her. I'm going to look up her husband, Gilbert. First stop was a newsstand. I bought an L.A. star, turned to page five, and found that the missing story was on a man identified only as Deniker, who'd been hit by a taxi on Temple Street at 8 a.m. The only reason it rated two columns was that before he lapsed into unconsciousness, he told the ambulance crew from the Citizens' Emergency Hospital that he knew he was going to die and wanted to clear his conscience by confessing a crime he'd committed. It ended with police standing by. I drove on into Benedict Canyon, wondering... What kind of a bridge is it going to take to span the gap between a female chemist and a downtown traffic accident? I was still wondering when I got the number 510. All I could see of Gilbert Vitello's studio over the brush around it was something pseudo-Spanish that had been stuck onto a piece of vertical real estate by an optimist in the early 20s. A path had been opened from the driveway to the house, and as I walked to the door, the piano music from inside got louder, but not better. 
Even in the long-haired circle, that stuff needed a haircut. Hey! Hey! Solo, break it up a minute, will you? What's the meaning of this outburst? I'm working and I won't be interrupted. Who are you? What do you want anyway? Take it easy, Mr. Vitello. My name is Marlo. Betty Cantor sent me here because she's worried about your wife. The waitress worried about Shirley. Why? Well, she's in some kind of trouble. Have you seen her tonight? No, no, no. Not since this morning, but that's not unusual. I often work late. My music is very demanding. Now, what gives that waitress the idea that Shirley's in trouble? Your wife's reaction to a newspaper story has scared the wits out of her. About a taxi hitting a man named Denica mean anything to you? Denica? Shirley worked with a fellow by that name once, I believe. But why would that story frighten her? Well, I was hoping you'd tell me. Do you have a gun? Uh, a, a, a little thirty-two pistol is at home. Why? It's gone. See here, what's this all about? Tell me. Tell me the truth and be quick about oh, it. Oh, shut up. Answer my question. All right. Uh, my wife was shocked by that item on Denica. She isn't at home, she isn't at Softman's lab, and hasn't been all afternoon. And what's oh. more, she's got a gun. That's all I know, except for one thing. Who's Ruth Britton? She's a friend of Shirley's on the east. She's been visiting relatives out here. Why? Nothing. Maybe Shirley's got a plane reservation for her. That's all. Mr. Marlowe, if that's all you have to offer, why don't you get out of here so I can go to work? I'm quite certain if Shirley were actually in trouble, she'd come to me if I help. And incidentally, tell Betty Cather to take some, some, some vitamins or something. She's becoming a meddlesome busybody. <laughs> You know, there was a quality about Gilbert Vitello that made me want to sock him on the temperament with the heavy end of his grand piano. When I started down the path to the driveway, I forgot about him. Because a pair of headlights slashed through the foliage like a giant scythe. I ran to where I could see and watch the girl in a brown suit get out of a sleek new Hudson and start toward the house. And she saw me. She backed away and threw me one scared look and darted into a side path like a jittery cottontail. I followed as fast as I could, but it was home ground to her, and in 20 yards I was outclassed. I lost her at the corner of a sagging shed and stopped to listen for her footsteps. I heard something else, but not in time to duck. Oh! 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 What happened, Mala? I heard a car come oh, in with a car. Oh, shut up, shut up. Surely she slugged me. I, I don't believe it. You're lying. Okay, I'm lying. For what it's worth to you, die hard. Your wife isn't kidding. She told me personally with a blunt instrument. Play that knee flat, Jack. Mr. Marlowe, did you get something? Lumps. Oh, How about you, Dr. Softman? No, nothing. Come in. Come in. Yeah. No, no one has come here. You found out something? Ever hear of a guy named Denica, Doc? Me? Here of Morris Denica? <laughs> Five times in the past three years, Morris Denica in Chicago has beaten me by introducing a new dye substance or a new process just days ahead of me. Huh. Five times this happened. He's a dye chemist, too. Huh? A brilliant one. I admire him. But why do you Listen, this me? is beginning to fit like a rubber glove. Hmm? Denica's in a hospital right here in L.A. He may not live and he wants to confess to a crime. Here, look. What? Now, read it is? yourself. When Shirley saw that story, it threw her into a panic. And now, it only figures one way. Your assistant has been selling your new developments to Denica before you released them. No, it is not true. Shirley would not do this thing. Not to me. Okay, Doc, we'll see. Now, look, why don't you go back to your lab and wait? I'm going to the hospital now and do some more fast addition. If it comes right... Just don't forget you're a scientist, will you? Oh, I would not forget. Now, you remember something, Mr. Marlowe. Two plus two does not always make four, especially when you are adding up human heart. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Wednesday's Wonderful on CBS with Dr. Christian, Groucho Marx, Bing Crosby, and Burns and Allen all coming your way over most of these same CBS stations. This Wednesday, Brother Bomb Crosby visits Bing. Gracie Allen stumps the income tax expert. Groucho will be on hand with his ad libs and teams of opposition. And Dr. Christian makes a wily grandmother stick to the truth for once. So be listening this Wednesday, won't you? Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe in tonight's story, The Big Step. It was 
Twenty stop-and-go minutes through the snarled early evening traffic over to the Citizens' Emergency Hospital. All the way, I kept hoping that Denica's confession wasn't going to have anything to do with Shirley Vitello. But when I was there, standing next to Detective Lieutenant Matthews and filling him in to date, I racked that hope up under wishful thinking. Morris Denica had already come, too. Yeah, Marlo, about a half hour ago. He didn't say too much. How much? Only something about this woman you mentioned, this Shirley Vitello, and yeah. the formula for some kind of a bleaching agent. Then he went out again. Hey, look, this, uh, this Vitello girl who currently adds up to something very dishonest, what does she look like? Oh, blonde, about 5'4", maybe 30. Wearing a dark brown suit and all hat? That's right. She's been around? Yeah, I spotted her here in the hall about 45 minutes ago. Claimed oh. she was a reporter, but she didn't make any small talk with the other news hands. I got a little suspicious. Just then, Denica came, too, so I went in there. When I came back out, she was gone. Hey, Marlowe, you know where we can pick her up? No, I don't, Lieutenant. Doesn't look so good for her. She could be pretty desperate right now. Like a quick trip to the country. Or like worse, she's got a gun, Matthews. And now oh. with Denica starting to talk, very little hope left. I better be going. Where? Just to? going, just going, Matthews. Hey, wait I'll a minute. keep in touch. Wait a minute. Look, we have a big organization, Mr. Marlowe. We're equipped to handle all kinds. We could do almost as good a job as you. Just keep that in mind, will you? Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad you said almost. So long. <laughs> I got back into my car and pointed it toward the Vitello place on Veteran Avenue again. Because I didn't know where else I could possibly pick up Shirley's trail. I felt like an uncomfortable emptiness was in the pit of my stomach. You know, like the guy who stands on a street corner and watches an ambulance in turn scrape up a traffic victim. He knows he didn't have anything to do with it, but that knowledge doesn't make him feel any better. Shirley Vitello is headed for trouble, bad trouble. And the pathetic little kid, Betty Cantor, who came into my office and started the whole thing, could get hurt in the process. Well, I parked in front of the place which, from inside, a desk lamp showed a circle of light the size and color of a lemon lifesaver, and, and the front door was open inches, as though somebody had left in a big hurry. I walked on eggs as far as the door and nudged it. I saw it. On the table in the far corner of the room, a note propped up against the lamp and nothing else. I started toward it. John Moore. I'm behind you, and I've got a gun. Oh, fine. 32 caliber out of the desk drawer, no doubt. No doubt. Marlo, why are you mixing into something that's no business of yours? I'm a private detective working for your friend Betty Cantor. She's worried about you, Shirley. Marlo, what's done is done. Betty can't help me. You can't help me. Nobody can help me. I stole Softman's work, and I sold it to Morris Deniker. I didn't count on a deathbed confession. Why'd you do it? I love my husband, and he needs money to go on with his work. No. Gilbert's in on this with you, huh? Oh, no. No, he isn't. He, he thought my wages were high, that's all. The note I left there on the table makes that clear. Also, it... Also what? It's goodbye. I, I love him, Marlowe. When I'm gone, he'll have enough money to carry on. Keep the studio that means so much to him. And nothing can be taken away from him. I've seen to that, legal-like. Just what do you mean, gone, Shirley? How far is gone? A long way, Marl. All the way. Suicide? <laughs> oh, no, Shirley, you Marl, can't mean that. Marl, let's not talk anymore. And don't bother about that phone. It's only Gilbert. How do you know? Well, when I pulled up outside here after I came from the hospital, he was home. I, I didn't want to speak to him, so I drove on until I came to a phone booth. And then I called here and told him to meet me at the Saffron Bar. <laughs> it's an old hangout of ours. You wanted to leave a note for him, but didn't want to face him, is that it? Yeah. Mm. He'll keep calling on and off for quite a while before he comes back here. I, I figured it would be better that way. I didn't want him chasing me. The air might give the big lug a cold. It always did. Well, Marlo, it looks like it's about time to put you away for safekeeping. I don't think so, Shirley. I think the phone is a... Next time, Marlo, it'll be more than a base, but just as fragile. Now, the closet seat aligned and strong. It, it should hold you long enough. Get in, Marlo. Go on. Okay. And it is, baby. But first... What? The step you're about to take, Shirley, Yeah, I listen. know all about it. it. It's a big step, isn't it, Marlowe? We'll save your breath. I wouldn't be any happier in prison or running away, believe me. 
Not a bit happier. So long, Marlo. Nobody's home. Shirley Vitello was mixed up about a lot of things in life, but that doesn't include closets because the one she put me in was strong. The lining she called Cedar must have been hand-me-down armor plate from a retired battle wagon. So all in all, I was 45 minutes alternately kicking and resting while the insistent telephone marked the five-minute intervals for me. But finally, it was the wood around the lock that gave way. I was out. Hello? Hello, sir. Who's this? Marlo Vitello, and save your questions till you hear what I have to say. Marlo, where's my wife? She was supposed to meet me here at the Saffron Barn. I said She's save not... it. Now listen. Your wife's out to kill herself. No, Marlo, no! Yes, tell me, did you two have a favorite spot out near the ocean? I, I don't see what I don't has... care whether you see or not, did you or didn't you? Yes, yes, the Redondo Fishing Pier below Santa Monica. Good, now keep listening, Vitello, and do as I say. Come straight home. But Marlo, it surely... Do as so... I say, Vitello. I'm back here and sit tight with fingers crossed. I worry about the pier. Goodbye. <laughs> and I picked up the phone again, dialed 116, got through to police emergency operator, and from there to Matthews, who was still at the Citizens Hospital. I told him to pick me up in a squad car and get ready for a fast 10-mile drive to the Redondo Fishing Pier, where Shirley Vitello was going to kill herself. Then I got outside and waited the four longest minutes of my life, until finally Matthews screeched up to a halt. When I piled in, we took off, siren wide open. Less than a minute now, Marlowe. Pier's only a couple of blocks away. Good. Better have Mooney kill that siren, Lieutenant. Jack, we want to come in quiet, Mooney. Okay, Lieutenant. Ah, uh, there she is. That car's out on the pier. Yeah, Mooney, pull up here, will you? We don't want to scare her into something. Matthews. What? That crowd there, halfway out on the pier. There's a cop with them. Yes, so there is. You better drive right up, Mooney. Looks like we're too late to. We were too late. At the center of a circle of the morbidly curious, always tanned and gaped, we found her lying face down in the greasy planks of the pier, dead. She shot herself through the heart, and the gun, the same 32 she'd used on me, was lying next to her. Two bullets gone. Explain the extra shot to Matthews. Uh huh. Okay, one bullet fired up at her place, and the other one here. Well, I hope you're satisfied, Marlow. What do you mean, satisfied? I mean single-handed. You had to leave the cops out of it, didn't you? You had to go up to Veteran Avenue all by your lonesome, didn't you? Now, you wait a minute, Matthews. I was only oh, trying to... nuts. Hey, Mooney, where's the nearest phone? Over there, Lieutenant, across the street, the Triple Eagle Cafe. The patrolman here's already called an ambulance. All right, tell him she can be moved. Come on, Marlow, I want to turn in a first report on this. Mooney, pick us up at the cafe. Right, Lieutenant. Okay, so Shirley Vitello was stealing formulas for those dyes from her boss and selling them to this Morris Denneker. Yeah. All was rosy until Denneker walked out in front of a taxi early this morning. That put him close to death and in the mood to talk. Also put Shirley Vitello on the spot. Hey, is that the place you want to phone from? Yeah, yeah. Look, one thing more, Mallow. The girl's motive all the way through. He loved her husband, he loved his work. Yeah? Her too? Yeah, after his work. So since he didn't make any dough, she stole to keep him going and close to her. <laughs> There's the phone, Phil. Come on, will you? I may need you to fill in the blanks for me. I... Marlo, I said I, I heard you. Me. I heard you. The phone can wait, Lieutenant. Come on over here. What? I want to talk to that piano player. Piano player? What about it? Tricky way he has of playing blue sky. What? Yeah. Hey, bud, that's all right. You got a mean left hand there. Yeah, I open in Carnegie Hall next week. Don't miss me. I'll try not to. It's just terrific what you do with that tune, you know? My own particular arrangement. Nobody else's, huh? Oh, nobody. I've been working on this arrangement for a week. That's all I wanted to know. Hey, Marla, what are you getting at? The phone, I've heard enough. Where'd you say it was, Matthew? Over there, the left of the bar. But still, what are what we doing? What time is it, Lieutenant? Five after twelve. Marla, what a is switch, it? A switch, a switch, Matthew. A switch? Yeah, one that'll knock your badge off. Well, you get a load of this. Oh, well, listen. Good evening, Federal Airwaves. Agent Frederick Stoltz. Listen, Frederick, I'm the party who called before about the reservations for Ruth Britton on the 1135 for New York. Oh, yes, I remember you. I'll probably... Never mind, it's police business, Freddy. Did the plane leave on schedule? Of course it did. But Miss Britton didn't make it, and she didn't bother to call and cancel her reservation. Thanks, I've heard enough. So far, so good, Matthew. Yeah, which means what? The Saffron Bar in Hollywood. Which means what? Charlie Vitello didn't commit suicide, Matthew. She was murdered. (laughs) 
Okay, Phil. Where's your man? Right there. That table against the wall. Oh. Come on, Matthew. Hawaiian music. Sentimental rock. Degradation. Pollination. Oh, I don't think it's as bad as all that, Gilbert, old boy. Marlowe. You were caught the most insensitive of all people. What would you know about music? Just for the record, he's not a cop. My question still stands. What do you know about music? As a matter of fact, not much. But you know, I'm fascinated by what they're doing with instruments these days. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. What are they doing that might fascinate you? Well, for example, take that picture where the score is done by only one instrument, a zither. What's more, it doesn't sound like a zipper. To a trained ear, a zipper is a zipper. You mean you can't make one instrument sound like another? Well, for example, uh, a guitar like a piano? Don't be ridiculous. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Not so ridiculous. Why, only tonight I heard a guitar that sounded just like a piano. Real tricky arrangement it was, too. Sounded... You're joking. Oh, no, no. Well, you must have heard it, too. It was while we were talking on the telephone. The telephone? I talked to you? Sure you did. You remember? Well, uh, Mom, Mom... You said you were calling from here, the Saffron Bar, but well, the conversation Mom. was being scored by the well, pianist at the Triple Eagle Cafe at Redondo uh, Beach. A real Mom. tricky arrangement in more ways than one. I, I, I didn't mean it. I, I didn't really want to. <laughs> All right, what's the rest of it, Phil? He didn't want to quit his work and spend the rest of his life hiding in some forgotten corner of the globe. Which was her plan? Yeah. As I figure it, once Shirley knew she was finished, she decided they should both run for it. She was in on what she was doing all along. And the suicide note? Uh, it was part of her plan. Oh. Leave Hubby here and innocent with money she got for a shenanigan. Then frame her own suicide, a trail that would lead us to the Redondo Pier, her hat and coat floating in the drink. Uh-huh. And after a couple of days of searching, we say the tide probably carried her body out to sea. Close case. That's right. In the meantime, she's flown to New York as Ruth Britton and is heading on from there. Hubby here to join her at a later date. Yeah, fine. Only Hubby double-crossed her and shot her so he can sit tight with the money right here. That's it, Matthew. Uh, please, please. Give me another chance. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Wipe them dry, Matthews, and take them away. I didn't go along with Matthews. I didn't even bother about my car, which I'd left in front of the Vitello place. Oh, I'd had enough. Not the kind of person who'd hitch his wife into a star, only the twinkle we saw on the horizon was the reflection of a dollar sign. Oh, yeah, they were a pair, all right, the Vitellans. A pair who finally canceled each other out. You know what? I'm glad of it. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Gene Bates, Paul Dubov, Vivi Janis, Edgar Barrier, and Peter Leeds. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard O'Ron. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time I tangled with a mad Scotchman, a phony English lord and a beautiful blonde corpse in a freight house. All because of a butler who walked on his knuckles. How about tying a mental string around your finger today to remind yourself to file your 1949 income tax return as soon as possible? The 15th of March isn't several miles down the road the way it used to be. It's almost at your front door. And you'd certainly get a scare if you came home one evening to find it sitting right smack in your living room saying smugly, Well, you forgot to file your income tax return. What now, little man? So why not set aside tonight as income tax night and file your 1949 return? 
This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS, where Burns and Allen are heard every Wednesday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.